The Odyssey By Homer Introduction Skepticism is as much the result of knowledge, as knowledge is of skepticism. To be content with what we at present know, is, for the most part, to shut our ears against conviction. Since, from the very gradual character of our education, we must continually forget, and emancipate ourselves from, knowledge previously acquired, we must set aside old notions and embrace fresh ones. And, as we learn, we must be daily unlearning something which it has cost us no small labor and anxiety to acquire. And this difficulty attaches itself more closely to an age in which progress has gained a strong ascendancy over prejudice, and in which persons and things are, day by day, finding their real level, in lieu of their conventional value. The same principles which have swept away traditional abuses, and which are making rapid havoc among the revenues of sinecurists, and stripping the thin, tawdry veil from attractive superstitions, are working as actively in literature as in society. The credulity of one writer, or the partiality of another, finds as powerful a touchstone and as wholesome a chastisement in the healthy skepticism of a temperate class of antagonists, as the dreams of conservatism or the impostures of pluralist sinecures in the Church. History and tradition, whether of ancient or comparatively recent times, are subjected to very different handling from that which the indulgence or credulity of former ages could allow. Mere statements are jealously watched, and the motives of the writer form as important an ingredient in the analysis or his history, as the facts he records. Probability is a powerful and troublesome test. And it is by this troublesome standard that a large portion of historical evidence is sifted. Consistency is no less pugnacious and exacting in its demands. In brief, to write a history, we must know more than mere facts. Human nature, viewed under an introduction of extended experience, is the best help to the criticism of human history. Historical characters can only be estimated by the standard which human experience, whether actual or traditionary, has furnished. To form correct views of individuals we must regard them as forming parts of a great whole, we must measure them by their relation to the mass of beings by whom they are surrounded. And, in contemplating the incidents in their lives or condition which tradition has handed down to us, we must rather consider the general bearing of the whole narrative, than the respective probability of its details. It is unfortunate for us, that, of some of the greatest men, we know least, and talk most. Homer, Socrates, and Shakespeare have, perhaps, contributed more to the intellectual enlightenment of mankind than any other three writers who could be named, and yet the history of all three has given rise to a boundless ocean of discussion, which has left us little save the option of choosing which theory or theories we will follow. The personality of Shakespeare is, perhaps, the only thing in which critics will allow us to believe without controversy, but upon everything else, even down to the authorship of plays, there is more or less of doubt and uncertainty. Of Socrates we know as little as the contradictions of Plato and Xenophon will allow us to know. He was one of the dramatis personae in two dramas as unlike in principles as in style. He appears as the enunciator of opinions as different in their tone as those of the writers who have handed them down. When we have read Plato or Xenophon, we think we know something of Socrates. When we have fairly read and examined both, we feel convinced that we are something worse than ignorant. It has been an easy, and a popular expedient of late years, to deny the personal or real existence of men and things whose life and condition were too much for our belief. This system, which has often comforted the religious skeptic, and substituted the consolations of Strauss for those of the New Testament, has been of incalculable value to the historical theorists of the last and present centuries. To question the existence of Alexander the Great would be a more excusable act than to believe in that of Romulus. To deny a fact related in Herodotus because it is inconsistent with a theory developed from an Assyrian inscription which no two scholars read in the same way is more pardonable. Then to believe in the good-natured old king whom the elegant pen of Florian has idealized, Numa Pompilius. Skepticism has attained its culminating point with respect to Homer, and the state of our Homeric knowledge may be described as a free permission to believe any theory, provided we throw overboard all written tradition. Concerning the author or authors of the Iliad and Odyssey. 
what few authorities exist on the subject, are summarily dismissed, although the arguments appear to run in a circle. This cannot be true, because it is not true, and that is not true, because it cannot be true. Such seems to be the style, in which testimony upon testimony, statement upon statement, is consigned to denial and oblivion. It is, however, unfortunate that the professed biographies of Homer are partly forgeries, partly freaks of ingenuity and imagination, in which truth is the requisite most wanting. Before taking a brief review of the Homeric theory in its present conditions, some notice must be taken of the treatise on the life of Homer which has been attributed to Herodotus. According to this document, the city of Cumae in Aeolia was, at an early period, the seat of frequent immigrations from various parts of Greece. Among the immigrants was Menapolis, the son of Ithagenes. Although poor, he married, and the result of the union was a girl named Critias. The girl was left an orphan at an early age, under the guardianship of Kleenax, of Argos. It is to the indiscretion of this maiden that we, are indebted for so much happiness. Homer was the first fruit of her juvenile frailty, and received the name of Melesigenes from having been born near the river Meles in Boeotia, whither Critias had been transported in order to save her reputation. At this time, continues our narrative, there lived at Smyrna a man named Phemius, a teacher of literature and music, who, not being married, engaged Critias to manage his household and spin the flax he received as the price of his scholastic labors. So satisfactory was her performance of this task, and so modest her conduct, that he made proposals of marriage, declaring himself, as a further inducement, willing to adopt her son, who, he asserted, would become a clever man. If he were carefully brought up. They were married, careful cultivation ripened the talents which nature had bestowed, and Melesigenes soon surpassed his schoolfellows in every attainment, and, when older, rivaled his preceptor in wisdom. Phineas died, leaving him sole heir to his property, and his mother soon followed. Melesigenes carried on his adopted father's school with great success, exciting the admiration not only of the inhabitants of Smyrna, but also of the strangers whom the trade carried on there, especially in the exportation of corn. Attracted to that city. Among these visitors, one Mentes, from Lucadia, the modern Santa Mora, who evinced a knowledge and intelligence rarely found in those times, persuaded Melesigenes to close his school and accompany him on his travels. He promised not only to pay his expenses, but to furnish him with a further stipend, urging, that, while he was yet young, it was fitting that he should see with his own eyes the countries and cities which might hereafter be the subjects of his discourses. Melesigenes consented, and set out with his patron, examining all the curiosities of the countries they visited, and informing himself of everything by interrogating those whom he met. We may also suppose, that he wrote memoirs of all that he deemed worthy of preservation. Having set sail from Tyrrhenia and Iberia, they reached Ithaca. Here Melesigenes, who had already suffered in his eyes, became much worse. And Mentes, who was about to leave for Lucadia, left him to the medical superintendence of a friend of his, named Mentor, the son of Alcina. Under his hospitable and intelligent host, Melesigenes rapidly became acquainted with the legends respecting Ulysses, which afterwards formed the subject of the Odyssey. The inhabitants of Ithaca assert, that it was here that Melesigenes became blind, but the Colophonians make their city the seat of that misfortune. He then returned to Smyrna, where he applied himself to the study of poetry. But poverty soon drove him to Cumae. Having passed over the Hermean plain, he arrived at Neon Tychos, the New Wall, a colony of Cumae. Here his misfortunes and poetical talent gained him the friendship of one Tychias, an armorer. And up to my time, continues the author, the inhabitants showed the place where he used to sit when giving a recitation of his verses, and they greatly honored the spot. Here also a poplar grew, which they said had sprung up ever since Melesigenes arrived. But poverty still drove him on, and he went by way of Larissa, as being the most convenient road. Here, the Cumans say, he composed an epitaph on Gordius, king of Phrygia, which has however, and with greater probability, been attributed to Cleobulus of Lindus. Arrived at Cumae, he frequented the conversaciones of the old men, and delighted all by the charms of his poetry. 
Encouraged by this favorable reception, he declared that, if they would allow him a public maintenance, he would render their city most gloriously renowned. They avowed their willingness to support him in the measure he proposed, and procured him an audience in the council. Having made the speech, with the purport of which our author has forgotten to acquaint us, he retired, and left them to debate respecting the answer to be given to his proposal. The greater part of the assembly seemed favorable to the poet's demand, but one man observed that if they were to feed Homers, they would be encumbered with a multitude of useless people. From this circumstance, says the writer, Melesigenes acquired the name of Homer, for the Cumans call blind men Homers. With a love of economy, which shows how similar the world has always been in its treatment of literary men, the pension was denied. And the poet vented his disappointment in a wish that Cumi might never produce a poet capable of giving it renown and glory. At Phocia Homer was destined to experience another literary distress. One Thesterides, who aimed at the reputation of poetical genius, kept Homer in his own house, and allowed him a pittance, on condition of the verses of the poet passing in his name. Having collected sufficient poetry to be profitable, Thesterides, like some would-be literary publishers, neglected the man whose brains he had sucked, and left him. At his departure, Homer is said to have observed, O Thesterides, of the many things hidden from the knowledge of man, nothing is more unintelligible than the human heart. Homer continued his career of difficulty and distress, until some Chian merchants, struck by the similarity of the verses they heard him recite, acquainted him with the fact that Thesterides was pursuing a profitable livelihood by the recital of the very same poems. This at once determined him to set out for Chios. No vessel happened then to be setting sail thither, but he found one ready to start for Erythri, a town of Ionia, which faces that island, and he prevailed upon the seamen to allow him to accompany them. Having embarked, he invoked a favorable wind, and prayed that he might be able to expose the imposture of Thesterides, who, by his breach of hospitality, had drawn down the wrath of Jove the hospitable. At Erythri, Homer fortunately met with a person who had known him in Phocia, by whose assistance he at length, after some difficulty, reached the little hamlet of Pythis. Here he met with an adventure, which we will continue in the words of our author. Having set out from Pythis, Homer went on, attracted by the cries of some goats that were pasturing. The dogs barked on his approach, and he cried out. Glaucus, for that was the name of the goat herd, heard his voice, ran up quickly, called off his dogs, and drove them away from Homer. For some time he stood wondering how a blind man should have reached such a place alone, and what could be his design in coming. He then went up to him and inquired who he was, and how he had come to desolate places and untrodden spots, and of what he stood in need. Homer, by recounting to him the whole history of his misfortunes, moved him with compassion. And he took him and led him to his cot, and, having lit a fire, bade him sup. The dogs, instead of eating, kept barking at the stranger, according to their usual habit. Whereupon Homer addressed Glaucus thus, O Glaucus, my friend, pry thee attend to my behest. First give the dogs their supper at the doors of the hut, for so it is better, since, whilst they watch, nor thief nor wild beast will approach the fold. Glaucus was pleased with the advice and marveled at its author. Having finished supper, they banquetted afresh on conversation, Homer narrating his wanderings, and telling of the cities he had visited. At length they retired to rest. But on the following morning, Glaucus resolved to go to his master, and acquaint him with his meeting with Homer. Having left the goats in charge of a fellow servant, he left Homer at home, promising to return quickly. Having arrived at Belissus, a place near the farm, and finding his mate, he told him the whole story respecting Homer and his journey. He paid little attention to what he said, and blamed Glaucus for his stupidity in taking in and feeding maimed and enfeebled persons. However, he bade him bring the stranger to him. Glaucus told Homer what had taken place, and bade him follow him, assuring him that good fortune would be the result. Conversation soon showed that the stranger was a man of much cleverness and general knowledge, and the Chian persuaded him to remain, and to undertake the charge of his children. Besides the satisfaction of driving the impostor Thesterides from the island, Homer enjoyed considerable success as a teacher. 
In the town of Chios he established a school, where he taught the precepts of poetry. To this day, says Chandler, the most curious remain is that which has been named, without reason, the school of Homer. It is on the coast, at some distance from the city, northward, and appears to have been an open temple of Sibylle, formed on the top of a rock. The shape is oval, and in the center is the image of the goddess, the head and an arm wanting. She is represented, as usual, sitting. The chair has a lion carved on each side, and on the back. The area is bounded by a low rim or seat, and about five yards over. The whole is hewn out of the mountain, is rude, indistinct, and probably of the most remote antiquity. So successful was this school, that Homer realized a considerable fortune. He married, and had two daughters, one of whom died single, the other married a Chian. The following passage betrays the same tendency to connect the personages of the poems with the history of the poet, which has already been mentioned. In his poetical compositions Homer displays great gratitude towards Mentor of Ithaca. In the Odyssey, whose name he has inserted in his poem as the companion of Ulysses, in return for the care taken of him when afflicted with blindness. He also testifies his gratitude to Phemius, who had given him both sustenance and instruction. His celebrity continued to increase, and many persons advised him to visit Greece whither his reputation had now extended. Having, it is said, made some additions to his poems calculated to please the vanity of the Athenians, of whose city he had hitherto made no mention, he set out for Samos. Here, being recognized by a Samian, who had met with him in Chios, he was handsomely received, and invited to join in celebrating the Apaturian festival. He recited some verses, which gave great satisfaction, and by singing the Irisian at the new moon festivals, he earned a subsistence, visiting the houses of the rich, with whose children he was very popular. In the spring he sailed for Athens, and arrived at the island of Ios, now Eno, where he fell extremely ill, and died. It is said that his death arose from vexation, at not having been able to unravel an enigma proposed by some fishermen's children. Such is, in brief, the substance of the earliest life of Homer we possess, and so broad are the evidences of its historical worthlessness, that it is scarcely necessary to point them out in detail. Let us now consider some of the opinions to which a persevering, patient, and learned, but by no means consistent, series of investigations has led. In doing so, I profess to bring forward statements, not to vouch for their reasonableness or probability. Homer appeared. The history of this poet in his works is lost in doubtful obscurity, as is the history of many of the first minds who have done honor to humanity, because they rose amidst darkness. The majestic stream of his song, Blessing and Fertilizing, flows like the Nile, through many lands and nations, and, like the sources of the Nile, its fountains will ever remain concealed. Such are the words in which one of the most judicious German critics has eloquently described the uncertainty in which the whole of the Homeric question is involved. With no less truth and feeling he proceeds. It seems here of chief importance to expect no more than the nature of things makes possible. If the period of tradition in history is the region of twilight, we should not expect in it perfect light. The creations of genius always seem like miracles, because they are, for the most part, created far out of the reach of observation. If we were in possession of all the historical testimonies, we never could wholly explain the origin of the Iliad and the Odyssey, for their origin, in all essential points, must have remained the secret of the poet. From this criticism, which shows as much insight into the depths of human nature as into the minute-wire drawings of scholastic investigation, let us pass on to the main question at issue. Was Homer an individual? Or were the Iliad and Odyssey the result of an ingenious arrangement of fragments by earlier poets? Well has Landor remarked, some tell us there were twenty Homers, some deny that there was ever one. It were idle and foolish to shake the contents of a vase, in order to let them settle at last. We are perpetually laboring to destroy our delights, our composure, our devotion to superior power. Of all the animals on earth we least know what is good for us. My opinion is, that what is best for us is our admiration of good. No man living venerates Homer more than I do. 
But, greatly as we admire the generous enthusiasm which rests contented with the poetry on which its best impulses had been nurtured and fostered, without seeking to destroy the vividness of first impressions by minute analysis. Our editorial office compels us to give some attention to the doubts and difficulties with which the Homeric question is beset, and to entreat our reader, for a brief period, to prefer his judgment to his imagination. And to condescend to dry details. Before, however, entering into particulars respecting the question of this unity of the Homeric poems, at least of the Iliad, I must express my sympathy with the sentiments expressed in the following remarks. We cannot but think the universal admiration of its unity by the better, the poetic age of Greece, almost conclusive testimony to its original composition. It was not till the age of the grammarians that its primitive integrity was called in question. Nor is it injustice to assert, that the minute and analytical spirit of a grammarian is not the best qualification for the profound feeling, the comprehensive conception of an harmonious whole. The most exquisite anatomist may be no judge of the symmetry of the human frame, and we would take the opinion of Chantry or Westmacott on the proportions and general beauty of a form, rather than that of Mr. Brodie or Sir Astley Cooper. There is some truth, though some malicious exaggeration, in the lines of Pope. The critic eye, that microscope of wit. Sees hairs and pores, examines bit by bit. How parts relate to parts, or they to whole. The body's harmony, the beaming soul. Are things which Custer, Berman, Was, shall see. When man's whole frame is obvious to a flea. Long was the time which elapsed before any one dreamt of questioning the unity of the authorship of the Homeric poems. The grave and cautious Thucydides quoted without hesitation the hymn to Apollo, the authenticity of which has been already disclaimed by modern critics. Longinus, in an oft-quoted passage, merely expressed an opinion touching the comparative inferiority of the Odyssey to the Iliad. And, among a mass of ancient authors, whose very names it would be tedious to detail, no suspicion of the personal non-existence of Homer ever arose. So far, the voice of antiquity seems to be in favor of our early ideas on the subject, let us now see what are the discoveries to which more modern investigations lay claim. At the end of the 17th century, doubts had begun to awaken on the subject, and we find Bentley remarking that, Homer wrote a sequel of songs and rhapsodies, to be sung by himself, for small comings and good cheer. At festivals and other days of merriment. These loose songs were not collected together, in the form of an epic poem, till about Pisistratus' time, about five hundred years after. Two French writers, Hedelin and Perrault, avowed a similar skepticism on the subject. But it is in the Scienza Nuova of Battista Vico that we first meet with the germ of the theory, subsequently defended by Wolf with so much learning and acuteness. Indeed, it is with the Wolfian theory that we have chiefly to deal, and with the following bold hypothesis, which we will detail in the words of Grote. Half a century ago, the acute and valuable prolegomena of F. A. Wolf, turning to account the Venetian scolia, which had then been recently published, first opened philosophical discussion as to the history of the Homeric text. A considerable part of that dissertation, though by no means the whole, is employed in vindicating the position, previously announced by Bentley, amongst others. That the separate constituent portions of the Iliad and Odyssey had not been cemented together into any compact body and unchangeable order, until the days of Pisistratus, in the sixth century before Christ. As a step towards that conclusion, Wolf maintained that no written copies of either poem could be shown to have existed during the earlier times, to which their composition is referred. And that without writing, neither the perfect symmetry of so complicated a work could have been originally conceived by any poet, nor, if realized by him, transmitted with assurance to posterity. The absence of easy and convenient writing, such as must be indispensably supposed for long manuscripts, among the early Greeks, was thus one of the points in Wolfe's case against the primitive integrity of the Iliad and Odyssey. By Nietzsche, and other leading opponents of Wolfe, the connection of the one with the other seems to have been accepted as he originally put it. And it has been considered incumbent on those who defended the ancient aggregate character of the Iliad and Odyssey, to maintain that they were written poems from the beginning. 
To me it appears, that the architectonic functions ascribed by Wolf to Pisistratus and his associates, in reference to the Homeric poems, are nowise admissible. But much would undoubtedly be gained towards that view of the question, if it could be shown, that, in order to controvert it, we were driven to the necessity of admitting long-written poems, in the ninth century before the Christian era. Few things, in my opinion, can be more improbable, and Mr. Payne Knight, opposed as he is to the Wolfian hypothesis, admits this no less than Wolf himself. The traces of writing in Greece, even in the seventh century before the Christian era, are exceedingly trifling. We have no remaining inscription earlier than the fortieth Olympiad, and the early inscriptions are rude and unskillfully executed. Nor can we even assure ourselves whether Archilochus, Simonides of Amorgus, Caulinus Tertius, Xanthus, and the other early elegiac and lyric poets, committed their compositions to writing, or at what time the practice of doing so became familiar. The first positive ground which authorizes us to presume the existence of a manuscript of Homer, is in the famous ordinance of Solon, with regard to the rhapsodies at the Panathenia, but for what length of time previously manuscripts had existed. We are unable to say. Those who maintain the Homeric poems to have been written from the beginning, rest their case, not upon positive proofs. Nor yet upon the existing habits of society with regard to poetry, for they admit generally that the Iliad and Odyssey were not read, but recited and heard. But upon the supposed necessity that there must have been manuscripts to ensure the preservation of the poems, the unassisted memory of reciters being neither sufficient nor trustworthy. But here we only escape a smaller difficulty by running into a greater. For the existence of trained bards, gifted with extraordinary memory, is far less astonishing than that of long manuscripts, in an age essentially non-reading and non-writing. And when even suitable instruments and materials for the process are not obvious. Moreover, there is a strong positive reason for believing that the bard was under no necessity of refreshing his memory by consulting a manuscript. For if such had been the fact, blindness would have been a disqualification for the profession, which we know that it was not, as well from the example of Demodocus, in the Odyssey, as from that of the blind bard of Chios. In the hymn to the Delian Apollo, whom Thucydides, as well as the general tenor of Grecian legend, identifies with Homer himself. The author of that hymn, be he who he may, could never have described a blind man as attaining the utmost perfection in his art. If he had been conscious that the memory of the bard was only maintained by constant reference to the manuscript in his chest. The loss of the digamma, that crux of critics, that quicksand upon which even the acumen of Bentley was shipwrecked, seems to prove beyond a doubt, that the pronunciation of the Greek language had undergone a considerable change. Now it is certainly difficult to suppose that the Homeric poems could have suffered by this change, had written copies been preserved. If Chaucer's poetry, for instance, had not been written, it could only have come down to us in a softened form, more like the effeminate version of Dryden, than the rough, quaint, noble original. At what period, continues Grote, these poems, or indeed any other Greek poems, first began to be written, must be matter of conjecture, though there is ground for assurance that it was before the time of Solon. If, in the absence of evidence, we may venture upon naming any more determinate period, the question at once suggests itself, what were the purposes which, in that state of society, a manuscript at its first commencement must have been intended to answer. For whom was a written Iliad necessary? Not for the rhapsodes. For with them it was not only planted in the memory, but also interwoven with the feelings, and conceived in conjunction with all those flexions and intonations of voice, pauses, and other oral artifices which were required for emphatic delivery. And which the naked manuscript could never reproduce. Not for the general public, they were accustomed to receive it with its rhapsodic delivery, and with its accompaniments of a solemn and crowded festival. The only persons for whom the written Iliad would be suitable would be a select few. Studious and curious men. A class of readers capable of analyzing the complicated emotions which they had experienced as hearers in the crowd, and who would, on perusing the written words, realize in their imaginations a sensible portion of the impression communicated by the reciter. Incredible as the statement may seem in an age like the present, there is in all early societies, 
and there was in early Greece, a time when no such reading class existed. If we could discover at what time such a class first began to be formed, we should be able to make a guess at the time when the old epic poems were first committed to writing. Now the period which may with the greatest probability be fixed upon as having first witnessed the formation even of the narrowest reading class in Greece, is the middle of the 7th century before the Christian era, BC 660 to BC. 630, the age of Terpander, Caulinus, Archilochus, Simonides of Amorgus, and C. I ground this supposition on the change then operated in the character and tendencies of Grecian poetry and music, the elegiac and the iambic measures having been introduced as rivals to the primitive hexameter, and poetical compositions having been transferred from the epical past to the affairs of present and real life. Such a change was important at a time when poetry was the only known mode of publication, to use a modern phrase not altogether suitable, yet the nearest approaching to the sense. It argued a new way of looking at the old epical treasures of the people, as well as a thirst for new poetical effect. And the men who stood forward in it may well be considered as desirous to study, and competent to criticize, from their own individual point of view, the written words of the Homeric rhapsodies. Just as we are told that Caulinus both noticed and eulogized the Thebais as the production of Homer. There seems, therefore, ground for conjecturing that, for the use of this newly formed and important, but very narrow class, manuscripts of the Homeric poems and other old epics, the Thebais and the Cypria, as well as the Iliad and the Odyssey, began to be compiled towards the middle of the 7th century B. C. I., and the opening of Egypt to Grecian commerce, which took place about the same period, would furnish increased facilities for obtaining the requisite papyrus to write upon. A reading class, when once formed, would doubtless slowly increase, and the number of manuscripts along with it, so that before the time of Solon, fifty years afterwards, both readers and manuscripts, though still comparatively few, might have attained a certain recognized authority, and formed a tribunal of reference against the carelessness of individual rhapsodies. But even Pisistratus has not been suffered to remain in possession of the credit, and we cannot help feeling the force of the following observations. There are several incidental circumstances which, in our opinion, throw some suspicion over the whole history of the Pisistratid compilation, at least over the theory that the Iliad was cast into its present stately and harmonious form by the directions of the Athenian ruler. If the great poets, who flourished at the bright period of Grecian song, of which, alas, we have inherited little more than the fame, and the faint echo. If Stesichorus, Anacreon, and Simonides were employed in the noble task of compiling the Iliad and Odyssey, so much must have been done to arrange, to connect, to harmonize. That it is almost incredible that stronger marks of Athenian manufacture should not remain. Whatever occasional anomalies may be detected, Anomalies which no doubt arise out of our own ignorance of the language of the Homeric age. However the irregular use of the digamma may have perplexed our Bentleys, to whom the name of Helen is said to have caused as much disquiet and distress as the fair one herself among the heroes of her age, however Mr. Knight may have failed in reducing the Homeric language to its primitive form. However, finally, the Attic dialect may not have assumed all its more marked and distinguishing characteristics, Still it is difficult to suppose that the language, particularly in the joinings and transitions, and connecting parts, should not more clearly betray the incongruity between the more ancient and modern forms of expression. It is not quite in character with such a period to imitate an antique style, in order to piece out an imperfect poem in the character of the original, as Sir Walter Scott has done in his continuation of Sir Tristram. If, however, not even such faint and indistinct traces of Athenian compilation are discoverable in the language of the poems, the total absence of Athenian national feeling is perhaps no less worthy of observation. In later, and it may fairly be suspected in earlier times, the Athenians were more than ordinarily jealous of the fame of their ancestors. But, amid all the traditions of the glories of early Greece embodied in the Iliad, the Athenians play a most subordinate and insignificant part. Even the few passages which relate to their ancestors, Mr. Knight suspects to be interpolations. It is possible, indeed, that in its leading outline, the Iliad may be true to historic fact. 
that in the great maritime expedition of western Greece against the rival and half-kindred empire of the Laomedontiidae, the chieftain of Thessaly, from his valour and the number of his forces, may have been the most important ally of the Peloponnesian sovereign, the preeminent value of the ancient poetry on the Trojan War may thus have forced the national feeling of the Athenians to yield to their taste. The songs which spoke of their own great ancestor were, no doubt, of far inferior sublimity and popularity, or, at first sight, a Thesid would have been much more likely to have emanated from an Athenian synod of compilers of ancient song. Than an Achilleid or an Odysseid. Could France have given birth to a Tasso, Tancred would have been the hero of the Jerusalem. If, however, the Homeric ballads, as they are sometimes called, which related the wrath of Achilles, with all its direful consequences, were so far superior to the rest of the poetic cycle, as to admit no rivalry, it is still surprising. That throughout the whole poem the Kalida Junctura should never betray the workmanship of an Athenian hand. And that the national spirit of a race, who have at a later period not inaptly been compared to our self-admiring neighbours, the French, should submit with lofty self-denial to the almost total exclusion of their own ancestors, or, at least, to the questionable dignity of only having produced a leader tolerably skilled in the military tactics of his age. To return to the Wolfian theory. While it is to be confessed, that Wolf's objections to the primitive integrity of the Iliad and Odyssey have never been wholly got over, we cannot help discovering that they have failed to enlighten us as to any substantial point. And that the difficulties with which the whole subject is beset, are rather augmented than otherwise, if we admit his hypothesis. Nor is Latchman's modification of his theory any better. He divides the first twenty-two books of the Iliad into sixteen different songs, and treats as ridiculous the belief that their amalgamation into one regular poem belongs to a period earlier than the age of Pisistratus. This as Grote observes, explains the gaps and contradictions in the narrative, but it explains nothing else. Moreover, we find no contradictions warranting this belief, and the so-called sixteen poets concur in getting rid of the following leading men in the first battle after the secession of Achilles, Elphenor, chief of the Eubians. Lipolemus, of the Rhodians, Pandarus, of the Lycians, Odins, of the Halizonians, Pyrrhus and Acamas, of the Thracians. None of these heroes again make their appearance, and we can but agree with Colonel Muir, that, it seems strange that any number of independent poets should have so harmoniously dispensed with the services of all six in the sequel. The discrepancy, by which Pylomenes, who is represented as dead in the fifth book, weeps at his son's funeral in the thirteenth, can only be regarded as the result of an interpolation. Grote, although not very distinct in stating his own opinions on the subject, has done much to clearly show the incongruity of the Wolfian theory, and of Latchman's modifications, with the character of Pisistratus. But he has also shown, and we think with equal success, that the two questions relative to the primitive unity of these poems, or, supposing that impossible, the unison of these parts by Pisistratus, and not before his time, are essentially distinct. In short, a man may believe the Iliad to have been put together out of pre-existing songs, without recognizing the age of Pisistratus as the period of its first compilation. The friends or literary employees of Pisistratus must have found an Iliad that was already ancient, and the silence of the Alexandrian critics respecting the Pisistratic recension, goes far to prove, that. Among the numerous manuscripts they examined, this was either wanting, or thought unworthy of attention. Moreover, he continues, the whole tenor of the poems themselves confirms what is here remarked. There is nothing, either in the Iliad or Odyssey, which savors of modernism, applying that term to the age of Pisistratus, nothing which brings to our view the alterations brought about by two centuries, in the Greek language, the coined money. The habits of writing and reading, the despotisms and republican governments, the close military array, the improved construction of ships, the amphictyonic convocations, the mutual frequentation of religious festivals, the oriental and Egyptian veins of religion, and familiar to the latter epoch. These alterations on Amacritus, and the other literary friends of Pisistratus, could hardly have failed to notice, even without design, had they then, for the first time, undertaken the task of piecing together many self-existent epics into one large aggregate. 
Everything in the two great Homeric poems, both in substance and in language, belongs to an age two or three centuries earlier than Pisistratus. Indeed, even the interpolations, or those passages which, on the best grounds, are pronounced to be such, betray no trace of the sixth century before Christ. And may well have been heard by Archilochus and Caulinus, in some cases even by Arctinus and Hesiod, as genuine Homeric matter. As far as the evidences on the case, as well internal as external, enable us to judge. We seem warranted in believing that the Iliad and Odyssey were recited substantially as they now stand, always allowing for partial divergences of text and interpolations, in 776 b. c. our first trustworthy mark of Grecian time. And this ancient date, let it be added, as it is the best authenticated fact, so it is also the most important attribute of the Homeric poems, considered in reference to Grecian history. For they thus afford us an insight into the anti-historical character of the Greeks, enabling us to trace the subsequent forward march of the nation, and to seize instructive contrasts between their former and their later condition. On the whole, I am inclined to believe, that the labors of Pisistratus were wholly of an editorial character, although I must confess that I can lay down nothing respecting the extent of his labors. At the same time, so far from believing that the composition or primary arrangement of these poems, in their present form, was the work of Pisistratus, I am rather persuaded that the fine taste and elegant mind of that Athenian would lead him to preserve an ancient and traditional order of the poems, rather than to patch and reconstruct them according to a fanciful hypothesis. I will not repeat the many discussions respecting whether the poems were written or not, or whether the art of writing was known in the time of their reputed author. Suffice it to say, that the more we read, the less satisfied we are upon either subject. I cannot, however, help thinking, that the story which attributes the preservation of these poems to Lycurgus, is little else than a version of the same story as that of Pisistratus. While its historical probability must be measured by that of many others relating to the Spartan Confucius. I will conclude this sketch of the Homeric theories with an attempt, made by an ingenious friend, to unite them into something like consistency. It is as follows. No doubt the common soldiers of that age had, like the common sailors of some fifty years ago, someone qualified to discourse in excellent music among them. Many of these, like those of the Negroes in the United States, were extemporaneous and allusive to events passing around them. But what was passing around them? The grand events of a spirit stirring war. Occurrences likely to impress themselves, as the mystical legends of former times had done, upon their memory, besides which, a retentive memory was deemed a virtue of the first water, and was cultivated accordingly in those ancient times. Ballads at first, and down to the beginning of the war with Troy, were merely recitations, with an intonation. Then followed a species of recitative, probably with an intoned burden. Tune next followed, as it aided the memory considerably. It was at this period, about four hundred years after the war, that a poet flourished of the name of Melesigenes, or Meonides, but most probably the former. He saw that these ballads might be made of great utility to his purpose of writing a poem on the social position of Hellas, and, as a collection, he published these lays connecting them by a tale of his own. This poem now exists, under the title of the Odyssea. The author, however, did not affix his own name to the poem, which, in fact, was, great part of it, remodeled from the archaic dialect of Crete, in which tongue the ballads were found by him. He therefore called it the poem of Homeros, or the collector, but this is rather a proof of his modesty and talent, than of his mere drudging arrangement of other people's ideas. For, as Grote has finally observed, arguing for the unity of authorship, a great poet might have recast pre-existing separate songs into one comprehensive whole, but no mere arrangers or compilers would be competent to do so. While employed on the wild legend of Odysseus, he met with a ballad, recording the quarrel of Achilles and Agamemnon. His noble mind seized the hint that there presented itself, and the Achilles grew under his hand. Unity of design, however, caused him to publish the poem under the same pseudonym as his former work, and the disjointed lays of the ancient bards were joined together, like those relating to the Cid, into a chronicle history, named the Iliad.
Melissa Jeans knew that the poem was destined to be a lasting one, and so it has proved, but, first, the poems were destined to undergo many vicissitudes and corruptions, by the people who took to singing them in the streets, assemblies, and agoras. However, Solon first, and then Pisistratus, and afterwards Aristoteles and others, revised the poems, and restored the works of Melesigenes Homeros to their original integrity in a great measure. Having thus given some general notion of the strange theories which have developed themselves respecting this most interesting subject, I must still express my conviction as to the unity of the authorship of the Homeric poems. To deny that many corruptions and interpolations disfigure them, and that the intrusive hand of the poet Asters may here and there have inflicted a wound more serious than the negligence of the copyist, would be an absurd and captious assumption. But it is to a higher criticism that we must appeal, if we would either understand or enjoy these poems. In maintaining the authenticity and personality of their one author, be he Homer or Melesigenes, quo cunc nomini vocari eum just fas que sit, I feel conscious that. While the whole weight of historical evidence is against the hypothesis which would assign these great works to a plurality of authors, the most powerful internal evidence, and that which springs from the deepest and most immediate impulse of the soul, also speaks eloquently to the contrary. The minutiae of verbal criticism I am far from seeking to despise. Indeed, considering the character of some of my own books, such an attempt would be gross inconsistency. But, while I appreciate its importance in a philological view, I am inclined to set little store on its aesthetic value, especially in poetry. Three parts of the emendations made upon poets are mere alterations, some of which, had they been suggested to the author by his Messenus or Africanus, he would probably have adopted. Moreover, those who are most exact in laying down rules of verbal criticism and interpretation, are often least competent to carry out their own precepts. Grammarians are not poets by profession, but may be so per accidents. I do not at this moment remember two emendations on Homer, calculated to substantially improve the poetry of a passage, although a mass of remarks, from Herodotus down to Loewy, have given us the history of a thousand minute points. Without which our Greek knowledge would be gloomy and jejune. But it is not on words only that grammarians, mere grammarians, will exercise their elaborate and often tiresome ingenuity. Binding down an heroic or dramatic poet to the block upon which they have previously dissected his words and sentences, they proceed to use the axe and the pruning knife by wholesale. And, inconsistent in everything but their wish to make out a case of unlawful affiliation, they cut out book after book, passage after passage, till the author is reduced to a collection of fragments or till those who fancied they possessed the works of some great man, find that they have been put off with a vile counterfeit got up at second hand. If we compare the theories of Knight, Wolf, Latchman, and others, we shall feel better satisfied of the utter uncertainty of criticism than of the apocryphal position of Homer. One rejects what another considers the turning point of his theory. One cuts a supposed knot by expunging what another would explain by omitting something else. Nor is this morbid species of sagacity by any means to be looked upon as a literary novelty. Justice Lipsius, a scholar of no ordinary skill, seems to revel in the imaginary discovery, that the tragedies attributed to Seneca are by four different authors. Now, I will venture to assert, that these tragedies are so uniform, not only in their borrowed phraseology, a phraseology with which writers like Boethius and Saxo Grammaticus were more charmed than ourselves, in their freedom from real poetry. And last, but not least, in an ultra-refined and consistent abandonment of good taste, that few writers of the present day would question the capabilities of the same gentleman, be he Seneca or not, to produce not only these, but a great many more equally bad. With equal sagacity, Father Harduin astonished the world with the startling announcement that the Aeneid of Virgil, and the satires of Horace, were literary deceptions. Now, without wishing to say one word of disrespect against the industry and in learning, nay, the refined acuteness, which scholars like Wolfe have bestowed upon this subject, I must express my fears. That many of our modern Homeric theories will become matter for the surprise and entertainment, rather than the instruction, of posterity. 
nor can I help thinking that the literary history of more recent times will account for many points of difficulty in the transmission of the Iliad and Odyssey to a period so remote from that of their first creation. I have already expressed my belief that the labors of Pisistratus were of a purely editorial character. And there seems no more reason why corrupt and imperfect editions of Homer may not have been abroad in his day, than that the poems of Valerius Flaccus and Tibullus should have given so much trouble to Poggio, Scaliger, and others. But, after all, the main fault in all the Homeric theories is, that they demand too great a sacrifice of those feelings to which poetry most powerfully appeals, and which are its most fitting judges. The ingenuity which has sought to rob us of the name and existence of Homer, does too much violence to that inward emotion, which makes our whole soul yearn with love and admiration for the blind bard of Chios. To believe the author of the Iliad a mere compiler, is to degrade the powers of human invention, to elevate analytical judgment at the expense of the most ennobling impulses of the soul, and to forget the ocean in the contemplation of a polypus. There is a Catholicity, so to speak, in the very name of Homer. Our faith in the author of the Iliad may be a mistaken one, but as yet nobody has taught us a better. While, however, I look upon the belief in Homer as one that has nature herself for its mainspring. While I can join with old Aeneas in believing in Homer as the ghost, who, like some patron saint, hovers round the bed of the poet, and even bestows rare gifts from that wealth of imagination which a host of imitators could not exhaust. Still I am far from wishing to deny that the author of these great poems found a rich fund of tradition, a well-stocked mythical storehouse, from whence he might derive both subject and embellishment. But it is one thing to use existing romances in the embellishment of a poem, another to patch up the poem itself from such materials. What consistency of style and execution can be hoped for from such an attempt? Or, rather, what bad taste and tedium will not be the infallible result? A blending of popular legends, and a free use of the songs of other bards, are features perfectly consistent with poetical originality. In fact, the most original writer is still drawing upon outward impressions, nay, even his own thoughts are a kind of secondary agents which support and feed the impulses of imagination. But unless there be some grand pervading principle, some invisible, yet most distinctly stamped archetypus of the great whole, a poem like the Iliad can never come to the birth. Traditions the most picturesque, episodes the most pathetic, local associations teeming with the thoughts of gods and great men, may crowd in one mighty vision, or reveal themselves in more substantial forms to the mind of the poet. But, except the power to create a grand whole, to which these shall be but as details and embellishments, be present, we shall have not but a scrapbook, a parterre filled with flowers and weeds strangling each other in their wild redundancy. We shall have a cento of rags and tatters, which will require little acuteness to detect. Sensible as I am of the difficulty of disproving a negative, and aware as I must be of the weighty grounds there are for opposing my belief. It still seems to me that the Homeric question is one that is reserved for a higher criticism than it has often obtained. We are not by nature intended to know all things, still less, to compass the powers by which the greatest blessings of life have been placed at our disposal. Were faith no virtue, then we might indeed wonder why God willed our ignorance on any matter. But we are too well taught the contrary lesson. And it seems as though our faith should be especially tried, touching the men and the events which have wrought most influence upon the condition of humanity. And there is a kind of sacredness attached to the memory of the great and the good, which seems to bid us repulse the skepticism which would allegorize their existence into a pleasing apologue. And measure the giants of intellect by an homeopathic dynamiter. Long and habitual reading of Homer appears to familiarize our thoughts even to his incongruities. Or rather, if we read in a right spirit and with a heartfelt appreciation, we are too much dazzled, too deeply wrapped in admiration of the whole, to dwell upon the minute spots which mere analysis can discover. In reading an heroic poem, we must transform ourselves into heroes of the time being, we in imagination must fight over the same battles, with the same loves, burn with the same sense of injury, as an Achilles or a Hector. And if we can but attain this degree of enthusiasm, and less enthusiasm will scarcely suffice for the reading of Homer, we shall feel that the poems of Homer are not only the work of one writer. 
but of the greatest writer that ever touched the hearts of men by the power of song. And it was this supposed unity of authorship which gave these poems their powerful influence over the minds of the men of old. Hiran, who is evidently little disposed in favor of modern theories, finally observes. It was Homer who formed the character of the Greek nation. No poet has ever, as a poet, exercised a similar influence over his countrymen. Prophets, lawgivers, and sages have formed the character of other nations, it was reserved to a poet to form that of the Greeks. This is a feature in their character which was not wholly erased even in the period of their degeneracy. When lawgivers and sages appeared in Greece, the work of the poet had already been accomplished, and they paid homage to his superior genius. He held up before his nation the mirror in which they were to behold the world of gods and heroes, no less than of feeble mortals, and to behold them reflected with purity and truth. His poems are founded on the first feeling of human nature. On the love of children, wife, and country, on that passion which outweighs all others, the love of glory. His songs were poured forth from a breast which sympathized with all the feelings of man. And therefore they enter, and will continue to enter, every breast which cherishes the same sympathies. If it is granted to his immortal spirit, from another heaven than any of which he dreamed on earth, to look down on his race, to see the nations from the fields of Asia, to the forests of Hercynia. Performing pilgrimages to the fountain which his magic wand caused to flow. If it is permitted to him to view the vast assemblage of grand, of elevated, of glorious productions, which had been called into being by means of his songs. Wherever his immortal spirit may reside, this alone would suffice to complete his happiness. Can we contemplate that ancient monument, on which the apotheosis of Homer is depictured, and not feel how much of pleasing association, how much that appeals most forcibly and most distinctly to our minds? is lost by the admittance of any theory but our old tradition. The more we read, and the more we think, think as becomes the readers of Homer, the more rooted becomes the conviction that the father of poetry gave us this rich inheritance, whole and entire. Whatever were the means of its preservation, let us rather be thankful for the treasury of taste and eloquence thus laid open to our use, than seek to make it a mere center around which to drive a series of theories whose wildness is only equaled by their inconsistency with each other. As the hymns, and some other poems usually ascribed to Homer, are not included in Pope's translation, I will content myself with a brief account of the Battle of the Frogs and Mice. From the pen of a writer who has done it full justice. This poem, says Coleridge, is a short mock heroic of ancient date. The text varies in different editions, and is obviously disturbed and corrupt to a great degree, it is commonly said to have been a juvenile essay of Homer's genius. Others have attributed it to the same pigries mentioned above, and whose reputation for humor seems to have invited the appropriation of any piece of ancient wit, the author of which was uncertain. So little did the Greeks, before the age of the Ptolemies, know or care about that department of criticism employed in determining the genuineness of ancient writings. As to this little poem being a youthful prolusion of Homer, it seems sufficient to say that from the beginning to the end, it is a plain and palpable parody, not only of the general spirit, but of numerous passages of the Iliad itself. And, even if no such intention to parody were discernible in it, the objection would still remain, that to suppose a work of mere burlesque to be the primary effort of poetry in a simple age. Seems to reverse that order in the development of national taste, which the history of every other people in Europe, and of many in Asia, has almost ascertained to be a law of the human mind. It is in a state of society much more refined and permanent than that described in the Iliad, that any popularity would attend such a ridicule of war and the gods as is contained in this poem. And the fact of there having existed three other poems of the same kind attributed, for aught we can see, with as much reason to Homer, is a strong inducement to believe that none of them were of the Homeric age. Knight infers from the usage of the word delta lambda tau omicron, writing tablet, instead of delta out of theta rho alpha, skin, which, according to Herod 5, 58, was the material employed by the Asiatic Greeks for that purpose. That this poem was another offspring of Attic ingenuity. And generally that the familiar mention of the cock, v. 191, is a strong argument against so ancient a date for its composition. 
Having thus given a brief account of the poems comprised in Pope's design, I will now proceed to make a few remarks on his translation and on my own purpose in the present edition. Pope was not a Grecian. His whole education had been irregular, and his earliest acquaintance with the poet was through the version of Ogilby. It is not too much to say that his whole work bears the impress of a disposition to be satisfied with the general sense, rather than to dive deeply into the minute and delicate features of language. Hence his whole work is to be looked upon rather as an elegant paraphrase than a translation. There are, to be sure, certain conventional anecdotes, which prove that Pope consulted various friends, whose classical attainments were sounder than his own, during the undertaking. But it is probable that these examinations were the result rather of the contradictory versions already existing, than of a desire to make a perfect transcript of the original. And in those days, what is called literal translation was less cultivated than at present. If something like the general sense could be decorated with the easy gracefulness of a practiced poet. If the charms of metrical cadence and a pleasing fluency could be made consistent with a fair interpretation of the poet's meaning his words were less jealously sought for. And those who could read so good a poem as Pope's Iliad had fair reason to be satisfied. It would be absurd, therefore, to test Pope's translation by our own advancing knowledge of the original text. We must be content to look at it as a most delightful work in itself, a work which is as much a part of English literature as Homer himself is of Greek. We must not be torn from our kindly associations with the old Iliad, that once was our most cherished companion, or our most look for prize, merely because but man, Loey. And Liddell have made us so much more accurate as to mu phi iota kappa pi epsilon lambda lambda omicron nu being an adjective, and not a substantive. Far be it from us to defend the faults of Pope, especially when we think of Chapman's fine, bold, rough old English, far be it from us to hold up his translation as what a translation of Homer might be. But we can still dismiss Pope's Iliad to the hands of our readers, with the consciousness that they must have read a very great number of books before they have read its fellow. Theodore Alloys Buckley Christ Church How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Book 1. Argument. Minerva's Descent to Ithaca. The poem opens within 48 days of the arrival of Ulysses in his dominions. He had now remained seven years in the island of Calypso, when the gods assembled in council, proposed the method of his departure from thence and his return to his native country. For this purpose it is concluded to send Mercury to Calypso, and Pallas immediately descends to Ithaca. She holds a conference with Telemachus, in the shape of Mantes, king of Taphians. In which she advises him to take a journey in quest of his father Ulysses, to Pylos and Sparta, where Nestor and Menelaus yet reigned, then, after having visibly displayed her divinity, disappears. The suitors of Penelope make great entertainments, and riot in her palace till night. Phineas sings to them the return of the Grecians, till Penelope puts a stop to the song. Some words arise between the suitors and Telemachus, who summons the council to meet the day following. The man for wisdom's various arts renowned. Long exercised in woes, O muse. Resound. Who, when his arms had wrought the destined fall. Of sacred Troy, and raised her heaven-built wall. Wandering from clime to clime, observant strayed. Their manners noted, and their states surveyed. On stormy seas unnumbered toils he bore. Safe with his friends to gain his natal shore. Vain toils. Their impious folly dared to pray. On herds devoted to the god of day. The god vindictive doomed them nevermore. Ah, men unblessed, to touch that natal shore. Oh, Snatch some portion of these acts from fate. Celestial muse. And to our world relate. Now at their native realms the Greeks arrived. All who the wars of ten long years survived. And, scaped the perils of the gulfy main. 
Ulysses, soul of all the victor train. An exile from his dear paternal coast. Deplored his absent queen and empire lost. Calypso in her caves constrained his stay. With sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. In vain for now the circling years disclose. The day predestined to reward his woes. At length his Ithaca is given by fate. Where yet new labors his arrival wait. At length there raged the hostile powers restrain. All but the ruthless monarch of the main. But now the god, remote, a heavenly guest. In A. Ethiopia graced the genial feast. A race divided, whom with sloping rays. The rising and descending sun surveys. There on the world's extremest verge revered. With hecatombs and prayer in pomp preferred. Distant he lay, while in the bright abodes. Of high Olympus, Jove convened the gods. The assembly thus the sire supreme addressed. A. Gistus fate revolving in his breast. Whom young Orestes to the dreary coast. Of Pluto sent, a blood-polluted ghost. Perverse mankind. Whose wills, created free. Charge all their woes on absolute degree. All to the dooming gods their guilt translate. And follies are miscalled the crimes of fate. When to his lust Aegisthus gave the rein. Did fate, or we, the adulterous act constrain? Did fate, or we, when great Atrides died? Urge the bold traitor to the regicide? Hermes I sent, while yet his soul remained. Sincere from royal blood, and faith profaned. To warn the wretch, that young Orestes, grown. To manly years, should reassert the throne. Yet, impotent of mind, and uncontrolled. He plunged into the gulf which heaven foretold. Here paused the god, and pensive thus replies. Minerva, graceful with her azure eyes. O thou! From whom the whole creation springs. The source of power on earth derived to kings. His death was equal to the direful deed. So may the man of blood be doomed to bleed. But grief and rage alternate wound my breast. For brave Ulysses, still by fate oppressed. Amidst an isle, around whose rocky shore. The forests murmur, and the surges roar. The blameless hero from his wished for home. A goddess guards in her enchanted dome. Atlas her sire, to whose far piercing eye. The wonders of the deep expanded lie. The eternal columns which on earth he rears. End in the starry vault, and prop the spheres. By his fair daughter is the chief confined. Who soothes to dear delight his anxious mind. Successless all her soft caresses prove. To banish from his breast his country's love. To see the smoke from his loved palace rise. While the dear isle in distant prospect lies. With what contentment could he close his eyes? And will omnipotence neglect to save? The suffering virtue of the wise and brave? Must he, whose altars on the Phrygian shore. With frequent rites, and pure, avowed thy power. Be doomed the worst of human ills to prove. Unblessed, abandoned to the wrath of Jove. Daughter. What words have passed thy lips unwait? Replied the thunderer to the martial made winky face. Deem not unjustly by my doom oppressed. Of human race the wisest and the best. Neptune, by prayer repentant rarely won. Afflicts the chief, to avenge his giant son. Whose visual orb Ulysses robbed of light. Great Polypheme, of more than mortal might. Him young Thousa bore, the bright increase. Of forces, dreaded in the sounds and seas. Whom Neptune eyed with bloom of beauty blessed. And in his cave the yielding nymph compressed. For this the god constrains the Greek to roam. A hopeless exile from his native home. From death alone exempt, but cease to mourn. Let all combine to achieve his wished return. Neptune atoned, his wrath shall now refrain. Or thwart the synod of the gods in vain. Father and king adored. Minerva cried. 
since all who in the Olympian bower reside. Now make the wandering Greek their public care. Let Hermes to the Atlantic Isle repair. Bid him, arrived in bright Calypso's court. The sanction of the assembled powers report. That wise Ulysses to his native land. Must speed, obedient to their high command. Meantime Telemachus, the blooming heir. Of sea-girt Ithaca, demands my care. Tis mine to form his green, unpractised years. In sage debates, surrounded with his peers. To save the state, and timely to restrain. The bold intrusion of the suitor train. Who crowd his palace, and with lawless power. His herds and flocks in feastful rites devour. To distant Sparta, and the spacious waste. Of sandy pile, the royal youth shall haste. There, warm with filial love, the cause inquire. That from his realm retards his godlike sire. Delivering early to the voice of fame. The promise of a green immortal name. She said, the sandals of celestial mold. Fledged with ambrosial plumes, and rich with gold. Surround her feet, with these sublime she sails. The aerial space, and mounts the winged gales. O'er earth and ocean wide prepared to soar. Her dreaded arm a beamy javelin bore. Ponderous and vast, which, when her fury burns. Proud tyrants humbles, and whole hosts o'erturns. From high Olympus prone her flight she bends. And in the realms of Ithaca descends. Her lineaments divine, the grave disguise. Of Mentes form concealed from human eyes. Mentes, the monarch of the Taphian land. A glittering spear waved awful in her hand. There in the portal placed, the heaven-born maid. Enormous riot and misrule surveyed. On hides of beeves, before the palace gate. Sad spoils of luxury, the suitors sate. With rival art, and ardor in their mien. At chest they vie, to captivate the queen. Divining of their loves. Attending nigh. A menial train the flowing bowl supply. Others, apart, the spacious hall prepare. And form the costly feast with busy care. Their young Telemachus, his bloomy face. Glowing celestial sweet, with godlike grace. Amid the circle shines, but hope and fear. Painful vicissitude, his bosom tear. Now, imaged in his mind, he sees restored. In peace and joy the people's rightful lord. The proud oppressors fly the vengeful sword. While his fond soul these fancy triumphs swelled. The stranger guessed the royal youth beheld. Grieved that a visitant so long should wait. Unmarked, unhonored, at a monarch's gate. Instant he flew with hospitable haste. And the new friend with courteous air embraced. Stranger, who are thou art, securely rest. Affianced in my faith, a ready guest. Approach the dome, the social banquet share. And then the purpose of thy soul declare. Thus affable and mild, the prince proceeds. And to the dome the unknown celestial leads. The spear receiving from the hand, he placed. Against a column, fair with sculpture graced. Where seemly ranged in peaceful order stood. Ulysses' arms now long disused to blood. He led the goddess to the sovereign seat. Her feet supported with a stool of state. A purple carpet spread the pavement wide. Then drew his seat, familiar, to her side. Far from the suitor train, a brutal crowd. With insolence, and wine, elate and loud. Where the free guest, unnoted, might relate. If haply conscious, of his father's fate. The golden ewer a maid obsequious brings. Replenished from the cool, translucent springs. With copious water the bright vase supplies. A silver laver of capacious size. They wash. The tables in fair order spread. They heap the glittering canisters with bread. Viands of various kinds allure the taste. Of choicest sort and savor, rich repast. Delicious wines the attending herald brought. The gold gave luster to the purple draught. 
lured with the vapor of the fragrant feast. In rushed the suitors with voracious haste. Marshaled in order due, to each a sewer. Presence, to bathe his hands, a radiant ewer. Luxurious then they feast. Observant round. Gay stripling youths the brimming goblets crowned. The rage of hunger quelled, they all advance. And form to measured airs the mazy dance. To Phineas was consigned the cord lyre. Whose hand reluctant touched the warbling wire. Phineas, whose voice divine could sweetest sing. High strains responsive to the vocal string. Meanwhile, in whispers to his heavenly guest. His indignation thus the prince expressed. Indulge my rising grief, whilst these, my friend. With song and dance the pompous revel end. Light is the dance, and doubly sweet the lays. When for the dear delight another pays. His treasured stores those cormorants consume. Whose bones, defrauded of a regal tomb. And common turf, lie naked on the plain. Or doomed to welter in the whelming main. Should he return, that troop so blithe and bold. With purple robes inwrought, and stiff with gold. Precipitant in fear would wing their flight. And curse their cumbrous pride's unwieldy weight. But ah, I dream, the appointed hour is fled. And hope, too long with vain delusion fed. Death to the rumor of fallacious fame. Gives to the roll of death his glorious name. With venial freedom let me now demand. Thy name, thy lineage, and paternal land. Sincere from whence began thy course, recite. And to what ship I owe the friendly freight. Now first to me this visit dost thou deign. Or numbered in my father's social train. All who deserved his choice he made his own. And, curious much to know, he far was known. My birth I boast, the blue-eyed virgin cries. From great Anchilus, renowned and wise. Mentes my name. I rule the Taphian race. Whose bounds the deep circumfluent waves embrace. A duteous people, an industrious isle. To naval arts inured, and stormy toil. Freighted with iron from my native land. I steer my voyage to the Brutian strand. To gain by commerce, for the labored mass. A just proportion of refulgent brass. Far from your capital my ship resides. At Riatoris, and secure at anchor rides. Where waving groves on airy main grow. Supremely tall and shade the deeps below. Thence to revisit your imperial dome. An old hereditary guest I come. Your father's friend. Laertes can relate. Our faith unspotted, and its early date. Who, pressed with heart-corroding grief and years. To the gay court a rural shed preters. Where, soul of all his train, a matron sage. Supports with homely fond his drooping age. With feeble steps from marshalling his vines. Returning sad. When toilsome day declines. With friendly speed, induced by erring fame. To hail Ulysses' safe return I came. But still the frown of some celestial power. With envious joy retards the blissful hour. Let not your soul be sunk in sad despair. He lives, he breathes this heavenly vital air. Among a savage race, whose shelfy bounds. With ceaseless roar the foaming deep surrounds. The thoughts which roll within my ravished breast. To me, no seer, the inspiring God suggest. Nor skilled nor studious, with prophetic eye. To judge the winged omens of the sky. Yet hear this certain speech, nor deem it vain. Though adamantine bonds the chief restrain. The dire restraint his wisdom will defeat. And soon restore him to his regal seat. But generous youth. Sincere and free declare. Are you, of manly growth, his royal heir? For sure Ulysses in your look appears. The same his features, if the same his years. Such was that face, on which I dwelt with joy. Ere Greece assembled stemmed the tides to Troy. But, parting then for that detested shore. Our eyes, 
unhappy never greeted more. To prove a genuine birth, the prince replies. On female truth assenting faith relies. Thus manifest of right, I build my claim. Sure founded on a fair maternal fame. Ulysses' son, but happier he, whom fate hath placed beneath the storms which toss the great. Happier the son, whose hoary sire is blessed with humble affluence, and domestic rest. Happier than I, to future empire born. But doomed a father's wretched fate to mourn. To whom, with aspect mild, the guest divine. O true descendant of a sceptred line. The gods a glorious fate from anguish free. To chaste Penelope's increased decree. But say, yon jovial troops so gaily dressed. Is this a bridal or a friendly feast? Or from their deed I rightlier may divine. Unseemly flown with insolence and wine. Unwelcome revellers, whose lawless joy. Pains the sage ear, and hurts the sober eye. Magnificence of old, the prince replied. Beneath our roof with virtue could reside. Unblamed abundance crowned the royal board. What time this dome revered her prudent lord. Who now, so heaven decrees, is doomed to mourn. Bitter constraint, erroneous and forlorn. Better the chief, on Ilion's hostile plain. Had fallen surrounded with his warlike train. Or safe returned, the race of glory passed. New to his friend's embrace, and breathed his last. Then grateful Greece with streaming eyes would raise. Historic marbles to record his praise. His praise, eternal on the faithful stone. Had with transmissive honor graced his son. Now snatched by harpies to the dreary coast. Sunk is the hero, and his glory lost. Vanished at once. Unheard of, and unknown. And I his heir in misery alone. Nor for a dear lost father only flow. The filial tears, but woe succeeds to woe. To tempt the spouseless queen with amorous wiles. Resort the nobles from the neighboring isles. From Samos, circled with the Ionian main. Delicium, and Zacintha's sylvan reign. Evan with presumptuous hope her bed to ascend. The lords of Ithaca their right pretend. She seems attentive to their pleaded vows. Her heart detesting what her ear allows. They, vain expectance of the bridal hour. My stores in riotous expense devour. In feast and dance the mirthful months employ. And meditate my doom to crown their joy. With tender pity touched, the goddess cried. Soon may kind heaven a sure relief provide. Soon may your sire discharge the vengeance due. And all your wrongs the proud oppressors rue. Oh! In that portal should the chief appear. Each hand tremendous with a brazen spear. In radiant panoply his limbs encased. For so of old my father's court he graced. When social mirth unbent his serious soul. O'er the full banquet. And the sprightly bowl. He then from Ephyre, the fair domain. Of Elos, sprung from Jason's royal strain. Measured a length of seas, a toilsome length, in vain. For, voyaging to learn the direful art. To taint with deadly drugs the barbed dart. Observant of the gods, and sternly just. Elos refused to impart the baneful trust. With friendlier zeal my father's soul was fired. The drugs he knew, and gave the boon desired. Appeared he now with such heroic port. As then conspicuous at the Taphian court. Soon should you boasters cease their haughty strife. Or each atone his guilty love with life. But of his wished return the care resign. Be future vengeance to the powers divine. My sentence here, with stern distaste avowed. To their own districts drive the suitor crowd. When next the morning warms the purple east. Convoke the peerage, and the gods attest. The sorrows of your inmost soul relate. And form sure plans to save the sinking state. Should second love a pleasing flame inspire. And the chaste queen connubial rites require. Dismissed with honor, let her hence repair. 
to great Icarius, whose paternal care will guide her passion and reward her choice with wealthy dower and bridal gifts of price. Then let this dictate of my love prevail. Instant, to foreign realms prepare to sail. To learn your father's fortunes, fame may prove. Or omened voice, the messenger of Jove. Propitious to the search. Direct your toil. Through the wide ocean first to sandy pile. Of Nestor, hoary sage, his doom demand. Then speed your voyage to the Spartan strand. For young Atrides to the Achaean coast. Arrived the last of all the victor host. If yet Ulysses views the light, forbear. Till the fleet hours restore the circling year. But if his soul hath winged the destined flight. Inhabitant of deep disastrous night. Homeward with pious speed repass the main. To the pale shade funereal rites ordain. Plant the fair column o'er the vacant grave. A hero's honours let the hero have. With decent grief the royal dead deplored. For the chaste queen select an equal lord. Then let revenge your daring mind employ. By fraud or force the suitor train destroy. And starting into manhood, scorn the boy. Hast thou not heard how young Orestes, fired. With great revenge, immortal praise acquired. His virgin sword Aegisthus veins embrued. The murderer fell, and blood atoned for blood. O oh, greatly blessed with every blooming grace. With equal steps the paths of glory trace. Join to that royal youth's your rival name. And shine eternal in the sphere of fame. But my associates now my stay deplore. Impatient on the horse resounding shore. Thou, heedful of advice, secure proceed. My praise the precept is, be thine the deed. The counsel of my friend, the youth rejoined. Imprints conviction on my grateful mind. So fathers speak, persuasive speech and mild. Their sage experience to the favorite child. But, since to part, for sweet refection do. The genial viands let my train renew. And the rich pledge of plighted faith receive. Worthy the heir of Ithaca to give. Defer the promised boon, the goddess cries. Celestial azure brightening in her eyes. And let me now regain the Reithrian port. From Temesi returned, your royal court. I shall revisit, and that pledge receive. And gifts, memorial of our friendship, leave. Abrupt, with eagle speed she cut the sky. Instant invisible to mortal eye. Then first he recognized the ethereal guest. Wonder and joy alternate fire his breast. Heroic thoughts, infused, his heart dilate. Revolving much his father's doubtful fate. At length, composed, he joined the suitor throng. Hushed in attention to the warbled song. His tender theme the charming lyrist chose. Minerva's anger, and the dreadful woes. Which voyaging from Troy the victors bore. While storms vindictive intercept the store. The shrilling airs the vaulted roof rebounds. Reflecting to the queen the silver sounds. With grief renewed the weeping fair descends. Their sovereign step a virgin train attends. A veil, of richest texture wrought, she wears. And silent to the joyous hall repairs. There from the portal, with her mild command. Thus gently checks the minstrel's tuneful hand. Phemius. Let acts of gods, and heroes old. What ancient bards in hall and bower have told. Attempered to the lyre, your voice employ. Such the pleased ear will drink with silent joy. But, oh! Forbear that dear disastrous name. To sorrow, sacred, and secure of fame. My bleeding bosom sickens at the sound. And every piercing note inflicts a wound. Why, dearest object of my duteous love? Replied the prince, will you the bard reprove? Oft, Jove's ethereal rays, resistless fire. The chanter's soul and raptured song inspire. Instinct divine. Nor blame severe his choice. Warbling the Grecian woes with heart and voice. 
for novel lays attract our ravished ears. But old, the mind with inattention hears. Patient permit the sadly pleasing strain. Familiar now with grief, your tears refrain. And in the public woe forget your own. You weep not for a perished lord alone. What Greeks knew wandering in the Stygian gloom. Wish your Ulysses shared an equal doom. Your widowed hours, apart, with female toil. And various labors of the loom beguile. Their rule, from palace cares remote and free. That care to man belongs, and most to me. Mature beyond his years, the queen admires. His sage reply, and with her train retires. Then swelling sorrows burst their former bounds. With echoing grief afresh the dome resounds. Till Pallas, piteous of her plaintive cries. In slumber closed her silver streaming eyes. Meantime, rekindled at the royal charms. Tumultuous love each beating bosom warms. In temperate rage a wordy war began. But bold Telemachus assumed the man. Instant, he cried, your female discord end. Ye deedless boasters. And the song attend. Obey that sweet compulsion, nor profane. With dissonance the smooth melodious strain. Pacific now prolong the jovial feast. But when the dawn reveals the rosy east, I, to the peers assembled, shall propose. The firm resolve, I here in few disclose. No longer live the cankers of my court. All to your several states with speed resort. Waste in wild riot what your land allows. There ply the early feast, and late carouse. But if, to honor lost, tis still decreed. For you my bowl shall flow, my flock shall bleed. Judge and revenge my right, impartial Jove. By him and all the immortal thrones above. A sacred oath, each proud oppressor slain. Shall with inglorious gore this marble stain. Awed by the prince, thus haughty, bold, and young. Rage gnawed the lip, and wonder chained the tongue. Silence at length the gay Antinous broke. Constrained a smile, and thus ambiguous spoke. What God to your untutored youth affords. This headlong torrent of amazing words. May Jove delay thy reign, and cumber late. So bright a genius with the toils of state. Those toils, Telemachus serene replies. Have charms, with all their weight, Tealur the wise. Fast by the throne obsequious fame resides. And wealth incessant rolls her golden tides. Nor let Antinous rage, if strong desire. Of wealth and fame a youthful bosom fire. Elect by Jove, his delegate of sway. With joyous pride the summons I'd obey. Weener Ulysses roams the realm of night. Should factious power dispute my lineal right. Some other Greeks a fairer claim may plead. To your pretense their title would precede. At least, the scepter lost, I still should reign. Soul o'er my vassals, and domestic train. To this Eurymachus, to heaven alone. Refer the choice to fill the vacant throne. Your patrimonial stores in peace possess. Undoubted, all your filial claim confess. Your private right should impious power invade. The peers of Ithaca would arm in aid. But say, that stranger guest who late withdrew. What and from whence? His name and lineage shew. His grave demeanor and majestic grace. Speak him descended of no vulgar race. Did he some loan of ancient right require? Or came forerunner of your sceptred sire? O son of Polybus! The prince replies. No more my sire will glad these longing eyes. The queen's fond hope inventive rumor cheers. Or vain diviner's dreams divert her fears. That stranger guest the Taphian realm obeys. A realm defended with encircling seas. Mentes, an ever-honored name, of old. High in Ulysses' social list enrolled. Thus he, though conscious of the ethereal guest. Answered evasive of the sly request. Meantime the liar rejoins the sprightly lay. Love diddied airs, and dance, conclude the day. 
but when the star of eve with golden light adorned the matron brow of sable knight the mirthful train dispersing quit the court and to their several domes to rest resort a towering structure to the palace joined to this his steps the thoughtful prince inclined in his pavilion there to sleep repairs the lighted torch the sage Euryclea bears daughter of ops the just pisenor's son for twenty beeves by great laertes won in rosy prime with charms attractive graced honored by him a gentle lord and chaste with dear esteem too wise with jealous strife to taint the joys of sweet connubial life soul with telemachus her service ends a child she nursed him and a man attends whilst to his couch himself the prince addressed the duteous dame received the purple vest the purple vest with decent care disposed the silver ring she pulled the door reclosed the bolt obedient to the silken cord to the strong staples inmost depth restored secured the valves there wrapped in silent shade pensive the rules the goddess gave he wait stretched on the downy fleece no rest he knows and in his raptured soul the vision glows book 2 argument the council of ithaca Telemachus in the assembly of the lords of Ithaca complains of the injustice done him by the suitors, and insists upon their departure from his palace. Appealing to the princes, and exciting the people to declare against them. The suitors endeavor to justify their stay, at least till he shall send the queen to the court of Icarius her father, which he refuses. There appears a prodigy of two eagles in the sky, which an augur expounds to the ruin of the suitors. Telemachus then demands a vessel to carry him to Pylos and Sparta, there to inquire of his father's fortunes. Pallas, in the shape of Mentor, an ancient friend of Ulysses, helps him to a ship, assists him in preparing necessaries for the voyage, and embarks with him that night, which concludes the second day from the opening of the poem. The scene continues in the palace of Ulysses, in Ithaca. Now reddening from the dawn, the morning ray glowed in the front of heaven, and gave the day. The youthful hero, with returning light, rose anxious from the inquietudes of night. A royal robe he wore with graceful pride. A two-edged falchion threatened by his side. Embroidered sandals glittered as he trod. And forth he moved, majestic as a god. Then by his heralds, restless of delay. To counsel calls the peers, the peers obey. Soon as in solemn form the assembly sate. From his high dome himself descends in state. Bright in his hand a ponderous javelin shined. Two dogs, a faithful guard, attend behind. Pallas with grace divine his form improves. And gazing crowds admire him as he moves. His father's throne he filled, while distant stood. The hoary peers, and aged wisdom bowed. Twas silence all. At last a Egyptius spoke. A Egyptius, by his age and sorrow broke. A length of days his soul with prudence crowned. A length of days had bent him to the ground. His eldest hope in arms to Ilion came. By great Ulysses taught the path to fame. But, hapless youth, the hideous Cyclops tore. His quivering limbs, and quaffed his spouting gore. Three sons remained, to climb with haughty fires. The royal bed, Euronomus aspires. The rest with duteous love his griefs assuage. And ease the sire of half the cares of age. Yet still his Antiphus he loves, he mourns. And, as he stood, he spoke and wept by turns. Since great Ulysses sought the Phrygian plains. Within these walls in glorious silence reigns. Say then, ye peers. By whose commands we meet? Why here once more in solemn council sit? Ye young, ye old, the weighty cause disclose. Arrive some message of invading foes? Or say, does high necessity of state inspire some patriot and demand debate? The present synod speaks its author wise. Assist him, Jove, thou regent of the skies. 
He spoke. Telemachus with transport glows. Embraced the omen, and majestic rose. His royal hand the imperial scepter swayed. Then thus, addressing to Aegyptius, said. Reverend old man. Lo here confessed he stands. By whom ye meet, my grief your care demands. No story I unfold of public woes. Nor bear advices of impending foes. Peace the blessed land, and joy's incessant crown. Of all this happy realm, I grieve alone. For my lost sire continual sorrows spring. The great, the good, your father and your king. Yet more, our house from its foundation bows. Our foes are powerful, and your sons the foes. Hither, unwelcome to the queen, they come. Why seek they not the rich Icarian dome? If she must wed, from other hands require. The dowry, is Telemachus her sire. Yet through my court the noise of revel rings. And waste the wise frugality of kings. Scarce all my herds their luxury suffice. Scarce all my wine their midnight hours supplies. Safe in my youth, in riot still they grow. Nor in the helpless orphan dread a foe. But come it will, the time when manhood grants. More powerful advocates than vain complaints. Approach that hour. Insufferable wrong. Cries to the gods, and vengeance sleeps too long. Rise then, ye peers. With virtuous anger rise. Your fame revere, but most the avenging skies. By all the deathless powers that reign above. By righteous Themis and by thundering Jove. Themis, who gives to counsels, or denies. Success, and humbles, or confirms the wise. Rise in my aid. Suffice the tears that flow. For my lost sire, nor add new woe to woe. If e'er he bore the sword to strengthen ill. Or, having power to wrong, betrayed the will. On me, on me your kindled wrath assuage. And bid the voice of lawless riot rage. If ruin to your royal race ye doom. Be you the spoilers, and our wealth consume. Then might we hope redress from juster laws. And raise all Ithaca to aid our cause. But while your sons commit the unpunished wrong. You make the arm of violence too strong. While thus he spoke, with rage and grief he frowned. And dashed the imperial scepter to the ground. The big round tear hung trembling in his eye. The synod grieved, and gave a pitying sigh. Then silent sate, at length Antinous burns. With haughty rage, and sternly thus returns. O oh, insolence of youth! Whose tongue affords? Such railing eloquence, and war of words. Studious thy country's worthies to defame. Thy erring voice displays thy mother's shame. Elusive of the bridal day, she gives. Fond hopes to all, and all with hopes deceives. Did not the sun, through heaven's wide azure rolled. For three long years the royal fraud behold. While she, laborious in delusion, spread. The spacious loom, and mixed the various thread. Whereas to life the wondrous figures rise. Thus spoke the inventive queen, with artful sighs. Though cold in death Ulysses breathes no more. Cease yet a while to urge the bridal hour. Cease, till to great Laertes I bequeath. A task of grief, his ornaments of death. Lest when the fates his royal ashes claim. The Grecian matrons taint my spotless fame. When he, whom living mighty realms obeyed. Shall want in death a shroud to grace his shade. Thus she, at once the generous train complies. Nor fraud mistrusts in virtue's fair disguise. The work she plied, but, studious of delay. By night reversed the labors of the day. While thrice the sun his annual journey made. The conscious lamp the midnight fraud surveyed. Unheard, unseen, three years her arts prevail. The fourth her maid unfolds the amazing tale. We saw, as unperceived we took our stand. The backward labors of her faithless hand. 
Then urged, she perfects her illustrious toils. A wondrous monument of female wiles. But you, O peers. And thou, O prince. Give ear. I speak aloud, that every Greek may hear. Dismiss the queen, and if her sire approves. Let him espouse her to the peer she loves. Bid instant to prepare the bridal train. Nor let a race of princes wait in vain. Though with a grace divine her soul is blessed. And all Minerva breathes within her breast. In wondrous arts than woman more renowned. And more than woman with deep wisdom crowned. Though Tyro nor Mycene match her name. Not great Aelmina, the proud boasts of fame. Yet thus by heaven adorned, by heaven's decree. She shines with fatal excellence, to thee. With thee, the bowl we drain, indulge the feast. Till righteous heaven reclaim her stubborn breast. What though from pole to pole resounds her name? The sun's destruction waits the mother's fame. For, till she leaves thy court, it is decreed. Thy bowl to empty and thy flock to bleed. While yet he speaks, Telemachus replies. Even nature starts, and what ye ask denies. Thus, shall I thus repay a mother's cares. Who gave me life, and nursed my infant years. While sad on foreign shores Ulysses treads. Or glides a ghost with unapparent shades. How to Icarus in the bridal hour. Shall I, by waste undone, refund the dower? How from my father should I vengeance dread? How would my mother curse my hated head? And while in wrath to vengeful fiends she cries. How from their hell would vengeful fiends arise? Abhorred by all, accursed my name would grow. The earth's disgrace, and humankind my foe. If this displease, why urge ye here your stay? Haste from the court, ye spoilers, haste away. Waste in wild riot what your land allows. There ply the early feast, and late carouse. But if to honor lost, tis still decreed. For you my bowl shall flow, my flocks shall bleed. Judge, and assert my right, impartial Jove. By him, and all the immortal host above. A sacred oath, if heaven the power supply. Vengeance I vow, and for your wrongs ye die. With that, two eagles from a mountain's height. By Jove's command direct their rapid flight. Swift they descend, with wing to wing conjoined. Stretch their broad plumes, and float upon the wind. Above the assembled peers they will on high. And clang their wings, and hovering beat the sky. With ardent eyes the rival train they threat. And shrieking loud denounce approaching fate. They cuff, they tear. Their cheeks and neck they rend. And from their plumes huge drops of blood descend. Then sailing o'er the domes and towers, they fly. Full toward the east, and mount into the sky. The wondering rivals gaze, with cares oppressed. And chilling horrors freeze in every breast. Till big with knowledge of approaching woes. The prince of augurs, Halitherses, rose. Prescient he viewed the aerial tracks. And drew. A sure presage from every wing that flew. Ye sons, he cried, of Ithaca, give ear. Hear all. But chiefly you, O rivals. Hear. Destruction sure o'er all your heads impends. Ulysses comes, and death his steps attends. Nor to the great alone is death decreed. We and our guilty Ithaca must bleed. Why cease we then the wrath of heaven to stay? Be humbled all, and lead, ye great. The way. For lo my words no fancied woes relate. I speak from science and the voice of fate. When great Ulysses sought the Phrygian shores. To shake with war proud Ilion's lofty towers. Deeds then undone my faithful tongue foretold. Heaven sealed my words, and you those deeds behold. I see, I cried, his woes, a countless train. I see his friends overwhelmed beneath the main. How twice ten years from shore to shore he roams. Now twice ten years are past, and now he comes. 
To whom Eurymachus, fly, dotard fly. With thy wise dreams, and fables of the sky. Go prophesy at home, thy sons advise. Here thou art sage in vain, I better read the skies. Unnumbered birds glide through the aerial way. Vagrants of air, and unforeboding stray. Cold in the tomb, or in the deeps below. Ulysses lies. O oh, wert thou laid as low. Then would that busy head no broil suggest. For fire to rage Telemachus breast. From him some bribe thy venal tongue requires. And interest, not the god, thy voice inspires. His guideless youth, if thy experienced age. Mislead fallacious into idle rage. Vengeance deserve thy malice shall repress. And but augment the wrongs thou wouldst redress. Telemachus may bid the queen repair. To great Icarius, whose paternal care. Will guide her passion, and reward her choice. With wealthy dower, and bridal gifts of price. Till she retires, determined we remain. And both the prince and augur threat in vain. His pride of words, and thy wild dream of fate. Move not the brave, or only move their hate. Thread on, O prince. Elude the bridal day. Thread on, till all thy stores in waste decay. True, Greece affords a train of lovely dames. In wealth and beauty worthy of our flames. But never from this nobler suit we cease. For wealth and beauty less than virtue please. To whom the youth, since then in vain I tell. My numerous woes, in silence let them dwell. But heaven, and all the Greeks, have heard my wrongs. To heaven, and all the Greeks, redress belongs. Yet this I ask, nor be it asked in vain. A bark to waft me o'er the rolling main. The realms of Pyle and Sparta to explore. And seek my royal sire from shore to shore. If, or to fame his doubtful fate be known. Or to be learned from oracles alone. If yet he lives, with patience I forbear. Till the fleet hours restore the circling year. But if already wandering in the train. Of empty shades, I measure back the main. Plant the fair column o'er the mighty dead. And yield his consort to the nuptial bed. He ceased. And while abashed the peers attend. Mentor arose, Ulysses' faithful friend. When fierce in arms he sought the scenes of war. My friend, he cried, my palace be thy care. Years rolled on years my godlike sire decay. Guard thou his age, and his behests obey. Stern as he rose, he cast his eyes around. That flashed with rage. And as spoke, he frowned. Oh never, never more let king be just. Be mild in power, or faithful to his trust. Let tyrants govern with an iron rod. Oppress, destroy, and be the scourge of God. Since he who like a father held his reign. So soon forgot, was just and mild in vain. True, while my friend is grieved, his griefs I share. Yet now the rivals are my smallest care. They for the mighty mischiefs they devise. Ere long shall pay, their forfeit lives the price. But against you, ye Greeks. Ye coward train. Gods. How my soul is moved with just disdain. Dumb ye all stand, and not one tongue affords. His injured prince the little aid of words. While yet he spoke, Leocritus rejoined. O oh, pride of words, and arrogance of mind. Wouldst thou to rise in arms the Greeks advise? Join all your powers. In arms, ye Greeks, arise. Yet would your powers in vain our strength oppose. The valiant few o'ermatch a host of foes. Should great Ulysses stern appear in arms. While the bowl circles and the banquet warms. Though to his breast his spouse with transport flies. Torn from her breast, that hour, Ulysses dies. But hence retreating to your domes repair. To arm the vessel, mentor. Be thy care. And Halithers is. Thine, be each his friend. Ye love the father, go, the son attend. 
But yet, I trust, the boaster means to stay. Safe in the court, nor tempt the watery way. Then, with a rushing sound the assembly bend. Diverse their steps, the rival route ascend. The royal dome. While sad the prince explores. The neighboring main, and sorrowing treads the shores. There, as the waters o'er his hands he shed. The royal suppliant to Minerva prayed. O goddess! Who descending from the skies. Vouchsafe thy presence to my wondering eyes. By whose commands the raging deeps I trace. And seek my sire through storms and rolling seas. Hear from thy heavens above, O warrior maid. Descend once more, propitious to my aid. Without thy presence, vain is thy command. Greece, and the rival train, thy voice withstand. Indulgent to his prayer, the goddess took. Sage mentor's form, and thus like mentor spoke. O prince, in early youth divinely wise. Born, the Ulysses of thy age to rise. If to the son the father's worth descends. O'er the wide wave success thy ways attends. To tread the walks of death he stood prepared. And what he greatly thought, he nobly dared. Were not wise sons descendant of the wise. And did not heroes from brave heroes rise. Vain were my hopes, few sons attain the praise. Of their great sires, and most their sires disgrace. But since thy veins paternal virtue fires. And all Penelope thy soul inspires. Go, and succeed, the rival's aims despise. For never, never wicked man was wise. Blind they rejoice, though now, even now they fall. Death hastes amain, one hour o'erwhelms them all. And lo, with speed we plough the watery way. My power shall guard thee, and my hand convey. The winged vessel studious I prepare. Through seas and realms companion of thy care. Thou to the court ascend, and to the shores. When night advances, bear the naval stores. Bread, that decaying man with strength supplies. And generous wine, which thoughtful sorrow flies. Meanwhile the mariners, by my command. Shall speed aboard, a valiant chosen band. Wide o'er the bay, by vessel vessel rides. The best I choose to waft then o'er the tides. She spoke, to his high dome the prince returns. And, as he moves, with royal anguish mourns. Twas riot all, among the lawless train. Boar bled by boar, and goat by goat lay slain. Arrived, his hand the gay Antinous pressed. And thus deriding, with a smile addressed. Grieve not, O daring prince. That noble heart. Ill suits gay youth the stern heroic part. Indulge the genial hour, unbend thy soul. Leave thought to age, and drain the flowing bowl. Studious to ease thy grief, our care provides. The bark, to waft thee o'er the swelling tides. Is this, returns the prince, for mirth a time. When lawless gluttons riot, mirth's a crime. The luscious wines, dishonored, lose their taste. The song is noise, and impious is the feast. Suffice it to have spent with swift decay. The wealth of kings, and made my youth a prey. But now the wise instructions of the sage. And manly thoughts inspired by manly age. Teach me to seek redress for all my woe. Here, or in pile, in pile, or here, your foe. Deny your vessels, ye deny in vain. A private voyager I pass the main. Free breathe the winds, and free the billows flow. And where on earth I live, I live your foe. He spoke and frowned, nor longer deigned to stay. Sternly his hand withdrew, and strode away. Meantime, o'er all the dome, they quaff, they feast. Derisive taunts were spread from guest to guest. And each in jovial mood his mate addressed. Tremble ye not, O friends, and coward fly. Doomed by the stern Telemachus to die. To pile or Sparta to demand supplies. Big with revenge, the mighty warrior flies. Or comes from Ephyre with poisons fraught. 
and kills us all in one tremendous draft. Or who can say, his gamesome mate replies. But, while the danger of the deeps he tries. He, like his sire, may sink deprived of breath. And punish us unkindly by his death. What mighty labors would he then create? To seize his treasures, and divide his state. The royal palace to the queen convey. Or him she blesses in the bridal day. Meantime the lofty rooms the prince surveys. Where lay the treasures of the Athatian race. Here ruddy brass and gold refulgent blazed. Their polished chests embroidered vestures graced. Here jars of oil breathed forth a rich perfume. Their casks of wine in rose adorned the dome. Pure flavorous wine, by gods in bounty given. And worthy to exalt the feasts of heaven. Untouched they stood, till, his long labors o'er. The great Ulysses reached his native shore. A double strength of bars secured the gates. Fast by the door the wise Euryclea waits. Euryclea, who great ops. Thy lineage shared. And watched all night, all day, a faithful guard. To whom the prince, O thou whose guardian care. Nurse the most wretched king that breathes the air. Untouched and sacred may these vessels stand. Till great Ulysses views his native land. But by thy care twelve urns of wine be filled. Next these in worth, and firm these urns be sealed. And twice ten measures of the choicest flower. Prepared, are yet descends the evening hour. For when the favoring shades of night arise. And peaceful slumbers close my mother's eyes. Me from our coast shall spreading sails convey. To seek Ulysses through the watery way. While yet he spoke, she filled the walls with cries. And tears ran trickling from her aged eyes. O oh, whither, whither flies my son, she cried. To realms, that rocks and roaring seas divide. In foreign lands thy father's days decayed. And foreign lands contain the mighty dead. The watery way ill-fated if thou try. All, all must perish, and by fraud you die. Then stay, my, child. Storms beat, and rolls the main. Oh, beat those storms, and roll the seas in vain. Far hence, replied the prince, thy fears be driven. Heaven calls me forth, these counsels are of heaven. But, by the powers that hate the perjured, swear. To keep my voyage from the royal ear. Nor uncompelled the dangerous truth betray. Till twice six times descends the lamp of day. Lest the sad tale a mother's life impair. And grief destroy what time a while would spare. Thus he. The matron with uplifted eyes. Attests the all-seeing sovereign of the skies. Then studious she prepares the choicest flower. The strength of wheat and wine's an ample store. While to the rival train the prince returns. The martial goddess with impatience burns. Like thee, Telemachus, in voice and size. With speed divine from street to street she flies. She bids the mariners prepare to stand. When night descends, embodied on the strand. Then to Nomon swift she runs, she flies. And asks a bark, the chief a bark supplies. And now, declining with his sloping wheels. Down sunk the sun behind the western hills. The goddess shoved the vessel from the shores. And stowed within its womb the naval stores. Full in the openings of the spacious main. It rides. And now descends the sailor train. Next, to the court, impatient of delay. With rapid step the goddess urged her way. There every eye with slumberous chains she bound. And dashed the flowing goblet to the ground. Drowsy they rose, with heavy fumes oppressed. Reeled from the palace, and retired to rest. Then thus, in mentor's reverend form arrayed. Spoke to Telemachus the martial maid. Lo! On the seas, prepared the vessel stands. The impatient mariner thy speed demands. Swift as she spoke, with rapid pace she leads. The footsteps of the deity he treads. 
swift to the shore they move along the strand. The ready vessel rides, the sailors ready stand. He bids them bring their stores, the attending train. Load the tall bark, and launch into the main. The prince and goddess to the stern ascend. To the strong stroke at once the rowers bend. Full from the west she bids fresh breezes blow. The sable billows foam and roar below. The chief his orders gives, the obedient band. With due observance wait the chief's command. With speed the mast they rear, with speed unbind. The spacious sheet, and stretch it to the wind. High o'er the roaring waves the spreading sails. Bow the tall mast, and swell before the gales. The crooked keel the parting surge divides. And to the stern retreating roll the tides. And now they ship their oars, and crown with wine. The holy goblet to the powers divine. Imploring all the gods that reign above. But chief the blue-eyed progeny of Jove. Thus all the night they stem the liquid way. And end their voyage with the morning ray. Book 3. Argument. The Interview of Telemachus and Nestor. Telemachus, guided by Pallas in the shape of Mentor, arrives in the morning at Pylos, where Nestor and his sons are sacrificing on the sea, shore to Neptune. Telemachus declares the occasion of his coming, and Nestor relates what passed in their return from Troy, how their fleets were separated, and he never since heard of Ulysses. They discourse concerning the death of Agamemnon, the revenge of Orestes, and the injuries of the suitors. Nestor advises him to go to Sparta, and inquire further of Menelaus. The sacrifice ending with the night, Minerva vanishes from them in the form of an eagle, Telemachus is lodged in the palace. The next morning they sacrifice a bullock to Minerva. And Telemachus proceeds on his journey to Sparta, attended by Pisistratus. The scene lies on the seashore of Pylos. The sacred sun, above the waters raised. Through heaven's eternal brazen portals blazed. And wide o'er earth diffused his cheering ray. To gods and men to give the golden day. Now on the coast of Pyle the vessel falls. Before old Neleus' venerable walls. There suppliant to the monarch of the flood. At nine green theatres the pillions stood. Each held five hundred, a deputed train. At each, nine oxen on the sand lay slain. They taste the entrails, and the altars load. With smoking thighs, an offering to the god. Full for the port the Ithascensian stand. And furl their sails, and issue on the land. Telemachus already pressed the shore. Not first, the power of wisdom marched before. And ere the sacrificing throng he joined. Admonished thus his well-attending mind. Proceed, my son. This youthful shame expel. An honest business never blush to tell. To learn what fates thy wretched sire detain. We pass the wide immeasurable main. Meet then the senior far renowned for sense. With reverend awe, but decent confidence. Urge him with truth to frame his fair replies. And sure he will. For wisdom never lies. Oh tell me, mentor. Tell me, faithful guide. The youth with prudent modesty replied. How shall I meet, or how accost the sage? Unskilled in speech, nor yet mature of age. Awful th approach, and hard the task appears. To question wisely men of riper years. To whom the martial goddess thus rejoined. Search, for some thoughts, thy own suggesting mind. And others, dictated by heavenly power shall rise spontaneous in the needful hour. For not unprosperous shall thy ways attend. Born with good omens, and with heaven thy friend. She spoke, and led the way with swiftest speed. As swift, the youth pursued the way she led. And joined the band before the sacred fire. Where sate, encompassed with his sons, the sire. The youth of Pylos, some on pointed wood. Transfixed the fragments, some prepared the food. In friendly throngs they gather to embrace. Their unknown guests, and at the banquet place. Pisistratus was first to grasp their hands. 
and spread soft hides upon the yellow sands. Along the shore the illustrious pair he led. Where Nestor sate with the youthful thrasened. To each a portion of the feast he bore. And held the golden goblet foaming o'er. Then first approaching to the elder guest. The latent goddess in these words addressed. Who a thou art, from fortune brings to keep. These rites of Neptune, monarch of the deep. Thee first it fits, O stranger. To prepare. The due libation and the solemn prayer. Then give thy friend to shed the sacred wine. Though much thy younger, and his years like mine. He too, I deem, implores the power divine. For all mankind alike require their grace. All born to want, a miserable race. He spake, and to her hand preferred the bowl. A secret pleasure touched Athena's soul. To see the preference due to sacred age. Regarded ever by the just and sage. Of ocean's king she then implores the grace. O thou! Whose arms this ample globe embrace. Fulfill our wish, and let thy glory shine. On Nestor first, and Nestor's royal line. Next grant the pillion states their just desires. Pleased with their hecatombs ascending fires. Last, deign Telemachus and me to bless. And crown our voyage with desired success. Thus she, and having paid the right divine. Gave to Ulysses' son the rosy wine. Suppliant he prayed. And now the victims dressed. They draw, divide, and celebrate the feast. The banquet done, the narrative old man. Thus mild, the pleasing conference began. Now gentle guests. The genial banquet o'er. It fits to ask ye, what your native shore? And whence your race? On what adventure say? Thus far you wander through the watery way. Relate if business, or the thirst of gain. Engage your journey o'er the pathless main. Where savage pirates seek through seas unknown. The lives of others, venturous of their own. Urged by the precepts by the goddess given. And filled with confidence infused from heaven. The youth, whom Pallas destined to be wise. And famed among the sons of men, replies. Inquirest thou, father. From what coast we came? O grace and glory of the Grecian name! From where high Ithaca o'erlooks the floods, brown with o'erarching shades and pendant woods, us to these shores our filial duty draws. A private sorrow, not a public cause. My sire I seek, where'er the voice of fame has told the glories of his noble name. The great Ulysses, famed from shore to shore. For valor much, for hardy suffering more. Long time with thee before proud Ilion's wall. In arms he fought. With thee beheld her fall. Of all the chiefs, this hero's fate alone. Has Jove reserved, unheard of, and unknown. Whether in fields by hostile fury slain. Or sunk by tempests in the gulfy main. Of this to learn, oppressed with tender fears. Lo! At thy knee his suppliant son appears. If o'er thy certain eye, or curious ear, Have learned his fate, the whole dark story clear. And, oh! Whatever heaven destined to betide, Let neither flattery soothe, nor pity hide. Prepared I stand, he was but born to try. The lot of man, to suffer, and to die. Oh then, if ever through the ten years' war, the wise, the good Ulysses claimed thy care. If e'er he joined thy counsel, or thy sword. True in his deed, and constant to his word. Far as thy mind through backward time can see. Search all thy stores of faithful memory. Tis sacred truth I ask, and ask of thee. To him experienced Nestor thus rejoined. O friend! What sorrows dost thou bring to mind? Shall I the long, laborious scene review? And open all the wounds of Greece anew? What toils by sea? Where dark in quest of prey? Dauntless we roved. Achilles led the way. What toils by land? 
we're mixed in fatal fight. Such numbers fell, such heroes sunk to night. Their Ajax great, Achilles there the brave. Their wise Patroclus, fill an early grave. There, too, my son, ah, once my best delight. Once swift of foot, and terrible in fight. In whom stern courage with soft virtue joined. A faultless body and a blameless mind. Antilochus, what more can I relate? How trace the tedious series of our fate? Not added years on years my task could close. The long historian of my country's woes. Back to thy native islands mightst thou sail. And leave half heard the melancholy tale. Nine painful years on that detested shore. What stratagems we formed, what toils we bore. Still laboring on, till scarce at last we found. Great Jove propitious, and our conquest crowned. Far o'er the rest thy mighty father shined. In wit, in prudence, and in force of mind. Art thou the son of that illustrious sire? With joy I grasp thee, and with love admire. So like your voices, and your words so wise. Who finds thee younger must consult his eyes. Thy sire and I were one, nor varied aught. In public sentence, or in private thought. Alike to council or the assembly came. With equal souls, and sentiments the same. But when, by wisdom won, proud Ilium burned. And in their ships the conquering Greeks returned. Twas God's high will the victors to divide. And turn the event, confounding human pride. Some be destroyed, some scattered as the dust. Not all were prudent, and not all were just. Then discord, sent by Pallas from above. Stern daughter of the great avenger Jove. The brother kings inspired with fell debate. Who called to counsel all the Achaean state. But called untimely, not the sacred right. Observed, nor heedful of the setting light. Nor herald soared the session to proclaim. Sour with debauch, a reeling tribe that came. To these the cause of meeting they explain. And Menelaus moves to cross the main. Not so the king of men, be willed to stay. The sacred rites and hecatombs to pay. And calm Minerva's wrath. O blind to fate! The gods not lightly change their love, or hate. With ireful taunts each other they oppose. Till in loud tumult all the Greeks arose. Now different counsels every breast divide. Each burns with rancor to the adverse side. The unquiet night strange projects entertained. So Jove, that urged us to our fate, ordained. We with the rising morn our ships unmoored. And brought our captives and our stores aboard. But half the people with respect obeyed. The king of men, and at his bidding stayed. Now on the wings of winds our course we keep. For God had smoothed the waters of the deep. For Tenedos we spread our eager oars. Their land, and pay due victims to the powers. To bless our safe return, we join in prayer. But angry Jove dispersed our vows in air. And raised new discord. Then, so heaven decreed. Ulysses first and neither disagreed. Wise as he was, by various counsels awayed. He there, though late, to please the monarch, stayed. But I, determined, stem the foamy floods. Warned of the coming fury of the gods. With us, Tydides feared, and urged his haste. And Menelaus came, but came the last. He joined our vessels in the Lesbian Bay. While yet we doubted of our watery way. If to the right to urge the pilot's toil. The safer road, beside the Syrian isle. Or the straight course to rocky Chios plough. And anchor under Mimas' shaggy brow. We sought direction of the power divine. The god propitious gave the guiding sign. Through the mid seas he bid our navy steer. And in Eubea shun the woes we fear. The whistling winds already waked the sky. Before the whistling winds the vessels fly. With rapid swiftness cut the liquid way. And reached Gerestus at the point of day. 
their hecacombs of bulls, to Neptune slain. High flaming pleased the monarch of the main. The fourth day shone, when all their labors o'er. Tidides' vessels touched the wished for shore. But I to Pylos scud before the gales. The god still breathing on my swelling sails. Separate from all, I safely landed here. Their fates or fortunes never reached my ear. Yet what I learned, attend. As here I sat. And asked each voyager each hero's fate. Curious to know, and willing to relate. Safe reached the Myrmidons their native land. Beneath Achilles' warlike son's command. Those, whom the heir of great Apollo's art. Brave Philoctetes, taught to wing the dart. And those whom Idomen from Ilion's plain. Had led, securely crossed the dreadful main. How Agamemnon touched his Argive coast. And how his life by fraud and force he lost. And how the murderer, paid his forfeit breath. What lands so distant from that scene of death. But trembling heard the fame. And heard, admire. How well the son appeased his slaughtered sire. Even to the unhappy, that unjustly bleed. Heaven gives posterity, to avenge the deed. So fell Aegisthus. And mayest thou, my friend, on whom the virtues of thy sire descend, make future times thy equal act adore, and be what brave Orestes was before. The prudent youth replied, O thou the grace, and lasting glory of the Grecian race. Just was the vengeance, and to latest days. Shall long posterity resound the praise. Some god this arm with equal prowess bless. And the proud suitors shall its force confess. Injurious men. Who while my soul is sore. Of fresh affronts, are meditating more. But heaven denies this honor to my hand. Nor shall my father repossess the land. The father's fortune never to return and the sad sons to softer and to mourn. Thus he. And Nestor took the word, My son. Is it then true, as distant rumors run, that crowds of rivals for thy mother's charms, thy palace fill with insults and alarms? Say, is the fault, through tame submission, thine? Or leagued against thee, do thy people join? Moved by some oracle, or voice divine? And yet who knows, but ripening lies in fate. An hour of vengeance for the afflicted state. When great Ulysses shall suppress these harms. Ulysses singly, or all Greece in arms. But if Athena, war's triumphant maid. The happy son will as the father aid. Whose fame and safety was her constant care. In every danger and in every war. Never on man did heavenly favor shine. With rays so strong, distinguished and divine. As those with which Minerva marked thy sire. So might she love thee, so thy soul inspire. Soon should their hopes in humble dust be laid. And long oblivion of the bridal bed. Ah! No such hope, the prince with sighs replies. Can touch my breast, that blessing heaven denies. Even by celestial favor were it given. Fortune or fate would cross the will of heaven. What words are these, and what imprudence thine? Thus interposed the martial made divine. Forgetful youth. But no, the power above. With ease can save each object of his love. Wide as his will, extends his boundless grace. Nor lost in time nor circumscribed by place. Happier his lot, who, many sorrows past. Long laboring gains his natal shore at last. Then who, too speedy, hastes to end his life. By some stern ruffian, or adulterous wife. Death only is the lot which none can miss. And all is possible to heaven but this. The best, the dearest favorite of the sky. Must taste that cup, for man is born to die. Thus checked, replied Ulysses prudent air. Mentor, no more the mournful thought forbear. For he no more must draw his country's breath. Already snatched by fate, and the black doom of death. 
pass we to other subjects. And engage. On themes remote the venerable sage. Who thrice has seen the perishable kind. Of men decay, and through three ages shine. Like God's majestic, and like God's in mind. For much he knows, and just conclusions draws. From various precedents, and various laws. O son of Neleus! Awful Nestor, tell. How he, the mighty Agamemnon, fell. By what strange fraud Aegisthus wrought, relate. By force he could not, such a hero's fate. Live Menelaus not in Greece. Or where? Was then the martial brother's pious care. Condemned perhaps some foreign short to tread. Or sure Aegisthus had not dared the deed. To whom the full of days, illustrious youth. Attend, though partly thou hast guessed, the truth. For had the martial Menelaus found. The ruffian breathing yet on Argive ground. Nor earth had bid his carcass from the skies. Nor Grecian virgins shrieked his obsequies. But fowls obscene dismembered his remains. And dogs had torn him on the naked plains. While us the works of bloody Mars employed. The wanton youth in glorious peace enjoyed. He stretched at ease in Argo's calm recess. Whose stately steeds luxuriant pastures bless. With flatteries insinuating art. Soothed the frail queen. And poisoned all her herd. At first, with the worthy shame and decent pride. The royal dame his lawless suit denied. For virtue's image yet possessed her mind. Taught by a master of the tuneful kind. Atrides, parting for the Trojan War. Consigned the youthful consort to his care. True to his charge, the bard preserved her long. In honor's limits, such the power of song. But when the gods these objects of their hate. Dragged to the destruction by the links of fate. The bard they banished from his native soil. And left all helpless in a desert isle. There he, the sweetest of the sacred train. Sung dying to the rocks, but sung in vain. Then virtue was no more, her guard away. She fell, to lust a voluntary prey. Even to the temple stalked the adulterous spouse. With impious thanks, and mockery of the vows. With images, with garments, and with gold. And odorous fumes from loaded altars rolled. Meantime from flaming Troy we cut the way. With Menelaus, through the curling sea. But when to Sunium's sacred point we came. Crowned with the temple of the Athenian dame. A tried's pilot, Frontes, there expired. Frontes, of all the songs of men admired. To steer the bounding bark with steady toil. When the storm thickens, and the billows boil. While yet he exercised the steerman's art. Apollo touched him with his gentle dart. Even with the rudder in his hand, he fell. To pay whole honors to the shades of hell. We checked our haste, by pious office bound. And laid our old companion in the ground. And now the rites discharged, our course we keep. Far on the gloomy bosom of the deep. Soon as Malai's misty tops arise. Sudden the thunderer blackens all the skies. And the winds whistle, and the surges roll. Mountains on mountains. And obscure the pole. The tempest scatters, and divides our fleet. Part, the storm urges on the coast of Crete. Where winding round the rich Sidonian plain. The streams of Jardin issue to the main. There stands a rock, high, eminent and steep. Whose shaggy brow o'erhangs the shady deep. And views Cortina on the western side. On this rough oster drove the impetuous tide. With broken force the billows rolled away. And heaved the fleet into the neighboring bay. Thus saved from death, they gained the festin shores. With shattered vessels and disabled oars. But five tall barks the winds and water tossed. Far from their fellows, on the Egyptian coast. There wandered Menelaus through foreign shores. Amassing gold, and gathering naval stores. While cursed Aegisthus the detested deed. 
by fraud fulfilled, and his great brother bled. Seven years, the traitor rich Mycenae swayed. And his stern rule the groaning land obeyed. The eighth, from Athens to his realm restored. Orestes brandished the avenging sword. Slew the dire pair, and gave to funeral flame. The vile assassin and adulterous dame. That day, ere yet the bloody triumph cease. Returned the tribes to the coast of Greece. And safe to Argos port his navy brought. With gifts of price and ponderous treasure fraught. Hence warned, my son, beware. Nor idly stand. Too long a stranger to thy native land. Lest heedless absence wear thy wealth away. While lawless feasters in thy palace away. Perhaps may seize thy realm, and share the spoil. And though return, with disappointed toil. From thy vain journey, to a rifled isle. However, my friend, indulge one labor more. And seek a trides on the Spartan shore. He, wandering long a wider circle made. And many languaged nations has surveyed. And measured tracks unknown to other ships. Amid the monstrous wonders of the deeps. A length of ocean and unbounded sky. Which scarce the sea fowl in a year o'erfly. Go then, to Sparta take the watery way. Thy ship and sailors but for orders stay. Or, if my land then choose thy course to bend. My steeds, my chariots, and my songs, attend. Thee to Atrides they shall safe convey. Guides of thy road, companions of thy way. Urge him with truth to frame his wise replies. And sure he will, for Menelaus is wise. Thus while he speaks the ruddy sun descends. And twilight grey her evening shade extends. Then thus the blue-eyed maid, O oh full of days. Wise are thy words, and just are all thy ways. Now immolate the tongues, and mix the wine. Sacred to Neptune and the powers divine. The lamp of day is quenched beneath the deep. And soft approach the balmy hours of sleep. Nor fits it to prolong the heavenly feast. Timeless, indecent, but retire to rest. So spake Jove's daughter, the celestial maid. The sober train attended and obeyed. The sacred heralds on their hands around. Poured the full urns. The youths the goblets crowned. From bowl to bowl the homely beverage flows. While to the final sacrifice they rose. The tongues they cast upon the fragrant flame. And pour, above, the consecrated stream. And now, their thirst by copious draughts allayed. The youthful hero and the Athenian maid. Proposed departure from the finished rite. And in their hollow bark to pass the night. But this hospitable sage denied. Forbid it, Jove. And all the gods. He cried. Thus from my walls and the much-loved son to send. Of such a hero, and of such a friend. Me, as some needy peasant, would ye leave. Whom heaven denies the blessing to relieve. Me would ye leave, who boast imperial sway. When beds of royal state invite your stay. No, long as life this mortal shall inspire. Or as my children imitate their sire. Here shall the wandering stranger find his home. And hospitable rites adorn the dome. Well hast thou spoke, the blue-eyed maid replies. Beloved old man. Benevolent as wise. Be the kind dictates of thy heart obeyed. And let thy words Telemachus persuade. He to thy palace shall thy steps pursue. I to the ship, to give the orders due. Prescribe directions and confirm the crew. For I alone sustain their naval cares. Who boast experience from these silver hairs. All youths the rest, whom to this journey move. Like years, like tempers, and their princes love. There in the vessel shall I pass the night. And, soon as morning paints the fields of light. I go to challenge from the caucus bold. A debt, contracted in the days of old. But this, thy guest, received with friendly care. Let thy strong coursers swift to Sparta bear. 
prepare thy chariot at the dawn of day. And be thy son companion of his way. Then, turning with the word, Minerva flies. And soars an eagle through the liquid skies. Vision divine. The thronged spectators gaze. In holy wonder fixed, and still amaze. But chief the reverend sage admired, he took. The hand of young Telemachus, and spoke. O, oh, happy youth! And favoured of the skies! Distinguished care of guardian deities! Whose early years for future worth engage! No vulgar manhood, no ignoble age! For lo! None other of the course above! Then she, the daughter of Almighty Jove! Pallas herself, the war triumphant maid! Confessed is thine, as once thy father's aid. So guide me, goddess. So propitious shine. On me, my consort, and my royal line. A yearling bullock to thy name shall smoke. Untamed, unconscious of the galling yoke. With ample forehead, and yet tender horns. Whose budding honours ductile gold adorns. Submissive thus the hoary sire preferred. His holy vow, the favouring goddess heard. Then, slowly rising, o'er the sandy space. Precedes the father, followed by his race. A long procession, timely marching home. In comely order to the regal dome. There when arrived, on thrones around him placed. His sons and grandsons the wide circle graced. To these the hospitable sage, in sign. Of social welcome mixed the racy wine. Late from the mellowing cask restored to light. By ten long years refined, and rosy bright. To palace high the foaming bowl he crowned. And sprinkled large libations on the ground. Each drinks a full oblivion of his cares. And to the gifts of balmy sleep repairs. Deep in a rich alcove the prince was laid. And slept beneath the pompous colonnade. Fast by his side Pisistratus was spread. In age his equal, on a splendid bed. But in an inner court, securely closed. The reverend Nestor and his queen reposed. When now Aurora, daughter of the dawn. With rosy luster purpled o'er the lawn. The old man early rose, walked forth, and sate. On polished stone before his palace gate. With unguents smooth the lucid marble shone. Where ancient Neleus sate, a rustic throne. But he descending to the infernal shade. Sage Nestor filled it, and the scepter swayed. His sons around him mild obeisance pay. And Dutius take the orders of the day. First Ehephron and Stratius quit their bed. Then Perseus, Aretas, and Thrasymed. The last Pisistratus arose from rest. They came, and near him placed the stranger guest. To these the senior thus declared his will. My sons! The dictates of your sire fulfill. To Pallas, first of gods, prepare the feast. Who graced our rites, a more than mortal guest. Let one, dispatchful, bid some swain to lead. A well-fed bullock from the grassy mead. One seek the harbour where the vessels moor. And bring thy friends, Telemachus. Ashore. Leave only two the galley to attend. Another Lerceus must we send. Artist Divine, whose skillful hands enfold. The victim's horn with circumfusal gold. The rest may hear the pious duty share. And bid the handmaids for the feast prepare. The seats to range, the fragrant wood to bring. And limpid waters from the living spring. He said, and busy each his care bestowed. Already at the gates the bullock load. Already came the Ithacentian crew. The dexterous smith the tools already drew. His ponderous hammer and his anvil sound. And the strong tongs to turn the metal round. Nor was Minerva absent from the right. She viewed her honours, and enjoyed the sight. With reverend hand the king presents the gold. Which round the entorted horns the gilder rolled. So wrought as Pallas might with pride behold. Young Aretas from forth his bride bower. Brought the full labor, o'er their hands to pour. 
and canisters of consecrated flour. Stratius and Ekephron the victim led. The axe was held by warlike Thrasim. In act to strike. Before him Perseus stood. The vase extending to receive the blood. The king himself initiates to the power. Scatters with quivering hand the sacred flower. And the stream sprinkles, from the curling brows. The hair collected in the fire he throws. Soon as due vows on every part were paid. And sacred wheat upon the victim laid. Strong Thrasim discharged the speeding blow. Full on his neck, and cut the nerves in two. Down sunk the heavy beast. The females round. Maids, wives, and matrons, mix a shrilling sound. Nor scorned the queen the holy choir to join. The first-born she, of old Climenus line. In youth by Nestor loved, of spotless fame. And loved in age, Eurydice her name. From earth they rear him, struggling now with death. And Nestor's youngest stops the vents of breath. The soul forever flies. On all sides round. Streams the black blood, and smokes upon the ground. The beast they then divide and disunite. The ribs and limbs, observant of the right. On these, in double calls involved with art. The choicest morsels lay from every part. The sacred sage before his altar stands. Turns the burnt offering with his holy hands. And pours the wine, and bids the flames aspire. The youth with instruments surround the fire. The thighs now sacrificed, and entrails dressed. The assistants part, transfix, and broil the rest. While these officious tend the rites divine. The last fair branch of the Nestorian line. Sweet Polycasti, took the pleasing toil. To bathe the prince. And pour the fragrant oil. O'er his fair limbs a flowery vest he throw. And issued, like a god, to mortal view. His former seat beside the king he found. His people's father with his peers around. All placed at ease the holy banquet join. And in the dazzling goblet laughs the wine. The rage of thirst and hunger now suppressed. The monarch turns him to his royal guest. And for the promised journey bids prepare. The smooth-haired horses, and the rapid car. Observant of his word, Tyre word scarce spoke. The sons obey, and join them to the yoke. Then bread and wine a ready handmaid brings. And presents, such as suit the state of kings. The glittering seat Telemachus ascends. His faithful guide Pisistratus attends. With hasty hand the ruling reins he drew. He lashed the coursers, and the coursers flew. Beneath the bounding yoke alike they hold. Their equal pace, and smoked along the field. The towers of Pylos sink, its views decay. Fields after fields fly back, till close of day. Then sunk the sun, and darkened all the way. To ferry now, Diocleus' stately seat. Of Alpheus' race, the weary youths retreat. His house affords the hospitable rite. And pleased they sleep, the blessing of the night. But when Aurora, daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster purpled o'er the lawn, again they mount, their journey to renew. And from the sounding portico they flew. Along the waving fields their way they hold. The fields receding as their chariot rolled. Then slowly sunk the ruddy globe of light. And o'er the shaded landscape rushed the night. Book 4. Argument. The conference with Menelaus. Telemachus with Pisistratus arriving at Sparta, is hospitably received by Menelaus to whom he relates the cause of his coming, and learns from him many particulars of what befell the Greeks since the destruction of Troy. He dwells more at large upon the prophecies of Proteus to him in his return, from which he acquaints Telemachus that Ulysses is detained in the island of Calypso. In the meantime the suitors consult to destroy Telemachus on the voyage home. Penelope is apprised of this, but comforted in a dream by Pallas, in the shape of her sister Ephthema. And now proud Sparta with their wheels resounds. Sparta whose walls a range of hills surrounds. 
At the fair dome the rapid labor ends. Where Seda trides, midst his bridal friends. With double vows invoking Hymen's power. To bless his sons and daughters' nuptial hour. That day, to great Achilles' son resigned. Hermione, the fairest of her kind. Was sent to crown the long protracted joy. Espoused before the final doom of Troy. With steeds and gilded cars, a gorgeous train. Attend the nymphs to Thyas' distant reign. Meanwhile at home, to Megapentha's bed. The virgin choir Elector's daughter led. Brave Megapenthas from a stolen amour. To great Atride's age his handmaid bore. To Helen's bed the gods alone assign. Hermione, to extend the regal line. On whom a radiant pomp o' graces wait. Resembling Venus in attractive state. While this gay friendly troop the kings surround. With festival and mirth the roofs resound. A bard amid the joyous circle sings. High airs attempered to the vocal strings. Whilst warbling to the varied strain, advance. Two sprightly youths to form the bounding dance. Twas then, that issuing through the palace gate. The splendid car rolled slow in regal state. On the bright eminence young Nestor shone. And fast beside him great Ulysses' son. Grave Etionius saw the pomp appear. And speeding, thus addressed the royal ear. Two youths approach, whose semblant features prove. Their blood devolving from the source of Jove. Is due reception deigned, or must they bend? Their doubtful course to seek a distant friend? Insensate. With a sigh the king replies. Too long, misjudging, have I thought thee wise. But sure relentless folly steals thy breast. Obdurate to reject the stranger guest. To those dear hospitable rites a foe. Which in my wanderings oft relieved my woe. Fed by the bounty of another's board. Till pitying Jove my native realm restored. Straight be the coursers from the car released. Conduct the youths to grace the genial feast. The seneschal, rebuked, in haste withdrew. With equal haste a menial train pursue. Part led the coursers, from the car enlarged. Each to a crib with choicest grain surcharged. Part in a portico, profusely graced. With rich magnificence, the chariot placed. Then to the dome the friendly pair invite. Who eye the dazzling roofs with vast delight. Resplendent as the blaze of summer noon. Or the pale radiance of the midnight moon. From room to room their eager view they bend. Thence to the bath, a beauteous pile, descend. Where a bright damsel train attends the guests. With liquid odors, and embroidered vests. Refreshed, they wait them to the bower of state. Where, circled with his pairs, a tried sate. Throne next the king, a fair attendant brings. The purest product of the crystal springs. High on a massy vase of silver mold. The burnished laver flames with solid gold. In solid gold the purple vintage flows. And on the board a second banquet rose. When thus the king, with hospitable port. Accept this welcome to the Spartan court. The waste of nature let the feast repair. Then your high lineage and your names declare. Say from what sceptred ancestry ye claim. Recorded eminent in deathless fame. For vulgar parents cannot stamp their race. With signatures of such majestic grace. Ceasing, benevolent he straight assigns. The royal portion of the choicest chins. To each accepted friend, with grateful haste. They share the honors of the rich repast. Sufficed, soft whispering thus to Nestor's son. His head reclined, young Ithacus begun. Views thou unmoved, O ever honored most. These prodigies of art, and wondrous cost. Above, beneath, around the palace shines. The sunless treasure of exhausted minds. The spoils of elephants the roofs inlay. And studded amber darts the golden ray. Such, and not nobler, in the realms above. My wonder dictates is the dome of Jove. The monarch took the word, and grave replied. 
presumptuous are the vaunts, and vain the pride of man, who dares in pomp with Jove contest. Unchanged, immortal, and supremely blessed. With all my affluence, when my woes are weight. Envy will own the purchase dearly paid. For eight slow circling years, by tempests tossed. From Cyprus to the far Phoenician coast. Sidon the capital, I stretched my toil. Through regions fattened with the flows of Nile. Next Ethiopia's utmost bound explore. And the parched borders of the Arabian shore. Then warp my voyage on the southern gales. O'er the warm Libyan wave to spread my sails. That happy clime, where each revolving year. The teeming use a triple offspring bear. And two fair crescents of translucent horn. The brows of all their young increase adorn. The shepherd swains, with sure abundance blessed. On the fat flock and rural dainties feast. Nor want of herbage makes the dairy fail. But every season fills the foaming pail. Whilst, heaping unwashed wealth, I distant roam. The best of brothers, at his natal home. By the dire fury of a traitorous wife. Ends the sad evening of a stormy life. Whence, with incessant grief my soul annoyed. These riches are possessed, but not enjoyed. My wars, the copious theme of every tongue. To you your fathers have recorded long. How favoring heaven repaid my glorious toils. With a sacked palace, and barbaric spoils. Oh! Had the gods so large a boon denied. And life, the just equivalent supplied. To those brave warriors, who, with glory fired. Far from their country, in my cause expired. Still in short intervals of pleasing woe. Regardful of the friendly dues I owe. I to the glorious dead, forever dear. Indulge the tribute of a grateful tear. But oh! Ulysses, deeper than the rest. That sad idea wounds my anxious breast. My heart bleeds fresh with agonizing pain. The bowl and tasteful viands tempt in vain. Nor sleep's soft power can close my streaming eyes. When image to my soul his sorrows rise. No peril in my cause he ceased to prove. His labors equalled only by my love. And both alike to bitter fortune born. For him to suffer, and for me to mourn. Whether he wanders on some friendly coast. Or glides in Stygian gloom a pensive ghost. No fame reveals, but, doubtful of his doom. His good old sire with sorrow to the tomb. Declines his trembling steps. Untimely care. Withers the blooming vigor of his heir. And the chaste partner of his bed and throne. Wastes all her widowed hours in tender moan. While thus pathetic to the prince he spoke. From the brave youth the streaming passion broke. Studious to veil the grief, in vain repressed. His face he shrouded with his purple vest. The conscious monarch pierced the coy disguise. And viewed his filial love with vast surprise. Dubious to press the tender theme, or wait. To hear the youth inquire his father's fate. In this suspense bright Helen graced the room. Before her breathed a gale of rich perfume. So moves, adorned with each attractive grace. The silver-shafted goddess of the chase. The seat of majesty Adrast brings. With art illustrious, for the pomp of kings. To spread the pall, beneath the regal chair. Of softest wool, is bright Alcipe's care. A silver canister, divinely wrought. In her soft hands the beauteous Philo brought. To Sparta's queen of old the radiant vase. Alcandra gave, a pledge of royal grace. For Polybus her lord, whose sovereign sway. The wealthy tribes of Pharian Thebes obey. When to that court a trides came, caressed. With vast munificence the imperial guest. Two lavers from the richest or refined. With silver tripods. The kind host assigned. And bounteous from the royal treasure told. Ten equal talents of refulgent gold. Alcandra, consort of his high command. 
a golden distaff gave to Helen's hand. And that rich vase, with living sculpture wrought, which heaped with wool the beauteous Philo brought. The silken fleece, empurpled for the loom, rivaled the hyacinth in vernal bloom. The sovereign seat then Jove born Helen pressed, and pleasing thus her sceptred lord addressed. Who grace our palace now, that friendly pair? Speak they their lineage, or their names declare? Uncertain of the truth, yet uncontrolled. Hear me the bodings of my breast unfold. With wonder wrapped on yonder check I trace. The feature of the Ulyssian race. Diffused o'er each resembling line appear. In just similitude, the grace and air. Of young Telemachus. The lovely boy. Who blessed Ulysses with a father's joy. What time the Greeks combined their social arms. To avenge the stain of my ill-fated charms. Just as thy thought, the king assenting cries. Methinks Ulysses strikes my wondering eyes. Full shines the father in the filial frame. His port, his features, and his shape the same. Such quick regards his sparkling eyes bestow. Such wavy ringlets o'er his shoulders flow. And when he heard the long disastrous store. Of cares, which in my cause Ulysses bore. Dismayed, heart wounded with paternal woes. Above restraint the tide of sorrow rose. Cautious to let the gushing grief appear. His purple garment veiled the falling tear. See there confessed, Pisistratus replies. The genuine worth of Ithacus the wise. Of that heroic sire the youth is sprung. But modest awe hath chained his timorous tongue. Thy voice, O king, with pleased attention heard, is like the dictates of a god revered. With him, at Nestor's high command, I came. Whose age I honor with a parent's name. By adverse destiny constrained to sue. For counsel and redress, he sues to you. Whatever ill the friendless orphan bears. Bereaved of parents in his infant years. Still must the wrong Telemachus sustain. If, hopeful of your aid, he hopes in vain. Affianced in your friendly power alone. The youth would vindicate the vacant throne. Is Sparta blessed, and these desiring eyes? View my friend's son. The king exalting cries winky face. Son of my friend, by glorious toils approved. Whose sword was sacred to the man he loved. Mirror of constant faith, revered and mourned. When Troy was ruined, had the chief returned. No Greek an equal space had e'er possessed. Of dear affection, in my grateful breast. I, to confirm the mutual joys we shared. For his abode a capital prepared. Argos, the seat of sovereign rule, I chose. Fair in the plan the future palace rose. Where my Ulysses and his race might reign. And portioned to his tribes the wide domain. To them my vassals had resigned a soil. With teeming plenty to reward their toil. There with commutual zeal we both had strove. In acts of dear benevolence and love. Brothers in peace, not rivals in command. And death alone dissolved the friendly band. Some envious power the blissful scene destroys. Vanished are all the visionary joys. The soul of friendship to my hope is lost. Fated to wander from his natal coast. He ceased, a gush of grief began to rise. Fast streams the tide from beauteous Helen's eyes. Fast for the sire the filial sorrows flow. The weeping monarch swells the mighty woe. Thy cheeks, Pisistratus, the tears bedew. While pictured so thy mind appeared in view. Thy martial brother. On the Phrygian plain. Extended pale, by swarthy Memnon slain. But silence soon the son of Nestor broke and melting with fraternal pity, spoke. Frequent, O king, was Nestor wont to raise. And charm attention with thy copious praise. To crowd thy various gifts, the sage assigned. The glory of a firm capacious mind. With that superior attribute control. This unavailing impotence of soul. 
Let not your roof with echoing grief resound. Now for the feast the friendly bowl is crowned. But when, from dewy shade emerging bright, Aurora streaks the sky with orient light, Let each deplore his dead, the rites of woe, Are all, alas, the living can bestow, O'er the congenial dust enjoined to shear, The graceful curl, and drop the tender tear. Then, mingling in the mournful pomp with you, I'll pay my brother's ghost a warrior's due, And mourn the brave Antilochus, a name, Not unrecorded in the rolls of fame, With strength and speed superior formed, in fight, To face the foe, or intercept his flight, Too early snatched by fate ere known to me, I boast a witness of his worth in thee, Young and mature, the monarch thus rejoins. In thee renewed the soul of Nestor shines. Formed by the care of that consummate sage. In early bloom an oracle of age. We near his influence Jove vouchsafes to shower. To bless the natal and the nuptial hour. From the great sire transmissive to the race. The boon devolving gives distinguished grace. Such, happy Nestor. Was thy glorious doom. Around thee, full of years, thy offspring bloom. Expert of arms, and prudent in debate. The gifts of heaven to guard thy hoary state. But now let each become his troubled breast. Wash, and partake serene the friendly feast. To move thy suit, Telemachus, delay. Till heaven's revolving lamp restores the day. He said, as Phalian swift the laver brings. Alternate, all partake the grateful springs. Then from the rites of purity repair. And with keen gust the savory viands share. Meantime, with genial joy to warm the soul. Bright Helen mixed a mirth-inspiring bowl. Tempered with drugs of sovereign use, to assuage. The boiling bosom of tumultuous rage. To clear the cloudy front of wrinkled care. And dry the tearful sluices of despair. Charmed with that virtuous draught, the exalted mind. All sense of woe delivers to the wind. Though on the blazing pile his parent lay. Or a loved brother groaned his life away. Or darling son, oppressed by ruffian force. Fell breathless at his feet, a mangled corse. From morn to eve, impassive and serene. The man entranced would view the dreadful scene. These drugs, so friendly to the joys of life. Bright Helen learned from Thone's imperial wife. Who swayed the scepter, where prolific Nile. With various simples clothes the fattened soil. With wholesome herbage mixed, the direful bane. A vegetable venom taints the plain. From Pian sprung, their patron god imparts. To all the Farian race his healing arts. The beverage now prepared to inspire the feast. The circle thus the beauteous queen addressed. Throned in omnipotence, supremest Jove. Tempers the fates of human race above. By the firm sanction of his sovereign will. Alternate are decreed our good and ill. To feastful mirth be this white hour assigned. And sweet discourse, the banquet of the mind. Myself, assisting in the social joy. Will tell Ulysses' bold exploit in Troy. Sole witness of the deed I now declare. Speak you, who saw, his wonders in the war. Seemed o'er with wounds, which his own sabre gave. In the vile habit of a village slave. The foe deceived, he passed the tented plain. In Troy to mingle with the hostile train. In this attire secure from searching eyes till happily piercing through the dark disguise. The chief I challenged, he, whose practiced wit, knew all the serpent mazes of deceit, eludes my search. But when his form I viewed, fresh from the bath, with fragrant oils renewed, his limbs in military purple dressed, each brightening grace the genuine Greek confessed, a previous pledge of sacred faith obtained, Till he the lines and Argive fleet regained. To keep his stay concealed, the chief declared. The plans of war against the town prepared. Exploring then the secrets of the state. 
he learned what best might urge the Dardan fate. And, safe returning to the Grecian host, sent many a shade to Pluto's dreary coast. Loud grief resounded through the towers of Troy. But my pleased bosom glowed with secret joy. For then, with dire remorse and conscious shame, I viewed the effects of that disastrous flame, which, kindled by the imperious queen of love, constrained me from my native realm to rove, and oft in bitterness of soul deplored, my absent daughter and my dearer lord, admired among the first of human race, for every gift of mind and manly grace. Right well, replied the king, your speech displays the matchless merit of the chief you praise. Heroes in various climes myself have found, for martial deeds and depth of thought renowned. But Ithacus, unrivalled in his claim, may boast a title to the loudest fame. In battle calm he guides the rapid storm, wise to resolve, and patient to perform. What wondrous conduct in the chief appeared, when the vast fabric of the steed we reared. Some demon, anxious for the Trojan doom, urged you with great Deiphobus to come, to explore the fraud, with guile opposed to guile, slow pacing thrice around the insidious pile. Each noted leader's name you thrice invoke, your accent varying as their spouses spoke. The pleasing sounds each latent warrior warmed, but most tide-eyed and coy heart alarmed. To quit the steed we both impatient press, threatening to answer from the dark recess. Unmoved the mind of Ithacus remained, and the vain ardors of our love restrained. But Anticlus, unable to control, spoke loud the language of his yearning soul. Ulysses straight, with indignation fired. For so the common care of Greece required. Firm to his lips his forceful hands applied till on his tongue the fluttering murmurs died. Meantime Minerva, from the fraudful horse, back to the court of Priam bent your course. Inclement fate. Telemachus replies. Frail is the boasted attribute of wise. The leader mingling with the vulgar host is in the common mass of matter lost. But now let sleep the painful waste repair of sad reflection and corroding care. He ceased, the menial fare that round her weight. At Helen's beck prepare the room of state. Beneath an ample portico they spread. The downy fleece to form the slumberous bed. And o'er soft palls of purple grain unfold. Rich tapestry, stiff with interwoven gold. Then, through the illumined dome, to balmy rest. The obsequious herald guides each princely guest while to his regal bower the king ascends, and beauteous Helen on her lord attends. Soon as the morn, in orient purple dressed, unbarred the portal of the roseate east, the monarch rose, magnificent to view, the imperial mantle o'er his vest he threw, the glittering zone athwart his shoulders cast, a starry falchion low depending graced, Clasped on his feet the embroidered sandals shine. And forth he moves, majestic and divine. Instant to young Telemachus he pressed. And thus benevolent his speech addressed. Say, royal youth, sincere of soul report. Wit cause hath led you to the Spartan court. Do public or domestic care constrain. This toilsome voyage o'er the surgy main. O highly flavored delegate of Jove. Replies the prince, inflamed with filial love. An anxious hope, to hear my parents' doom. A suppliant to your royal court I come. Our sovereign seat a lewd usurping race. With lawless riot and misrule disgrace. To pampered insolence devoted fall. Prime of the flock, and choicest of the stall. For wild ambition wings their bold desire. And all to mount the imperial bed aspire. But prostrate I implore, O King. Relate. The mournful series of my father's fate. Each known disaster of the man disclose. Born by his mother to a world of woes. Recite them, nor in erring pity fear. 
to wound with storied grief the filial ear. If e'er Ulysses, to reclaim your right, avowed his zeal in counsel or in fight, if Phrygian camps the friendly toils attest, to the sire's merit give the son's request, deep from his inmost soul a tried sight. And thus, indignant, to the prince replied, Heavens! Would a soft, inglorious, dastard train! An absent hero's nuptial joys profane! So with her young, amid the woodland shades! A timorous hind the lion's court invades! Leaves in the fatal lair the tender fawns! Climbs the green cliff, or feeds the flowery lawns! Meantime returned, with dire remorseless sway! The monarch savage rends the trembling prey. With equal fury, and with equal fame. Ulysses soon shall reassert his claim. O Jove supreme, whom gods and men revere. And thou. To whom, tis given to gild the sphere. With power congenial joined, propitious aid. The chief adopted by the martial maid. Such to our wish the warrior soon restore as when contending on the lesbian shore. His prowess Philomelides confessed. And loud acclaiming Greeks the victor blessed. Then soon the invaders of his bed and throne. Their love presumptuous shall with life atone. With patient ear, O royal youth, attend. The storied labor of thy father's friend. Fruitful of deeds, the copious tale is long. But truth severe shall dictate to my tongue. Learn what I heard the seaborn seer relate. Whose eye can pierce the dark recess of fate. Long on the Egyptian coast by calms confined. Heaven to my fleet refused a prosperous wind. No vows had we preferred, nor victims slain. For this the gods each favoring gale restrain. Jealous, to see their high behests obeyed. Severe, if men the eternal rights evade. High o'er a gulfy sea, the Farian Isle. Fronts the deep roar of disemboguing Nile. Her distance from the shore, the course begun. At dawn, and ending with the setting sun. A galley measures. When the stiffer gales. Rise on the poop, and fully stretch the sails. There, anchored vessels safe in harbor lie. Whilst limpid springs the failing cask supply. And now the twentieth sun, descending, laves. His glowing axle in the western waves. Still with expanded sails we court in vain. Propitious winds to waft us o'er the main. And the pale mariner at once deplores. His drooping vigor and exhausted stores. When lo! A bright cerulean form appears. Proteus her sire divine. With pity pressed. Me soul the daughter of the deep addressed. What time, with hunger pined, my absent mates. Roam the wide isle in search of rural cates. Bait the barbed steel, and from the fishy flood. Appease the afflictive fierce desire of food. Who are thou art, the azure goddess cries. Thy conduct ill deserves the praise of wise. Is death thy choice, or misery thy boast? That here inglorious, on a barren coast. Thy brave associates droop, a meager train. With famine pale. And ask thy care in vain. Struck with the loud reproach, I straight reply. Whatever thy title in thy native sky. A god is sure. For more than moral grace. Speaks the descendant of ethereal race. Deem not that here of choice my fleet remains. Some heavenly power averse my stay constrains. Oh, piteous of my fate, vouchsafe to show. For what sequestered from celestial view? What power becomes the innavigable seas? What guilt provokes him, and what vows appease? I ceased, when affable the goddess cried. Observe, and in the truths I speak confide. The oracular seer frequents the Farian coast. From whose high bed my birth divine I boast. Proteus, a name tremendous o'er the main. The delegate of Neptune's watery reign. Watch with insidious care his known abode. There fast in chains constrain the various god. Who bound, 
obedient to superior force. Unerring will prescribe your destined course. If, studious on your realms, you then demand. Their state, since last you left your natal land. Instant the god obsequious will disclose. Bright tracks of glory or a cloud of woes. She ceased. And suppliant thus I made reply. O goddess I on thy aid my hopes rely. Dictate propitious to my duteous ear. What arts can captivate the changeful seer? For perilous the essay, unheard the toil. To elude the prescience of a god by guile. Thus to the goddess mild my suit I end. Then she, obedient to my rule attend. When through the zone of heaven the mounted sun. Hath journeyed half, and half remains to run. The seer, while zephyrs curl the swelling deep. Basks on the breezy shore, in grateful sleep. His oozy limbs. Emerging from the wave. The focus swift surround his rocky cave. Frequent and full. The consecrated train. Of her, whose azure trident was the main. Their wallowing warm, the enormous herd exhales. An oily steam, and taints the noontide gales. To that recess, commodious for surprise. When purple light shall next suffuse the skies. With me repair, and from thy warrior band. Three chosen chiefs of dauntless soul command. Let their auxiliar force befriend the toil. For strong the god, and perfected in guile. Strecked on the shelly shore, he first surveys. The flouncing herd ascending from the seas. Their number summed, reposed in sleep profound. The scaly charge their guardian god surround. So with his battening flocks the careful swain. Abides pavilioned on the grassy plain. With powers united, obstinately bold. Invade him, couched amid the scaly fold. Instant he wears, elusive of the rape. The mimic force of every savage shape. Or glides with liquid lapse a murmuring stream. Or, wrapped in flame, he glows at every limb. Yet, still retentive, with redoubled might. Through each vain passive form constrain his flight. But when, his native shape renamed, he stands. Patient of conquest, and your cause demands. The cause that urged the bold attempt declare. And suit the vanquished with a victor's prayer. The bands released, implore the seer to say. What Godhead interdicts the watery way? Who, straight propitious, in prophetic strain, will teach you to repass the unmeasured main? She ceased, and bounding from the shelfy shore, round the descending nymph the waves resounding roar. High wrapped in wonder of the future deed, with joy impetuous to the port I speed. The wants of nature with repast suffice, till night with grateful shade involved the skies. And shed ambrosial dews. Fast by the deep. Along the tented shore, in balmy sleep. Our cares were lost. When o'er the eastern lawn. In saffron robes, the daughter of the dawn. Advanced her rosy steps, before the bay. Do ritual honors to the gods I pay. Then seek the place the sea-born nymph assigned. With three associates of undaunted mind. Arrived, to form along the appointed strand. For each a bed, she scoops the hilly sand. Then, from her azure cave the finny spoils. Of four vast folk he takes, to veil her wiles. Beneath the finny spoils extended prone. Hard toil. The prophet's piercing eye to shun. New from the course, the scaly frauds diffuse. Unsavorous stench of oil, and brackish ooze. But the bright sea maid's gentle power implored. With nectar drops the sickening sense restored. Thus till the sun had traveled half the skies. Ambushed we lie, and wait the bold emprise. When, thronging quick to bask in open air. The flocks of ocean to the strand repair. Couched on the sunny sand, the monsters sleep. Then Proteus, mounting from the hoary deep. Surveys his charge, unknowing of deceit. In order told, we make the sum complete. 
pleased with the false review, secure he lies. And leaden slumbers press his drooping eyes. Rushing impetuous forth, we straight prepare. A furious onset with the sound of war. And shouting, seize the god, our force to evade. His various arts he soon resumes in aid. A lion now, he curls a surgy mane. Sudden our hands the spotted paid restrain. Then, armed with tusks, and lightning in his eyes. A boar's obsceneer shape the god belies. On spiry volumes, there a dragon rides. Here, from our strict embrace a stream he glides. At last, sublime, his stately growth he rears. A tree, and well dissembled foliage wears. Vain efforts with superior power compressed. Me with reluctance thus the seer addressed. Say, son of Atreus, say what God inspired. This daring fraud, and what the boon desired. I thus, O thou, whose certain I foresees. The fixed event of fate's remote decrees. After long woes, and various toil endured. Still on this desert all my fleet is moored. Unfriended of the gales. All knowing, say. What God had interdicts the watery way. What vows repentant will the power appease. To speed a prosperous voyage o'er the seas. To Jove, with stern regard the God replies. And all the offended synod of the skies. Just hecatombs with due devotion slain. Thy guilt absolved, a prosperous voyage gain. To the firm sanction of thy fate attend. An exile thou, nor cheering face of friend. Nor sight of natal shore, nor regal dome. Shalt yet enjoy, but still art doomed to roam. Once more the Nile, who from the secret source. Of Jove's high seat descends with sweepy force. Must view his billows white beneath thy oar. And altars blaze along his sanguine shore. Then will the gods with holy pomp adored. To thy long vows a safe return accord. He ceased, heart wounded with afflictive pain. Doomed to repeat the perils of the main. A shelfy track and long. O seer, I cry. To the stern sanction of the offended sky. My prompt obedience bows. But deign to say. What fate propitious, or what dire dismay. Sustain those peers, the relics of our host. Whom I with Nestor on the Phrygian coast. Embracing left. Must I the warriors weep. Whelmed in the bottom of the monstrous deep. Or did the kind domestic friend deplore. The breathless heroes on their native shore. Press not too far, replied the god, but cease. To know what, known, will violate thy peace. Too curious of their doom. With friendly woe. Thy breast will heave, and tears eternal flow. Part live. The rest, a lamentable train. Range the dark bounds of Pluto's dreary reign. Two, foremost in the role of Mars renowned. Whose arms with conquest in thy cause were crowned. Fell by disastrous fate, by tempests tossed. A third lives wretched on a distant coast. By Neptune rescued from Minerva's hate. On Gyri, safe Oilean Ajax sate. His ship o'erwhelmed, but, frowning on the floods. Impious he roared defiance to the gods. To his own prowess all the glory gave. The power defrauding who vouchsafed to save. This heard the raging ruler of the main. His spear, indignant for such high disdain. He launched. Dividing with his forky mace. The aerial summit from the marble base. The rock rushed seaward, with impetuous roar. Engulfed, and to the abyss the boaster bore. By Juno's guardian aid, the watery vast. Secure of storms, your royal brother passed. Till, coasting nigh the cape where Malin shrouds. Her spiry cliffs amid surrounding clouds. A whirling gust tumultuous from the shore. Across the deep his laboring vessel bore. In an ill-fated hour the coast he gained. Where late in regal pomp Thyestis reigned. But, when his hoary honors bowed to fate. Aegisthus governed in paternal state. 
The surges now subside, the tempest ends. From his tall ship the king of men descends. There fondly thinks the gods conclude his toil. Far from his own domain salutes the soil. With rapture oft the urge of Greece reviews. And the dear turf with tears of joy bedews. Him, thus exulting on the distant stand. A spy distinguished from his airy stand. To bribe whose vigilance, Aegisthus told. A mighty sum of ill-persuading gold. There watched this guardian of his guilty fear. Till the twelfth moon had wheeled her pale career. And now, admonished by his eye, to court. With terror winged conveys the dread report. Of deathful arts expert, his lord employs. The ministers of blood in dark surprise. And twenty youths, in radiant mail encased. Close ambushed nigh the spacious hall he placed. Then bids prepare the hospitable treat. Vain shows of love to veil his felon hate. To grace the victor's welcome from the wars. A train of coursers and triumphal cars. Magnificent he leads, the royal guest. Thoughtless of ill, accepts the fraudful feast. The troop forth issuing from the dark recess. With homicidal rage the king oppress. So, whilst he feeds luxurious in the stall. The sovereign of the herd is doomed to fall. The partners of his fame and toils at Troy. Around their lord, a mighty ruin, lie. Mixed with the brave, the base invaders bleed. Aegisthus' soul survives to boast the deed. He said, chill horrors shook my shivering soul. Racked wish convulsive pangs in dust I roll. And hate, in madness of extreme despair. To view the sun, or breathe the vital air. But when, superior to the rage of woe, I stood restored and tears had ceased to flow. Lenient of grief the pitying God began. Forget the brother, and resume the man. To fate supreme dispose the dead resign. That care be fates, a speedy passage thine. Still lives the wretch who wrought the death deplored. But lives a victim for thy vengeful sword. Unless with filial rage Orestes glow. And swift prevent the meditated blow. You timely will return a welcome guest. With him to share the sad funereal feast. He said, new thoughts my beating heart employ. My gloomy soul receives a gleam of joy. Fair hope revives, and eager I addressed. The prescient Godhead to reveal the rest. The doom decreed of those disastrous too. I've heard with pain, but oh. The tale pursue. What third brave son of Mars the fates constrain? To roam the howling desert of the main. Or, in eternal shade of cold he lies. Provoke new sorrows from these grateful eyes. That chief, rejoined the god, his race derives. From Ithaca, and wondrous woe survives. Laertes' son, girt with circumfluous tides. He still calamitous constraint abides. Him in Calypso's cave of late. Viewed. When streaming grief his faded cheek bed out. But vain his prayer, his arts are vain, to move. The enamored goddess, or elude her love. His vessel sunk, and dear companions lost. He lives reluctant on a foreign coast. But oh, beloved by heaven. Reserved to thee. A happier lot the smiling fates decree. Free from that law, beneath whose mortal sway. Matter is changed, and varying forms decay. Elysium shall be thine, the blissful plains. Of utmost earth, where Radamanthus reigns. Joys ever young, unmixed with pain or fear. Fill the wide circle of the eternal year. Stern winter smiles on that auspicious clime. The fields are florid with unfading prime. From the bleak pole no winds inclement blow. Mold the round hail, or flake the fleecy snow. But from the breezy deep the blessed inhale. The fragrant murmurs of the western gale. This grace peculiar will the gods afford. To thee, the son of Jove, and beauteous Helen's lord. He ceased, and plunging in the vast profound. Beneath the god and whirling billows bound. 
then speeding back, involved in various thought. My friends attending at the shore I sought. Arrived, the rage of hunger we control. Till night with silent shade invests the pole. Then lose the cares of life in pleasing rest. Soon as the morn reveals the roseate east. With sails we wing the masts, our anchors weigh. Unmoor the fleet, and rush into the sea. Ranged on the banks, beneath our equal oars. White curl the waves, and the vexed ocean roars. Then, steering backward from the Farian isle. We gain the stream of Jove descended Nile. There quit the ships, and on the destined shore. With ritual hecatombs the gods adore. Their wrath atoned, to Agamemnon's name. A cenotaph I raise of deathless fame. These rites to piety and grief discharged. The friendly gods a springing gale enlarged. The fleet swift tilting o'er the surges flew. Till Grecian cliffs appeared a blissful view. Thy patient ear hath heard me long relate. A story, fruitful of disastrous fate. And now, young prince, indulge my fond request. Be Sparta honored with his royal guest. Till, from his eastern goal, the joyous sun. His twelfth diurnal race begins to run. Meantime I train the friendly gifts prepare. The sprightly coursers and a polished car. With these a goblet of capacious mold. Figured with art to dignify the gold. Formed for libation to the gods, shall prove. A pledge and monument of sacred love. My quick return, young Ithacus rejoined. Damps the warm wishes of my raptured mind. Did not my fate my needful haste constrain. Charmed by your speech so graceful and humane. Lost in delight the circling year would roll. While deep attention fixed my listening soul. But now to pile permit my destined way. My loved associates chide my long delay. In dear remembrance of your royal grace. I take the present of the promised vase. The coursers, for the champagne sports retain. That gift our barren rocks will render vain. Horrid with cliffs, our meager land allows. Thin herbage for the mountain goat to browse. But neither mead nor plain supplies, to feed. The sprightly courser. Or indulge his speed. To see surrounded realms the gods assign. Small tract of fertile lawn, the least to mine. His hand the king with tender passion pressed. And, smiling, thus the royal youth addressed. O early worth! A soul so wise, and young. Proclaims you from the sage Ulysses sprung. Selected from my stores, of matchless price. An urn shall recompense your prudent choice. By Vulcan's art, the verge with gold and chaste. A pledge the sceptred power of Sidon gave. When to his realm I plout the orient wave. Thus they alternate. While, with artful care. The menial train the regal feast prepare. The firstlings of the flock are doomed to die. Rich fragrant wines the cheering bowl supply. A female band the gift of Ceres bring. And the gilt roofs with genial triumph ring. Meanwhile, in Ithaca, the suitor powers. In active games divide their jovial hours. In areas varied with mosaic art. Some whirl the disc, and some the javelin dart. Aside, sequestered from the vast resort. Antinous sole spectator of the sport. With great Eurymachus, of worth confessed. And high descent, superior to the rest. Whom young Nomon lowly thus addressed. My ship, equipped within the neighboring port. The prince, departing for the Pylian court. Requested for his speed. But, courteous, say. When steers he home, or why this long delay? For Ellis I should sail with utmost speed. To import twelve mares which their luxurious feed. And twelve young mules, a strong laborious race. New to the plough, unpractised in the trace. Unknowing of the course to pile designed. A sudden horror seized on either mind. The prince in rural bower they fondly thought. Numbering his flocks and herds, not far remote. 
Relate, Antinous cries, devoid of guile. When spread the prince his sail for distant pile. Did chosen chiefs across the gulfy main. Attend his voyage, or domestic train. Spontaneous did you speed his secret course. Or was the vessel seized by fraud or force? With willing duty, not reluctant mind. No man cried, the vessel was resigned. Who, in the balance, with the great affairs? Of courts presumed to weigh their private cares. With him, the peerage next in power to you. And mentor, captain of the lordly crew. Or some celestial in his reverend form. Safe from the secret rock and adverse storm. Pilots the course. For when the glimmering ray. Of yester dawn disclosed the tender day. Mentor himself I saw, and much admired. Then ceased the youth, and from the court retired. Confounded and appalled, the unfinished game. The suitors quit, and all to council came. Antinous first the assembled peers addressed. Rage sparkling in his eyes, and burning in his breast. O oh, shame to manhood! Shall one daring boy The scheme of all our happiness destroy? Fly unperceived, seducing half the flower Of nobles, and invite a foreign power? The ponderous engine raised to crush us all Recoiling, on his head is sure to fall Instant prepare me, on the neighboring strand With twenty chosen mates a vessel manned for ambushed close beneath the Samian shore. His ship returning shall my spies explore. He soon his rashness shall with life atone. Seek for his father's fate, but find his own. With vast applause the sentence all approve. Then rise, and to the feastful hall remove. Swift to the queen the herald meeting ran. Who heard the consult of the dire divan. Before her dome the royal matron stands. And thus the message of his haste demands. What will the suitors? Must my servant train? The allotted labors of the day refrain. For them to form some exquisite repast. Heaven grant this festival may prove their last. Or, if they still must live, from me remove. The double plague of luxury and love. Forbear, ye sons of insolence. Forbear. In riot to consume a wretched air. In the young soul illustrious thought to raise. Were ye not tutored with Ulysses' praise? Have not your fathers oft my lord defined? Gentle of speech, beneficent of mind. Some kings with arbitrary rage devour. Or in their tyrant minions vest the power. Ulysses let no partial favors fall. The people's parent, he protected all. But absent now, perfidious and ingrate. His stores you ravage, and usurp his state. He thus, oh were the woes you speak the worst. They form a deed more odious and accursed. More dreadful than your boding soul divines. But pitying Jove avert the dire designs. The darling object of your royal care. Is marked to perish in a deathful snare. Before he anchors in his native port. From pile resailing and the Spartan court. Horrid to speak. In ambush is decreed. The hope and heir of Ithaca to bleed. Sudden she sunk beneath the weighty woes. The vital streams a chilling horror froze. The big round tear stands trembling in her eye. And on her tongue imperfect accents die. At length in tender language interwove. With sighs, she thus expressed her anxious love. Why rarely would my son his fate explore? Ride the wild waves, and quit the safer shore. Did he with all the greatly wretched, crave? A blank oblivion, an untimely grave? Tis not, replied the sage, to meet and given. To know, if some inhabitant of heaven. In his young breast the daring thought inspired. Or if, alone with filial duty fired. The winds and waves he tempts in early bloom. Studious to learn his absent father's doom. The sage retired, unable to control. The mighty griefs that swell her laboring soul. Rolling convulsive on the floor is seen. 
the piteous object of a prostrate queen. Words to her dumb complaint a pause supplies. And breath, to waste in unavailing cries. Around their sovereign wept the menial fair. To whom she thus addressed her deep despair. Behold a wretch whom all the gods consign. To woe. Did ever sorrows equal mine? Long to my joys my dearest lord is lost. His country's buckler, and the Grecian boast. Now from my fond embrace, by tempests torn. Our other column of the state is born. Nor took a kind adieu, nor sought consent. Unkind confederates in his dire intent. Ill suits it with your shows of duteous zeal. From me the purposed voyage to conceal. Though at the solemn midnight hour he rose. Why did you fear to trouble my repose? He either had obeyed my fond desire. Or seen his mother pierced with grief expire. Bid Dolius quick attend, the faithful slave. Whom to my nuptial train Icarius gave. To tend the fruit groves, with incessant speed. He shall this violence of death decreed. To good Laertes tell. Experienced age. May timely intercept the ruffian rage. Convene the tribes the murderous plot reveal. And to their power to save his race appeal. Then Euryclea thus, my dearest dread. Though to the sword I bow this hoary head. Or if a dungeon be the pain decreed. I own me conscious of the unpleasing deed. Auxilia to his flight, my aid implored. With wine and viands I the vessel stored. A solemn oath, imposed, the secret sealed. Till the twelfth dawn the light of day revealed. Dreading the effect of a fond mother's fear. He dared not violate your royal ear. But bathe, and, in imperial robes arrayed. Pay due devotions to the martial maid. And rest affianced in her guardian aid. Send not to good Laertes, nor engage. In toils of state the miseries of age. Tis impious to surmise the powers divine. To ruin doom the Jove descended line. Long shall the race of just Arcesius reign. And isles remote enlarge his old domain. The queen her speech with calm attention hears. Her eyes restrain the silver streaming tears. She bathes, and robed, the sacred dome ascends. Her pious speed a female train attends. The salted cakes and canisters are laid. And thus the queen invokes Minerva's aid. Daughter divine of Jove, whose arm can wield. The avenging bolt, and shake the dreadful shield. If e'er Ulysses to thy fame preferred. The best and choicest of his flock and herd. Here, goddess, here, by those oblations won. And for the pious sire preserve the son. His wished return with happy power befriend. And on the suitors let thy wrath descend. She ceased, shrill ecstasies of joy declare. The favoring goddess present to the prayer. The suitors heard, and deemed the mirthful voice. A signal of her hymeneal choice. Whilst one most jovial thus accosts the board. Too late the queen selects a second lord. In evil hour the nuptial rite intends. When o'er her son disastrous death impends. Thus he, unskilled of what the fates provide. But with severe rebuke Antinous cried. These empty vaunts will make the voyage vain. Alarm not with discourse the menial train. The great event with silent hope attend. Our deeds alone our counsel must commend. His speech thus ended short, he frowning rose. And twenty chiefs renowned for valor chose. Down to the strand he speeds with haughty strides. Where anchored in the bay the vessel rides. Replete with mail and military store. In all her tackle trim to quit the shore. The desperate crew ascend, unfurl the sails. The seaward prow invites the tardy gales. Then take repast till Hesperus displayed. His golden circlet, in the western shade. Meantime the queen, without reflection due. Heart wounded, to the bed of state withdrew. In her sad breast the prince's fortunes roll. And hope and doubt alternate seize her soul. 
so when the woodman's toil her cave surrounds. And with the hunter's cry the grove resounds. With grief and rage the mother lion stung. Fearless herself, yet trembles for her young. While pensive in the silent slumberous shade. Sleep's gentle powers her drooping eyes invade. Minerva, lifelike, on embodied air. Impressed the form of Ephthema the fair. Icarius' daughter she, whose blooming charms. Allured Eumelus to her virgin arms. A sceptred lord, who o'er the fruitful plain. Of Thessaly wide stretched his ample reign. As Pallas willed, along the sable skies. To con the queen, the phantom sister flies. Swift on the regal dome, descending right. The bolted valves are pervious to her flight. Close to her head the pleasing vision stands. And thus performs Minerva's high commands. O oh why, Penelope, this causeless fear. To render sleep's soft blessing unsincere. Alike devote to sorrow's dire extreme. The day reflection, and the midnight dream. Thy son the gods propitious will restore. And bid thee cease his absence to deplore. To whom the queen, whilst yet in pensive mind. Was in the silent gates of sleep confined. O sister to my soul forever dear. Why this first visit to reprove my fear? How in a realm so distant should you know? From what deep source ceaseless sorrows flow? To all my hope my royal lord is lost. His country's buckler, and the Grecian boast. And with consummate woe to weigh me down. The heir of all his honours and his crown. My darling son is fled. An easy prey. To the fierce storms, or men more fierce than they. Who, in a league of blood associates sworn. Will intercept the unwary youth's return. Courage resume, the shadowy form replied. In the protecting care of heaven confide. On him attends the blue-eyed martial maid. What earthly can implore a surer aid? Me now the guardian goddess deigns to send. To bid the patient his return attend. The queen replies, if in the blessed abodes. A goddess, thou hast commerce with the gods. Say, breathes my lord the blissful realm of light. Or lies he wrapped in ever during night. Inquire not of his doom, the phantom cries. I speak not all the counsel of the skies. Nor must indulge with vain discourse, or long. The windy satisfaction of the tongue. Swift through the valves the visionary fair. Repassed, and viewless mixed with common air. The queen awakes, delivered of her woes. With florid joy her heart dilating glows. The vision, manifest of future fate. Makes her with hope her son's arrival wait. Meantime the suitors plough the watery plain. Telemachus in thought already slain. When sight of lessening Ithaca was lost. Their sail directed for the Samian coast. A small but verdant isle appeared in view. An asterisk the advancing pilot knew. An ample port the rocks projected form. To break the rolling waves and ruffling storm. That safe recess they gain with happy speed. And in close ambush wait the murderous deed. Book 5. Argument. The departure of Ulysses from Calypso. Pallas in a council of the gods complains of the detention of Ulysses in the island of Calypso, whereupon Mercury is sent to command his removal. The seat of Calypso described. She consents with much difficulty, and Ulysses builds a vessel with his own hands, in which he embarks. Neptune overtakes him with a terrible tempest, in which he is shipwrecked, and in the last danger of death. Till Lenkathea, a sea goddess, assists him, and, after innumerable perils, he gets ashore on Phaeacia. The saffron morn, with early blushes spread. Now rose refulgent from Tithonus' bed. With newborn day to gladden mortal sight. And gild the courts of heaven with sacred light. Then met the eternal synod of the sky. Before the God, who thunders from on high. Supreme in might, sublime in majesty. Pallas, to these, deplores the unequal fates. Of wise Ulysses and his toils relates. 
her hero's danger touched the pitying power. The nymph's seducements, and the magic bower. Thus she began her plaint, immortal Jove. And you who fill the blissful seats above. Let kings no more with gentle mercy sway. Or bless a people willing to obey. But crush the nations with an iron rod. And every monarch be the scourge of God. If from your thoughts Ulysses you remove. Who ruled his subjects with a father's love. Soul in an isle, encircled by the main. Abandoned, banished from his native reign. Unblessed he sighs, detained by lawless charms. And pressed unwilling in Calypso's arms. Nor friends are there, nor vessels to convey. Nor oars to cut the immeasurable way. And now fierce traitors, studious to destroy. His only son, their ambushed fraud employ. Who, pious, following his great father's fame. To sacred Pylos and to Sparta came. What words are these? replied the power who forms. The clouds of night, and darkens heaven with storm's winky face. Is not already in thy soul decreed. The chief's return shall make the guilty bleed. What cannot wisdom do? Thou mayst restore. The sun in safety to his native shore. While the fell foes, who laid in ambush lay. With fraud defeated measure back their way. Then thus to Hermes the command was given. Hermes, thou chosen messenger of heaven. Go, to the nymph be these our orders born. Tis Jove's decree, Ulysses shall return. The patient man shall view his old abodes. Nor helped by mortal hand, nor guiding gods. In twice ten days shall fertile Scyria find. Alone. And floating to the wave and wind. The bold Phaeacians there, whose haughty line is mixed with gods, half human, half divine. The chief shall honor as some heavenly guest, and swift transport him to his place of rest. His vessels loaded with a plenteous store, of brass, of vestures, and resplendent ore, a richer prize than if his joyful isle, received him charged with Ilion's noble spoil. His friends, his country, he shall see, though late. Such is our sovereign will, and such is fate. He spoke. The God who mounts the winged winds. Fast to his feet the golden pinions binds. That high through fields of air his flight sustain. O'er the wide earth, and o'er the boundless main. He grasps the wand that causes sleep to fly. Or in soft slumber seals the wakeful eye. Then shoots from heaven to high Pyrrhus steep and stoops incumbent on the rolling deep. So watery fowl, that seek their fishy food, with wings expanded o'er the foaming flood, now sailing smooth the level surface sweep, now dip their pinions in the briny deep. Thus o'er the word of waters Hermes flew, till now the distant island rose in view. Then, swift ascending from the azure wave, he took the path that winded to the cave. Large was the grot, in which the nymph he found. The fair-haired nymph with every beauty crowned. The cave was brightened with a rising blaze. Cedar and frankincense, an odorous pile. Flamed on the hearth, and wide perfumed the aisle. While she with work and song the time divides. And through the loom the golden shuttle guides. Without the grot a various sylvan scene. Appeared around, and groves of living green. Poplars and alders ever quivering played. And nodding cypress formed a fragrant shade. On whose high branches, waving with the storm. The birds of broadest wing their mansions form. The chuff, the sea mew, the loquacious crow. And scream aloft. And skim the deeps below. Depending vines the shelving cavern screen. With purple clusters blushing through the green. For limped fountains from the clefts distill. And every fountain pours a several rill. In mazy windings wandering down the hill. Where bloomy meads with vivid greens were crowned. And glowing violets threw odors round. A scene, where, if a god should cast his sight. A god might gaze, 
and wander with delight. Joy touched the messenger of heaven, he stayed. Entranced, and all the blissful haunts surveyed. Him, entering in the cave, Calypso knew. For powers celestial to each other's view. Stand still confessed, though distant far they lie. To habitants of earth, or sea, or sky. But sad Ulysses, by himself apart. Poured the big sorrows of his swelling herd. All on the lonely shore he sate to weep. And rolled his eyes around the restless deep. Toward his loved coast he rolled his eyes in vain. Till, dimmed with rising grief, they streamed again. Now graceful seated on her shining throne. To Hermes thus the nymph divine begun. God of the golden wand. On what behest? Arrivest thou here, an unexpected guest. Loved as thou art, thy free injunctions lay. Tis mine with joy and duty to obey. Till now a stranger, in a happy hour. Approach, and taste the dainties of my bower. Thus having spoke, the nymph the table spread. Ambrosial cates, with nectar rosy red. Hermes the hospitable rite partook. Divine refection. Then, recruited, spoke. What moves this journey from my native sky? A goddess asks, nor can a god deny. Hear then the truth. By mighty Jove's command. Unwilling have I trod this pleasing land. For who, self-moved, with weary wing would sweep? Such length of ocean and unmeasured deep. A world of waters. Far from all the ways. Where men frequent, or sacred altars blaze. But to Jove's will submission we must pay. What power so great to dare to disobey? A man, he says, a man resides with thee. Of all his kind most worn with misery. The Greeks, whose arms for nine long year employed. Their force on Ilion, in the tenth destroyed. At length, embarking in a luckless hour. With conquest proud, incensed Minerva's power. Hence on the guilty race her vengeance hurled. With storms pursued them through the liquid world. There all his vessels sunk beneath the wave. There all his dear companions found their grave. Saved from the jaws of death by heaven's decree. The tempest drove him to these shores and thee. Him, Jove now orders to his native lands. Straight to dismiss, so destiny commands. Impatient fate his near return attends. And calls him to his country, and his friends. E'en to her inmost soul the goddess shook. Then thus her anguish, and her passion broke. Ungracious gods! With spite and envy cursed. Still to your own ethereal race the worst. Ye envy mortal and immortal joy. And love, the only sweet of life destroy. Did ever goddess by her charms engage. A favored mortal, and not feel your rage. So when Aurora sought Orion's love. Her joys disturbed your blissful hours above. Till, in Ortigia Diane's winged dart. Had pierced the hapless hunter to the heart. So when the covert of the thrice-eared field. Saw a stately series to her passion yield. Scarce could Iasian taste her heavenly charms. But Jove's swift lightning scorched him in her arms. And is it now my turn, ye mighty powers? Am I the envy of your blissful bowers? A man, an outcast to the storm and wave. It was my crime to pity, and to save. When he who thunders rent his bark in twain. And sunk his brave companions in the main. Alone, abandoned, in mid-ocean tossed. The sport of winds, and driven from every coast. Hither this man of miseries I led. Received the friendless. And the hungry fed. Nay promised, vainly promised, to bestow. Immortal life, exempt from age and woe. Tis past and Jove decrees he shall remove. Gods as we are, we are but slaves to Jove. Go then he must, he must, if he ordain. Try all those dangers, all those deeps, again. But never, never shall Calypso send. To toils like these her husband and her friend. What ships have I, 
what sailors to convey, what oars to cut the long laborious way. Yet I'll direct the safest means to go. That last advice is all I can bestow. To her the power who hears the charming rod. Dismiss the man, nor irritate the god. Prevent the rage of him who reigns above. For what so dreadful is the wrath of Jove? Thus having said, he cut the cleaving sky. And in a moment vanished from her eye. The nymph, obedient to divine command. To seek Ulysses, paced along the sand. Him pensive on the lonely beach she found. With streaming eyes in briny torrents drowned. And inly pining for his native shore. For now the soft enchantress pleased no more. For now, reluctant, and constrained by charms. Absent he lay in her desiring arms. In slumber wore the heavy night away. On rocks and shores consumed the tedious day. There sate all desolate, and sighed alone. With echoing sorrows made the mountains groan. And rolled his eyes o'er all the restless main. Till, dimmed with rising grief, they streamed again. Here, on his musing mood the goddess pressed. Approaching soft, and thus the chief addressed. Unhappy man! To wasting woes a prey. No more in sorrows languish life away. Free as the winds I give thee now to rove. Go, fell the timber of yon lofty grove. And form a raft, and build the rising ship. Sublime to bear thee o'er the gloomy deep. To store the vessel let the care be mine. With water from the rock and rosy wine. And life-sustaining bread, and fair array. And prosperous gales to waft thee on the way. These, if the gods with my desire comply. The gods, alas, more mighty far than I. And better skilled in dark events to come. In peace shall land thee at thy native home. With sighs Ulysses heard the words she spoke. Then thus his melancholy silence broke. Some other motive, goddess. Sways thy mind. Some close design, or turn of womankind. Nor my return the end, nor this the way. On a slight raft to pass the swelling sea. Huge, horrid, vast. Where scarce in safety sails. The best built ship, though Jove inspires the gales. The bold proposal how shall I fulfill? Dark as I am, unconscious of thy will. Swear, then, thou meanst not what my soul forebodes. Swear by the solemn oath that binds the gods. Him, while he spoke, with smiles Calypso eyed. And gently grasped his hand, and thus replied. This shows thee, friend, by old experience taught. And learned in all the wiles of human thought. How prone to doubt, how cautious, are the wise. But here, O earth, and here, ye sacred skies. And thou, O Styx. Whose formidable floods. Glide through the shades, and bind the attesting gods. No form design, no meditated end. Lurks in the counsel of thy faithful friend. Kind the persuasion, and sincere my aim. The same my practice, were my fate the same. Heaven has not cursed me with a heart of steel. But given the sense to pity, and to feel. Thus having said, the goddess marched before. He trod her footsteps in the sandy shore. At the cool cave arrived, they took their state. He filled the throne where Mercury had sate. For him the nymph a rich repast ordains. Such as the mortal life of man sustains. Before herself were placed the decates divine. Ambrosial banquet and celestial wine. Their hunger satiate, and their thirst repressed. Thus spoke Calypso to her godlike guest. Ulysses. With a sigh she thus began winky face. O oh, sprung from gods. In wisdom more than man. Is then thy home the passion of thy heart? Thus wilt thou leave me, are we thus to part? Farewell. And ever joyful mayst thou be. Nor break the transport with one thought of me. But ah, Ulysses! Wert thou given to know? What fate yet dooms thee still to undergo? 
thy heart might settle in this scene of ease. And e'en these slighted charms might learn to please. A willing goddess, an immortal life. Might banish from thy mind an absent wife. Am I inferior to a mortal dame? Less soft my feature less august my frame. Or shall the daughters of mankind compare? Their earth-born beauties with the heavenly fair. Alas! For this, the prudent man replies. Against Ulysses shall thy anger rise. Loved and adored, O goddess as thou art. Forgive the weakness of a human heart. Though well I see thy graces far above. The dear, though mortal, object of my love. Of youth eternal well the difference know. And the short date of fading charms below. Yet every day, while absent thus I roam. I languish to return and die at home. Whatever the gods shall destine me to bear. In the black ocean or the watery war. Tis mine to master with a constant mind. Inured to perils, to the worst resigned. By seas, by wars, so many dangers run. Still I can suffer, their high will he done. Thus while he spoke, the beamy sun descends. And rising night her friendly shade extends. To the close grot the lonely pair remove. And slept delighted with the gifts of love. When rose morning called them from their rest. Ulysses robed him in the cloak and vest. The nymph's fair head a veil transparent graced. Her swelling loins a radiant zone embraced. With flowers of gold. An under robe, unbound. In snowy waves flowed glittering on the ground. Forth issuing thus, she gave him first to wield. A weighty axe with truest temper steeled. And double-edged. The handle smooth and plain. Rod of the clouded olive's easy grain. And next, a wedge to drive with sweepy sway. Then to the neighboring forest led the way. On the lone island's utmost verge there stood. Of poplars, pine, and firs, a lofty wood. Whose leafless summits to the skies aspire. Scorched by the sun, or seared by heavenly fire. Already dried. These pointing out to view. The nymph just showed him, and with tears withdrew. Now toils the hero, trees on trees o'erthrown. Fall crackling round him, and the forests groan. Sudden, full twenty on the plain are strode. And lopped and lightened of their branchy load. At equal angles these disposed to join. He smoothed and squared them by the rule and line. The wimbles for the work Calypso found. With those he pierced them and with clinchers bound. Long and capacious as a shipwright forms. Some barks broad bottom to outride the storms. So large he built the raft, then ribbed it strong. From space to space, and nailed the planks along. These formed the sides, the deck he fashioned last. Then o'er the vessel raised the taper mast. With crossing sail yards dancing in the wind. And to the helm the guiding rudder joined. With yielding osiers fenced, to break the force. Of surging waves, and steer the steady course. Thy loom, Calypso, for the future sails. Supplied the cloth, capacious of the gales. With stays and cordage last he rigged the ship. And, rolled on levers, launched her in the deep. For days were past, and now the work complete. Shone the fifth morn, when from her sacred seat. The nymph dismissed him, odorous garments given. And bathed in fragrant oils that breathed of heaven. Then filled two goatskins with her hands divine. With water one, and one with sable wine. Of every kind, provisions heaved aboard. And the full decks with copious viands stored. The goddess, last, a gentle breeze supplies. To curl old ocean, and to warm the skies. And now, rejoicing in the prosperous gales. With beating heart Ulysses spreads his sails. Placed at the helm he sate, and marked the skies. Nor closed in sleep his ever watchful eyes. There viewed the Pleiades, and the northern team. And great Orion's more refulgent beam. To which, around the axle of the sky. The bear, 
revolving, points his golden eye. Who shines exalted on the ethereal plain? Nor bathes his blazing forehead in the main. Far on the left those radiant fires to keep. The nymph directed, as he sailed the deep. Full seventeen nights he cut the foaming way. The distant land appeared the following day. Then swelled to sight Phaeacia's dusky coast. And woody mountains, half in vapors lost. That lay before him indistinct and vast. Like a broad shield amid the watery waste. But him, thus voyaging the deeps below. From far, on Solemn's aerial brow. The king of ocean saw, and seeing burned. From Ethiopia's happy climes returned. The raging monarch shook his azure head. And thus in secret to his soul he said. Heavens! How uncertain are the powers on high! Is then reversed the sentence of the sky. In one man's favor. While a distant guest. I shared secure the Aethiopian feast. Behold how near Phoenicia's land he draws. The land affixed by fate's eternal laws. To end his toils. Is then our anger vain? No, if this scepter yet commands the main. He spoke, and high the forky trident hurled. Rolls clouds on clouds, and stirs the watery world. At once the face of earth and sea deforms. Swells all the winds, and rouses all the storms. Down rush the night, east, west, together roar. And south and north roll mountains to the shore. Then shook the hero, to despair resigned. And questioned thus his yet unconquered mind. Wretch that I am! What farther fates attend? This life of toils, and what my destined end? Too well, alas! The island goddess knew. On the black sea what perils should ensue. New horrors now this destined head enclose. Until this yet the measure of my woes. With what a cloud the brows of heaven are crowned. What raging winds! What roaring waters round! Tis Jove himself the swelling tempest rears. Death, present death, on every side appears. Happy. Thrice happy. Who, in battle slain. Pressed in a trides cause the Trojan plain. Oh! Had I died before that well-fought wall. Had some distinguished day renowned my fall. Such as was that when showers of javelins fled. From conquering Troy around Achilles dead. All Greece had paid me solemn funerals then. And spread my glory with the sons of men. A shameful fate now hides my hapless head. Unwept, unnoted, and forever dead. A mighty wave rushed o'er him as he spoke. The raft is covered, and the mast is broke. Swept from the deck and from the rudder torn. Far on the swelling surge the chief was borne. While by the howling tempest rent in twain. Flew sail and sail yards rattling o'er the main. Long pressed, he heaved beneath the weighty wave. Clogged by the cumbrous vest Calypso gave. At length, emerging, from his nostrils wide. And gushing mouth effused the briny tide. E'en then not mindless of his last retreat. He seized the raft, and leaped into his seat. Strong with the fear of death. In rolling flood. Now here, now there, impelled the floating wood. As when a heap of gathered thorns is cast. Now to, now fro, before the autumnal blast. Together clung, it rolls around the field. So rolled the float, and so its texture held. And now the south, and now the north, bear sway. And now the east the foamy floods obey. And now the west wind whirls it o'er the sea. The wandering chief with toils on toils oppressed. Leucothea saw, and pity touched her breast. Herself a mortal once, of Cadmus strain. But now an azure sister of the main. Swift as a sea mew springing from the flood. All radiant on the raft the goddess stood. Then thus addressed him, thou whom heaven decrees. To Neptune's wrath, stern tyrant of the seas. Unequal contest, not his rage and power. 
great as he is, such virtue shall devour. What I suggest, thy wisdom will perform. Forsake thy float, and leave it to the storm. Strip off thy garments, Neptune's fury brave. With naked strength, and plunge into the wave. To reach Phaeacia all thy nerves extend. Their fate decrees thy miseries shall end. This heavenly scarf beneath thy bosom bind. And live, give all thy terrors to the wind. Soon as thy arms the happy shore shall gain. Return the gift, and cast it in the main. Observe my orders, and with heed obey. Cast it far off, and turn thy eyes away. With that, her hand the sacred veil bestows. Then down the deep she dived from whence she rose. A moment snatched the shining form away. And all was covered with the curling sea. Struck with amaze, yet still to doubt inclined. He stands suspended, and explores his mind. What shall I do? Unhappy me! Who knows? But other gods intend me other woes. Who if thou art, I shall not blindly join. Thy pleaded reason, but consult with mine. For scarce in ken appears that distant isle. Thy voice foretells me shall conclude my toil. Thus then I judge, while yet the planks sustain. The wild wave's fury, here I fixed remain. But, when their texture to the tempest yields. I launch adventurous on the liquid fields. Join to the help of gods the strength of man. And take this method. Since the best I can. While thus his thoughts and anxious counsel hold. The raging god a watery mountain rolled. Like a black sheet the whelming billows spread. Burst o'er the float, and thundered on his head. Planks, beams, disparked fly. The scattered wood. Rolls diverse, and in fragments strews the flood. So the rude Boreas, o'er the field new shorn. Tosses and drives the scattered heaps of corn. And now a single beam the chief bestrides. There poised a while above the bounding tides. His limbs discumbers of the clinging vest. And binds the sacred cincture round his breast. Then prone an ocean in a moment flung. Stretched wide his eager arms, and shot the seas along. All naked now, on heaving billows laid. Stern Neptune eyed him, and contemptuous said. Go, learned in woes, and other foes essay. Go, wander helpless on the watery way. Thus, thus find out the destined shore, and then. If Jove ordains it, mix with happier men. Whatever thy fate, the ills our wrath could raise. Shall last remembered in thy best of days. This said, his sea-green steeds divide the foam. And reach high Egi and the towery dome. Now, scarce withdrawn the fierce earth-shaking power. Jove's daughter Pallas watched the favoring hour. Back to their cave she bade the winds to fly. And hushed the blustering brethren of the sky. The drier blasts alone of Boreas away. And bear him soft on broken waves away. With gentle force impelling to that shore. Where fate has destined he shall toil no more. And now, two nights, and now two days were passed. Since wide he wandered on the watery waste. Heaved on the surge with intermitting breath. And hourly panting in the arms of death. The third fair morn now blazed upon the main. Then glassy smooth lay all the liquid plain. The winds were hushed, the billows scarcely curled. And a dead silence stilled the watery world. When lifted on a ridgy wave he spies. The land at distance, and with sharpened eyes. As pious children joy with vast delight. When a loved sire revives before their sight. Who, lingering along, has called on death in vain. Fixed by some demon to his bed of pain. Till heaven by miracle his life restore. So joys Ulysses at the appearing shore. And sees, and labors onward as he sees. The rising forests, and the tufted trees. And now, as near approaching as the sound. Of human voice the listening ear may wound. Amidst the rocks he heard a hollow roar. Of murmuring surges breaking on the shore. 
nor peaceful port was there, nor winding bay, to shield the vessel from the rolling sea. But cliffs and shaggy shores, a dreadful sight. All rough with rocks, with foamy billows white. Fear seized his slackened limbs and beating heart. As thus he communed with his soul apart. Ah me! When, o'er a length of waters tossed. These eyes at last behold the unhoped for coast. No port receives me from the angry main. But the loud deeps demand me back again. Above, sharp rocks forbid access, around. Roar the wild waves. Beneath, is sea profound. No footing sure affords the faithless sand. To stem too rapid, and too deep to stand. If here I enter, my efforts are vain. Dashed on the cliffs, or heaved into the main. Or round the island if my course I bend. Where the ports open, or the shores descend. Back to the seas the rolling surge may sweep and bury all my hopes beneath the deep. Or some enormous whale the god may send. For many such an amphitrite attend. Too well the turns of mortal chance I know. And hate relentless of my heavenly foe. While thus he thought, a monstrous wave upbore. The chief, and dashed him on the craggy shore. Torn was his skin, nor had the ribs been whole. But instant Pallas entered in his soul. Close to the cliff with both his hands he clung. And stuck adherent, and suspended hung. Till the huge surge rolled off. Then backward sweep. The refluent tides, and plunge him in the deep. As when the polypus, from forth his cave. Torn with full force, reluctant beats the wave. His ragged claws are stuck with stones and sands. So the rough rock had shagged Ulysses' hands and now had perished, whelmed beneath the main. The unhappy man, e'en fate had been in vain. But all subduing Pallas lent her power. And prudence saved him in the needful hour. Beyond the beating surge his course he bore. A wider circle, but in sight of shore. With longing eyes, observing, to survey. Some smooth ascent, or safe sequestered bay. Between the parting rocks at length he spied. A failing stream with gentler waters glide. Where to the seas the shelving shore declined. And formed a bay impervious to the wind. To this calm port the glad Ulysses pressed. And hailed the river, and its god addressed. Who are thou art, before whose stream unknown? I bend, a suppliant at thy watery throne. Here, azure king. Nor let me fly in vain. To thee from Neptune and the raging main. Heaven hears and pities hapless men like me. For sacred even to gods is misery. Let then thy waters give the weary rest. And save a suppliant, and a man distressed. He prayed, and straight the gentle stream subsides. Detains the rushing current of his tides. Before the wanderer smooths the watery way. And soft receives him from the rolling sea. That moment, fainting as he touched the shore. He dropped his sinewy arms, his knees no more. Performed their office, or his weight upheld. His swollen heart heaved, his bloated body swelled. From mouth and nose the briny torrent ran. And lost in lassitude lay all the man. Deprived of voice, of motion, and of breath. The soul scarce waking in the arms of death. Soon as warm life its wonted office found. The mindful chief Leucotheus' scarf unbound. Observant of her word, he turned aside. H. I.'s head, and cast it on the rolling tide. Behind him far, upon the purple waves. The waters waft it, and the nymph receives. Now parting from the stream, Ulysses found. A mossy bank with pliant rushes crowned. The bank he pressed, and gently kissed the ground. Where on the flowery herb as soft he lay. Thus to his soul the sage began to say. What will ye next ordain, ye powers on high? And yet, ah yet, what fates are we to try? Here by the stream, if I the night out wear. Thus spent already, how shall nature bear? The dews descending, and nocturnal air. 
or chilly vapors breathing from the flood. When morning rises, if I take the wood, and in thick shelter of innumerous boughs, enjoy the comfort gentle sleep allows. Though fenced from cold, and though my toil be past, what savage beasts may wander in the waste? Perhaps I yet may fall a bloody prey to prowling bears, or lions in the way. Thus long debating in himself he stood. At length he took the passage to the wood, whose shady horrors on a rising brow waved high, and frowned upon the stream below. There grew two olives, closest of the grove. With roots entwined, the branches interwove. Alike their leaves, but not alike they smiled. With sister fruits, one fertile, one was wild. Nor here the sun's meridian rays had power. Nor wind sharp piercing, nor the rushing shower. The verdant arch so close its texture kept. Beneath this covert great Ulysses crept. Of gathered leaves an ample bed he made. Thick strewn by tempest through the bowery shade. Where three at least might winter's cold defy. Though Boreas raged along the inclement sky. This store with joy the patient hero found. And, sunk amidst them, heaped the leaves around. As some poor peasant, fated to reside. Remote from neighbors in a forest wide. Studious to save what human wants require. In embers heaped, preserves the seeds of fire. Hid in dry foliage thus Ulysses lies. Till Pallas poured soft slumbers on his eyes and golden dreams, the gift of sweet repose. Lulled all his cares, and banished all his woes. Book 6. Argument. Pallas appearing in a dream in Nausicaa, the daughter of Alcinous, king of Phaeacia, commands her to descend to the river, and wash the robes of state, in preparation for her nuptials. Nausicaa goes with her handmaidens to the river, where, while the garments are spread on the bank, they divert themselves in sports. Their voices awaken Ulysses, who, addressing himself to the princess, is by her relieved and clothed, and receives directions in what manner to apply to the king and queen of the island. While thus the weary wanderer sunk to rest, and peaceful slumbers calmed his anxious breast, the marshal made from heaven's aerial height, swift to Phaeacia winged her rapid flight. In elder times the soft Phaeacian train. In ease possessed the wide Hyperion plain. Till the Cyclopean race in arms arose. A lawless nation of gigantic foes. Then great Nasithous from Hyperia far. Through seas retreating from the sounds of war. The recreant nation to fair Scyria led. Where never science reared her laurelled head. There round his tribes a strength of wall he raised. To heaven the glittering domes and temples blazed. Just to his realms, he parted grounds from grounds. And shared the lands, and gave the lands their bounds. Now in the silent grave the monarch lay. And wise Alcinous held the legal sway. To his high palace through the fields of air. The goddess shot, Ulysses was her care. There, as the night in silence rolled away. A heaven of charms divine Nausicaa lay. Through the thick gloom the shining portals blaze. Two nymphs the portals guard, each nymph a grace. Light as the viewless air the warrior maid. Glides through the valves, and hovers round her head. A favorite virgin's blooming form she took. From Dima sprung, and thus the vision spoke. O oh, indolent! To waste thy hours away. And sleeps thou careless of the bridal day. Thy spousal ornament neglected lies. Arise, prepare the bridal train, arise. A just applause the cares of dress impart. And give soft transport to a parent's heart. Haste, to the limpid stream direct thy way. When the gay morn unveils her smiling ray. Haste to the stream. Companion of thy care. Lo, I thy steps attend, thy labors share. Virgin, awake. The marriage hour is nigh. See from their thrones thy kindred monarchs sigh. The royal car at early dawn obtain. 
and order mules obedient to the rain. For rough the way, and distant rolls the wave. Where their fair vests Phaeacian virgins lave. In pomp ride forth, for pomp becomes the great. And majesty derives a grace from state. Then to the palaces of heaven she sails. Incumbent on the wings of wafting gales. The seat of gods, the regions mild of peace. Full joy, and calm eternity of ease. There no rude winds presume to shake the skies. No rains descend, no snowy vapors rise. But on immortal thrones the blessed repose. The firmament with living splendors glows. Hither the goddess winged the aerial way. Through heaven's eternal gates that blazed with day. Now from her rosy car aurora shed. The dawn, and all the orient flamed with red. Up rose the virgin with the morning light. Obedient to the vision of the night. The queen she sought, the queen her hours bestowed. In curious works. The whirling spindle glowed. With crimson threads, while busy damsels call. The snowy fleece, or twist the purpled wool. Meanwhile Phaeacia's peers in council sate. From his high dome the king descends in state. Then with a filial awe the royal maid. Approached him passing, and submissive said. Will my dread sire his ear regardful deign? And may his child the royal car obtain? Say, with my garments shall I bend my way? Where through the valas the mazy waters stray? A dignity of dress adorns the great. And kings draw luster from the robe of state. Five sons thou hast, three wait the bridal day. And spotless robes become the young and gay. So when with praise amid the dance they shine. By these my cares adorn that praise is mine. Thus she, but blushes ill-restrained betray. Her thoughts intentive on the bridal day. The conscious sire the dawning blush surveyed. And, smiling, thus bespoke the blooming maid. My child, my darling joy, the car receive. That, and whatever our daughter asks, we give. Swift at the royal nod the attending train. The car prepare, the mule's incessant rain. The blooming virgin with dispatchful cares. Tunics, and stoles, and robes imperial, bears. The queen, assiduous to her train assigns. The sumptuous viands, and the flavorous wines. The train prepare a cruise of curious mold. A cruise of fragrance, formed of burnished gold. Odor divine. Whose soft refreshing streams. Sleek the smooth skin, and scent the snowy limbs. Now mounting the gay seat, the silken reins. Shine in her hand, along the sounding plains. Swift fly the mules, nor rode the nymph alone. Around, a bevy of bright damsels shone. They seek the cisterns where Phaeacian dames. Wash their fair garments in the limpid streams. Where, gathering into depth from falling rills. The lucid wave a spacious basin fills. The mules, unharnessed, range beside the main. Or crop the verdant herbage of the plain. Then emulous the royal robes they lave. And plunge the vestures in the cleansing wave. The vestures cleansed o'er spread the shelly sand. Their snowy luster whitens all the strand. Then with a short repast relieve their toil. And o'er their limbs diffuse ambrosial oil. And while the robes imbibe the solar ray. O'er the green mead the sporting virgins play. Their shining veils unbound. Along the skies. Tossed and retossed, the ball incessant flies. They sport, they feast, Nausicaa lifts her voice. And, warbling sweet, makes earth and heaven rejoice. As when o'er Aramanth Diana roves. Or wide to Aegidas resounding groves. A sylvan train the huntress queen surrounds. Her rattling quiver from her shoulder sounds. Fierce in the sport, along the mountain's brow. They bay the boar, or chase the bounding roe. High o'er the lawn, with more majestic pace. Above the nymphs she treads with stately grace. Distinguished excellence the goddess proves. Exults Latona as the virgin moves. 
with equal grace Nausicaa trod the plain, and shone transcendent o'er the beauteous train. Meantime, the care and favorite of the skies, wrapped in embowering shade, Ulysses lies, his woes forgot, but Pallas now addressed, to break the bands of all composing rest. Forth from her snowy hand Nausicaa threw. The various ball, the ball erroneous flew. And swam the stream, loud shrieks the virgin train. And the loud shriek redoubles from the main. Waked by the shrilling sound, Ulysses rose. And, to the deaf woods wailing, breathed his woes. Ah me! On what inhospitable coast! On what new region is Ulysses tossed? Possessed by wild barbarians fierce in arms. Or men, whose bosom tender pity warms. What sounds are these that gather from he shores? The voice of nymphs that haunt the sylvan bowers. The fair-haired dryads of the shady wood. Or azure daughters of the silver flood. Or human voice. But issuing from the shades. Why cease I straight to learn what sound invades? Then, where the grove with leaves umbrageous bends. With forceful strength a branch the hero rends. Around his loins the verdant cincture spreads. A wreathy foliage and concealing shades. As when a lion in the midnight hours. Beat by rude blasts, and wet with wintry showers. Descends terrific from the mountain's brow. With living flames his rolling eyeballs glow. With conscious strength elate, he bends his way. Majestically fierce, to seize his prey. The steer or stag winky face or, with keen hunger bold. Spring o'er the fence and dissipates the fold. No less a terror, from the neighboring groves. Rough from the tossing surge, Ulysses moves. Urged on by want, and recent from the storms. The brack issues his manly grace deforms. Wide o'er the shore with many a piercing cry. To rocks, to caves, the frightened virgins fly. All but the nymph, the nymph stood fixed alone. By Pallas armed with boldness not her own. Meantime in dubious thought the king awaits. And, self-considering, as he stands, debates. Distant his mournful story to declare. Or prostrate at her knee address the prayer. But fearful to offend, by wisdom swayed. At awful distance he accosts the maid. If from the skies a goddess, or if earth. Imperial virgin, boast thy glorious birth. To thee I bend. If in that bright disguise. Thou visit earth, a daughter of the skies. Hail, Dien, hail. The huntress of the groves. So shines majestic, and so stately moves. So breathes an air divine. But if thy race. Be mortal, and this earth thy native place. Blessed is the father from whose loins you sprung. Blessed is the mother at whose breast you hung. Blessed are the brethren who thy blood divide. To such a miracle of charms allied. Joyful they see applauding princes gaze. When stately in the dance you swim the harmonious maze. But blessed o'er all, the youth with heavenly charms. Who clasps the bright perfection in his arms. Never. I never viewed till this blast hour. Such finished grace. I gaze, and I adore. Thus seems the palm with stately honors crowned. By Phoebus' altars, thus o'erlooks the ground. The pride of Delos. By the Delian coast. I voyaged, leader of a warrior host. But ah, how changed I from thence my sorrow flows. O fatal voyage, source of all my woes winky face. Raptured I stood, and as this hour amazed. With reverence at the lofty wonder gazed. Raptured I stand. For earth ne'er knew to bear. A plant so stately, or a nymph so fair. Awed from access, I lift my suppliant hands. For misery, O queen. Before thee stands. Twice ten tempestuous nights I rolled, resigned. To roaring blows, and the warring wind. Heaven bade the deep to spare. But heaven, my foe. 
spares only to inflict some mightier woe. Inured to cares, to death in all its forms. Outcast I rove, familiar with the storms. Once more I view the face of humankind. Oh let soft pity touch thy generous mind. Unconscious of what air I breathe, I stand. Naked, defenseless on a narrow land. Propitious to my wants a vest supply. To guard the wretched from the inclement sky. So may the gods, who heaven and earth control. Crown the chaste wishes of thy virtuous soul. On thy soft hours their choicest blessings shed. Blessed with a husband be thy bridal bed. Blessed be thy husband with a blooming race. And lasting union crown your blissful days. The gods, when they supremely bless, bestow. Firm union on their favorites below. Then envy grieves, with inly pining hate. The good exult, and heaven is in our state. To whom the nymph, O stranger, cease thy care. Wise is thy soul, but man is bore to bear. Jove weighs affairs of earth in dubious scales. And the good suffers, while the bad prevails. Bear, with a soul resigned, the will of Jove. Who breathes, must mourn, thy woes are from above. But since thou treadst our hospitable shore, tis mine to bid the wretched grieve no more. To clothe the naked, and thy way to guide. No, the Phaeacian tribes this land divide. From great Alcinous' royal loins I spring. A happy nation, and a happy king. Then to her maids, why, why, ye coward train? These fears, this flight. Ye fear, and fly in vain. Dread ye a foe. Dismiss that idle dread. Tis death with hostile step these shores to tread. Safe in the love of heaven, an ocean flows. Around our realm, a barrier from the foes. Tis ours this son of sorrow to relieve. Cheer the sad heart, nor let affliction grieve. By Jove the stranger and the poor are sent. And what to those we give to Jove is lent. Then food supply, and bathe his fainting limbs. Where waving shades obscure the mazy streams. Obedient to the call, the chief they guide. To the calm current of the secret tide. Close by the stream a royal dress they lay. A vest and robe, with rich embroidery gay. Then unguents in a vase of gold supply. That breathed a fragrance through the balmy sky. To them the king, no longer I detain. Your friendly care, retire, ye virgin train. Retire, while from my wearied limbs I lave. The foul pollution of the briny wave. Ye gods. Since this worn frame refection know. What scenes have I surveyed of dreadful view. But, nymphs, recede. Sage chastity denies. To raise the blush, or pain the modest eyes. The nymphs withdrawn, at once into the tide. Active he bounds. The flashing waves divide. O'er all his limbs his hands the waves diffuse. And from his locks compress the weedy ooze. The balmy oil, a fragrant shower, be sheds. Then, dressed, in pomp magnificently treads. The warrior goddess gives his frame to shine. With majesty enlarged, and air divine. Back from his brows a length of hair unfurls. His hyacinth and locks descend in wavy curls. As by some artist, to whom Vulcan gives. His skill divine, a breathing statue lives. By palace taught, he frames the wondrous mold. And o'er the silver pours the fusel gold. So palace his heroic frame improves. With heavenly bloom, and like a god he moves. A fragrance breathes around. Majestic grace. Attends his steps, the astonished virgin's gaze. Soft he reclines along the murmuring seas. Inhaling freshness from the fanning breeze. The wandering nymph his glorious port surveyed. And to her damsels, with amazement, said. Not without care divine the stranger treads. This land of joy. His steps some godhead leads. Would Jove destroy him, sure he had been driven. Far from this realm, 
the favorite isle of heaven. Late, a sad spectacle of woe, he trod. The desert sands, and now be looks a god. O heaven! In my connubial hour decree. This man my spouse, or such a spouse as he. But haste, the viands and the bowl provide. The maids the viands and the bowl supplied. Eager he fed, for keen his hunger raged. And with the generous vintage thirst assuaged. Now on return her care Nausicaa bends. The robes resumes, the glittering car ascends. Far blooming o'er the field, and as she pressed. The splendid seat, the listening chief addressed. Stranger, arise. The sun rolls down the day. Lo, to the palace I direct thy way. Where, in high state, the nobles of the land. Attend my royal sire, a radiant band. But here, though wisdom in thy soul presides. Speaks from thy tongue, and every action guides. Advance at distance, while I pass the plain. Where o'er the furrows waves the golden grain. Alone I reascend, with airy mounds. A strength of wall the guarded city bounds. The jutting land two ample bays divides. Full through the narrow mouths descend the tides. The spacious basins arching rocks enclose. A sure defense from every storm that blows. Close to the bay great Neptune's fane adjoins. And near, a forum flanked with marble shines. Where the bold youth, the numerous fleets to store. Shape the broad sail, or smooth the taper oar. For not the bow they bend, nor boast the skill. To give the feathered arrow wings to kill. But the tall mast above the vessel rear. Or teach the fluttering sail to float in air. They rush into the deep with eager joy. Climb the steep surge, and through the tempest fly. A proud, unpolished race, to me belongs. The care to shun the blast of slanderous tongues. Lest malice, prone the virtuous to defame. Thus with wild censure taint my spotless name. What stranger this whom thus Nausicaa leads? Heavens, with what graceful majesty he treads. Perhaps a native of some distant shore. The future consort of her bridal hour. Or rather some descendant of the skies. Won by her prayer, the aerial bridegroom flies. Heaven on that hour its choicest influence shed. That gave a foreign spouse to crown her bed. All, all the godlike worthies that adorn. This realm, she flies, Phaeacia is her scorn. And just the blame, for female innocence. Not only flies the guilt, but shuns the offense. The unguarded virgin, as unchaste, I blame. And the least freedom with the sex is shame. Till our consenting sires a spouse provide. And public nuptials justify the bride. But wouldst thou soon review thy native plain? Attend, and speedy thou shalt pass the main. Nigh where a grove with verdant poplars crowned. To palace sacred, shades the holy ground. We bend our way, a bubbling fount distills. A lucid lake, and thence descends in rills. Around the grove, a mead with lively green. Falls by degrees, and forms a beauteous scene. Here a rich juice the royal vineyard pours. And there the garden yields a waste of flowers. Hence lies the town, as far as to the ear. Floats a strong shout along the waves of air. Their weight embowered, while I ascend alone. To great Alcinous on his royal throne. Arrived, advance, impatient of delay. And to the lofty palace bend thy way. The lofty palace overlooks the town. From every dome by pomp superior known. A child may point the way. With earnest gait. Seek thou the queen along the rooms of state. Her royal hand a wondrous work designs. Around a circle of bright damsels shines. Part twist the threads, and part the wool dispose. While with the purple orb the spindle glows. High on a throne, amid the Shirzian powers. My royal father shares the genial hours. But to the queen thy mournful tale disclose. 
with the prevailing eloquence of woes. So shalt thou view with joy thy natal shore. Though mountains rise between and oceans roar. She added not, but waving, as she wheeled. The silver scourge, it glittered o'er the field. With skill the virgin guides the embroidered rein. Slow rolls the car before the attending train. Now whirling down the heavens, the golden day. Shot through the western clouds a dewy ray. The grove they reach, where, from the sacred shade. To Pallas thus the pensive hero prayed. Daughter of Jove. Whose arms in thunder wield. The avenging bolt, and shake the dreadful shield. Forsook by thee, in vain I sought thy aid. When booming billows closed above my bead. Attend, unconquered maid. Accord my vows. Bid the great hear, and pitying, heal my woes. This heard Minerva, but forbore to fly. By Neptune awed, apparent from the sky. Stern God. Who raged with vengeance, unrestrained. Till great Ulysses hailed his native land. Book 7. Argument. The Court of Alcinous. The Princess Nausicaa returns to the city and Ulysses soon after follows thither. He is met by Pallas in the form of a young virgin, who guides him to the palace, and directs him in what manner to address the queen arate. She then involves him in a mist which causes him to pass invisible. The palace and gardens of Alcinous described. Ulysses falling at the feet of the queen, the mist disperses, the Phaeacians admire, and receive him with respect. The queen inquiring by what means he had the garments he then wore, be relates to her Nelsinoas his departure from Calypso, and his arrival in their dominions. The same day continues, and the book ends with the night. The patient heavenly man thus suppliant prayed. While the slow mules draws on the imperial maid. Through the proud street she moves, the public gaze. The turning wheel before the palace stays. With ready love her brothers, gathering round. Receive the vestures, and the mules unbound. She seeks the bridal bower, a matron there. The rising fire supplies with busy care. Whose charms in youth her father's heart inflamed. Now worn with age, Eurymedusa named. The captive dame Phaeacian rovers bore. Snatched from Epirus, her sweet native shore. A grateful prize, and in her bloom bestowed. On good Alcinous, honored as a god. Nurse of Nausicaa from her infant years. And tender second to a mother's cares. Now from the sacred thicket where he lay. To town Ulysses took the winding way. Propitious palace, to secure her care. Around him spread a veil of thickened air. To shun the encounter of the vulgar crowd. Insulting still, inquisitive and loud. When near the famed Phaeacian walls he drew. The beauteous city opening to his view. His step a virgin met, and stood before. A polished urn the seeming virgin bore. And youthful smiled. But in the low disguise. Lay hid the goddess with the azure eyes. Show me, fair daughter, thus the chief demands. The house of him who rules these happy lands. Through many woes and wanderings, do I come. To good Alcinous hospitable dome. Far from my native coast, I rove alone. A wretched stranger, and of all unknown. The goddess answered, Father, I obey. And point the wandering traveller his way. Well known to me the palace you inquire. For fast beside it dwells my honoured sire. But silent march, nor greet the common train. With question needless. Or inquiry vain. A race of ragged mariners are these. Unpolished men, and boisterous as their seas. The native islanders alone their care. And hateful he who breathes a foreign air. These did the ruler of the deep ordain. To build proud navies, and command the main. On canvas wings to cut the watery way. No bird so light, no thought so swift as they. Thus having spoke, the unknown celestial leads. The footsteps of the duty he treads. And secret moves along the crowded space. 
unseen of all the rude Phaeacian race. So Pallas ordered, Pallas to their eyes. The mist objected, and condensed the skies. The chief with wonder sees the extended streets. The spreading harbors, and the riding fleets. He next their prince's lofty domes admires. In separate islands, crowned with rising spires. And deep entrenchments, and high walls of stone. That gird the city like a marble zone. At length the kingly palace gates he viewed. There stopped the goddess, and her speech renewed. My task is done, the mansion you inquire. Appears before you, enter, and admire. High throned, and feasting, there thou shalt behold. The sceptered rulers. Fear not, but be bold. A decent boldness ever meets with friends. Succeeds, and even a stranger recommends. First to the queen prefer a suppliant's claim. Alcinous queen, irate is her name. The same her parents, and her power the same. For no, from ocean's god Nasithous sprung. And Parabia, beautiful and young. Eurymedon's last hope, who ruled of old. The race of giants, impious, proud, and bold. Perished the nation in unrighteous war. Perished the prince. And left this only heir. Who now, by Neptune's amorous power compressed. Produced a monarch that his people blessed. Father and prince of the Phaeacian name. From him Rexener and Alcinous came. The first by Phoebus hurtling arrows fired. Knew from his nuptials, hapless youth. Expired. No son survived, Arate aired his state. And her, Alcinous chose his royal mate. With honors yet to womankind unknown. This queen he graces, and divides the throne. In equal tenderness her sons conspire. And all the children emulate their sire. When through the streets she gracious deigns to move. The public wonder and the public love. The tongues of all with transport sound her praise. The eyes of all, as on a goddess, gaze. She feels the triumph of a generous breast. To heal divisions, to relieve the oppressed. In virtue rich, in blessing others, blessed. To then secure, thy humble suit prefer. And owe thy country and thy friends to her. With that the goddess deigned no longer stay. But o'er the world of waters winged her way. Forsaking Scyria's ever-pleasing shore. The winds to Marathon the virgin bore. Thence, where proud Athens rears her towery head. With opening streets and shining structures spread. She passed, delighted with the well-known seats. And to Erechtheus' sacred dome retreats. Meanwhile Ulysses at the palace waits. There stops, and anxious with his soul debates. Fixed in a maze before the royal gates. The front appeared with radiant splendors gay. Bright as the lamp of night, or orb of day. The walls were massy brass, the cornice high. Blue metals crowned in colors of the sky. Rich plates of gold the folding doors encase. The pillars silver, on a brazen base. Silver the lintels deep projecting o'er. And gold the ringlets that command the door. Two rows of stately dogs, on either hand. In sculptured gold and labored silver stood. These Vulcan formed with art divine, to wait. Immortal guardians at Alcinous gate. Alive each animated frame appears. And still to live beyond the power of years. Fair thrones within from space to space were raised. Where various carpets with embroidery blessed. The work of matrons, these the princes pressed. Day following day, a long continued feast. Refulgent pedestals the walls surround. Which boys of gold with illuming torches crowned. The polished ore, reflecting every ray. Blazed on the banquets with a double day. Full fifty handmaids form the household train. Some turn the mill, or sift the golden grain. Some ply the loom, their busy fingers move. Like poplar leaves when Zephyr fans the grove. Not more renowned the men of Scyria's isle. For sailing arts and all the naval toil. 
then works of female skill their women's pride. The flying shuttle through the threads to guide. Palace to these her double gifts imparts. Incentive genius. And industrious arts. Close to the gates a spacious garden lies. From storms defended and inclement skies. For acres was the allotted space of ground. Fenced with a green enclosure all around. Tall thriving trees confessed the fruitful mold. The reddening apple ripens here to gold. Here the blue fig with luscious juice o'erflows. With deeper red the full pomegranate glows. The branch here bends beneath the weighty pear. And verdant olives flourish round the year. The balmy spirit of the western gale. Eternal breathes on fruits, unthought to fail. Each dropping pear a following pear supplies. On apples apples. Figs on figs arise. The same mild season gives the blooms to blow. The buds to harden, and the fruits to grow. Here ordered vines in equal ranks appear. With all the united labors of the year. Some to unload the fertile branches run. Some dry the blackening clusters in the sun. Others to tread the liquid harvest join. The groaning presses foam with floods of wine. Here are the vines in early flower descried. Here grapes discolored on the sunny side. And there in autumn's richest purple dyed. Beds of all various herbs, forever green. In beauteous order terminate the scene. Two plenteous fountains the whole prospect crowned. This through the gardens leads its streams around. Visits each plant, and waters all the ground. While that in pipes beneath the palace flows. And thence its current on the town bestows. To various use their various streams they bring. The people one, and one supplies the king. Such were the glories which the gods ordained. To grace Alcinous, and his happy land. E'en from the chief whom men and nations knew. The unwanted scene surprise and rapture drew. In pleasing thought he ran the prospect o'er. Then hasty entered at the lofty door. Night now approaching, in the palace stand. With goblets crowned, the rulers of the land. Prepared for rest, an offering to the god. Who bears the virtue of the sleepy rod. Unseen he glided through the joyous crowd. With darkness circled, and an ambient cloud. Direct to great Alcinous throne he came. And prostrate fell before the imperial dame. Then from around him dropped the veil of night. Sudden he shines, and manifests to sight. The nobles gaze, with awful fear oppressed. Silent they gaze, and I the godlike guest. Daughter of great Rexener. Thus began. Lo at her knees, the much enduring man. To thee, thy consort, and this royal train. To all that share the blessings of your reign. A suppliant bends, O oh, pity human woe. Tis what the happy to the unhappy owe. A wretched exile to his country send. Long worn with griefs, and long without a friend. So may the gods your better days increase. And all your joys descend on all your race. So reign forever on your country's breast. Your people blessing, by your people blessed. Then to the genial hearth he bowed his face. And humbled in the ashes took his place. Silence ensued. The eldest first began. Echeneus sage, a venerable man. Whose well-taught mind the present age surpassed. And joined to that the experience of the last. Fit words attended on his weighty sense. And mild persuasion flowed in eloquence. O oh sight, he cried, dishonest and unjust. A guest, a stranger, seated in the dust. To raise the lowly suppliant from the ground. Befits a monarch. Lo! The peers around. But wait thy word, the gentle guest to grace. And seat him fair in some distinguished place. Let first the herald do libation pay. To Jove, who guides the wanderer on his way. Then set the genial banquet in his view. And give the stranger guest a stranger's due. His sage advice the listening king obeys. 
he stretched his hand the prudent chief to raise. And from his seat Laodamus removed. The monarch's offspring, and his best beloved. There next his side the godlike hero sate. With stars of silver shone the bed of state. The golden ewer a beauteous handmaid brings. Replenished from the cool translucent springs. Whose polished vase with copious stream supplies. A silver layer of capacious size. The table next in regal order spread. The glittering canisters are heaped with bread. Viands of various kinds invite the taste. Of choicest sort and savor, rich repast. Thus feasting high, Alcinous gave the sign. And bade the herald pour the rosy wine. Let all around the due libation pay. To Jove, who guides the wanderer on his way. He said. Pontinus heard the king's command. The circling goblet moves from hand to hand. Each drinks the juice that glads the heart of man. Alcinous then, with aspect mild, began. Princes and peers, attend, while we impart. To you the thoughts of no inhuman heart. Now pleased and satiate from the social rite. Repair we to the blessings of the night. But with the rising day, assembled here. Let all the elders of the land appear. Pious observe our hospitable laws. And heaven propitiate in the stranger's cause. Then joined in council, proper means explore. Safe to transport him to the wished for shore. How distant that, imports us not to know. Nor weigh the labor, but relieve the woe. Meantime, nor harm nor anguish let him bear. This interval, heaven trusts him to our care. But to his native land our charge resigned. Heaven's is his life to come, and all the woes behind. Then must he suffer what the fates ordain. For fate has wove the thread of life with pain. And twins, e'en from the birth, are misery and man. But if, descended from the Olympian bower, gracious approach us some immortal power. If in that form thou comest a guest divine, some high event the conscious gods design. As yet, Unbid they never graced our feast. The solemn sacrifice called down the guest. Then manifest of heaven the vision stood. And to our eyes familiar was the God. Oft with some favored traveler they stray. And shine before him all the desert way. With social intercourse, and face to face. The friends and guardians of our pious race. So near approach we their celestial kind by justice, truth, and probity of mind. As our dire neighbors of Cyclopean birth. Match in fierce wrong the giant sons of earth. Let no such thought, with modest grace rejoined. The prudent Greek, possessed the royal mind. Alas! A mortal, like thyself, am I. No glorious native of yon azure sky. In form, a how unlike their heavenly kind. How more inferior in the gifts of mind! Alas, a mortal! Most oppressed of those Whom fate has loaded with a weight of woes By a sad train of miseries alone Distinguished long, and second now to none By heaven's high will compelled from shore to shore With heaven's high will prepared to suffer more What histories of toil could I declare? But still long wearied nature wants repair Spent with fatigue, and shrunk with pining fast. My craving bowels still require repast. How of the noble, suffering mind may grieve. Its load of anguish, and disdain to live. Necessity demands our daily bread. Hunger is insolent, and will be fed. But finish, O ye peers. What you propose. And let the morrow's dawn conclude my woes. Pleased will I suffer all the gods ordain. To see my soil, my son, my friends again. That view vouchsafed, let instant death surprise. With ever during shade these happy eyes. The assembled peers with general praise approved. His pleaded reason, and the suit he moved. Each drinks a full oblivion of his cares. And to the gifts of balmy sleep repairs. Ulysses in the regal walls alone. 
remained, beside him, on a splendid throne. Divine Arate and Alcinous shone. The queen, a nearer view, the guest surveyed. Robbed in the garments her own hands had made. Not without wonder seen. Then thus began. Her words addressing to the godlike man. Camest thou hither, wondrous stranger I say. From lands remote and o'er a length of sea. Tell, then, whence art thou? Whence, that princely air? And robes like these, so recent and so fair. Hard is the task, O princess. You impose. Thus sighing spoke the man of many woes. The long, the mournful series to relate. Of all my sorrows sent by heaven and fate. Yet what you ask, attend. An island lies. Beyond these tracts, and under other skies. Ogygia named, in ocean's watery arms. Where dwells Calypso, dreadful in her charms. Remote from gods or men she holds her reign. Amid the terrors of a rolling main. Me, only me, the hand of fortune bore. Unblessed. To tread that interdicted shore. When Jove tremendous in the sable deeps. Launched his red lightning at our scattered ships. Then, all my fleet and all my followers lost. Soul on a plank on boiling surges tossed. Heaven drove my wreck the Ogygian isle to find. Full nine days floating to the wave and wind. Met by the goddess there with open arms. She bribed my stay with more than human charms. Nay, promised, vainly promised, to bestow. Immortal life, exempt from age and woe. But all her blandishments successless prove. To banish from my breast my country's love. I stay reluctant seven continued years. And water her ambrosial couch with tears. The eighth she voluntary moves to part. Or urged by Jove, or her own changeful heart. A raft was formed to cross the surging sea. Herself supplied the stores and rich array. And gave the gales to waft me on my way. In seventeen days appeared your pleasing coast. And woody mountains half in vapors lost. Joy touched my soul. My soul was joyed in vain. For angry Neptune roused the raging main. The wild winds whistle, and the billows roar. The splitting raft the furious tempest tore. And storms vindictive intercept the shore. Soon as their rage subsides, the seas I brave. With naked force, and shoot along the wave. To reach this isle, but there my hopes were lost. The surge impelled me on a craggy coast. I chose the safer sea, and chanced to find. A river's mouth impervious to the wind. And clear of rocks. I fainted by the flood. Then took the shelter of the neighboring wood. Twas night, and, covered in the foliage deep. Jove plunged my senses in the death of sleep. All night I slept, oblivious of my pain. Aurora dawned and Phoebus shined in vain. Nor, till oblique he sloped his evening ray. Had somnus dried the balmy dews away. Then female voices from the shore I heard. A maid amidst them, goddess-like appeared. To her I sued, she pitied my distress. Like thee in beauty, nor in virtue less. Who from such youth could hope considerate care? In youth and beauty wisdom is but rare. She gave me life, relieved with just supplies. My wants, and lent these robes that strike your eyes. This is the truth, and O, oh, ye powers on high. Forbid that want should sink me to a lie. To this the king, our daughter but expressed. Her cares imperfect to our godlike guest. Suppliant to her, since first he chose to pray. Why not herself did she conduct the way? And with her handmaids to our court convey. Hero and king, Ulysses thus replied. Nor blame her faultless nor suspect of pride. She bade me follow in the attendant train. But fear and reverence did my steps detain. Lest rash suspicion might alarm thy mind. Man's of a jealous and mistaken kind. Far from my soul, he cried, the gods efface. 
all wrath ill-grounded, and suspicion base. Whatever is honest, stranger, I approve. And would to Phoebus, Pallas, and to Jove. Such as thou art, thy thought and mine were one. Nor thou unwilling to be called my son. In such alliance couldst thou wish to join. A palace stored with treasures should be thine. But if reluctant, who shall force thy stay? Jove bids to set the stranger on his way. And ships shall wait thee with the morning ray. Till then, let slumber cross thy careful eyes. The wakeful mariners shall watch the skies. And seize the moment when the breezes rise. Then gently waft thee to the pleasing shore. Where thy soul rests, and labor is no more. Far as you be a though thy country lay. Our ships with ease transport thee in a day. Thither of old, earth's giant sun to view. On wings of wind with radamanth they flew. This land, from whence their morning course begun. Saw them returning with the setting sun. Your eyes shall witness and confirm my tale. Our youth how dexterous, and how fleet our sail. When justly timed with equal sweep they row. And ocean whitens in long tracks below. Thus he. No word the experienced man replies. But thus to heaven, and heavenward lifts his eyes. O Jove! O Father! What the King accords! Do thou make perfect! Sacred be his words! Wide o'er the world Alcinous glory shine! Let fame be his, and ah! My country mine! Meantime irate, for the hour of rest! Ordains the fleecy couch, and covering vest. Bids her fair train the purple quilts prepare. And the thick carpet spread with busy care. With torches blazing in their hands they passed. And finished all their queen's command with haste. Then gave the signal to the willing guest. He rose with pleasure, and retired to rest. There, soft extended, to the murmuring sound. Of the high porch, Ulysses sleeps profound. Within, released from cares, Alcinous lies. And fast beside were closed Arate's eyes. Book 8. Alcinous calls a council, in which it is resolved to transport Ulysses into his country. After which splendid entertainments are made, where the celebrated musician and poet, Demodocus, plays and sings to the guests. They next proceed to the games, the race, the wrestling, discus, and k, where Ulysses casts a prodigious length, to the admiration of all the spectators. They return again to the banquet and Demodocus sings the loves of Mars and Venus. Ulysses, after a compliment to the poet, desires him to sing the introduction of the wooden horse into Troy, which subject provoking his tears, Alcinous inquires of his guest his name, parentage, and fortunes. Now fair Aurora lifts her golden ray. And all the ruddy orient flames with day. Alcinous, and the chief, with dawning light. Rose instant from the slumbers of the night. Then to the council seat they bend their way. And fill the shining thrones along the bay. Meanwhile Minerva, in her guardian care. Shoots from the starry vault through fields of air. In form, a herald of the king, she flies. From peer to peer, and thus incessant cries. Nobles and chiefs who rule Phaeacia's states. The king in council your attendance waits. A prince of grace divine your aid implores. O'er unknown seas arrived from unknown shores. She spoke, and sudden with tumultuous sounds. Of thronging multitudes the shore rebounds. At once the seats they fill. And every eye. Glazed, as before some brother of the sky. Pallas with grace divine his form improves. More high he treads, and more enlarged he moves. She sheds celestial bloom, regard to draw. And gives a dignity of mien, to awe. With strength, the future prize of fame to play. And gather all the honors of the day. Then from his glittering throne Alcinous rose. Attend, he cried, while we are will disclose. Your present aid this godlike stranger craves. Tossed by rude tempest through a war of waves. 
perhaps from realms that view the rising day, or nations subject to the western ray. Then grant, what here all sons of wine obtain. For here affliction never pleads in vain. Be chosen youth prepared, expert to try. The vast profound and hid the vessel fly. Launch the tall back, and order every oar. Then in our court indulge the genial hour. Instant, you sailors to this task attend. Swift to the palace, all ye peers ascend. Let none to strangers' honors do disclaim. Be there Demodocus the bard of fame. Taught by the gods to please, when high he sings. The vocal lay, responsive to the strings. Thus spoke the prince, the attending peers obey. In state they move. Alcinous heads the way. Swift to Demodocus the herald flies. At once the sailors to their charge arise. They launch the vessel, and unfurl the sails. And stretch the swelling canvas to the gales. Then to the palace move, a gathering throng. Youth, and white age, tumultuous pour along. Now all accesses to the dome are filled. Eight boars, the choicest of the herd, are killed. Two beeves, twelve fadlings, from the flock they bring. To crown the feast, so wills the bounteous king. The herald now arrives, and guides along. The sacred master of celestial song. Dear to the muse. Who gave his days to flow. With mighty blessings, mixed with mighty woe. With clouds of darkness quenched his visual ray. But gave him skill to raise the lofty lay. High on a radiant throne sublime in state. Encircled by huge multitudes, he sate. With silver shone the throne, his lyre, well strung. To rapturous sounds, at hand puddinous hung. Before his seat a polished table shines. And a full goblet foams with generous wines. His food a herald bore, and now they fed. And now the rage of craving hunger fled. Then, fired by all the muse, aloud he sings. The mighty deeds of demigods and kings. From that fierce wrath the noble song arose. That made Ulysses and Achilles foes. How o'er the feast they doomed the fall of Troy. The stern debate atrides hears with joy. For heaven foretold the contest, when he trod. The marble threshold of the Delphic god. Curious to learn the counsels of the sky. Ere yet he loosed the rage of war on Troy. Touched at the song, Ulysses straight resigned. To soft affliction all his manly mind. Before his eyes the purple vest he drew. Industrious to conceal the falling dew. But when the music paused, he ceased to shed. The flowing tear, and raised his drooping head. And, lifting to the gods a goblet crowned. He poured a pure libation to the ground. Transported with the song, the listening train. Again with loud applause demand the strain. Again Ulysses veiled his pensive head. Again unmanned, a shower of sorrows shed. Concealed he wept. The king observed alone. The silent tear, and heard the secret groan. Then to the bard aloud, O cease to sing. Dumb be thy voice and mute the harmonious string. Enough the feast has pleased, enough the power. Of heavenly song has crowned the genial hour. Incessant in the games your strength display. Contest, ye brave the honors of the day. That pleased the admiring stranger may proclaim. In distant regions the Phaeacian fame. None wield the gauntlet with so dire a sway. Or swifter in the race devour the way. None in the leap spring with so strong a bound. Or firmer, in the wrestling, press the ground. Thus spoke the king, the attending peers obey. In state they move, Alcinous lends the way. His golden lyre Demodocus unstrung. High on a column in the palace hung. And guided by a herald's guardian cares. Majestic to the lists of fame repairs. Now swarms the populace, a countless throng. Youth and bore age, and man drives man along. The games begin, ambitious of the prize. Acronius, Thun, and Eretmius rise. 
the prize Osilus and Primius claim. Ancylus and Pontius, chiefs of fame. Their Proreus, Nauts, Eritreus, appear. And famed Amphilus, Polinius heir. Euryalus, like Mars terrific, rose. When clad in wrath he withers hosts of foes. Nobilides with grace unequalled shone. Or equalled by Laodamus alone. With these came forth Ambicinius the strong. And three brave sons, from great Alcinous sprung. Ranged in a line the ready racers stand. Start from the goal, and vanish o'er the strand. Swift as on wings of winds, upborne they fly. And drifts of rising dust involve the sky. Before the rest, what space the hinds allow. Between the mule and ox, from plow to plow. Clytonius sprung, he winged the rapid way. And bore the unrivalled honors of the day. With fierce embrace the brawny wrestlers join. The conquest, great Euryalus, is thine. Amphilus sprung forward with a bound. Superior in the leap, a length of ground. From Elytria's strong arm the discus flies. And sings with unmatched force along the skies. And Laudam whirls high, with dreadful sway. The gloves of death, victorious in the fray. While thus the peerage in the games contends. In act to speak, Laodamus ascends. O friends, he cries, the stranger seems well skilled. To try the illustrious labors of the field. I deem him brave, then grant the brave man's claim. Invite the hero to his share of fame. What nervous arms he boasts. How firm his tread. His limbs how turned. How broad his shoulders spread. By age unbroke, but all-consuming care. Destroys perhaps the strength that time would spare. Dire is the ocean, dread in all its forms. Man must decay when man contends with storms. Well hast thou spoke, Euryalus replies. Thine is the guest, invite him thou to rise. Swift as the word, advancing from the crowd. He made obeisance, and thus spoke aloud. Vouchsafes the reverend stranger to display. His manly worth, and share the glorious day. Father, arise. For thee thy port proclaims. Expert to conquer in the solemn games. To fame arise. For what more fame can yield. Than the swift race, or conflict of the field. Steal from corroding care one transient day. To glory give the space thou hast to stay. Short is the time, and lo. E'en now the gales. Call thee aboard, and stretch the swelling sails. To whom with sighs Ulysses gave reply. Ah why the ill-suiting pastime must I try. To gloomy care my thoughts alone are free. Ill the gay sorts with troubled hearts agree. Sad from my natal hour my days have ran. A much afflicted, much enduring man. Who, suppliant to the king and peers, implores. A speedy voyage to his native shore. Wise wanders, Laudam, thy erring tongue. The sports of glory to the brave belong. Retorts Euryalus he bears no claim. Among the great, unlike the sons of fame. A wandering merchant he frequents the main. Some mean seafarer in pursuit of gain. Studious of freight, in naval trade well skilled. But dreads the athletic labors of the field. Incensed, Ulysses with a frown replies. O forward to proclaim thy soul unwise. With partial hands the gods their gifts dispense. Some greatly think, some speak with manly sense. Here heaven an elegance of form denies. But wisdom the defect of form supplies. This man with energy of thought controls. And steals with modest violence our souls. He speaks reservedly, but he speaks with force. Nor can one word be changed but for a worse. In public more than mortal he appears. And as he moves, the praising crowd reveres. While others, beauteous as the ethereal kind. The nobler portion went, a knowing mind. In outward show heaven gives thee to excel. But heaven denies the praise of thinking well. 
I'll bear the brave a rude ungoverned tongue. And, youth, my generous soul resents the wrong. Skilled in heroic exercise, I claim. A post of honor with the sons of fame. Such was my boast while vigor crowned my days. Now care surrounds me, and my force decays. Inured a melancholy part to bear. In scenes of death, by tempest and by war. Yet thus by woes impaired, no more I wave. To prove the hero, slander stings the brave. Then gliding forward with a furious bound. He wrenched a rocky fragment from the ground. By far more ponderous, and more huge by far. Then what Phaeacia's sons discharged in air. Fierce from his arm the enormous load he flings. Sonorous through the shaded air it sings. Couched to the earth, tempestuous as it flies. The crowd gaze upward while it cleaves the skies. Beyond all marks, with many a giddy round. Down rushing, it upturns a hill of ground. That instant palace, bursting from a cloud fixed a distinguished mark, and cried aloud. E'en he who, sightless, wants his visual ray, may by his touch alone award the day. Thy signal throw transcends the utmost bound of every champion by a length of ground. Securely bid the strongest of the train arise to throw. The strongest throws in vain. She spoke, and momentary mounts the sky. The friendly voice Ulysses hears with joy. Then thus aloud, elate with decent pride. Rise, ye Phaeacians, try your force, he cried. If with this throw the strongest caster vie. Still, further still, I bid the discus fly. Stand forth, ye champions, who the gauntlet wield. Or ye, the swiftest racers of the field. Stand forth, ye wrestlers, who these pastimes grace. I wield the gauntlet, and I run the race. In such heroic games I yield to none. Or yield to brave Laodamus alone. Shall I with brave Laodamus contend? A friend is sacred, and I style him friend. Ungenerous were the man, and base of heart. Who takes the kind, and pays the ungrateful part. Chiefly the man, in foreign realms confined. Base to his friend, to his own interest blind. All, all your heroes I this day defy. Give me a man that we our might may try. Expert in every art, I boast the skill. To give the feathered arrow wings to kill. Should a whole host at once discharge the bow. My well-aimed shaft with death prevents the foe. Alone superior in the field of Troy. Great Philoctetes taught the shaft to fly. From all the sons of earth unrivaled praise. I justly claim. But yield to better days. To those famed days when great Alcides rose. And Eurydice, who bade the gods be foes. Vain Eurydice, whose art became his crime. Swept from the earth, he perished in his prime. Sudden the irremeable way he trod. Who boldly durst defy the boyer god. In fighting fields as far the spear I throw. As flies an arrow from the well-drawn bow. Soul in the race the contest I decline. Stiff are my weary joints, and I resign. By storms and hunger worn. Age well may fail. When storms and hunger doth at once assail. Abashed, the numbers hear the godlike man. Till great Alcinous mildly thus began. Well hast thou spoke, and well thy generous tongue. With decent pride refutes a public wrong. Warm are thy words, but warm without offense. Fear only fools, secure in men of sense. Thy worth is known. Then hear our country's claim. And bear to heroes our heroic fame. In distant realms our glorious deeds display. Repeat them frequent in the genial day. When, blessed with ease, thy woes and wanderings end. Teach them thy consort, bid thy sons attend. How, loved of Jove, he crowned our sires with praise. How we their offspring dignify our race. Let other realms the deathful gauntlet wield. Or boast the glories of the athletic field. 
we in the course unrivaled speed display. Or through cerulean billows plow the way. To dress, to dance, to sing, our soul delight. The feast or bath by day, and love by night. Rise, then, ye skilled in measures, let him bear. Your fame to men that breathe a distant air. And faithful say, to you the powers belong. To race, to sail, to dance, to chant the song. But, herald, to the palace swift repair. And the soft lyre to grace our pastimes bear. Swift at the word, obedient to the king. The herald flies the tuneful lyre to bring. Up rose nine seniors, chosen to survey. The future games, the judges of the day. With instant care they mark a spacious round. And level for the dance the allotted ground. The herald bears the lyre, intent to play. The bard advancing meditates the lay. Skilled in the dance, tall youths, a blooming band. Graceful before the heavenly minstrel stand. Light bounding from the earth, at once they rise. Their feet half viewless quiver in the skies. Ulysses gazed. Astonished to survey. The glancing splendors as their sandals play. Meantime the bard, alternate to the strings. The loves of Mars and Cytherea sings. How the stern god, enamored with her charms. Clasped the gay panting goddess in his arms. By bribe seduced. And how the sun, whose eye. Views the broad heavens, disclosed the lawless joy. Stung to the soul, indignant through the skies. To his black forge vindictive Vulcan flies. Arrived, his sinewy arms incessant place. The eternal anvil on the massy base. A wondrous net he labors, to betray. The wanton lovers, as entwined they lay. Indissolubly strong. Then instant bears. To his immortal dome the finished snares. Above, below, around, with art to spread. The sure enclosure folds the genial bed. Whose texture even the search of gods deceives. Thin as the filmy threads the spider weaves. Then. As withdrawing from the starry bowers. He feigns a journey to the Lemnian shores. His favorite isle, observant Mars descries. His wished receives, and to the goddess flies. He glows, he burns, the fair-haired queen of love. Descends, smooth gliding from the courts of Jove. Gay blooming in full charms, her hand he pressed. With eager joy, and with a sigh addressed. Come, my beloved. And taste the soft delights. Come, to repose the genial bed invites. Thy absent spouse, neglectful of thy charms. Prefers his barbarous Scythians to thy arms. Then, nothing loath, the enamored fair he led. And sunk transported on the conscious bed. Down rushed the toils, inwrapping as they lay. The careless lovers in their wanton play. In vain they strive, the entangling snares deny. Inextricably firm, the power to fly. Warned by the god who sheds the golden day. Stern Vulcan homeward treads the starry way. Arrived, he sees, he grieves, with rage he burns. Full horribly he roars, his voice all heaven returns. O Jove, he cried, O all ye powers above. See the lewd dalliance of the queen of love. Me, awkward me, she scorns, and yields her charms. To that fair lecher, the strong god of arms. If I am lame, that stain my natal hour. By fate imposed. Such me my parent bore. Why was I born? See how the wanton lies. O sight tormenting to a husband's eyes. But yet, I trust, this once he and Mars would fly. His fair one's arms, he thinks her, once, too nigh. But there remain, ye guilty, in my power. Till Jove refunds his shameless daughter's dower. Too dear I prized a fair enchanting face. Beauty unchaste is beauty in disgrace. Meanwhile the gods the dome of Vulcan throng. Apollo comes, and Neptune comes along. With these gay Hermes trod the starry plain. 
but modesty withheld the goddess train. All heaven beholds, imprisoned as they lie. An unextinguished laughter shakes the sky. Then mutual, thus they spoke, behold on wrong. Swift vengeance waits, and art subdues the strong. Dwells there a god on all the Olympian brow. More swift than Mars, and more than Vulcan slow. Yet Vulcan conquers, and the god of arms. Must pay the penalty for lawless charms. Thus serious they. But he who gilds the skies. The gay Apollo, thus to Hermes cries. Wouldst thou enchained like Mars, O Hermes, lie. And bear the shame like Mars to share the joy. O envied shame. The smiling youth rejoined Winky Face. And thrice the chains, and thrice more firmly bind. Gaze all ye gods, and every goddess gaze. Yet eager would I bless the sweet disgrace. Loud laugh the rest, e'en Neptune laughs aloud. Yet sues importunate to loose the god. And free, he cries, O Vulcan. Free from shame. Thy captives, I ensure the penal claim. Will Neptune, Vulcan then, the faithless trust? He suffers who gives surety for the unjust. But say, if that lewd scandal of the sky. To liberty restored, perfidious fly. Say, wilt thou bear the mulct? He instant cries. The mulct I bear, if Mars perfidious flies. To whom appeased, no more I urge delay. When Neptune sues, my part is to obey. Then to the snares his force the god applies. They burst. And Mars to Thrace indignant flies. To the soft Cyprian shores the goddess moves. To visit Paphos and her blooming groves. Where to the power an hundred altars rise. And breathing odors scent the balmy skies. Concealed she bathes in consecrated bowers. The graces unguents shed, ambrosial showers. Unguents that charm the gods. She last assumes. Her wondrous robes, and full the goddess blooms. Thus sung the bard, Ulysses hears with joy. And loud applauses read the vaulted sky. Then to the sports his sons the king commands. Each blooming youth before the monarch stands. In dance unmatched. A wondrous ball is brought. The work of Polypus, divinely wrought. This youth with strength enormous bids it fly. And bending backward whirls it to the sky. His brother, springing with an active bound. At distance intercepts it from the ground. The ball dismissed, in dance they skim the strand. Turn and return, and scarce imprint the sand. The assembly gazes with astonished eyes. And sends in shouts applauses to the skies. Then thus Ulysses, happy king, whose name. The brightest shines in all the roles of fame. In subjects happy with surprise I gaze. Thy praise was just, their skill transcends thy praise. Pleased with his people's fame, the monarch hears. And thus benevolent accosts the peers. Since wisdom's sacred guidance he pursues. Give to the stranger guest a stranger's dues. Twelve princes in our realm dominion share. O'er whom supreme. Imperial power I bear. Bring gold, a pledge of love, a talent bring. A vest, a robe, and imitate your king. Be swift to give, that he this night may share. The social feast of joy, with joy sincere. And thou, Euryalus, redeem thy wrong. A generous heart repairs a slanderous tongue. The assenting peers, obedient to the king. In haste their heralds send the gifts to bring. Then thus Euryalus, O prince, whose sway. Rules this blessed realm, repentant I obey. Be his this sword, whose blade of brass displays. A ruddy gleam, whose hilt a silver blaze. Whose ivory sheath, inwrought with curious pride. Adds graceful terror to the wearer's side. He said, and to his hand the sword consigned. And if, he cried, my words affect thy mind. Far from thy mind those words, ye whirlwinds, bear. And scatter them, ye storms, in empty air. 
crown, O ye heavens, with joy his peaceful hours. And grant him to his spouse, and native shores. And blessed be thou, my friend, Ulysses cries. Crown him with every joy, ye favoring skies. To thy calm hours continued peace afford. And never, never mayst thou want this sword. He said, and o'er his shoulder flung the blade. Now o'er the earth ascends the evening shade. The precious gifts the illustrious heralds bear. And to the court the embodied peers repair. Before the queen Alcinous sons unfold. The vests, the robes, and heaps of shining gold. Then to the radiant thrones they move in state. Aloft, the king in pomp imperial sate. Thence to the queen, O partner of our reign. O soul beloved. Command thy menial train. A polished chest and stately robes to bear. And healing waters for the bath prepare. That, bathed, our guest may bid his sorrows cease. Hear the sweet song, and taste the feast in peace. A bowl that flames with gold, of wondrous frame. Ourself we give, memorial of our name. To raise in offerings to Almighty Jove. And every god that treads the courts above. Instant the queen, observant of the king. Commands her train a spacious vase to bring. The spacious vase with ample streams suffice. Heap the high wood, and bid the flames arise. The flames climb round it with a fierce embrace. The fuming waters bubble o'er the blaze. Herself the chest prepares. In order rolled. The robes, the vests are ranged, and heaps of gold. And adding a rich dress inwrought with art. A gift expressive of her bounteous heart. Thus spoke to Ithacus, to guard with bands. Insolvable these gifts, thy care demands. Lest, in thy slumbers on the watery main, the hand of rapine make our bounty vain. Then bending with full force around he rolled. A labyrinth of bands in fold on fold. Closed with Circean art. A train attends. Around the bath, the bath the king ascends. Untasted joy, since that disastrous hour. He sailed ill-fated from Calypso's bower. Where, happy as the gods that range the sky. He feasted every sense with every joy. He bathes. The damsels with officious toil. Shed sweets, shed unguents, in a shower of oil. Then o'er his limbs a gorgeous robe he spreads. And to the feast magnificently treads. Full where the dome its shining valves expands. Nausicaa blooming as a goddess stands. With wondering eyes the hero she surveyed. And graceful thus began the royal maid. Hail, godlike stranger! And when heaven restores. To thy fond wish thy long-expected shores. This ever grateful in remembrance bear. To me thou owest, to me, the vital heir. O royal maid! Ulysses straight returns. Whose worth the splendors of thy race adorns. So may dread Jove, whose arm in vengeance forms. The writ hen bolt, and blackens heaven with storms. Restore me safe, through weary wanderings tossed. To my dear country's ever-pleasing coast. As while the spirit in this bosom glows. To thee, my goddess, I address my vows. My life, thy gift I boast. He said, and sate. Fast by Alcinous on a throne of state. Now each partakes the feast, the wine prepares. Portions the food, and each his portion shares. The bard a herald guides. The gazing throng. Pay low obeisance as he moves along. Beneath a sculptured arch he sits enthroned. The peers encircling form an awful round. Then, from the chine, Ulysses carves with art. Delicious food, an honorary part. This, let the master of the lyre receive. A pledge of love, tis all a wretch can give. Lives there a man beneath the spacious skies. Who sacred honors to the bard denies. The muse the bard inspires, exalts his mind. The muse indulgent loves the harmonious kind. 
the herald to his hand the charge conveys. Not fond of flattery, nor unpleased with praise. When now the rage of hunger was allayed. Thus to the lyrist wise Ulysses said. O oh, more than man! Thy soul the muse inspires. Or Phoebus animates with all his fires. For who, by Phoebus uninformed, could know? The woe of Greece, and sing so well the woe. Just to the tale, as present at the fray. Or taught the labors of the dreadful day. The song recalls past horrors to my eyes. And bids proud Aelian from her ashes rise. Once more harmonious strike the sounding string. The Apian fabric, framed by Pallas, sing. How stern Ulysses, furious to destroy. With latent heroes sacked imperial Troy. If faithful thou record the tale of fame. The God himself inspires thy breast with flame. And mine shall be the task henceforth to raise. In every land thy monument of praise. Full of the God he raised his lofty strain. How the Greeks rushed tumultuous to the main. How blazing tents illumined half the skies. While from the shores the winged navy flies. How Ian and Ilion's walls, in deathful bands. Came the stern Greeks by Troy's assisting hands. All Troy upheaved the steed. Of differing mind. Various the Trojans counseled, part consigned. The monster to the sword, part sentence gave. To plunge it headlong in the whelming wave. The unwise award to lodge it in the towers. An offering sacred to the immortal powers. The unwise prevail, they lodge it in the walls. And by the gods decree proud Aelian falls. Destruction enters in the treacherous wood. And vengeful slaughter. Fierce for human blood. He sung the Greeks stern issuing from the steed. How Aelian burns, how all her fathers bleed. How to thy dome, Deiphobus. Ascends. The Spartan king, how Ithacus attends. Horrid as Mars. And how with dire alarms. He fights, subdues, for Pallas strings his arms. Thus while he sung, Ulysses' griefs renew. Tears bathe his cheeks. And tears the ground bedew. As some fond matron views in mortal fight. Her husband falling in his country's right. Frantic through clashing swords she runs, she flies. As ghastly pale he groans, and faints, and dies. Close to his breast she grovels on the ground. And bathes with floods of tears the gaping wound. She cries, she shrieks, the fierce insulting foe. Relentless mocks her violence of woe. To chains condemned, as wildly she deplores. A widow, and a slave on foreign shores. So from the sluices of Ulysses' eyes. Fast fell the tears, and sighs succeeded sighs. Concealed he grieved, the king observed alone. The silent tear, and heard the secret groan. Then to the bard aloud, O cease to sing. Dumb be thy voice, and mute the tuneful string. To every note his tears responsive flow. And his great heart heaves with tumultuous woe. Thy lay too deeply moves, then cease the lay. And o'er the banquet every heart be gay. This social rite demands, for him the sails. Floating in air. Invite the impelling gales. His are the gifts of love, the wise and good. Receive the stranger as a brother's blood. But, friend, discover faithful what I crave. Artful concealment ill becomes the brave. Say what thy birth, and what the name you bore. Imposed by parents in the natal hour. For from the natal hour distinctive names. One common right, the great and lowly claims. Say from what city, from what regions tossed. And what inhabitants those regions boast. So shalt thou instant reach the realm assigned. In wondrous ships, self-moved, instinct with mind. No helm secures their course, no pilot guides. Like man intelligent, they plough the tides. Conscious of every coast, and every bay. That lies beneath the sun's all-seeing ray. Though clouds and darkness veil the encumbered sky. 
Fearless through darkness and through clouds they fly. Though tempests rage, though rolls the swelling main. The seas may roll, the tempests rage in vain. E'en the stern God that o'er the waves presides. Safe as they pass, and safe repass the tides. With fury burns. While careless they convey. Promiscuous every guest to every bay. These ears have heard my royal sire disclose. A dreadful story, big with future woes. How Neptune raged, and how, by his command. Firm rooted in a surge a ship should stand. A monument of wrath, how mound on mound. Should bury these proud towers beneath the ground. But this the gods may frustrate or fulfill. As suits the purpose of the eternal will. But say through what waste regions hast thou strayed. What customs noted, and what coasts surveyed. Possessed by wild barbarians fierce in arms. Or men whose bosom tender pity warms. Say why the fate of Troy awaked thy cares. Why heaved thy bosom, and why flowed thy tears. Just are the ways of heaven, from heaven proceed. The woes of man. Heaven doomed the Greeks to bleed. A theme of future song. Say, then, if slain. Some dear loved brother pressed the Phrygian plain. Or bled some friend, who bore a brother's part. And claimed by merit, not by blood, the heart. Book 9. Argument. The Adventures of the Cycons, Lotophagi and Cyclops. Ulysses begins the relation of his adventures, how, after the destruction of Troy, he with his companions made an incursion on the Cycons, by whom they were repulsed. And, meeting with a storm, were driven to the coast of the Lotophagi. From there they sailed to the land of the Cyclops, whose manners and situation are particularly characterized. The giant Polyphemus and his cave described. The usage Ulysses and his companions met with there, and, lastly, the method and artifice by which he escaped. Then thus Ulysses, thou whom first in sway. As first in virtue, these thy realms obey. How sweet the products of a peaceful reign! The heaven-taught poet and enchanting strain. The well-filled palace, the perpetual feast. A land rejoicing, and a people blessed. How goodly seems it ever to employ. Man's social days in union and in joy. The plenteous hoard high-heaped with cates divine. And o'er the foaming bowl the laughing wine. Amid these joys, why seals thy mind to know? The unhappy series of a wanderer's woe. Remembrance sad, whose image to review. Alas, I must open all my wounds anew. And oh, what first, what last shall I relate? Of woes unnumbered sent by heaven and fate. Know first the man, though now a wretch distressed. Who hopes thee, monarch, for his future guest? Behold Ulysses. No ignoble name. Earth sounds my wisdom and high heaven my fame. My native soil is Ithaca the fair. Where high Neridus waves his woods in air. Delicium, same and Zaxinthus crowned. With shady mountains spread their isles around. These to the north and night's dark regions run. Those to Aurora and the rising sun. Low lies our isle, yet blessed in fruitful stores. Strong are her sons, though rocky are her shores. And none, are none no lovely to my sight. Of all the lands that heaven o'er spreads with light. In vain Calypso long constrained my stay. With sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. With all her charms as vainly Circe strove. And added magic to secure my love. In pomps or joys, the palace or the grot. My country's image never was forgot. My absent parents rose before my sight. And distant lay contentment and delight. Here, then, the woes which mighty Jove ordained. To wait my passage from the Trojan land. The winds from Ilion to the Sycon's shore. Beneath cold Ismarus our vessels bore. We boldly landed on the hostile place. And sacked the city, and destroyed the race. Their wives made captive, their possessions shared. 
and every soldier found a like reward. I then advised to fly. Not so the rest. Who stayed to revel, and prolong the feast. The fatted sheep and sable bulls they slay. And bulls flow round, and riot wastes the day. Meantime the Sycons, to their holds retired. Call on the Sycons, with new fury fired. With early morn the gathered country swarms. And all the continent is bright with arms. Thick as the budding leaves or rising flowers. Or spread the land, when spring descends in showers. All expert soldiers, skilled on foot to dare. Or from the bounding courser urge the war. Now fortune changes, so the fates ordain. Our hour was come to taste our share of pain. Close at the ships the bloody fight began. Wounded they wound, and man expires on man. Long as the morning sun increasing bright. O'er heaven's pure azure spreads the glowing light. Promiscuous death the form of war confounds. Each adverse battle gored with equal wounds. But when his evening wheels o'erhung the main. Then conquest crowned the fierce Siconian train. Six brave companions from each ship we lost. The rest escape in haste, and quit the coast. With sails outspread we fly the unequal strife. Sad for their loss, but joyful of our life. Yet as we fled, our fellows' rights we paid. And thrice we called on each unhappy shade. Meanwhile the God, whose hand the thunder forms, drives clouds on clouds, and blackens heaven with storms. Wide o'er the waste the rage of Boreas sweeps. And night rushed headlong on the shaded deeps. Now here, now there, the giddy ships are born. And all the rattling shrouds in fragments torn. We furled the sail, we plied the laboring oar. Took down our masts, and rowed our ships to shore. Two tedious days and two long nights we lay. Er watched thee and battered in the naked bay. But the third morning when Aurora brings. We rear the masts, we spread the canvas wings. Refreshed and careless on the deck reclined. We sit, and trust the pilot and the wind. Then to my native country had I sailed. But, the cape doubled, adverse winds prevailed. Strong was the tide, which by the northern blast. Impelled, our vessels on Sathira cast. Nine days our fleet the uncertain tempest bore. Far in wide ocean, and from sight of shore. The tenth we touched, by various errors tossed. The land of lotus and the flowery coast. We climbed the beach, and springs of water found. Then spread our hasty banquet on the ground. Three men were sent, deputed from the crew. A herald one, the dubious coast to view. And learn what habitants possessed the place. They went, and found a hospitable race. Not prone to ill, nor strange to foreign guest. They eat, they drink, and nature gives the feast. The trees around them all their food produce. Lotus the name, divine, nectarious juice. Thence called loophagi, which whose tastes. Insatiate riots in the sweet repasts. Nor other home, nor other care intends. But quits his house, his country, and his friends. The three we sent, from off the enchanting ground. We dragged reluctant, and by force we bound. The rest in haste forsook the pleasing shore. Or, the charm tasted, had returned no more. Now placed in order on their banks, they sweep. The sea's smooth face, and cleave the hoary deep. With heavy hearts we labor through the tide. To coasts unknown, and oceans yet untried. The land of Cyclops first, a savage kind. Nor tamed by manners, nor by laws confined. Untaught to plant, to turn the glebe, and sow. They all their products to free nature owe. The soil, untilled, a ready harvest yields. With wheat and barley wave the golden fields. Spontaneous wines from weighty clusters pour. And Jove descends in each prolific shower. By these no statues and no rites are known. No council held, no monarch fills the throne. But high on hills, 
or airy cliffs, they dwell. Or deep in caves whose entrance leads to hell. Each rules his race, his neighbor not his care. Heedless of others, to his own severe. Opposed to the Cyclopean coast, there lay. An isle, whose hill their subject field survey. Its name Lakia, crowned with many a grove. Where savage goats through pathless thickets rove. No needy mortals here, with hunger bold. Or wretched hunters through the wintry cold. Pursue their flight. But leave them safe to bound. From hill to hill, o'er all the desert ground. Nor knows the soil to feed the fleecy care. Or feels the labors of the crooked share. But uninhabited, untilled, unsown. It lies, and breeds the bleeding goat alone. For there no vessel with vermilion poor. Or bark of traffic, glides from shore to shore. The rugged race of savages, unskilled. The seas to traverse, or the ships to build. Gaze on the coast, nor cultivate the soil. Unlearned in all the industrious art of toil. Yet here all produces and all plants abound. Sprung from the fruitful genius of the ground. Fields waving high with heavy crops are seen. And vines that flourish in eternal green. Refreshing meads along the murmuring main. And fountains streaming down the fruitful plain. A port there is, enclosed on either side. Where ships may rest, unanchored and untied. Till the glad mariners incline to sail. And the sea whitens with the rising gale. High at the head, from out the caverned rock. In living rills a gushing fountain broke. Around it, and above, forever green. The busy alders formed a shady scene. Hither some favoring god, beyond our thought. Through all surrounding shade our navy brought. For gloomy night descended on the main. Nor glimmered Phoebe in the ethereal plain. But all unseen the clouded island lay. And all unseen the surge and rolling sea. Till safe we anchored in the sheltered bay. Our sails we gathered. Cast our cables o'er. And slept secure along the sandy shore. Soon as again the rosy morning shone. Revealed the landscape and the scene unknown. With wonder seized, we view the pleasing ground. And walk delighted, and expatiate round. Roused by the woodland nymphs at early dawn. The mountain goats came bounding o'er the lawn. In haste our fellows to the ships repair. For arms and weapons of the sylvan war. Straight in three squadrons all our crew we part. And bend the bow, or wing the missile dart. The bounteous gods afford a copious prey. And nine fat goats each vessel bears away. The royal bark had ten. Our ships complete. We thus supplied, for twelve were all the fleet. Here, till the setting sun rolled down the light. We sat indulging in the genial rite. Nor wines were wanting, those from ample jars. We drained, the prize of our Siconian wars. The land of Cyclops lay in prospect near. The voice of goats and bleeding flocks we hear. And from their mountains rising smokes appear. Now sunk the sun, and darkness covered o'er. The face of things, along the sea beat shore. Satiate we slept, but, when the sacred dawn. Arising glittered o'er the dewy lawn. I called my fellows, and these words addressed. My dear associates. Here indulge your rest. While, with my single ship, adventurous, I. Go forth, the manners of you men to try. Whether a race unjust, of barbarous might. Rude and unconscious of a stranger's right. Or such who harbor pity in their breast. Revere the gods, and succor the distressed. This said, I climbed my vessel's lofty side. My train obeyed me, and the ship untied. In order seated on their banks, they sweep. Neptune's smooth face, and cleave the yielding deep. When to the nearest verge of land we drew. Fast by the sea a lonely cave we view. High, and with darkening laurels covered o'er. Where sheep and goats lay slumbering round the shore. 
Near this, a fence of marble from the rock. Brown with o'erratching pine and spreading oak. A giant shepherd here his flock maintains. Far from the rest, and solitary reigns. In shelter thick of horrid shade reclined. And gloomy mischiefs labor in his mind. A form enormous. Far unlike the race. Of human birth, in stature, or in face. As some lone mountain's monstrous growth he stood. Crowned with rough thickets, and a nodding wood. I left my vessel at the point of land. And close to guard it, gave our crew command. With only twelve, the boldest and the best. I seek the adventure, and forsake the rest. Then took a goatskin filled with precious wine. The gift of Marin of Evanthius line. The priest of Phoebus at the Ismarian shrine. In sacred shade his honored mansion stood. Amidst Apollo's consecrated wood. Him, and his house, heaven moved my mind to save. And costly presents in return he gave. Seven golden talents to perfection wrought. A silver bowl that held a copious draught. And twelve large vessels of unmingled wine. Mellifluous, undecaying, and divine. Which now, some ages from his race concealed. The hoary sire in gratitude revealed. Such was the wine, to quench whose fervent steam. Scarce twenty measures from the living stream. To cool one cup sufficed, the goblet crowned. Breathed aromatic fragrances around. Of this an ample vase we heaved aboard. And brought another with provisions stored. My soul foreboded I should find the bower. Of some fell monster, fierce with barbarous power. Some rustic wretch, who lived in heaven's despite. Contemning laws, and trampling on the right. The cave we found, but vacant all within. His flock the giant tended on the green. But round the grot we gaze. And all we view. In order ranged our admiration drew. The bending shelves with loads of cheeses pressed. The folded flocks each separate from the rest. The larger here, and there the lesser lambs. The new fallen young here bleeding for their dams. The kid distinguished from the lambkin lies. The cavern echoes with responsive cries. Capacious chargers all around were laid. Full pails, and vessels of the milking trade. With fresh provisions hence our fleet to store. My friends advise me, and to quit the shore. Or drive a flock of sheep and goats away. Consult our safety, and put off to sea. Their wholesome counsel rashly I declined. Curious to view the man of monstrous kind. And try what social rights a savage lends. Dire rights, alas. And fatal to my friends. Then first a fire we kindle, and prepare. For his return with sacrifice and prayer. The loaden shelves afford us full repast. We sit expecting. Lo! He comes at last. Near half a forest on his back he bore. And cast the ponderous burden at the door. It thundered as it fell. We trembled then. And sought the deep recesses of the den. New driven before him through the arching rock. Came tumbling, heaps on heaps, the unnumbered flock. Big uttered ewes, and goats of female kind. The males were penned in outward courts behind. Then, heaved on high, a rock's enormous weight. To the cave's mouth he rolled, and closed the gate. Scarce twenty four-wheeled cars, compact and strong. The massy load could bear, or roll along. He next betakes him to his evening cares. And, sitting down, to milk his flocks prepares. Of half their udders eases first the dams. Then to the mother's teeth submits the lambs. Half the white stream to hardening cheese be pressed. And high in wicker baskets heaped, the rest. Reserved in bowls, supplied his nightly feast. His labor done, he fired the pile, that gave. A sudden blaze, and lighted all the cave. We stand discovered by the rising fires. Askance the giant glares, and thus inquires. What are ye, guests? On what adventure, say? 
Thus far ye wander through the watery way. Pirates perhaps, who seek through seas unknown. The lives of others, and expose your own. His voice like thunder through the cavern sounds. My bold companions thrilling fear confounds. Appalled at sight of more than mortal man. At length, with heart recovered, I began. From Troy's famed fields, sad wanderers o'er the main. Behold the relics of the Grecian train. Through various seas, by various perils tossed. And forced by storms, unwilling on your coast. Far from our destined course and native land. Such was our fate, and such high Jove's command. Nor what we are befits us to disclaim. A tried's friends, in arms a mighty name. Who taught proud Troy and all her sons to bow. Victors of late, but humble suppliants now. Lo at thy knee thy succor we implore. Respect us, human, and relieve us, poor. At least, some hospitable gift bestow. Tis what the happy to the unhappy owe. Tis what the gods require, those gods revere. The poor and stranger are their constant care. To Jove their cause, and their revenge belongs. He wanders with them, and he feels their wrongs. Fools that ye are, the savage thus replies. His inward fury blazing at his eyes. Or strangers, distant far from our abodes. To bid me reverence or regard the gods. Know then, we Cyclops are a race above. Those airbred people, and their goat nursed Jove. And learn, our power proceeds with thee and thine. Not as he wills, but as ourselves incline. But answer, the good ship that brought ye o'er. Where lies she anchored? Near or off the shore? Thus he. His meditated fraud I find. Versed in the turns of various humankind. And, cautious thus, against a dreadful rock. Fast by your shore the gallant vessel broke. Scarce with these few I escaped. Of all my train. Whom angry Neptune, whelmed beneath the main. The scattered wreck the winds blew back again. He answered with his deed, his bloody hand. Snatched too, unhappy. Of my martial band. And dashed like dogs against the stony floor. The pavement swims with brains and mingled gore. Torn limb from limb, he spreads his horrid feast. And fierce devours it like a mountain beast. He sucks the marrow, and the blood he drains. Nor entrails, flesh, nor solid bone remains. We see the death from which we cannot move. And humbled groan beneath the hand of Jove. His ample maw with human carnage filled. A milky deluge next the giant swilled. Then stretched in length o'er half the caverned rock. Lay senseless, and supine, amidst the flock. To seize the time, and with a sudden wound. To fix the slumbering monster to the ground. My soul impels me. And in act I stand. To draw the sword. But wisdom held my hand. A deed so rash had finished all our fate. No mortal forces from the lofty gate. Could roll the rock. In hopeless grief we lay. And sigh, expecting the return of day. Now did the rosy fingered morn arise. And shed her sacred light along the skies. He wakes, he lights the fire, he milks the dams. And to the mother's teats submits the lambs. The task thus finished of his morning hours. Two more he snatches, murders, and devours. Then pleased, and whistling, drives his flock before. Removes the rocky mountain from the door. And shuts again, with equal ease disposed. As a light quiver's lid is op-ed and closed. His giant voice the echoing region fills. His flocks, obedient, spread o'er all the hills. Thus left behind, even in the last despair. I thought, devised, and Pallas heard my prayer. Revenge, and doubt, and caution, worked my breast. But this of many counsels seemed the best. The monster's club within the cave I spied. A tree of stateliest growth, and yet undried. Green from the wood, 
of height and bulk so vast. The largest ship might claim it for a mast. This shortened of its top, I gave my train. A fathom's length, to shape it and to plane. The narrower end I sharpened to a spire. Whose point we hardened with the force of fire. And hid it in the dust that strewed the cave. Then to my few companions, bold and brave. Proposed, who first the venturous deed should try. In the broad orbit of his monstrous eye. To plunge the brand and twirl the pointed wood. When slumber next should tame the man of blood. Just as I wished, the lots were cast on four. Myself the fifth. We stand and wait the hour. He comes with evening, all his fleecy flock. Before him march, and pour into the rock. Not one, or male or female, stayed behind. So fortune chanced, or so some god designed. Then heaving high the stone's unwieldy weight. He rolled it on the cave and closed the gate. First down he sits, to milk the woolly dams. And then permits their udder to the lambs. Next seized two wretches more, and headlong cast. Brained on the rock, his second dire repast. I then approached him reeking with their gore. And held the brimming goblet foaming o'er. Cyclop. Since human flesh has been thy feast. Now drain this goblet, potent to digest. Know hence what treasures in our ship we lost. And what rich liquors other climates boast. We to thy shore the precious freight shall bear. If home thou send us and vouchsafe to spare. But oh! Thus furious, thirsting thus for gore. The sons of men shall ne'er approach thy shore. And never shalt thou taste this nectar more. He heard, he took, and pouring down his throat. Delighted, swilled the large luxurious draught. More. Give me more, he cried the boon be thine. Who are thou art that bears celestial wine? Declare thy name, not mortal is this juice. Such as the unblessed Cyclopean climes produce. Though sure our vine the largest cluster yields. And Jove's scorned thunder serves to drench our fields. But this descended from the blessed abodes. A rill of nectar, streaming from the gods. He said, and greedy grasped the heady bowl. Thrice drained, and poured the deluge on his soul. His sense lay covered with the dozy fume. While thus my fraudful speech I reassume. Thy promised boon, O Cyclop. Now I claim. And plead my title, Noman is my name. By that distinguished from my tender years. Tis what my parents call me, and my peers. The giant then, our promised grace receive. The hospitable boon we mean to give. When all thy wretched crew have felt my power. Noman shall be the last I will devour. He said, then nodding with the fumes of wine. Drooped his huge head, and snoring lay supine. His neck obliquely o'er his shoulders hung. Pressed with the weight of sleep that tames the strong. There belched the mingled streams of wine and blood. And human flesh, his indigested food. Sudden I stir the embers, and inspire. With animating breath the seeds of fire. Each drooping spirit with bold words repair. And urged my train the dreadful deed to dare. The stake now glowed beneath the burning bed. Green as it was, and sparkled fiery red. Then forth the vengeful instrument I bring. With beating hearts my fellows form a ring. Urged by some present god, they swift let fall. The pointed torment on his visual ball. Myself above them from a rising ground. Guide the sharp stake, and twirl it round and round. As when a shipwright stands his workman o'er. Who ply the wimble, some huge beam to bore. Urged on all hands, it nimbly spins about. The grain deep piercing till it scoops it out. In his broad eye he whirls the fiery wood. From the pierced pupil spouts the boiling blood. Singed are his brows, the scorching lids grow black. The jelly bubbles, and the fibers crack. And as when armorers temper in the ford. The keen-edged pole axe, or the shining sword. 
The red-hot metal hisses in the lake. Thus in his eyeball hissed the plunging stake. He sends a dreadful groan, the rocks around. Through all their inmost winding caves resound. Scared we recoiled. Forth with frantic hand. He tore and dashed on earth and gory brand. Then calls the cyclops, all that round him dwell. With voice like thunder, and a direful yell. From all their dens the one-eyed race repair. From rift rocks, and mountains bleak in air. All haste assembled, at his well-known roar. Inquire the cause, and crowd the cavern door. What hurts thee, Polypheme? What strange affright? Thus breaks our slumbers, and disturbs the night. Does any mortal, in the unguarded hour, of sleep, oppress thee, or by fraud or power, or thieves insidious thy fair flock surprise? Thus they, the cyclop from his den replies. Friends, no man kills me. No man in the hour. Of sleep, oppresses me with fraudful power. If no man hurt thee, but the hand divine. Inflict disease, it fits thee to resign. To Jove or to thy father Neptune pray. The brethren cried, and instant strode away. Joy touched my secret soul and conscious heart. Pleased with the effect of conduct and of art. Meantime the cyclop, raging with his wound, Spreads his wide arms, and searches round and round. At last, the stone removing from the gate, With hands extended in the midst he sate, And searched each passing sheep, and fell it o'er, Secure to seize us ere we reached the door. Such as his shallow wit he deemed was mine, but secret I revolved the deep design. Twas for our lives my laboring bosom wrought. Each scheme I turned, and sharpened every thought. This way and that I cast to save my friends. Till one resolve my varying counsel ends. Strong were the rams, with native purple fare. Well fed, and largest of the fleecy care. These, three and three, with osier bands we tied. The twining bands the cyclops' bed supplied. The midmost bore a man, the outward too. Secured each side, so bound we all the crew. One ram remained, the leader of the flock. In his deep fleece my grasping hands I lock. And fast beneath, in woolly curls and wove. Their cling implicit. And confide in Jove. When rosy morning glimmered o'er the dales. He drove to pasture all the lusty males. The ewes still folded, with distended thighs. Unmilked lay bleeding in distressful cries. But heedless of those cares, with anguish stung. He felt their fleeces as they passed along. Fool that he was, and let them safely go. All unsuspecting of their freight below. The master ram at last approached the gate. Charged with his wool, and with Ulysses' fate. Him while he passed, the monster blind bespoke. What makes my ram the lag of all the flock? First thou wert wont to crop the flowery mead. First to the field and river's bank to lead. And first with stately step at evening hour. Thy fleecy fellows usher to their bower. Now far the last, with pensive pace and slow. Thou movest, as conscious of thy master's woe. Sayest thou these lids that now unfold in vain? The deed of Noman and his wicked train. Oh! Didst thou feel for thy afflicted lord? And would but fate the power of speech afford? Soon mightst thou tell me, where in secret here. The dastard lurks, all trembling with his fear. Swung round and round, and dashed from rock to rock. His battered brains should on the pavement smoke. No ease, no pleasure my sad heart receives. While such a monster as vile Noman lives. The giant spoke, and through the hollow rock. Dismissed the ram, the father of the flock. No sooner freed, and through the enclosure passed. First I release myself, my fellows last. Fat sheep and goats in throngs we drive before. And reach our vessel on the winding shore. With joy the sailors view their friends returned. And hail us living whom as dead they mourned. 
big tiers of transport stand in every eye. I check their fondness, and command to fly. Aboard in haste they heave the wealthy sheep. And snatch their oars, and rush into the deep. Now off at sea, and from the shallows clear. As far as human voice could reach the ear. With taunts the distant giant I accost. Hear me, O Cyclop. Here, ungracious host. Twas on no coward, no ignoble slave. Thou meditatest thy meal in yonder cave. But one, the vengeance faded from above. Doomed to inflict, the instrument of Jove. Thy barbarous breach of hospitable bands. The god, the god revenges by my hands. These words the cyclops burning rage provoke. From the tall hill he rends a pointed rock. High o'er the billows flew the massy load. And near the ship came thundering on the flood. It almost brushed the helm, and fell before. The whole sea shook, and refluent beat the shore. The strong concussion on the heaving tide. Rolled back the vessel to the island side. Again I shoved her off, our fate to fly. Each nerve we stretch. And every oar we ply. Just, scaped impending death, when now again. We twice as far had furrowed back the main. Once more I raise my voice. My friends, afraid. With mild entreaties my design dissuade. What boots the godless giant to provoke? Whose arm may sink us at a single stroke? Already when the dreadful rock he threw. Old ocean shook, and back his surges flew. The sounding voice directs his aim again. The rock overwhelms us, and we escaped in vain. But I, of mind elate, and scorning fear. Thus with new taunts insult the monster's ear. Cyclop. If any, pitying thy disgrace. Ask, who disfigured thus that eyeless face? Say, twas Ulysses, twas his deed declare. Laertes son, of Ithaca the fair. Ulysses, far in fighting fields renowned. Before whose arm Troy tumbled to the ground. The astonished savage with a roar replies. O heavens! O faith of ancient prophecies! This, Telemus Eurymedes foretold. The mighty seer who on these hills grew old. Skilled the dark fates of mortals to declare. And learned in all winged omens of the air. Long since he menaced, such was fate's command. And named Ulysses as the destined hand. I deemed some godlike giant to behold. Or lofty hero, haughty, brave, and bold. Not this weak pygmy wretch, of mean design. Who, not by strength subdued me, but by wine. But come, accept our gifts, and join to pray. Great Neptune's blessing on the watery way. For his I am, and I the lineage own. The immortal father no less boasts the son. His power can heal me, and relight my eye. And only his, of all the gods on high. Oh! Could this arm, I thus aloud rejoin. From that vast bulk dislodge thy bloody mind. And send thee howling to the realms of night. As sure as Neptune cannot give thee sight. Thus I. While raging he repeats his cries. With hands uplifted to the starry skies. Hear me, O Neptune, thou whose arms are hurled. From shore to shore, and gird the solid world. If thine I am, nor thou my birth disown. And if the unhappy Cyclop be thy son. Let not Ulysses breathe his native air. Laertes' son, of Ithaca the fair. If to review his country be his fate. Be it through toils and sufferings long and late. His lost companions let him first deplore. Some vessel, not his own, transport him o'er. And when at home from foreign sufferings freed. More near and deep, domestic woes succeed. With imprecations thus he filled the air. An angry Neptune heard the unrighteous prayer. A larger rock then heaving from the plain. He whirled it round, its sun across the main. It fell, and brushed the stern, the billows roar. Shake at the weight, and refluent beat the shore. 
With all our force we kept aloof to sea. And gained the island where our vessels lay. Our sight the whole collected navy cheered. Who, waiting long, by turns had hoped and feared. There disembarking on the green seaside. We land our cattle, and the spoil divide. Of these due shares to every sailor fall. The master ram was voted mine by all. And him, the guardian of Ulysses' fate. With pious mind to heaven I consecrate. But the great God, whose thunder rends the skies. A verse, beholds the smoking sacrifice. And sees me wandering still from coast to coast. And all my vessels, all my people, lost. While thoughtless we indulge the genial rite. As plenteous cates and flowing bowls invite. Till evening Phoebus rolled away the light. Stretched on the shore in careless ease we rest. Till ruddy morning purpled o'er the east. Then from their anchors all our ships unbind. And mount the decks, and call the willing wind. Now, ranged in order on our banks we sweep. With hasty strokes the horse resounding deep. Blind to the future, pensive with our fears. Glad for the living, for the dead in tears. Book 10. Argument. Adventures with Aeolus, the Lestrigons, and Circe. Ulysses arrives at the island of Aeolus, who gives him prosperous winds, and encloses the adverse ones in a bag, which his companions untying, they are driven back again and rejected. Then they sail to the Lestrigons, where they lose eleven ships, and, with only one remaining, proceed to the island of Circe. Eurylochus is sent first with some companions, all which, except Eurylochus, are transformed into swine. Ulysses then undertakes the adventure, and, by the help of Mercury, who gives him the herb moly, overcomes the enchantress, and procures the restoration of his men. After a year's stay with her, he prepares, at her instigation, for his voyage to the infernal shades. At length we reached Aeolus' sea-girt shore. Where great Hippotades the scepter bore. A floating isle. High raised by toil divine. Strong walls of brass the rocky coast confine. Six blooming youths, in private grandeur bred. And six fair daughters, graced the royal bed. These sons their sisters wed, and all remain. Their parents' pride, and pleasure of their reign. All day they feast, all day the bowls flow round. And joy and music through the isle resound. At night each pair on splendid carpets lay. And crowned with love the pleasures of the day. This happy port affords our wandering fleet. A month's reception, and a safe retreat. Full off the monarch urged me to relate. The fall of Aeolian, and the Grecian fate. Full oft I told, at length for parting moved. The king with mighty gifts my suit approved. The adverse winds in leathern bags he braced. Compressed their force, and locked each struggling blast. For him the mighty sire of gods assigned. The tempest's lud, the tyrant of the wind. His word alone the listening storms obey. To smooth the deep, or swell the foamy sea. These in my hollow ship the monarch hung. Securely fettered by a silver thong. But Zephyrus exempt, with friendly gales. He charged to fill, and guide the swelling sails. Rare gift. But oh, what gift to fools avails. Nine prosperous days we plied the laboring oar. The tenth presents our welcome native shore. The hills display the beacon's friendly light and rising mountains gain upon our sight. Then first my eyes, by watchful toils oppressed, complied to take the balmy gifts of rest. Then first my hands did from the rudder part. So much the love of home possessed my heart. When lo! On board a fond debate arose. What rare device those vessels might enclose. What sum, what prize from Aeolus I brought whilst to his neighbor each expressed his thought. Say, whence ye gods, contending nations strive. Who most shall please, who most our hero give. Long have his coffers groaned with Trojan spoils. Whilst we, the wretched partners of his toils, reproached by want, 
our fruitless labors mourn. And only rich in barren fame return. Now Aeolus, ye see, augments his store. But come, my friends, these mystic gifts explore. They said, and, O oh cursed fate, the thongs unbound. The gushing tempest sweeps the ocean round. Snatched in the whirl, the hurried navy flew. The ocean widened and the shores withdrew. Roused from my fatal sleep I long debate. If still to live, or desperate plunge to fate. Thus doubting, prostrate on the deck I lay. Till all the coward thoughts of death gave way. Meanwhile our vessels plough the liquid plain. And soon the known Aeolian coast regain. Our groan the rocks remurmured to the main. We leaped on shore, and with a scanty feast. Our thirst and hunger hastily repressed. That done, two chosen heralds straight attend. Our second progress to my royal friend. And him amidst his jovial sons we found. The banquet steaming, and the goblets crowned. There humbly stooped with conscious shame and awe. Nor nearer than the gate presumed to draw. But soon his sons their well-known guest descried. And starting from their couches loudly cried. Ulysses here. What demon couldst thou meet? To thwart thy passage, and repel thy fleet? Wast thou not furnished by our choicest care? For Greece, for home and all thy soul held dear. Thus they, in silence long my fate I mourned. At length these words with accents low returned. Me, locked in sleep, my faithless crew bereft. Of all the blessing of your godlike gift. But grant, O oh grant, our loss we may retrieve. A favor you, and you alone can give. Thus I with art to move their pity tried. And touched the youths, but their stern sire replied. Vile wretch, begone. This instant I command. Thy fleet accursed to leave our hallowed land. His baneful suit pollutes these blessed abodes. Whose fate proclaims him hateful to the gods. Thus fierce he said, we sighing went our way. And with desponding hearts put off to sea. The sailors spent with toils their folly mourn. But mourn in vain, no prospect of return. Six days and nights a doubtful course we steer. The next proud Lamos stately towers appear. And Lestragonia's gates arise distinct in air. The shepherd, quitting here at night the plain. Calls, to succeed his cares, the watchful swain. But he that scorns the chains of sleep to wear. And adds the herdsman's to the shepherd's care. So near the pastures, and so short the way. His double toils may claim a double pay. And join the labors of the night and day. Within a long recess a bay there lies. Edged round with cliffs high pointing to the skies. The jutting shores that swell on either side. Contract its mouth, and break the rushing tide. Our eager sailors seize the fair retreat. And bound within the port their crowded fleet. For here retired the sinking billows sleep. And smiling calmness silvered o'er the deep. I only in the bay refused to moor. And fixed without, my housers to the shore. From thence we climbed a point, whose airy brow. Commands the prospect of the plains below. No tracks of beasts, or signs of men, we found. But smoky volumes rolling from the ground. Two with our herald thither we command. With speed to learn what men possessed the land. They went, and kept the wheel's smooth beaten road. Which to the city drew the mountain wood. When lo! They met, beside a crystal spring. The daughter of Antiphates the king. She to Artatia's silver streams came down. Artatia's streams alone supply the town. The damsel they approach, and asked what race. The people were. Who monarch of the place? With joy the maid the unwary strangers heard. And showed them where the royal dome appeared. They went. But as they entering saw the queen. Of size enormous, and terrific mien. Not yielding to some bulky mountain's height. A sudden horror struck their aching sight. 
swift at her call her husband scoured away. To wreak his hunger on the destined prey. One for his food the raging glutton slew. But two rushed out, and to the navy flew. Balked of his prey, the yelling monster flies. And fills the city with his hideous cries. A ghastly band of giants hear the roar. And, pouring down the mountains, crowd the shore. Fragments they rend from off the craggy brow. And dash the ruins on the ships below. The crackling vessels burst. Hoarse groans arise. And mingled horrors echo to the skies. The men like fish, they struck upon the flood. And crammed their filthy throats with human food. Whilst thus their fury rages at the bay. My sword our cables cut, I called to weigh. And charged my men, as they from fate would fly. Each nerve to strain, each bending or to ply. The sailors catch the word, their oars they seize. And sweep with equal strokes the smoky seas. Clear of the rocks the impatient vessel flies. Whilst in the port each wretch encumbered dies. With earnest haste my fright sailors press. While kindling transports glowed at our success. But the sad fate that did our friends destroy. Cooled every breast, and damped the rising joy. Now dropped our anchors in the Ian Bay. Where Circe dwelt, the daughter of the day. Her mother purse, of old ocean's strain. Thus from the Luan descended, and the main. From the same lineage stern Eats came. The far-famed brother of the enchantress dame. Goddess, the queen, to whom the powers belong. Of dreadful magic and commanding song. Some god directing to this peaceful bay. Silent we came, and melancholy lay. Spent and o'erwatched. Two days and nights rolled on. And now the third succeeding morning shone. I climbed a cliff, with spear and sword in hand. Whose ridge o'erlooked a shady length of land. To learn if aught of mortal works appear. Or cheerful voice of mortal strike the ear. From the high point I marked, in distant view. A stream of curling smoke ascending blue. And spiry tops, the tufted trees above. Of Circe's palace bosomed in the grove. Thither to haste, the region to explore. Was first my thought, but speeding back to shore. I deemed it best to visit first my crew. And send our spies the dubious coast to view. As down the hill I solitary go. Some power divine, who pities human woe. Sent a tall stag, descending from the wood. To cool his fervor in the crystal flood. Luxuriant on the wave-worn bank he lay. Stretched forth and panting in the sunny ray. I launched my spear, and with a sudden wound. Transpierced his back, and fixed him to the ground. He falls, and mourns his fate with human cries. Through the wide wound the vital spirit flies. I drew, and casting on the river's side. The bloody spear, his gathered feet I tied. With twining osiers which the bank supplied. An L in length the pliant wisp I weaved. And the huge body on my shoulders heaved. Then leaning on my spear with both my hands. Up bore my load, and pressed the sinking sands. With weighty steps, till at the ship I threw. The welcome burden. And bespoke my crew. Cheer up, my friends. It is not yet our fate. To glide with ghosts through Pluto's gloomy gate. Food in the desert land, behold is given. Live, and enjoy the providence of heaven. The joyful crew survey his mighty size. And on the future banquet feast their eyes. As huge in length extended lay the beast. Then wash their hands, and hasten to the feast. There, till the setting sun rolled down the light. They sate indulging in the genial rite. When evening rose, and darkness covered o'er. The face of things, we slept along the shore. But when the rosy morning warmed the east. My men I summoned, and these words addressed. Followers and friends, attend what I propose. Ye sad companions of Ulysses' woes. We know not here what land before us lies. 
or to what quarter now we turn our eyes. Or where the sun shall set, or where shall rise. Here let us think, if thinking be not vain. If any counsel, any hope remain. Alas! From yonder promontory's brow. I viewed the coast, a region flat and low. An isle encircled with the boundless flood. A length of thickets, an entangled wood. Some smoke I saw amid the forest rise. And all around it only seas and skies. With broken hearts my sad companions stood. Mindful of Cyclops and his human food. And horrid Lestrigons, the men of blood. Presaging tears apace began to rain. But tears in mortal miseries are vain. In equal parts one straight divide my band. And name a chief each party to command. I led the one, and of the other side. Appointed brave Eurylochus the guide. Then in the brazen helm the lots we throw. And fortune casts Eurylochus to go. He marched with twice eleven in his train. Pensive they march, and pensive we remain. The palace in a woody vale they found. High raised of stone, a shaded space around. Where mountain wolves and brindled lions roam. By magic tamed, familiar to the dome. With gentle blandishment our men they meet. And wag their tails, and fawning lick their feet. As from some feast a man returning late. His faithful dogs all meet him at the gate. Rejoicing round, some morsel to receive. Such as the good man ever used to give. Domestic thus the grisly beasts drew near. They gaze with wonder not unmixed with fear. Now on the threshold of the dome they stood. And heard a voice resounding through the wood. Placed at her loom within, the goddess sung. The vaulted roofs and solid pavement rung. O'er the fair web the rising figures shine. Immortal labor. Worthy hands divine. Polites to the rest the question moved. A gallant leader, and a man I loved. What voice celestial, chanting to the loom. Or nymph, or goddess, echoes from the room. Say, shall we seek access? With that they call. And wide unfold the portals of the hall. The goddess, rising, asks her guests to stay. Who blindly follow where she leads the way. Eurylochus alone of all the band. Suspecting fraud, more prudently remained. On thrones around with downy coverings graced. With semblance fair, the unhappy men she placed. Milk newly pressed, the sacred flower of wheat. And honey fresh, and pramian wines the treat. But venomed was the bread, and mixed the bowl. With drugs of force to darken all the soul. Soon in the luscious feast themselves they lost. And drank oblivion of their native coast. Instant her circling wand the goddess waves. To hogs transforms them, and the sty receives. No more was seen the human form divine. Head, face, and members, bristle into swine. Still cursed with sense, their minds remain alone. And their own voice affrights them when they groan. Meanwhile the goddess in disdain bestows. The mast and acorn, brutal food. And strows. The fruits and cornel, as their feast, around. Now prone and groveling on unsavory ground. Eurylochus, with pensive steps and slow. Aghast returns, the messenger of woe. And bitter fate. To speak he made essay. In vain essayed, nor would his tongue obey. His swelling heart denied the words their way. But speaking tears the want of words supply. And the full soul bursts copious from his eye. Affrighted, anxious for our fellow's fates. We press to hear what sadly he relates. We went, Ulysses. Such was thy command. Through the lone thicket and the desert land. A palace in a woody vale we found. Brown with dark forests, and with shades around. A voice celestial echoed through the dome. Or nymph for goddess, chanting to the loom. Access we sought, nor was access denied. Radiant she came, the portals opened wide. 
the goddess mild invites the guests to stay. They blindly follow where she leads the way. I only wait behind of all the train. I waited long, and eyed the doors in vain. The rest are vanished, none repass the gate. And not a man appears to tell their fate. I heard, an instant o'er my shoulder flung. The belt in which my weighty falchion hung. A beamy blade then seized the bended bow. And bade him guide the way, resolved to go. He, prostrate falling, with both hands embraced. My knees, and weeping thus his suit addressed. O King, beloved of Jove, thy servant spare. And ah, thyself the rash attempt forbear. Never, alas! Thou never shalt return. Or see the wretched for whose loss we mourn. With what remains from certain ruin fly. And save the few not fated yet to die. I answered stern, inglorious then remain. Here feast and loiter, and desert thy train. Alone, unfriended, will I tempt my way. The laws of fate compel, and I obey. This said, and scornful turning from the shore. My haughty step, I stalked the valley o'er. Till now approaching nigh the magic bower. Where dwelt the enchantress skilled in herbs of power. A form divine forth issued from the wood. Immortal Hermes with the golden rod. In human semblance. On his bloomy face. Youth smiled celestial, with each opening grace. He seized my hand, and gracious thus began. Ah whither roam'st thou, much enduring man? O oh, blind to fate! What led thy steps to rove? The horrid mazes of this magic grove. Each friend you seek in yon enclosure lies. All lost their form, and habitants of styes. Think'st thou by wit to model their escape? Sooner shalt thou, a stranger to thy shape. Fall prone their equal, first thy danger know. Then take the antidote the gods bestow. The plant I give through all the direful bower. Shall guard thee, and avert the evil hour. Now hear her wicked arts, before thy eyes. The bowl shall sparkle, and the banquet rise. Take this, nor from the faithless feast abstain. For tempered drugs and poison shall be vain. Soon as she strikes her wand, and gives the word. Draw forth and brandish thy refulgent sword. And menace death, those menaces shall move. Her altered mind to blandishment and love. Nor shun the blessing proffered to thy arms. Ascend her bed, and taste celestial charms. So shall thy tedious toils a respite find. And thy lost friends return to humankind. But swear her first by those dread oaths that tie. The powers below, the blessed in the sky. Lest to thee naked secret fraud be meant. Or magic bind thee cold and impotent. Thus while he spoke, the sovereign plant he drew. Where on the all-bearing earth unmarked it grew and showed its nature and its wondrous power. Black was the root, but milky white the flower. Moly the name, to mortals hard to find. But all is easy to the ethereal kind. This Hermes gave, then, gliding off the glade. Shot to Olympus from the woodland shade. While, full of thought, revolving fates to come. I speed my passage to the enchanted dome. Arrived, before the lofty gates I stayed. The lofty gates the goddess wide displayed. She leads before, and to the feast invites. I follow sadly to the magic rites. Radiant with starry studs, a silver seat. Received my limbs, a footstool eased my feet. She mixed the potion, fraudulent of soul. The poison mantled in the golden bowl. I took, and quaffed it, confident in heaven. Then waved the wand, and then the word was given. Hence to thy fellows. Dreadful she began. Go, be a beast. I heard, and yet was man. Then, sudden whirling, like a waving flame. My beamy falchion, I assault the dame. Struck with unusual fear, she trembling cries. She faints, she falls, she lifts her weeping eyes. What art thou? Say. 
From whence, from whom you came. O more than human! Tell thy race, thy name. Amazing strength, these poisons to sustain. Not mortal thou, nor mortal is thy brain. Or art thou he, the man to come, foretold. By Hermes, powerful with the wand of gold. The man from Troy, who wandered ocean round. The man for wisdom's various arts renowned. Ulysses. Oh! Thy threatening fury cease. Sheath thy bright sword, and join our hands in peace. Let mutual joys our mutual trust combine. And love, and love-born confidence, be thine. And how, dread Circe! Furious I rejoin. Can love, and love-born confidence, be mine? Beneath thy charms when my companions groan. Transformed to beasts, with accents not their own. O thou of fraudful heart, shall I be led. To share thy feast rites, or ascend thy bed. That, all unarmed, thy vengeance may have vent. And magic bind me, cold and impotent. Celestial as thou art, yet stand denied. Or swear that oath by which the gods are tied. Swear, in thy soul no latent frauds remain. Swear by the vow which never can be vain. The goddess swore, then seized my hand, and led. To the sweet transports of the genial bed. Ministrant to the queen, with busy care. For faithful handmaids the soft rites prepare. Nymphs sprung from fountains, or from shady woods. Or the fair offspring of the sacred floods. One o'er the couches painted carpets through. Whose purple luster glowed against the view. White linen lay beneath. Another placed. The silver stands, with golden flaskets graced. With dulcet beverage this the beaker crowned. Fair in the midst, with gilded cups around. That in the tripod o'er the kindled pile. The water pours, the bubbling waters boil. An ample vase receives the smoking wave. And, in the bath prepared, my limbs I lave. Reviving sweets repair the mind's decay. And take the painful sense of toil away. A vest and tunic o'er me next she threw. Fresh from the bath, and dropping balmy dew. Then led and placed me on the sovereign seat. With carpet spread, a footstool at my feet. The golden ewer a nymph obsequious brings. Replenished from the cool translucent springs. With copious water the bright vase supplies. A silver laver of capacious size. I washed. The table in fair order spread. They heap the glittering canisters with bread. Viands of various kinds allure the taste. Of choicest sort and savor, rich repast. Circe in vain invites the feast to share. Absent I ponder, and absorbed in care. While scenes of woe rose anxious in my breast. The queen beheld me, and these words addressed. Why sits Ulysses silent and apart? Some hoard of grief close harbored at his heart. Untouched before thee stand the cates divine. And unregarded laughs the rosy wine. Can yet a doubt or any dread remain? When sworn that oath which never can be vain. I answered, Goddess. Human is my breast. By justice swayed, by tender pity pressed. Ill fits it me, whose friends are sunk to beasts. To quaff thy bowls, or riot in thy feasts. Me wouldst thou please. For them thy cares employ. And them to me restore, and me to joy. With that she parted, in her potent hand. She bore the virtue of the magic wand. Then, hastening to the sties, set wide the door. Urged forth, and drove the bristly herd before. Unwieldy, out they rushed with general cry. Enormous beasts, dishonest to the eye. Now touched by counter-charms they change again. And stand majestic, and recall to men. Those hairs of late that bristled every part. Fall off, miraculous effect of art. Till all the form in full proportion rise. More young, more large, more graceful to my eyes. They saw, they knew me, and with eager pace. 
clung to their master in a long embrace. Sad, pleasing sight. With tears each eye ran o'er. And sobs of joy re-echoed through the bower. Ian Circe wept, her adamantine heart. Felt pity enter, and sustained her part. Son of Laertes. Then the queen began. O oh, much enduring, much experienced man! Haste to thy vessel on the sea beach shore. Unload thy treasures, and the galley more. Then bring thy friends, secure from future harms. And in our grotto stow thy spoils and arms. She said. Obedient to her high command. I quit the place, and hasten to the strand. My sad companions on the beach I found. Their wistful eyes in floods of sorrow drowned. As from fresh pastures and the dewy field. When loaded cribs their evening banquet yield. The lowing herds return. Around them throng. With leaps and bounds their late imprisoned young. Rush to their mothers with unruly joy. And echoing hills return the tender cry. So round me pressed, exulting at my sight. With cries and agonies of wild delight. The weeping sailors. Nor less fierce their joy. Than if returned to Ithaca from Troy. Ah master! Ever honoured, ever dear. These tender words on every side I hear. What other joy can equal thy return? Not that loved country for whose sight we mourn. The soil that nursed us, and that gave us breath. But ah! Relate our lost companion's death. I answered cheerful, haste, your galley more. And bring our treasures and our arms ashore. Those in yon hollow caverns let us lay. Then rise, and follow where I lead the way. Your fellows live. Believe your eyes, and come. To taste the joys of Circe's sacred dome. With ready speed the joyful crew obey. Alone Eurylochus persuades their stay. Whither, he cried, ah whither will ye run? Seek ye to meet those evils ye should shun. Will you the terrors of the dome explore? In swine to grovel, or in lion's roar? Or wolf-like howl away the midnight hour? In dreadful watch around the magic bower? Remember Cyclops, and his bloody deed. The leader's rashness made the soldiers bleed. I heard incensed, and first resolved to speed. My flying falchion at the rebel's head. Dear as he was, by ties of kindred bound. This hand had stretched him breathless on the ground. But all at once my interposing train. For mercy pleaded, nor could plead in vain. Leave here the man who dares his prince desert. Leave to repentance and his own sad heart. To guard the ship. Seek we the sacred shades. Of Circe's palace, where Ulysses leads. This with one voice declared, the rising train. Left the black vessel by the murmuring main. Shame touched Eurylochus' altered breast. He feared my threats, and followed with the rest. Meanwhile the goddess, with indulgent cares. And social joys, the late transformed repairs. The bath, the feast, their fainting soul renews. Rich in refulgent robes, and dropping balmy dews. Brightening with joy, their eager eyes behold. Each other's face, and each his story told. Then gushing tears the narrative confound. And with their sobs the vaulted roof resound. When hushed their passion, thus the goddess cries. Ulysses, taught by labors to be wise. Let this short memory of grief suffice. To me are known the various woes ye bore. In storms by sea, in perils on the shore. Forget whatever was in fortune's power. And share the pleasures of this genial hour. Such be your mind as ere ye left your coast. Or learned to sorrow for a country lost. Exiles and wanderers now, where'er ye go. Too faithful memory renews your woe. The cause removed, habitual griefs remain. And the soul saddens by the use of pain. Her kind entreaty moved the general breast. Tired with long toil, we willing sunk to rest. We plied the banquet, and the bowl we crowned. 
till the full circle of the year came round. But when the seasons following in their train brought back the months, the days, and hours again, as from a lethargy at once they rise and urge their chief with animating cries, Is this, Ulysses, our inglorious lot? And is the name of Ithaca forgot? Shall never the dear land in prospect rise? Or the loved palace glitter in our eyes? Melting I heard. Yet till the sun's decline. Prolonged the feast, and quaffed the rosy wine. But when the shades came on at evening hour. And all lay slumbering in the dusky bower. I came a suppliant to fair Circe's bed. The tender moment ceased. And thus I said. Be mindful, goddess. Of thy promise made. Must sad Ulysses ever be delayed. Around their lord my sad companions mourn. Each breast beats homeward, anxious to return. If but a moment parted from thy eyes. Their tears flow round me, and my heart complies. Go then, she cried, I'll go. Yet think, not I. Not Circe, but the fates, your wish deny. Ah, hope not yet to breathe thy native air. Far other journey first demands thy care. To tread the uncomfortable paths beneath. And view the realms of darkness and of death. There seek the Theban bard, deprived of sight. Within, irradiate with prophetic light. To whom Persephone, entire and whole. Gave to retain the unseparated soul. The rest are forms, of empty ether made. Impassive semblance, and a flitting shade. Struck at the word, my very heart was dead. Pensive I sate, my tears bedewed the bed. To hate the light and life my soul begun. And saw that all was grief beneath the sun. Composed at length the gushing tears suppressed. And my tossed limbs now wearied into rest. How shall I tread, I cried, ah, Circe. Say. The dark descent, and who shall guide the way? Can living eyes behold the realms below? What bark to waft me, and what wind to blow? Thy faded road, the magic power replied. Divine Ulysses. Ask no mortal guide. Rear but the mast, the spacious sail display. The northern winds shall wing thee on thy way. Soon shalt thou reach old ocean's utmost ends. Where to the main the shelving shore descends. The barren trees of Proserpine's black woods. Poplars and willows trembling o'er the floods. There fix thy vessel in the lonely bay. And enter there the kingdom's void of day. Where Phlegathon's loud torrents, rushing down. Hiss in the flaming gulf of Acheron. And where, slow rolling from the Stygian bed. Cocytus lamentable waters spread. Where the dark rock o'erhangs the infernal lake. And mingling streams eternal murmurs make. First draw thy falchion, and on every side. Trench the black earth a cubit long and wide. To all the shades around libations pour. And o'er the ingredients strew the hallowed flower. New wine and milk, with honey tempered bring. And living water from the crystal spring. Then the wan shades and feeble ghosts implore. With promised offerings on thy native shore. A barren cow, the stateliest of the isle. And heaped with various wealth, a blazing pile. These to the rest. But to the seer must bleed. A sable ram, the pride of all thy breed. These solemn vows and holy offerings paid. To all the phantom nations of the dead. Be next thy care the sable sheep to place. Full o'er the pit, and hellward turn their face. But from the infernal right thine eye withdraw. And back to ocean glance with reverend awe. Sudden shall skim along the dusky glades. Thin airy shoals, and visionary shades. Then give command the sacrifice to haste. Let the flayed victims in the flame be cast. And sacred vows and mystic song applied. To grisly Pluto and his gloomy bride. Wide o'er the pool thy falchion waved around. Shall drive the spectres from unbidden ground. The sacred draught shall all the dead forbear. 
till awful from the shades arise the seer. Let him, oraculous, the end, the way. The turns of all thy future fate display. Thy pilgrimage to come, and remnant of thy day. So speaking, from the ruddy orient shone. The morn, conspicuous on her golden throne. The goddess with a radiant tunic dressed. My limbs, and o'er me cast a silken vest. Long flowing robes, of purest white, array. The nymph, that added luster to the day. A tire wreathed her head with many a fold. Her waist was circled with a zone of gold. Forth issuing then, from place to place I flew. Rouse man by man, and animate my crew. Rise, rise, my mates, tis Circe gives command. Our journey calls us, haste, and quit the land. All rise and follow, yet depart not all. For fate decreed one wretched man to fall. A youth there was, Elpiner was he named. Not much for sense, nor much for courage famed. The youngest of our band, a vulgar soul. Born but to banquet, and to drain the bowl. He, hot and careless, on a turret's height. With sleep repaired the long debauch of night. The sudden tumult stirred him where he lay. And down he hastened, but forgot the way. Full headlong from the roof the sleeper fell. And snapped the spinal joint, and waked in hell. The rest crowd round me with an eager look. I met them with a sigh, and thus bespoke. Already, friends. Ye think your toils are o'er. Your hopes already touch your native shore. Alas! Far otherwise the nymph declares. Far other journey first demands our cares. To tread the uncomfortable paths beneath. The dreary realms of darkness and of death. To seek Tiresias' awful shade below. And thence our fortunes and our fates to know. My sad companions heard in deep despair. Frantic they tore their manly growth of hair. To earth they fell, the tears began to rain. But tears in mortal miseries are vain. Sadly they fared along the sea beach shore. Still heaved their hearts, and still their eyes ran o'er. The ready victims at our bark we found. The sable ewe and ram together bound. For swift as thought the goddess had been there. And thence had glided, viewless as the air. The paths of gods what mortal can survey? Who eyes their motion? Who shall trace their way? Book 11 Argument The Descent into Hell Ulysses continues his narration. How he arrived at the land of the Sumerians, and what ceremonies he performed to invoke the dead. The manner of his descent, and the apparition of the shades, his conversation with Elpiner, and with Tiresias who informs him in a prophetic manner of his fortunes to come. He meets his mother Anticles, from whom he learns the state of his family. He sees the shades of the ancient heroines, afterwards of the heroes, and converses in particular with Agamemnon and Achilles. Ajax keeps at a sullen distance, and disdains to answer him. He then beholds Titius, Tantalus, Sisyphus, Hercules till he is deterred from further curiosity by the apparition of horrid spectres, and the cries of the wicked in torments. Now to the shores we bend, a mournful train. Climb the tall bark, and launch into the main. At once the mast we rear, at once unbind. The spacious sheet, and stretch it to the wind. Then pale and pensive stand, with cares oppressed. And solemn horror saddens every breast. A freshening breeze the magic power supplied. While the winged vessel flew along the tide. Our oars we shipped, all day the swelling sails. Full from the guiding pilot catched the gales. Now sunk the sun from his aerial height. And o'er the shaded billows rushed the night. When lo! We reached old ocean's utmost bounds. Where rocks control his waves with ever during mounds. There in a lonely land, and gloomy cells. The dusky nation of Samaria dwells. The sun ne'er views the uncomfortable seats. When radiant he advances, or retreats. Unhappy race. Whom endless night invades. 
clouds the dull air, and wraps them round in shades. The ship we moor on these obscure abodes. Disbark the sheep, an offering to the gods. And, hellward bending, o'er the beach descry. The doleful passage to the infernal sky. The victims, vowed to each Tartarian power. Eurylochus and Perimedes bore. Here opened hell, all hell I here implored. And from the scabbard drew the shining sword. And trenching the black earth on every side. A cavern formed, a cubit long and wide. New wine, with honey-tempered milk, we bring. Then living waters from the crystal spring. O'er these was strewed the consecrated flower. And on the surface shone the holy store. Now the wan shades we hail, the infernal gods. To speed our course, and waft us o'er the floods. So shall a barren heifer from the stall. Beneath the knife upon your altars fall. So in our palace, at our safe return. Rich with unnumbered gifts the pile shall burn. So shall a ram, the largest of the breed. Black as these regions, to Tiresias bleed. Thus solemn rites and holy vows we paid. To all the phantom nations of the dead. Then died the sheep, a purple torrent flowed. And all the caverns smoked with streaming blood. When lo! Appeared along the dusky coasts. Thin, airy shoals of visionary ghosts. Fair, pensive youths, and soft enamored maids. And withered elders, pale and wrinkled shades. Ghastly with wounds the forms of warriors slain. Stocked with majestic port, a martial train. These and a thousand more swarmed o'er the ground. And all the dire assembly shrieked around. Astonished at the sight, aghast I stood. And a cold fear ran shivering through my blood. Straight I command the sacrifice to haste. Straight the flayed victims to the flames are cast. And muttered vows, and mystic song applied. To grisly Pluto, and his gloomy bride. Now swift I waved my falchion o'er the blood. Back started the pale throngs, and trembling stood. Round the black trench the gore untasted flows. Till awful from the shades Tiresias rose. There wandering through the gloom I first surveyed. New to the realms of death, Elpiner's shade. His cold remains all naked to the sky. On distant shores unwept, unburied lie. Sad at the sight I stand, deep fixed in woe. And ere I spoke the tears began to flow. Oh say what angry power Elpiner led. To glide in shades, and wander with the dead. How could thy soul, by realms and seas disjoined? Outfly the nimble sail, and leave the lagging wind. The ghost replied, To hell my doom I owe. Demons accursed, dire ministers of woe. My feet, through wine unfaithful to their weight. Betrayed me tumbling from a towery height. Staggering I reeled, and as I reeled I fell. Lux the neck joint my soul descends to hell. But lend me aid, I now conjure thee lend. By the soft tie and sacred name of friend. By thy fond consort. By thy father's cares. By loved Telemachus' blooming years. For well I know that soon the heavenly powers. Will give thee back today, and Circe's shores. Their pious on my cold remains attend. Their call to mind thy poor departed friend. The tribute of a tear is all I crave. And the possession of a peaceful grave. But if, unheard, in vain compassion plead. Revere the gods. The gods avenge the dead. A tomb along the watery margin raise. The tomb with manly arms and trophies grace. To show posterity Elpiner was. There high in air, memorial of my name. Fix the smooth oar and bid me live to fame. To whom with tears, these rites, O mournful shade. Due to thy ghost, shall to thy ghost be paid. Still as I spoke the phantom seemed to moan. Tear followed tear, and groan succeeded groan. But, as my waving sword the blood surrounds. The shade withdrew, and muttered empty sounds. There as the wondrous visions I surveyed. 
All pale ascends my royal mother's shade. A queen, to Troy she saw our legions pass. Now a thin form is all Anticlea was. Struck at the sight I melt with filial woe. And down my cheek the pious sorrows flow. Yet as I shook my falchion o'er the blood. Regardless of her son the parent stood. When lo! The mighty Theban I behold. To guide his steps he bore a staff of gold. Awful he trod, majestic was his look. And from his holy lips these accents broke. Why, mortal, wanderest thou from cheerful day? To tread the downward, melancholy way. What angry gods to these dark regions led? Thee, yet alive, companion of the deed. But sheath thy poniard, while my tongue relates. Heaven's steadfast purpose, and thy future fates. While yet he spoke, the prophet I obeyed. And in the scabbard plunged the glittering blade. Eager he quaffed the gore, and then expressed. Dark things to come, the counsels of his breast. Weary of light, Ulysses here explores. A prosperous voyage to his native shores. But no, by me unerring fates disclose. New trains of dangers, and new scenes of woes. I see, I see, thy bark by Neptune tossed. For injured Cyclops, and his eyeball lost. Yet to thy woes the gods decree an end. If heaven thou please, and how to please attend. Whereon Trinacrian rocks the ocean roars. Graze numerous herds along the verdant shores. Though hunger press, yet fly the dangerous prey. The herds are sacred to the god of day. Who all surveys with his extensive eye. Above, below, on earth, and in the sky. Rob not the god. And so propitious gales. Attend thy voyage, and impel thy sails. But, if his herds ye seize, beneath the waves. I see thy friends o'erwhelmed in liquid graves. The direful wreck Ulysses scarce survives. Ulysses at his country scarce arrives. Strangers thy guides. Nor there thy labors end. New foes arise, domestic ills attend. Their foul adulterers to thy bride resort. And lordly gluttons riot in thy court. But vengeance hastes amain. These eyes behold. The deathful scene, princes on princes rolled. That done, a people far from sea explore. Who ne'er knew salt, or heard the billows roar. Or saw gay vessel stem the watery plain. A painted wonder flying on the main. Bear on thy back an oar, with strange amaze. A shepherd meeting thee, the oar surveys. And names of Anne, there fix it on the plain. To calm the god that holds the watery rain. A threefold offering to his altar bring. A bull, a ram, a boar. And hail the ocean king. But home returned, to each ethereal power. Slay the due victim in the genial hour. So peaceful shalt thou end thy blissful days. And steal thyself from life by slow decays. Unknown to pain, in age resign thy breath. When late stern Neptune points the shaft with death. To the dark grave retiring as to rest. Thy people blessing, by thy people blessed. Unerring truths, O oh man, my lips relate. This is thy life to come, and this is fate. To whom unmoved, if this the gods prepare. What heaven ordains the wise with courage bear. But say, why yonder on the lonely strands? Unmindful of her son, Anticlea stands. Why to the ground she bends her downcast eye? Why is she silent, while her son is nigh? The latent cause, O sacred seer, reveal. Nor this, replies the seer, will I conceal. No, to the spectres that thy beverage taste. The scenes of life recur, and actions past. They, sealed with truth, return the sure reply. The rest, repelled, a train oblivious fly. The phantom prophet ceased, and sunk from sight. To the black palace of eternal night. Still in the dark abodes of death I stood. When near Anticlea moved, and drank the blood. 
straight all the mother in her soul awakes. And, owning her Ulysses, thus she speaks. Comest thou, my son, alive, to realms beneath. The dulcome realms of darkness and of death. Comest thou alive from pure, ethereal day. Dire is the region, dismal is the way. Here lakes profound, their floods oppose their waves. There the wide sea with all his billows raves. Or, since to dust proud Troy submits her towers. Comest thou a wanderer from the Phrygian shores? Or say, since honour called thee to the field. Hast thou thy Ithaca, thy bride, beheld? Source of my life, I cried, from earth I fly. To seek Tiresias in the nether sky. To learn my doom. For, tossed from woe to woe. In every land Ulysses finds a foe. Nor have these eyes beheld my native shores. Since in the dust proud Troy submits her towers. But, when thy soul from her sweet mansion fled. Say, what distemper gave thee to the dead? Has life's fair lamp declined by slow decays? Or swift expired it in a sudden blaze? Say, if my sire, good old Laertes, lives. If yet Telemachus, my son, survives. Say, by his rule is my dominion awed. Or crushed by traitors with an iron rod. Say, if my spouse maintains her royal trust. Though tempted, chaste, and obstinately just. Or if no more her absent lord she wails. But the false woman o'er the wife prevails. Thus I, and thus the parent shade returns. Thee, ever thee, thy faithful consort mourns. Whether the night descends or day prevails. Thee she by night, and thee by day bewails. Thee in Telemachus thy realm obeys. In sacred grove celestial rites he pays. And shares the banquet in superior state. Graced with such honours as become the great. Thy sire in solitude foments his care. The court is joyless, for thou art not there. No costly carpets raise his hoary head. No rich embroidery shines to grace his bed. Even when keen winter freezes in the skies. Ranked with his slaves, on earth the monarch lies. Deep are his sighs, his visage pale, his dress. The garb of woe and habit of distress. And when the autumn takes his annual round. The leafy honours scattering on the ground. Regardless of his years, abroad he lies. His bed the leaves, his canopy the skies. Thus cares on cares his painful days consume. And bow his age with sorrow to the tomb. For thee, my son, I wept my life away. For thee through hell's eternal dungeon stray. Nor came my fate by lingering pains and slow. Nor bent the silver-shafted queen her bow. No dire disease bereaved me of my breath. Thou, thou, my son, wert my disease and death. Unkindly with my love my son conspired. For thee I lived, for absent thee expired. Thrice in my arms I strove her shade to bind. Thrice through my arms she slipped like empty wind. Or dreams, the vain illusions of the mind. Wild with despair, I shed a copious tide. Of flowing tears, and thus with sighs replied. Fliest thou, loved shade, while I thus fondly mourn. Turn to my arms, to my embraces turn. Is it, ye powers that smile at human harms? Too great a bliss to weep within her arms. Or has hell's queen an empty image sent? That wretched I might e'en my joys lament. O son of woe, the pensive shade rejoined. O most inured to grief of all mankind. Tis not the queen of hell who thee deceives. All, all are such, when life the body leaves. No more the substance of the man remains. Nor bounds the blood along the purple veins. These the funereal flames in atoms bear. To wander with the wind in empty air. While the impassive soul reluctant flies. Like a vain dream, to these infernal skies. But from the dark dominion speed the way. And climb the steep ascent to upper day. To thy chaste bride the wondrous story tell. The woes, 
the horrors, and the laws of hell. Thus while she spoke, in swarms hell's empress brings. Daughters and wives of heroes and of kings. Thick and more thick they gather round the blood. Ghost thronged on ghost, a dire assembly, stood. Dauntless my sword I seize, the airy crew. Swift as it flashed along the gloom, withdrew. Then shade to shade in mutual form succeeds. Her race recounts, and their illustrious deeds. Tyro began, whom great Solmonius bred. The royal partner of famed Cretheus bed. For fair Anapius, as from fruitful urns. He pours his watery store, the virgin burns. Smooth flows the gentle stream with wanton pride. And in soft mazes rolls a silver tide. As on his banks the maid enamoured roves. The monarch of the deep beholds and loves. In her Enipeus form and borrowed charms. The amorous god descends into her arms. Around, a spacious arch of waves he throws. And high in air the liquid mountain rose. Thus in surrounding floods concealed, he proves. The pleasing transport, and completes his loves. Then, softly sighing, he the fair addressed. And as he spoke her tender hand he pressed. Hail, happy nymph. No vulgar births are owed. To the prolific raptures of a god. Lo! When nine times the moon renews her horn. Two brother heroes shall from thee be born. Thy early care the future worthies claim. To point them to the arduous paths of fame. But in thy breast the important truth conceal. Nor dare the secret of a god reveal. For know, thou Neptune viewst. And at my nod. Earth trembles, and the waves confess their god. He added not, but mounting spurned the plain. Then plunged into the chambers of the main. Now in the time's full process forth she brings. Jove's dread vicegerents in two future kings. O'er proud Iolcos Peleus stretched his reign. And godlike Neleus ruled the Pilian plain. Then, fruitful, to her Cretheus royal bed. She gallant fears and famed as in bread. From the same fountain Amatheon rose. Pleased with the din of scar. And noble shout of foes. There moved Antiope, with haughty charms. Who blessed the almighty thunderer in her arms. Hence sprung Amphion, hence brave Zethus came. Founders of Thebes, and men of mighty name. Though bold in open field, they yet surround. The town with walls, and mound inject on mound. Here ramparts stood, their towers rose high in air. And here through seven wide portals rushed the war. There with soft step the fair Alcmena trod. Who bore Alcides to the thundering god. And Megara, who charmed the son of Jove. And softened his stern soul to tender love. Sullen and sour, with discontented mien. Jocasta frowned, the incestuous Theban queen. With her own son she joined in nuptial bands. Though father's blood embrued his murderous hands. The gods and men the dire offense detest. The gods with all their furies rend his breast. In lofty Thebes he wore the imperial crown. A pompous wretch. Accursed upon a throne. The wife self-murdered from a beam depends. And her foul soul to blackest hell descends. Thence to her son the choicest plagues she brings. And the fiends haunt him with a thousand stings. And now the beauteous Chloris I descry. A lovely shade, Amphion's youngest joy. With gifts unnumbered Neleus sought her arms. Nor paid too dearly for unequal charms. Great in Orchomenos, in Pylos great. He swayed the scepter with imperial state. Three gallant sons the joyful monarch told. Sage Nestor, Periclimenus the bold. And Chromius last, but of the softer race. One nymph alone, a miracle of grace. Kings on their thrones for lovely peril burn. The sire denies, and kings rejected mourn. To him alone the beauteous prize he yields. Whose arm should ravish from phylation fields. 
the herds of Iphiclus, detained in wrong. Wild, furious herds, unconquerably strong. This dares a seer, but not the seer prevails. In beauty's cause illustriously he fails. Twelve moons the foe the captive youth detains. In painful dungeons, and coercive chains. The foe at last from durance where he lay. His heart revering, give him back today. One by prophetic knowledge, to fulfill. The steadfast purpose of the Almighty will. With graceful port advancing now I spied. Leda the fair, the godlike Tinder's bride. Hence Pollock sprung, who wields the furious sway. The deathful gauntlet, matchless in the fray. And Castor, glorious on the embattled plain. Curbs the proud steeds, reluctant to the rein. By turns they visit this ethereal sky. And live alternate, and alternate die. In hell beneath, on earth, in heaven above. Reign the twin gods. The favorite sons of Jove. Their Ephemedia trod the gloomy plain. Who charmed the monarch of the boundless main. Hence Ephialtes, hence stern Otis sprung. More fierce than giants, more than giants strong. The earth o'erburdened groaned beneath their weight. None but Orion e'er surpassed their height. The wondrous youths had scarce nine winters told. When high in air, tremendous to behold. Nine ells aloft they reared their towering head. And full nine cubits broad their shoulders spread. Proud of their strength, and more than mortal size. The gods they challenge, and affect the skies. Heaved on Olympus tottering Asa stood. On Asa, Pelion nods with all his wood. Such were they youths I had they to manhood grown. Almighty Jove had trembled on his throne. But ere the harvest of the beard began. To bristle on the chin, and promise man. His shafts Apollo aimed. At once they sound. And stretch the giant monsters o'er the ground. Their mournful Phaedra with sad Procris moves. Both beauteous shades, both hapless in their loves. And near them walked with solemn pace and slow. Sad Adriadon, partner of their woe. The royal Minus Ariadne bred. She Theseus loved, from Crete with Theseus fled. Swift to the Dien Al the hero flies. And towards his Athens bears the lovely prize. Their Bacchus with fierce rage Diana fires. The goddess aims her shaft, the nymph expires. Their climbing and Mera I behold. Their Eraphile weeps, who loosely sold. Her lord, her honor, for the lust of gold. But should I all recount, the night would fail. Unequal to the melancholy tale. An all composing rest my nature craves. Here in the court, or yonder on the waves. In you I trust, and in the heavenly powers. To land Ulysses on his native shores. He ceased, but left so charming on their ear. His voice, that listening still they seemed to hear. Till, rising up, irate silence broke. Stretched out her snowy hand, and thus she spoke. What wondrous man heaven sends us in our guest. Through all his woes the hero shines confessed. His comely port, his ample frame express. A manly air, majestic in distress. He, as my guest, is my peculiar care. You share the pleasure, then in bounty share. To worth in misery a reverence pay. And with a generous hand reward his stay. For since kind heaven with wealth our realm has blessed. Give it to heaven by aiding the distressed. Then sage Echeneus, whose grave reverend brow. The hand of time had silvered o'er with snow. Mature in wisdom rose, your words, he cries. Demand obedience, for your words are wise. But let our king direct the glorious way. To generous acts. Our part is to obey. While life informs these limbs, the king replied. Well to deserve, be all my cares employed. But hear this night the royal guest detain. Till the sun flames along the ethereal plain. Be it my task to send with ample stores. The stranger from our hospitable shores. 
Tread you my steps. Tis mine to lead the race. The first in glory, as the first in place. To whom the prince, this night with joy I stay. O monarch great in virtue as in sway. If thou the circling year my stay control. To raise a bounty noble as thy soul. The circling year I wait, with ampler stores. And fitter pomp to hail my native shores. Then by my realms due homage would be paid. For wealthy kings are loyally obeyed. O king! For such thou art, and sure thy blood. Through veins, he cried, of royal fathers flowed. Unlike those vagrants who on falsehood live. Skilled in smooth tales, and artful to deceive. Thy better soul abhors the liar's part. Wise is thy voice, and noble is thy heart. Thy words like music every breast control. Steal through the ear, and win upon the soul. Soft, as some song divine, thy story flows. Nor better could the muse record thy woes. But say, upon the dark and dismal coast. Sawst thou the worthies of the Grecian host? The godlike leaders who, in battle slain. Fell before Troy, and nobly pressed the plain. And lo! A length of night behind remains. The evening stars still mount the ethereal plains. Thy tale with raptures I could hear thee tell. Thy woes on earth, the wondrous scenes in hell. Till in the vault of heaven the stars decay. And the sky reddens with the rising day. O oh, worthy of the power the gods assigned. Ulysses thus replies, a king in mind. Since yet the early hour of night allows. Time for discourse, and time for soft repose. If scenes of misery can entertain. Woes I unfold, of woes a dismal train. Prepare to air of murder and of blood. Of godlike heroes who uninjured stood. Amidst a war of spears in foreign lands. Yet bled at home, and bled by female hands. Now summon Proserpine to hell's black hall. The heroine shades, they vanished at her call. When lo! Advanced the forms of heroes slain. By stern Aegisthus, a majestic train. And, high above the rest Atrides pressed the plain. He quaffed the gore. And straight his soldier knew. And from his eyes poured down the tender dew. His arms he stretched. His arms the touch deceive. Nor in the fond embrace, embraces give. His substance vanished, and his strength decayed. Now all Atrides is an empty shade. Moved at the sight, I for a pace resigned. To soft affliction all my manly mind. At last with tears, oh what relentless doom! Imperial phantom, bowed thee to the tomb. Say while the sea, and while the tempest raves. Has fate oppressed thee in the roaring waves? Or nobly seized thee in the dire alarms? Of war and slaughter, and the clash of arms. The ghost returns, O chief of humankind. For active courage and a patient mind. Nor while the sea, nor while the tempest raves. Has fate oppressed me on the roaring waves. Nor nobly seized me in the dire alarms. Of war and slaughter, and the clash of arms. Stabbed by a murderous hand Atrides died. A foul adulterer, and a faithless bride. E'en in my mirth, and at the friendly feast. O'er the full bowl, the traitor stabbed his guest. Thus by the gory arm of slaughter falls. The stately ox, and bleeds within the stalls. But not with me the direful murder ends. These, these expired. Their crime, they were my friends. Thick as the boars, which some luxurious lord. Kills for the feast, to crown the nuptial board. When war has thundered with its loudest storms. Death thou hast seen in all her ghastly forms. In duel met her on the listed ground. When hand to hand they wound return for wound. But never have the eyes astonished viewed. So vile a deed, so dire a scene of blood. E'en in the flow of joy, when now the bowl. Glows in our veins, and opens every soul. We groan, we faint, 
with blood the doom is dyed. And o'er the pavement floats the dreadful tide. Her breast all gore, with lamentable cries. The bleeding innocent Cassandra dies. Then though pale death froze cold in every vein. My sword I strive to wield, but strive in vain. Nor did my traitorous wife these eyelids close. Or decently in death my limbs compose. O woman, woman, when to ill thy mind. Is bent, all hell contains no fouler fiend. And such was mine. Who basely plunged her sword. Through the fond bosom where she reigned adored. Alas! I hope the toils of war overcome. To meet soft quiet and repose at home. Delusive hope. O wife, thy deeds disgrace. The perjured sex, and blacken all the race. And should posterity one virtuous find. Name Clytemnestra, they will curse the kind. O injured shade, I cried, what mighty woes. To thy imperial race from woman rose. By woman here thou treads this mournful strand. And Greece by woman lies a desert land. Warned by my ills beware, the shade replies. Nor trust the sex that is so rarely wise. When earnest to explore thy secret breast. Unfold some trifle, but conceal the rest. But in thy consort cease to fear a foe. For thee she feels sincerity of woe. When Troy first bled beneath the Grecian arms. She shone unrivalled with a blaze of charms. Thy infant son her fragrant bosom pressed. Hung at her knee, or wantoned at her breast. But now the years a numerous train have ran. The blooming boy is ripened into man. Thy eyes shall see him burn with noble fire. The sire shall bless his son, the son his sire. But my Orestes never met these eyes. Without one look the murdered father dies. Then from a wretched friend this wisdom learn. E'en to thy queen disguised, unknown, return. For since of womankind so few are just. Think all are false, nor e'en the faithful trust. But, say, resides my son in royal port. In rich Orcaminos, or Sparta's court. Or say in pile. For yet he views the light. Nor glides a phantom through the realms of night. Then I, thy suit is vain, nor can I say. If yet he breathes in realms of cheerful day. Or pale or wan beholds these nether skies. Truth I revere, for wisdom never lies. Thus in a tide of tears our sorrows flow. And add new horror to the realms of woe. Till side by side along the dreary coast. Advanced Achilles and Patroclus' ghost. A friendly pair. Near these the pillion strayed. And towering Ajax, an illustrious shade. War was his joy, and pleased with loud alarms. None but Pelides brighter shone in arms. Through the thick gloom his friend Achilles knew. And as he speaks the tears descend in dew. Comest thou alive to view the Stygian bounds. Where the wan spectres walk eternal rounds. Nor fierce the dark and dismal waste to tread. Thronged with pale ghosts, familiar with the dead. To whom with sighs, I pass these dreadful gates. To seek the Theban, and consult the fates. For still, distressed, I rove from coast to coast. Lost to my friends, and to my country lost. But sure the eye of time beholds no name. So blessed as thine in all the roles of fame. Alive we hailed thee with our guardian gods. And dead thou rulest a king in these abodes. Talk not of ruling in this dolorous gloom. Nor think vain words, he cried, can ease my doom. Rather I'd choose laboriously to bear. A weight of woes, and breathe the vital air. A slave to some poor hind that toils for bread. Then reign the sceptred monarch of the dead. But say, if in my steps my son proceeds. And emulates his godlike father's deeds. If at the clash of arms, and shout of foes. Swells his bold heart, his bosom nobly glows. Say if my sire, the reverend Peleus, reigns. Great in his thia, 
and his throne maintains. Or, weak and old, my youthful arm demands. To fix the scepter steadfast in his hands. Oh, might the lamp of life rekindled burn. And death release me from the silent urn. This arm, that thundered o'er the Phrygian plain. And swelled the ground with mountains of the slain. Should vindicate my injured father's fame. Crush the proud rebel, and assert his claim. Illustrious shade, I cried, of Peleus fates. No circumstance the voice of fame relates. But hear with pleased attention the renown. The wars and wisdom of thy gallant son. With me from Cyrus to the field of fame. Radiant in arms the blooming hero came. When Greece assembled all her hundred states. To ripen councils, and decide debates. Heavens! How he charmed us with a flow of sense. And won the heart with manly eloquence. He first was seen of all the peers to rise. The third in wisdom, where they all were wise. But when, to try the fortune of the day. Host moved toward host in terrible array. Before the van, impatient for the fight. With martial port he strode, and stern delight. Heaps strewed on heaps beneath his falchion groaned. And monuments of dead deformed the ground. The time would fail should I in order tell. What foes were vanquished, and what numbers fell. How, lost through love, Eurypylus was slain. And round him bled his bold Cetian train. To Troy no hero came of nobler line. Or if of nobler, Memnon, it was thine. When Ilion in the horse received her doom. And unseen armies ambushed in its womb. Greece gave her latent warriors to my care. Twas mine on Troy to pour the imprisoned war. Then when the boldest bosom beat with fear. When the stern eyes of heroes dropped a tear. Fierce in his look his ardent valor glowed. Flushed in his cheek, or sallied in his blood. Indignant in the dark recess he stands. Pants for the battle, and the war demands. His voice breathed death, and with a martial air. He grasped his sword, and shook his glittering spear. And when the gods are arms with conquest crowned. When Troy's proud bulwarks smoked upon the ground. Greece, to reward her soldiers' gallant toils. Heaped high his navy with unnumbered spoils. Thus great in glory, from the din of war. Safe he returned, without one hostile scar. Though spears in iron tempests rained around. Yet innocent they played, and guiltless of a wound. While yet I spoke, the shade with transport glowed. Rose in his majesty, and nobler trod. With haughty stock he sought the distant glades. Of warrior kings, and joined the illustrious shades. Now without number ghost by ghost arose. All wailing with unutterable woes. Alone, apart, in discontented mood. A gloomy shade the sullen Ajax stood. Forever sad, with proud disdain he pined. And the lost arms forever stung his mind. Though to the contest Thetis gave the laws. And Pallas, by the Trojans, judged the cause. Oh why was I victorious in the strife? Oh dear bought honour with so brave a life. With him the strength of war, the soldier's pride. Our second hope to great Achilles, died. Touched at the sight from tears I scarce refrain. And tender sorrow thrills in every vein. Pensive and sad I stand, at length accost. With accents mild the inexorable ghost. Still burns thy rage. And can brave souls resent. E'en after death. Relent, great shade, relent. Perish those arms which by the gods decree. Accursed our army with the loss of thee. With thee we fall, Greece wept thy hapless fates. And shook astonished through her hundred states. Not more, when great Achilles pressed the ground. And breathed his manly spirit through the wound. O oh, deem thy fall not owed to man's decree. Jove hated Greece, and punished Greece in thee. Turn then. O oh, peaceful turn, thy wrath control. And calm the raging tempest of thy soul. While yet I speak, 
the shade disdains to stay. In silence turns, and sullen stalks away. Touched at his sour retreat, through deepest night. Through hell's black bounds I had pursued his flight. And forced the stubborn spectre to reply. But wondrous visions drew my curious eye. High on a throne, tremendous to behold. Stern minus waves a mace of burnished gold. Around ten thousand thousand spectres stand. Through the wide dome of Dis, a trembling band. Still as they plead, the fatal lots he rolls. Absolves the just, and dooms the guilty souls. The huge Orion, of portentous size. Swift through the gloom a giant hunter flies. A ponderous mace of brass with direful sway. Aloft he whirls, to crush the savage prey. Stern beasts in trains that by his truncheon fell. Now grisly forms, shoot o'er the lawns of hell. Their titius large and long, in fetters bound. O'er spreads nine acres of infernal ground. Two ravenous vultures, furious for their food. Scream o'er the fiend, and riot in his blood. Incessant gore the liver in his breast. The immortal liver grows, and gives the immortal feast. For as o'er panopes enamel plains. Latona journeyed to the Pythian fanes. With haughty love the audacious monster strove. To force the goddess, and to rival Jove. Their tantalus along the Stygian bounds. Pours out deep groans, with groans all hell resounds. E'en in the circling floods refreshment craves. And pines with thirst amidst a sea of waves. When to the water he his lip applies. Back from his lip the treacherous water flies. Above, beneath, around his hapless head. Trees of all kinds delicious fruitage spread. Their figs, sky-dyed, a purple hue disclose. Green looks the olive, the pomegranate glows. Their dangling pears exalting scents unfold. And yellow apples ripen into gold. The fruit he strives to seize. But blasts arise. Toss it on high, and whirl it to the skies. I turned my eye, and as I turned surveyed. A mournful vision. The Sisyphean shade. With many a weary step, and many a groan. Up the high hill he heaves a huge round stone. The huge round stone, resulting with a bound. Thunders impetuous down, and smokes along the ground. Again the restless orb his toil renews. Dust mounts in clouds, and sweat descends in dews. Now I the strength of Hercules behold. A towering specter of gigantic mold. A shadowy form. For high in heaven's abodes. Himself resides, a god among the gods. There in the bright assemblies of the skies. He nectar quaffs, and he be crowns his joys. Here hovering ghosts, like fowl, his shade surround. And clang their pinions with terrific sound. Gloomy as night he stands, in act to throw. The aerial arrow from the twanging bow. Around his breast a wondrous zone is rolled. Where woodland monsters grin in fretted gold. Their sullen lions sternly seem to roar. The bear to growl to foam the tusky boar. Their war and havoc and destruction stood. And vengeful murder red with human blood. Thus terribly adorned the figures shine. Inimitably wrought with skill divine. The mighty good advanced with awful look. And, turning his grim visage, sternly spoke. O oh, exercise in grief. By arts refined. O oh, taught to bear the wrongs of base mankind. Such, such was I. Still tossed from care to care. While in your world I drew the vital air. E and I, who from the Lord of Thunders rose. Bore toils and dangers, and a weight of woes. To a base monarch still a slave confined. The hardest bondage to a generous mind. Down to these worlds I trod the dismal way. And dragged the three-mouthed dog to upper day. E'en hell I conquered, through the friendly aid. Of Maya's offspring, and the martial maid. Thus he, nor deigned for our reply to stay. But, turning, 
stalked with giant strides away. Curious to view the kings of ancient days. The mighty dead that live in endless praise. Resolved I stand. And haply had surveyed. The godlike Theseus, and Pyrithoa's shade. But swarms of spectres rose from deepest hell. With bloodless visage, and with hideous yell. They scream, they shriek. And groans and dismal sounds. Stun my scared ears, and pierce hell's utmost bounds. No more my heart the dismal din sustains. And my cold blood hangs shivering in my veins. Lest Gorgon, rising from the infernal lakes. With horrors armed, and curls of hissing snakes. Should fix me stiffened at the monstrous sight. A stony image, in eternal night. Straight from the direful coast to purer air. I speed my flight, and to my mates repair. My mates ascend the ship, they strike their oars. The mountains lessen, and retreat the shores. Swift o'er the waves we fly. The freshening gales. Sing through the shrouds, and stretch the swelling sails. Book 12. Argument. The Cyrene, Scylla, and Charybdis. He relates how, after his return from the shades, he was sent by Circe on his voyage, by the coast of the Sirens, and by the strait of Scylla and Charybdis, the manner in which he escaped those dangers, how, being cast on the island Trinacria. His companions destroyed the oxen of the sun, the vengeance that followed. How all perished by shipwreck except himself, who, swimming on the mast of the ship, arrived on the island of Calypso. With which his narration concludes. Thus o'er the rolling surge the vessel flies. Till from the waves the Aeaean hills arise. Here the gay morn resides in radiant bowers. Here keeps here revels with the dancing hours. Here Phoebus, rising in the ethereal way. Through heaven's bright portals pours the beamy day. At once we fix our housers on the land. At once descend, and press the desert sand. There, worn and wasted, lose our cares in sleep. To the hoarse murmurs of the rolling deep. Soon as the morn restored the day, we paid. Sepulchral honors to Elpiner's shade. Now by the axe the rushing forest bends. And the huge pile along the shore ascends. Around we stand, a melancholy train. And a loud groan re-echoes from the main. Fierce o'er the pyre, by fanning breezes spread. The hungry flames devour the silent dead. A rising tomb, the silent dead to grace. Fast by the roarings of the main we place. The rising tomb a lofty column bore. And high above it rose the tapering oar. Meantime the goddess our return surveyed. From the pale ghosts and hell's tremendous shade. Swift she descends, a train of nymphs divine. Bear the rich viands and the generous wine. In act to speak the power of magic stands. And graceful thus accosts the listening bands. O sons of woe! Decreed by adverse fates. Alive to pass through hell's eternal gates. All, soon or late, are doomed that path to tread. More wretched you! Twice numbered with the dead. This day adjourn your cares, exalt your souls. Indulge the taste, and drain the sparkling bowls. And when the morn unveils her saffron ray. Spread your broad sails, and plough the liquid way. Lo, I this night, your faithful guide, explain. Your woes by land, your dangers on the main. The goddess spoke. In feasts we waste the day. Till Phoebus downward plunged his burning ray. Then sable night ascends, and balmy rest. Seals every eye, and calms the troubled breast. Then curious she commands me to relate. The dreadful scenes of Pluto's dreary state. She sat in silence while the tale I tell. The wondrous visions and the laws of hell. Then thus, the lot of man the gods dispose. These ills are past, now hear thy future woes. O prince attend. Some favoring power be kind and print the important story on thy mind. Next, where the sirens dwells, you plough the seas. 
their song is death, and makes destruction please. Unblessed the man, who music wins to stay. Nigh the cursed shore and listen to the lay. No more that wretch shall view the joys of life. His blooming offspring, or his beauteous wife. In verdant meads they sport. And wide around. Lie human bones that whiten all the ground. The ground polluted floats with human gore. And human carnage taints the dreadful shore. Fly swift the dangerous coast, let every year. Be stopped against the song, tis death to hear. Firm to the mast with chains thyself be bound. Nor trust thy virtue to the enchanting sound. If, mad with transport, freedom thou demand. Be every fetter strained, an added band to band. These seas o erpist, be wise. But I refrain. To mark distinct thy voyage o'er the main. New horrors rise. Let prudence be thy guide. And guard thy various passage through the tide. High o'er the main two rocks exalt their brow. The boiling billows thundering roll below. Through the vast waves the dreadful wonders move. Hence named erratic by the gods above. No bird of air, no dove of swiftest wing. That bears ambrosia to the ethereal king. Shuns the dire rocks, in vain she cuts the skies. The dire rocks meet, and crush her as she flies. Not the fleet bark, when prosperous breezes play. Plows o'er that roaring surge its desperate way. O'erwhelmed e it sinks, while round a smoke expires. And the waves flashing seem to burn with fires. Scarce the famed Argo passed these raging floods. The sacred Argo, filled with demigods. E'en she had sunk, but Jove's imperial bride. Winged her fleet sail, and pushed her o'er the tide. High in the air the rock its summit shrouds. In brooding tempests, and in rolling clouds. Loud storms around, and mists eternal rise. Beat its bleak brow, and intercept the skies. When all the broad expansion, bright with day. Glows with the autumnal or the summer ray. The summer and the autumn glow in vain. The sky forever lowers, forever clouds remain. Impervious to the step of man it stands. Though borne by twenty feet, though armed with twenty hands. Smooth as the polish of the mirror rise. The slippery sides, and shoot into the skies. Full in the center of this rock displayed. A yawning cavern casts a dreadful shade. Nor the fleet arrow from the twanging bow. Sent with full force, could reach the depth below. Wide to the west the horrid gulf extends. And the dire passage down to hell descends. O oh fly the dreadful sight. Expand thy sails. Ply the strong oar, and catch the nimble gales. Hear Scylla bellows from the dire abodes. Tremendous pest, abhorred by man and gods. Hideous her voice, and with less terrors roar. The whelps of lions in the midnight hour. Twelve feet, deformed and foul, the fiend dispreads. Six horrid necks she rears, and six terrific heads. Her jaws grin dreadful with three rows of teeth. Jaggy they stand, the gaping den of death. Her parts obscene the raging billows hide. Her bosom terribly o'erlooks the tide. When stung with hunger she embroils the flood. The sea-dog and the dolphin are her food. She makes the huge leviathan her prey. And all the monsters of the watery way. The swiftest racer of the azure plain. Here fills her sails, and spreads her oars in vain. Fell Scylla rises, in her fury roars. At once six mouths expands, at once six men devours. Close by, a rock of less enormous height. Breaks the wild waves, and forms a dangerous strait. Full on its crown a fig's green branches rise. And shoot a leafy forest to the skies. Beneath, Charybdis holds her boisterous reign. Midst roaring whirlpools, and absorbs the main. Thrice in her gulfs the boiling seas subside. Thrice in dire thunders she refunds the tide. Oh, if thy vessel plough the direful waves. 
when sees retreating roar within her caves. Ye perish all. Though he who rules the main lends his strong aid, his aid he lends in vain. Ah, shun the horrid gulf. By Scylla fly. Tis better six to lose, than all to die. I then, O nymph propitious to my prayer. Goddess divine, my guardian power, declare. Is the foul fiend from human vengeance freed? Or, if I rise in arms, can Scylla bleed? Then she, O worn by toils, O broken fight. Still are new toils and war thy dire delight. Will martial flames forever fire thy mind? And never, never be to heaven resigned? How vain thy efforts to avenge the wrong! Deathless the pest! Impenetrably strong! Furious and fell, tremendous to behold! E'en with a look she withers all the bold! She mocks the weak attempts of human might! Oh, fly her rage! Thy conquest is thy flight! If but to seize thy arms thou make delay. Again thy fury vindicates her prey. Her six mouths yawn, and six are snatched away. From her foul wound Cratius gave to air. This dreadful pest. To her direct thy prayer. To curb the monster in her dire abodes. And guard thee through the tumult of the floods. Thence to Trinacria's shore you bend your way. Where graze thy herds, illustrious source of day. Seven herds, seven flocks enrich the sacred plains. Each herd, each flock full fifty heads contains. The wondrous kind a length of age survey. By breed increase not, nor by death decay. Two sister goddesses possess the plain. The constant guardian of the woolly train. Lampity fair, and Phethusa young. From Phoebus and the bright Nia sprung. Here, watchful o'er the flocks, in shady bowers. And flowery meads, they waste the joyous hours. Rob not the gods. And so propitious gales. Attend thy voyage, and impel thy sails. But if thy impious hands the flocks destroy. The gods, the gods avenge it, and ye die. Tis thine alone, thy friends and navy lost through tedious toils to view thy native coast. She ceased, and now arose the morning ray. Swift to her dome the goddess held her way. Then to my mates I measured back the plain. Climbed the tall bark, and rushed into the main. Then, bending to the stroke, their oars they drew. To their broad breasts, and swift the galley flew. Up sprung a brisker breeze, with freshening gales. The friendly goddess stretched the swelling sails. We drop our oars, at ease the pilot guides. The vessel light along the level glides. When, rising sad and slow, with pensive look. Thus to the melancholy train I spoke. O friends, O ever partners of my woes. Attend while I what heaven for dooms disclose. Hear all. Fate hangs o'er all, on you it lies to live or perish. To be safe, be wise. In flowery meads the sportive sirens play. Touch the soft lyre, and tune the vocal lay. Me, me alone, with fetters firmly bound. The gods allow to hear the dangerous sound. Hear and obey. If freedom I demand. Be every fetter strained, be added band to band. While yet I speak the winged galley flies. And lo! The siren shores like mists arise. Sunk where at once the winds, the air above. And waves below, at once forgot to move. Some demon calmed the air and smoothed the deep. Hushed the loud winds, and charmed the waves to sleep. Now every sail we furl, each or we ply. Lashed by the stroke, the frothy waters fly. The ductile wax with busy hands I mold and cleft in fragments, and the fragments rolled. The aerial region now grew warm with day. The wax dissolved beneath the burning ray. Then every ear I barred against the strain. And from access of frenzy locked the brain. Now round the masts my mates the fetters rolled. 
and bound me limb by limb with fold on fold. Then bending to the stroke, the active train. Plunge all at once their oars, and cleave the main. While to the shore the rapid vessel flies. Our swift approach the siren choir descries. Celestial music warbles from their tongue. And thus the sweet deluders tune the song. O oh stay, O oh pride of Greece! Ulysses, stay! O oh cease thy course, and listen to our lay! Blessed is the man ordained our voice to hear. The song instructs the soul, and charms the ear. Approach! Thy soul shall into raptures rise. Approach! And learn new wisdom from the wise. We know whatever the kings of mighty name. Achieve that Ilion in the field of fame. Whatever beneath the sun's bright journey lies. O oh, stay, and learn new wisdom from the wise. Thus the sweet charmers warbled o'er the main. My soul takes wing to meet the heavenly strain. I give the sign, and struggle to be free. Swift row my mates, and shoot along the sea. New chains they add, and rapid urge the way. Till, dying off, the distant sounds decay. Then scudding swiftly from the dangerous ground. The deafened ear unlocked, the chains unbound. Now all at once tremendous scenes unfold. Thundered the deeps, the smoky billows rolled. Tumultuous waves embroil the bellowing flood. All trembling, deafened, and aghast we stood. No more the vessel ploughed the dreadful wave. Fear seized the mighty, and unnerved the brave. Each dropped his oar. But swift from man to man. With look serene I turned, and thus began. O oh friends! O oh often tried in adverse storms. With ills familiar in more dreadful forms. Deep in the dire Cyclopean den you lay. Yet safe returned, Ulysses led the way. Learn courage hence, and in my care confide. Lo! Still the same Ulysses is your guide. Attend my words. Your oars incessant ply. Strain every nerve, and bid the vessel fly. If from yon jostling rocks and wavy war. Jove safety grants, he grants it to your care. And thou, whose guiding hand directs our way. Pilot, attentive listen and obey. Bear wide thy course, nor plough those angry waves. Where rolls yon smoke, yon tumbling ocean raves. Steer by the higher rock, lest world around. We sink, beneath the circling eddy drowned. While yet I speak, at once their oars they seize. Stretch to the stroke, and brush the working seas. Cautious the name of Scylla I suppressed. That dreadful sound had chilled the boldest breast. Meantime, forgetful of the voice divine. All dreadful bright my limbs in armor shine. High on the deck I take my dangerous stand. Two glittering javelins lighten in my hand. Prepared to whirl the whizzing spear I stay. Till the fell fiend arise to seize her prey. Around the dungeon, studious to behold. The hideous pest, my laboring eyes I rolled. In vain. The dismal dungeon, dark as night. Veils the dire monster, and confounds the sight. Now through the rocks, appalled with deep dismay. We bend our course, and stem the desperate way. Dire Scylla there a scene of horror forms. And here Charybdis fills the deep with storms. When the tide rushes from her rumbling caves. The rough rock roars, tumultuous boil the waves. They toss, they foam, a wild confusion raise. Like waters bubbling o'er the fiery blaze. Eternal mists obscure the aerial plain. And high above the rock she spouts the main. When in her gulfs the rushing sea subsides. She drains the ocean with the refluent tides. The rock rebellows with a thundering sound. Deep, wondrous deep, below appears the ground. Struck with despair, with trembling hearts we viewed. The yawning dungeon, and the tumbling flood. When lo! Fierce Scylla stooped to seize her prey. Stretched her dire jaws, and swept six men away. Chiefs of renown. 
loud echoing shrieks arise. I turn, and view them quivering in the skies. They call, and aid with outstretched arms implore. In vain they call. Those arms are stretched no more. As from some rock that overhangs the flood. The silent fisher casts the insidious food. With fraudful care he waits the finny prize. And sudden lifts it quivering to the skies. So the foul monster lifts her prey on high. So pant the wretches struggling in the sky. In the wide dungeon she devours her food. And the flesh trembles while she churns the blood. Worn as I am with griefs, with care decayed. Never, I never seen so dire surveyed. My shivering blood, congealed, forgot to flow. Aghast I stood, a monument of woe. Now from the rocks the rapid vessel flies. And the hoarse din like distant thunder dies. To soul's bright isle our voyage we pursue. And now the glittering mountains rise to view. There, sacred to the radiant god of day. Graze the fair herds, the flocks promiscuous stray. Then suddenly was heard along the main. To low the ox, to bless the woolly train. Straight to my anxious thoughts the sound conveyed. The words of Circe and the Theban shade. Warned by their awful voice these shores to shun. With cautious fears oppressed I thus begun. O friends! O ever exorcised in care! Hear heaven's commands, and reverence what ye hear. To fly these shores the prescient Theban shade. And Circe warn. O oh, be their voice obeyed. Some mighty woe relentless heaven forebodes. Fly these dire regions, and revere the gods. While yet I spoke, a sudden sorrow ran. Through every breast, and spread from man to man. Till wrathful thus Eurylochus began. O oh, cruel thou! Some fury sure has steeled. That stubborn soul, by toil untaught to yield. From sleep to bard, we sink from woes to woes. And cruel, envious thou a short repose. Still must we restless rove, new seas explore. The sun descending, and so near the shore. And lo! The night begins her gloomy reign. And doubles all the terrors of the main. Oft in the dead of night loud winds rise. Lash the wild surge, and bluster in the skies. Oh, should the fierce southwest his rage display. And toss with rising storms the watery way. Though gods descend from heaven's aerial plain. To lend us aid, the gods descend in vain. Then while the night displays her awful shade. Sweet time of slumber. Be the night obey. Haste ye to land. And when the morning ray. Sheds her bright beam, pursue the destined way. A sudden joy in every bosom rose. So willed some demon, minister of woes. To whom with grief, O oh swift to be undone. Constrained I act what wisdom bids me shun. But yonder herbs and yonder flocks forbear. Attest the heavens, and call the gods to hear. Content, an innocent repast display. By Circe given, and fly the dangerous prey. Thus I, and while to shore the vessel flies. With hands uplifted they attest the skies. Then, where a fountain's gurgling waters play. They rush to land, and end in feasts the day. They feed, they quaff. And now, their hunger fled. Sigh for their friends devoured, and mourn the dead. Nor cease the tears till each in slumber shares. A sweet forgetfulness of human cares. Now far the night advanced her gloomy reign. And setting stars rolled down the azure plain. When at the voice of Jove wild whirlwinds rise. And clouds and double darkness veil the skies. The moon, the stars, the bright ethereal host. Seem as extinct, and all their splendors lost. The furious tempest roars with dreadful sound. Air thunders, rolls the ocean, groans the ground. All night it raged, when morning rose to land. We hauled our bark, and moored it on the strand. Where in a beauteous grotto's cool recess. Danced the green narolds of the neighboring seas. 
there while the wild winds whistled o'er the main. Thus careful I addressed the listening train. O friends, be wise. Nor dare the flocks destroy. Of these fair pastures, if ye touch, ye die. Warned by the high command of heaven, be awed. Holy the flocks, and dreadful is the God. That God who spreads the radiant beams of light. And views wide earth and heaven's unmeasured height. And now the moon had run her monthly round. The southeast blustering with a dreadful sound. Unhurt the beeves, untouched the woolly train. Low through the grove, or touched the flowery plain. Then failed our food, then fish we make our prey. Or fowl that screaming haunt the watery way. Till now from sea or flood no succor found. Famine and meager want besieged us round. Pensive and pale from grove to grove I strayed. From the loud storms to find a sylvan shade. There o'er my hands the living wave I pour. And heaven and heaven's immortal thrones implore. To calm the roarings of the stormy main. And guide me peaceful to my realms again. Then o'er my eyes the gods soft slumbers shed. While thus Eurylochus arising said. O friends, a thousand ways frail mortals lead. To the cold tomb, and dreadful all to tread. But dreadful most, when by a slow decay. Pale hunger wastes the manly strength away. Why cease ye then to implore the powers above? And offer hecatombs to thundering Jove? Why seize ye not yon beeves, and fleecy prey? Arise unanimous, arise and slay. And if the gods ordain a safe return, To Phoebus' shrines shall rise, and altars burn. But should the powers that o'er mankind preside, Decree to plunge us in the whelming tide, Better to rush at once to shades below, Than linger life away, and nourish woe. Thus he, the beeves around securely stray. When swift to ruin they invade the prey. They seize, they kill, but for the right divine. The barley failed, and for libations wine. Swift from the oak they strip the shady pride. And verdant leaves the flowery cake supplied. With prayer they now address the ethereal train. Slay the selected beeves, and flay the slain. The thighs, with fat involved, divide with art. Strewed o'er with morsels cut from every part. Water, instead of wine, is brought in urns. And poured profanely as the victim burns. The thighs thus offered, and the entrails dressed. They roast the fragments, and prepare the feast. Twas then soft slumber fled my troubled brain. Back to the bark I speed along the main. When lo! An odor from the feast exhales. Spreads o'er the coast and scents the tainted gales. A chilly fear congealed my vital blood. And thus, obtesting heaven, I mourned aloud. O sire of men and gods, immortal Jove! O all ye blissful powers that reign above! Why were my cares beguiled in short repose? O fatal slumber, paid with lasting woes! A deed so dreadful all the gods' alarms! Vengeance is on the wing, and heaven in arms! Meantime Lampity mounts the aerial way! And kindles into rage the god of day. Vengeance, ye powers, he cries, and then whose hand. Aims the red bolt, and hurls the writ hen brand. Slain are those herds which I with pride survey. When through the ports of heaven I pour the day. Or deep in ocean plunge the burning ray. Vengeance, ye gods. Or I the skies forego. And bear the lamp of heaven to shades below. To whom the thundering power, O source of day, Whose radiant lamp adorns the azure way, Still may thy beams through heaven's bright portal rise, The joy of earth, the glory of the skies. Lo! My red arm I bear, my thunders guide, To dash the offenders in the whelming tide, To fair Calypso, from the bright abodes. Hermes conveyed these counsels of the gods, Meantime from man to man my tongue exclaims. My wrath is kindled, and my soul inflames. In vain. 
I view perform the direful deed. Beeves, slain in heaps, along the ocean bleed. Now heaven gave signs of wrath, along the ground. Crept the raw hides, and with a bellowing sound. Roared the dead limbs, the burning entrails groaned. Six guilty days my wretched mates employ. In impious feasting, and unhallowed joy. The seventh arose, and now the sire of gods. Rained the rough storms, and calmed the tossing floods. With speed the bark we climb, the spacious sails. Loosed from the yards invite the impelling gales. Past sight of shore, along the surge we bound. And all above is sky, and ocean all around. When lo! A murky cloud the thunderer forms. Full o'er our heads, and blackens heaven with storms. Night dwells o'er all the deep, and now outflies. The gloomy west, and whistles in the skies. The mountain billows roar. The furious blast. Howls o'er the shroud, and rends it from the mast. The mast gives way, and, crackling as it bends. Tears up the deck. Then all at once descends. The pilot by the tumbling ruin slain. Dashed from the helm, falls headlong in the main. Then Jove in anger bids his thunders roll. And forky lightnings flash from pole to pole. Fierce at our heads his deadly bolt he aims. Red with uncommon wrath, and wrapped in flames. Full on the bark it fell. Now high, now low. Tossed and retossed, it reeled beneath the blow. At once into the main the crew it shook. Sulfurious odors rose, and smoldering smoke. Like fowl that haunt the floods, they sink, they rise. Now lost, now seen, with shrieks and dreadful cries. And strive to gain the bark, but Jove denies. Firm at the helm I stand, when fierce the main. Rushed with dire noise, and dashed the sides in twain. Again impetuous drove the furious blast. Snapped the strong helm, and bore to see the mast. Firm to the mast with cords the helm I bind. And ride aloft, to providence resigned. Through tumbling billows and a war of wind. Now sunk the west, and now a southern breeze. More dreadful than the tempest lashed the seas. For on the rocks it bore where Scylla raves. And dire Charybdis rolls her thundering waves. All night I drove, and at the dawn of day. Fast by the rocks beheld the desperate way. Just when the sea within her gulf subsides. And in the roaring whirlpools rush the tides. Swift from the float I vaulted with a bound. The lofty fig tree seized, and clung around. So to the beam the bat tenacious clings. And pendant round it clasps his leather wings. High in the air the tree its boughs displayed. And o'er the dungeon cast a dreadful shade. All unsustained between the wave and sky. Beneath my feet the whirling billows fly. What time the judge forsakes the noisy bar. To take repast, and stills the wordy war. Charybdis, rumbling from her inmost caves. The mast refunded on her refluent waves. Swift from the tree, the floating mast to gain. Sudden I dropped amidst the flashing main. Once more undaunted on the ruin road. And oared with laboring arms along the flood. Unseen I passed by Scylla's dire abodes. So Jove decreed, dread sire of men and gods. Then nine long days I ploughed the calmer seas. Heaved by the surge, and wafted by the breeze. Weary and wet the Ogygian shores I gain. When the tenth sun descended to the main. There, in Calypso's ever-fragrant bowers. Refreshed I lay, and joy beguiled the hours. My following fates to thee, O king, are known. And the bright partner of thy royal throne. Enough, in misery can words avail. And what so tedious as a twice-told tale? Book 13. Argument. The Arrival of Ulysses in Ithaca. Ulysses takes his leave of Alcinous and Arate, and embarks in the evening. Next morning the ship arrives at Ithaca. Where the sailors, as Ulysses is yet sleeping, 
lay him on the shore with all his treasures. On their return, Neptune changes their ship into a rock. In the meantime Ulysses, awaking, knows not his native Ithaca, by reason of a mist which Pallas had cast around him. He breaks into loud lamentations. Till the goddess appearing to him in the form of a shepherd, discovers the country to him, and points out the particular places. He then tells a feigned story of his adventures, upon which she manifests herself, and they consult together of the measures to be taken to destroy the suitors. To conceal his return, and disguise his person the more effectually, she changes him into the figure of an old beggar. He ceased, but left so pleasing on their ear. His voice, that listening still they seemed to hear. A pause of silence hushed the shady rooms. The grateful conference then the king resumes. Whatever toils the great Ulysses passed. Beneath this happy roof they end at last. No longer now from shore to shore to roam. Smooth seas and gentle winds invite him home. But hear me, princes. Whom these walls enclose. For whom my chanter sings, and goblet flows. With wine unmixed, an honor due to age. To cheer the grave, and warm the poet's rage. Though labored gold and many a dazzling vest. Lie heaped already for our godlike guest. Without new treasures let him not remove. Large, and expressive of the public love. Each pure a tripod, each a vase bestow. A general tribute, which the state shall owe. This sentence pleased, then all their steps addressed. To separate mansions, and retired to rest. Now did the rosy-fingered morn arise. And shed her sacred light along the skies. Down to the haven and the ships in haste. They bore the treasures, and in safety placed. The king himself the vases ranged with care. Then bade his followers to the feast prepare. A victim ox beneath the sacred hand. Of great Alcinous falls, and stains the sand. To Jove the Eternal, power above all powers. Who wings the winds, and darkens heaven with showers. The flames ascend, till evening they prolong. The rites, more sacred made by heavenly song. For in the midst, with public honors graced. Thy lyre divine, Demodocus. Was placed. All, but Ulysses, heard with fixed delight. He sate, and eyed the sun, and wished the night. Slow seemed the sun to move, the hours to roll. His native home deep imaged in his soul. As the tired plowman, spent with stubborn toil. Whose oxen long have torn the furrowed soil. Sees with delight the sun's declining ray. When home with feeble knees he bends his way. To late repast, the day's hard labor done. So to Ulysses welcome set the sun. Then instant to Alcinous and the rest. The Shirzian states, he turned, and thus addressed. O thou, the first in merit and command. And you the peers and princes of the land. May every joy be yours. Nor this the least. When do libation shall have crowned the feast. Safe to my home to send your happy guest. Complete are now the bounties you have given. Be all those bounties but confirmed by heaven. So may I find, when all my wanderings cease. My consort blameless, and my friends in peace. On you be every bliss, and every day. In home felt joys, delighted roll away. Yourselves, your wives, your long descending race. May every god enrich with every grace. Sure fixed on virtue may your nation stand. And public evil never touch the land. His words well wait, the general voice approved. Benign, and instant his dismission moved. The monarch to Pontonus gave the sign. To fill the goblet high with rosy wine. Great Jove the father first, he cried, implore. Then send the stranger to his native shore. The luscious wine the obedient herald brought. Around the mansion flowed the purple draught. Each from his seat to each immortal pours. Whom glory circles in the Olympian bowers. Ulysses' soul with air majestic stands. The bowl presenting to Arate's hands. Then thus, 
O Queen, farewell. Be still possessed. Of dear remembrance, blessing still and blessed. Till age and death shall gently call thee hence. Sure fate of every mortal excellence. Farewell. And joys successive ever spring. To thee, to thine, the people, and the king. Thus he, then parting prince the sandy shore. To the fair port, a herald marched before. Sent by Alcinous, of Arate's train. Three chosen maids attend him to the main. This does a tunic and white vest convey. A various casket that, of rich inlay. And bread and wine the third. The cheerful mates. Safe in the hollow poop dispose the cates. Upon the deck soft painted robes they spread. With linen covered, for the hero's bed. He climbed the lofty stern, then gently pressed. The swelling couch, and lay composed to rest. Now placed in order, the Phaeacian train. Their cables loose, and launch into the main. At once they bend, and strike their equal oars. And leave the sinking hills and lessening shores. While on the deck the chief in silence lies. And pleasing slumbers steal upon his eyes. As fiery coursers in the rapid race. Urged by fierce drivers through the dusty space. Toss their high heads, and scour along the plain. So mounts the bounding vessel o'er the main. Back to the stern the parted billows flow. And the black ocean foams and roars below. Thus with spread sails the winged galley flies. Less swift an eagle cuts the liquid skies. Divine Ulysses was her sacred load. A man, in wisdom equal to a god. Much danger, long and mighty toils he bore. In storms by sea, and combats on the shore. All which soft sleep now banished from his breast. Wrapped in a pleasing, deep, and death-like rest. But when the morning star with early ray. Flamed in the front of heaven, and promised day. Like distant clouds the mariner descries. Fair Ithaca's emerging hills arise. Far from the town a spacious port appears. Sacred to force's power, whose name it bears. Two craggy rocks projecting to the main. The roaring winds tempestuous rage restrain. Within the waves in softer murmurs glide. And ships secure without their housers ride. High at the head a branching olive grows. And crowns the pointed cliffs with shady boughs. Beneath, a gloomy grotto's cool recess. Delights the nereids of the neighboring seas. Where bowls and urns were formed of living stone. And massy beams in native marble shone. On which the labors of the nymphs were rolled. Their webs divine of purple mixed with gold. Within the cave the clustering bees attend. Their waxen works, or from the roof depend. Perpetual waters o'er the pavement glide. Two marble doors unfold on either side. Sacred the south, by which the gods descend. But mortals enter at the northern end. Thither they bent, and hauled their ship to land. The crooked keel divides the yellow sand. Ulysses sleeping on his couch they bore. And gently placed him on the rocky shore. His treasures next, Alcinous gifts, they laid. In the wild olive's unfrequented shade. Secure from theft. Then launched the bark again. Resumed their oars, and measured back the main. Nor yet forgot old ocean's dread supreme. The vengeance vowed for eyeless Polypheme. Before the throne of mighty Jove lie stood. And sought the secret counsels of the god. Shall then no more, O sire of gods. Be mine. The rights and honors of a power divine. Scorned e'en by man, and, O oh, severe disgrace! By soft fiations, my degenerate race. Against yon destined head in vain I swore. And menaced vengeance, ere he reached his shore. To reach his natal shore was thy decree. Mild I obeyed, for who shall war with thee? Behold him landed, careless and asleep. From all the eluded dangers of the deep. Lo where he lies, amidst a shining store. Of brass, 
rich garments, and refulgent ore. And bears triumphant to his native isle. A prize more worth than Ilion's noble spoil. To whom the father of the immortal powers. Who swells the clouds, and gladdens earth with showers. Can mighty Neptune thus of man complain? Neptune, tremendous o'er the boundless main. Revered and awful e'en in heaven's abodes. Ancient and great. A god above the gods. If that low race offend thy power divine. Weak, daring creatures, is not vengeance thine. Go, then, the guilty at thy will chastise. He said. The shaker of the earth replies. This then, I doom, to fix the gallant ship. A mark of vengeance on the sable deep. To warn the thoughtless, self-confiding train. No more unlicensed thus to brave the main. Full in their port a shady hill shall rise. If such thy will. We will it, Jove replies. E'en when with transport blackening all the strand. The swarming people hail their ship to land. Fix her forever, a memorial stone. Still let her seem to sail, and seem alone. The trembling crowds shall see the sudden shade. Of whelming mountains overhang their head. With that the god whose earthquakes rock the ground. Fierce to Phaeacia crossed the vast profound. Swift as a swallow sweeps the liquid way. The winged pinnace shot along the sea. The god arrests her with a sudden stroke. And roots her down an everlasting rock. Aghast the Scyrians stand in deep surprise. All press to speak, all question with their eyes. What hands unseen the rapid bark restrain? And yet it swims, or seems to swim, the main. Thus they, unconscious of the deed divine. Till great Alcinous, rising, owned the sign. Behold the long predestined day I, he cries winky face. O oh, certain faith of ancient prophecies! These ears have heard my royal sire disclose. A dreadful story, big with future woes. How, moved with wrath, that careless we convey. Promiscuous every guest to every bay. Stern Neptune raged, and how by his command. Firm rooted in the surge a ship should stand. A monument of wrath. And mound on mound. Should hide our walls, or whelm beneath the ground. The fates have followed as declared the seer. Be humbled, nations. And your monarch here. No more unlicensed brave the deeps, no more. With every stranger pass from shore to shore. On angry Neptune now for mercy call. To his high name let twelve black oxen fall. So may the god reverse his purposed will. Nor o'er our city hang the dreadful hill. The monarch spoke they trembled and obeyed. Forth on the sands the victim oxen led. The gathered tribes before the altars stand. And chiefs and rulers, a majestic band. The king of ocean all the tribes implore. The blazing altars redden all the shore. Meanwhile Ulysses in his country lay. Released from sleep, and round him might survey. The solitary shore and rolling sea. Yet had his mind through tedious absence lost. The dear resemblance of his native coast. Besides, Minerva, to secure her care. Diffused around a veil of thickened air. For so the gods ordained to keep unseen. His royal person from his friends and queen. Till the proud suitors for their crimes afford. An ample vengeance to their injured lord. Now all the land another prospect bore. Another port appeared, another shore. And long continued ways, and winding floods. And unknown mountains, crowned with unknown woods. Pensive and slow, with sudden grief oppressed. The king arose, and beat his careful breast. Cast a long look o'er all the coast and main. And sought. Around, his native realm in vain. Then with erected eyes stood fixed in woe. And as he spoke, the tears began to flow. Ye gods, he cried, upon what barren coast? In what new region, is Ulysses tossed? Possessed by wild barbarians, 
fierce in arms. Or men whose bosom tender pity warms. Where shall this treasure now in safely be? And whither, whither its sad owner fly? Ah, why did I Elsinoa's grace implore? Ah, why forsake Phaeacia's happy shore? Some juster prince perhaps had entertained. And safe restored me to my native land. Is this the promised, long-expected coast? And this the faith Phaeacia's rulers boast? O righteous gods! Of all the great, how few! Are just to heaven, and to their promise true. But he, the power to whose all-seeing eyes. The deeds of men appear without disguise. Tis his alone to avenge the wrongs I bear. For still the oppressed are his peculiar care. To count these presents, and from thence to prove. Their faith is mine, the rest belongs to Jove. Then on the sands he ranged his wealthy store. The gold, the vests, the tripods numbered o'er. All these he found, but still in error lost. Disconsolate he wanders on the coast. Sighs for his country, and laments again. To the deaf rocks. And hoarse resounding main. When lo! The guardian goddess of the wise. Celestial palace, stood before his eyes. In show a youthful swain, of form divine. Who seemed descended from some princely line. A graceful robe her slender body dressed. Around her shoulders flew the waving vest. Her decent hand a shining javelin bore. And painted sandals on her feet she wore. To whom the king, who are of human race. Thou art, that wanderest in this desert place. With joy to thee, as to some god I bend. To thee my treasures and myself commend. O oh, tell a wretch in exile doomed to stray. What air I breathe, what country I survey. The fruitful continent's extremest bound. Or some fair isle which Neptune's arms surround. From what far clime, said she, remote from fame. Arrivest thou here, a stranger to our name. Thou sayest an island, not to those unknown. Whose hills are brightened by the rising sun. Nor those that placed beneath his utmost reign. Behold him sinking in the western main. The rugged soil allows no level space. For flying chariots, or the rapid race. Yet, not ungrateful to the peasant's pain. Suffices fullness to the swelling grain. The loaded trees their various fruits produce. And clustering grapes afford a generous juice. Woods crown our mountains, and in every grove. The bounding goats and frisking heifers rove. Soft rains and kindly dews refresh the field. And rising springs eternal verdure yield. E'en to those shores is Ithaca renowned. Where Troy's majestic ruins strew the ground. At this, the chief with transport was possessed. His panting heart exulted in his breast. Yet, well dissembling his untimely joys. And veiling truth in plausible disguise. Thus, with an air sincere, in fiction bold. His ready tale the inventive hero told. Oft have I heard in Crete this island's name. For, t'was from Crete, my native soil, I came. Self banished thence. I sailed before the wind. And left my children and my friends behind. From fierce Idomeneus revenge I flew. Whose son, the swift Orsilicus, I slew. With brutal force he seized my Trojan prey. Due to the toils of many a bloody day. Unseen I escaped, and favored by the night. In a Phoenician vessel took my flight. For Pyle or Ellis bound, but tempests tossed. And raging billows drove us on your coast. In dead of night an unknown port we gained. Spent with fatigue, and slept secure on land. But ere the rosy morn renewed the day. While in the embrace of pleasing sleep I lay. Sudden, invited by auspicious gales. They land my goods, and hoist their flying sails. Abandoned here, my fortune I deplore. A hapless exile on a foreign shore. Thus while he spoke, the blue-eyed maid began. With pleasing smiles to view the godlike man. 
then changed her form, and now, divinely bright. Jove's heavenly daughter stood confessed to sight. Like a fair virgin in her beauty's bloom. Skilled in the illustrious labors of the loom. Oh, still the same Ulysses. She rejoined. In useful craft successfully refined. Artful in speech, in action, and in mind. Sufficed it not, that, thy long labors past. Secure thou sayest thy native shore at last. But this to me. Who, like thyself, excel. In arts of counsel and dissembling well. To me. Whose wit exceeds the powers divine. No less than mortals are surpassed by thine. Knowst thou not me. Who made thy life my care. Through ten years wandering, and through ten years war. Who taught the arts, Alcinous to persuade. To raise his wonder, and engage his aid. And now appear, thy treasures to protect. Conceal thy person, thy designs direct. And tell what more thou must from fate expect. Domestic woes far heavier to be borne. The pride of fools, and slaves insulting scorn. But thou be silent, nor reveal thy state. Yield to the force of unresisted fate. And bear unmoved the wrongs of base mankind. The last, and hardest, conquest of the mind. Goddess of Wisdom. Ithacus replies. He who discerns thee must be truly wise. So seldom viewed and ever in disguise. When the bold Argives led their warring powers. Against proud Aelians well-defended towers. Ulysses was thy care, celestial maid. Graced with thy sight, and favored with thy aid. But when the Trojan piles and ashes lay. And bound for Greece we plowed the watery way. Our fleet dispersed, and driven from coast to coast. Thy sacred presence from that hour I lost. Till I beheld thy radiant form once more. And heard thy counsels on Phaeacia's shore. But, by the Almighty Author of thy race. Tell me, O oh tell, is this my native place? For much I fear, long tracts of land and sea. Divide this coast from distant Ithaca. The sweet delusion kindly you impose. To soothe my hopes, and mitigate my woes. Thus he. The blue-eyed goddess thus replies. How prone to doubt, how cautious are the wise. Who, versed in fortune, fear the flattering show. And taste not half the bliss the gods bestow. The more shall Pallas aid thy just desires. And guard the wisdom which herself inspires. Others long absent from their native place. Straight seek their home, and fly with eager pace. To their wives' arms, and children's dear embrace. Not thus Ulysses, he decrees to prove. His subjects' faith, and queen's suspected love. Who mourned her lord twice ten revolving years. And wastes the days in grief, the nights in tears. But Pallas knew, thy friends and navy lost. Once more, t'was given thee to behold thy coast. Yet how could I with adverse fate engage? And mighty Neptune's unrelenting rage? Now lift thy longing eyes, while I restore. The pleasing prospect of thy native shore. Be bold the port of forces. Fenced around. With rocky mountains, and with olives crowned. Behold the gloomy grot. Whose cool recess. Delights the nereids of the neighboring seas. Whose now neglected altars in thy reign. Blushed with the blood of sheep and oxen slain. Behold. Where Neritus the clouds divides. And shakes the waving forests on his sides. So spake the goddess, and the prospect cleared. The mists dispersed, and all the coast appeared. The king with joy confessed his place of birth and on his knees salutes his mother earth. Then, with his suppliant hands upheld in air. Thus to the sea-green sisters sends his prayer. All hail! Ye virgin daughters of the main! Ye streams, beyond my hopes, beheld again! To you once more your own Ulysses bows. Attend his transports, and receive his vows. If Jove prolong my days, 
and palace crown. The growing virtues of my youthful son. To you shall rites divine be ever paid. And grateful offerings on your altars laid. Thus then Minerva, from that anxious breast. Dismiss those cares, and leave to heaven the rest. Our task be now thy treasured stores to save. Deep in the close recesses of the cave. Then future means consult. She spoke, and trod. The shady grot, that brightened with the god. The closest caverns of the grot she sought. The gold, the brass, the robes, Ulysses brought. These in the secret gloom the chief disposed. The entrance with a rock the goddess closed. Now, seated in the olive's sacred shade. Confer the hero and the martial maid. The goddess of the azure eyes began. Son of Laertes. Much experienced man. The suitor trained thy earliest care demand. Of that luxurious race to rid the land. Three years thy house their lawless rule has seen. And proud addresses to the matchless queen. But she thy absence mourns from day to day. And inly bleeds, and silent wastes away. Elusive of the bridal hour, she gives. Fond hopes to all, and all with hopes deceives. To this Ulysses, O celestial maid. Praised be thy counsel, and thy timely aid. Else had I seen my native walls in vain. Like great Atrides, just restored and slain. Vouchsafe the means of vengeance to debate. And plan with all thy arts the scene of fate. Then, then be present, and my soul inspire. As when we wrapped Troy's heaven-built walls in fire. Though leagued against me hundred heroes stand. Hundreds shall fall, if Pallas aid my hand. She answered, in the dreadful day of fight. No, I am with thee, strong in all my might. If thou but equal to thyself be found. What gasping numbers then shall press the ground? What human victims stain the feastful floor? How wide the pavements float with guilty gore! It fits thee now to wear a dark disguise. And secret walk unknown to mortal eyes. For this, my hand shall wither every grace. And every elegance of form and face. O'er thy smooth skin a bark of wrinkles spread. Turn whore the auburn honours of thy head. Disfigure every limb with coarse attire. And in thy eyes extinguish all the fire. Add all the wants and the decays of life. Estrange thee from thy own. Thy son, thy wife. From the loath object every sight shall turn. And the blind suitors their destruction scorn. Go first the master of thy herds to find. True to his charge, a loyal swain in kind. For thee he sighs. And to the loyal heir. And chaste Penelope extends his care. At the Coratian rock he now resides. Where Arethusa's sable water glides. The sable water and the copious mast. Swell the fat herd, luxuriant, large repast. With him rest peaceful in the rural cell. And all you ask his faithful tongue shall tell. Me into other realms my cares convey. To Sparta, still with female beauty gay. For no, to Sparta thy loved offspring came. To learn thy fortunes from the voice of fame. At this the father, with a father's care. Must he too suffer? He, O goddess. Bear. Of wanderings and of woes a wretched share. Through the wild ocean plough the dangerous way. And leave his fortunes and his house a prey. Why wouldst not thou, O all-enlightened mind? Inform him certain, and protect him, kind. To whom Minerva, be thy soul at rest. And know, whatever heaven ordains is best. To fame I sent him, to acquire renown. To other regions is his virtue known. Secure he sits, near great Atrides placed. With friendship strengthened, and with honours graced. But lo! An ambush waits his passage o'er. Fierce foes insidious intercept the shore. In vain, far sooner all the murderous brood. This injured land shall fatten with their blood. She spake, then touched him with her powerful wand. 
the skin shrunk up, and withered at her hand. A swift old age o'er all his members spread. A sudden frost was sprinkled on his head. Nor longer in the heavy eyeball shined. The glance divine, forth beaming from the mind. His robe, which spots indelible besmear. In rags dishonest flutters with the air. A stag's torn hide is lapped around his reins. A rugged staff his trembling hand sustains. And at his side a wretched scrip was hung. Wide patched, and knotted to a twisted thong. So looked the chief, so moved, to mortal eyes. Object uncouth. A man of miseries. While Pallas, cleaving the wild fields of air. To Sparta flies, Telemachus her care. Book 14. Argument. The conversation with Eumius. Ulysses arrives in disguise at the house of Eumius, where he is received, entertained, and lodged with the utmost hospitality. The several discourses of that faithful old servant, with the feigned story told by Ulysses to conceal himself and other conversations on various subjects, take up this entire book. But he, deep musing, o'er the mountain strayed. Through mazy thickets of the woodland shade. And caverned ways, the shaggy coast along. With cliffs and nodding forests overhung. Eumius at his sylvan lodge he sought. A faithful servant, and without a fault. Ulysses found him busied as he sate. Before the threshold of his rustic gate. Around the mansion in a circle shone. A rural portico of rugged stone. In absence of his lord with honest toil. His own industrious hands had raised the pile. The wall was stone from neighboring quarries born. Encircled with a fence of native thorn. And strong with pails, by many a weary stroke. Of stubborn labor hewn from heart of oak. Frequent and thick. Within the space were reared. Twelve ample cells, the lodgments of his herd. Full fifty pregnant females each contained. The males without, a smaller race, remained. Doomed to supply the suitor's wasteful feast. A stock by daily luxury decreased. Now scarce four hundred left. These to defend. For savage dogs, a watchful guard, attend. Here sat Eumius, and his cares applied. To form strong buskins of well-seasoned hide. Of four assistants who his labor share. Three now were absent on the rural care. The fourth drove victims to a suitor train. But he, of ancient faith, a simple swain. Sight, while he furnished the luxurious board. And wearied heaven with wishes for his lord. Soon as Ulysses near the enclosure drew. With open mouths the furious mastiffs flew. Down sat the sage, and cautious to withstand. Let fall the offensive truncheon from his hand. Sudden, the master runs, aloud he calls. And from his hasty hand the leather falls. With showers of stones he drives then far away. The scattering dogs around at distance bay. Unhappy stranger. Thus the faithful swain. Began with accent gracious and humane. What sorrow had been mine, if at my gate. Thy reverend age had met a shameful fate. Enough of woes already have I known. Enough my master's sorrows and my own. While here, ungrateful task, his herds I feed. Ordained for lawless rioters to bleed. Perhaps, supported at another's board. Far from his country roams my hapless lord. Or sight in exile forth his latest breath. Now covered with the eternal shade of death. But enter this my homely roof, and see. Our woods not void of hospitality. Then tell me whence thou art, and what the share. Of woes and wanderings thou wert born to bear. He said, and, seconding the kind request. With friendly step precedes his unknown guest. A shaggy goat's soft hide beneath him spread. And with fresh rushes heaped an ample bed. Jove touched the hero's tender soul, to find. So just reception from a heart so kind. And, oh, ye gods! With all your blessings grace. He thus broke forth, 
this friend of human race. The swain replied, it never was our guise. To slight the poor, or aught humane despise. For Jove unfold our hospitable door. Tis Jove that sends the stranger and the poor. Little, alas! Is all the good I can. A man oppressed, dependent, yet a man. Accept such treatment as a swain affords. Slave to the insolence of youthful lords. Far hence is by unequal gods removed. That man of bounties, loving and beloved. To whom whatever his slave enjoys is owed. And more, had fate allowed, had been bestowed. But fate condemned him to a foreign shore. Much have I sorrowed, but my master more. Now cold he lies, to death's embrace resigned. Ah, perish Helen! Perish all her kind! For whose cursed cause, in Agamemnon's name, he trod so fatally the paths of fame. His vest succinct then girding round his waist. Forth rushed the swain with hospitable haste. Straight to the lodgments of his herd he run. Where the fat porkers slept beneath the sun. Of two, his cutlass launched the spouting blood. These quartered, singed, and fixed on forks of wood. All hasty on the hissing coals he threw. And smoking, back the tasteful viands drew. Brochures and all then in the board displayed. The ready meal, before Ulysses laid. With flour and brown. Next mingled wine yet new. And luscious as the bees nectarius do. Then sate, companion of the friendly feast. With open look. And thus bespoke his guest. Take with free welcome what our hands prepare. Such food as falls to simple servants share. The best our lords consume, those thoughtless peers. Rich without bounty, guilty without fears. Yet sure the gods their impious acts detest. And honor justice and the righteous breast. Pirates and conquerors of hardened mind. The foes of peace, and scourges of mankind. To whom offending men are made a prey. When Jove in vengeance gives a land away. E'en these, when of their ill-got spoils possessed. Find sure tormentors in the guilty breast. Some voice of God close whispering from within. Wretch! This is villainy, and this is sin. But these, no doubt, some oracle explore. That tells, the great Ulysses is no more. Hence springs their confidence, and from our sighs. Their rapine strengthens, and their riots rise. Constant as Jove the night and day bestows. Bleeds a whole hecatomb, a vintage flows. None matched this hero's wealth, of all who reign. O'er the fair islands of the neighboring main. Nor all the monarchs whose far dreaded sway. The wide extended continents obey. First, on the main land, of Ulysses breed. Twelve herds, twelve flocks, on ocean's margin feed. As many stalls for shaggy goats are reared. As many lodgments for the tusky herd. Two foreign keepers guard, and here are seen. Twelve herds of goats that graze our utmost green. To native pastors is their charge assigned. And mine the care to feed the bristly kind. Each day the fattest bleeds of either herd. All to the suitor's wasteful board preferred. Thus he, benevolent, his unknown guest. With hunger keen devours the savory feast. While schemes of vengeance ripen in his breast. Silent and thoughtful while the board he eyed. Eumaeus pours on high the purple tide. The king with smiling looks his joy expressed. And thus the kind inviting host addressed. Say now, what man is he, the man deplored? So rich, so potent, whom you style your lord. Late with such affluence and possessions blessed. And now in honor's glorious bed at rest. Whoever was the warrior, he must be. To fame no stranger, nor perhaps to me. Who, so the gods and so the fates ordained. Have wandered many a sea, and many a land. Small is the faith the prince and queen ascribe. Replied Eumaeus, to the wandering tribe. 
for needy strangers still to flattery fly. And want too oft betrays the tongue to lie. Each vagrant traveller, that touches here. Deludes with fallacies the royal ear. To dear remembrance makes his image rise. And calls the springing sorrows from her eyes. Such thou mayst be. But he whose name you crave. Moulders in earth, or welters on the wave. Or food for fish or dogs his relics lie. Or torn by birds are scattered through the sky. So perished he, and left, for ever lost. Much woe to all, but sure to me the most. So mild a master never shall I find. Less dear the parents whom I left behind. Less soft my mother, less my father kind. Not with such transport would my eyes run o'er. Again to hail them in their native shore. As loved Ulysses once more to embrace. Restored and breathing in his natal place. That name for ever dread, yet ever dear. E'en in his absence I pronounce with fear. In my respect, he bears a prince's part. But lives a very brother in my heart. Thus spoke the faithful swain, and thus rejoined. The master of his grief, the man of patient mind. Ulysses, friend. Shall view his old abodes. Distrustful as thou art, nor doubt the gods. Nor speak I rashly, but with faith averred. And what I speak attesting heaven has heard. If so, a cloak and vesture be my meed. Till his return no title shall I plead. Though certain be my news, and great my need. Whom want itself can force untruths to tell. My soul detests him as the gates of hell. Thou first be witness, hospitable Jove. And every God inspiring social love. And witness every household power that waits. Guard of these fires, and angel of these gates. Ere the next moon increase or this decay. His ancient realms Ulysses shall survey. In blood and dust each proud oppressor mourn. And the lost glories of his house return. Nor shall that mead be thine, nor evermore. Shall loved Ulysses hail this happy shore. Replied Eumaeus to the present hour. Now turn thy thought, and joys within our power. From sad reflection let my soul repose. The name of him awakes a thousand woes. But guard him, gods. And to these arms restore. Not his true consort can desire him more. Not old Laertes, broken with despair. Not young Telemachus, his blooming heir. Alas, Telemachus! My sorrows flow. Afresh for thee, my second cause of woe. Like some fair plant set by a heavenly hand. He grew, he flourished, and he blessed the land. In all the youth his father's image shined. Bright in his person, brighter in his mind. What man, or God, deceived his better sense? Far on the swelling seas to wander hence. To distant Pylos hapless is he gone. To seek his father's fate and find his own. For traitors wait his way, with dire design. To end at once the great Arcesian line. But let us leave him to their wills above. The fates of men are in the hand of Jove. And now, my venerable guest. Declare. Your name, your parents, and your native heir. Sincere from whence begun, your course relate. And to what ship I owe the friendly freight. Thus he, and thus, with prompt invention bold. The cautious chief his ready story told. On dark reserve what better can prevail. Or from the fluent tongue produce the tale. Then when two friends, alone, in peaceful place. Confer, and wines and cates the table grace. But most, the kind inviter's cheerful face. Thus might we sit, with social goblets crowned. Till the whole circle of the year goes round. Not the whole circle of the year would close. My long narration of a life of woes. But such was heaven's high will. Know then, I came. From sacred Crete, and from a sire of fame. Castor Hylocides, that name he bore. Beloved and honored in his native shore. Blessed in his riches, in his children more. 
sprung of a handmaid, from a bought embrace. I shared his kindness with his lawful race. But when that fate, which all must undergo, from earth removed him to the shades below, the large domain his greedy sons divide, and each was portioned as the lots decide. Little, alas, was left my wretched share, except a house, a covert from the air. But what by niggard fortune was denied? A willing widow's copious wealth supplied. My valor was my plea, a gallant mind. That, true to honor, never lagged behind. The sex is ever to a soldier kind. Now wasting years my former strength confound. And added woes have bowed me to the ground. Yet by the stubble you may guess the grain. And mark the ruins of no vulgar man. Me, Pallas gave to lead the martial storm. And the fair ranks of battle to deform. Me, Mars inspired to turn the foe to flight. And tempt the secret ambush of the night. Let ghastly death in all his forms appear. I saw him not, it was not mine to fear. Before the rest I raised my ready steel. The first I met, he yielded, or he fell. But works of peace my soul disdained to bear. The rural labor, or domestic care. To raise the mast, the missile dart to wing. And send swift arrows from the bounding string. Were arts the gods made grateful to my mind. Those gods, who turn, to various ends designed. The various thoughts and talents of mankind. Before the Grecians touched the Trojan plain. Nine times commander or by land or main. In foreign fields I spread my glory far. Great in the praise, rich in the spoils of war. Thence charged with riches, as increased in fame. To Crete returned, an honorable name. But when great Jove that direful war decreed. Which roused all Greece, and made the mighty bleed. Our states myself and Idomen employ. To lead their fleets, and carry death to Troy. Nine years we ward, the tenth saw Ilion fall. Homeward we sailed, but heaven dispersed us all. One only month my wife enjoyed my stay. So willed the God who gives and takes away. Nine ships I manned, equipped with ready stores. Intent to voyage to the Egyptian shores. In feast and sacrifice my chosen train. Six days consumed, the seventh we ploughed the main. Crete's ample fields diminished to our eye. Before the boreal blast the vessels fly. Safe through the level seas we sweep our way. The steersman governs, and the ships obey. The fifth fair morn we stem the Egyptian tide. And tilting o'er the bay the vessels ride. To anchor there my fellows I command. And spies commissioned to explore the land. But, swayed by lust of gain, and headlong will. The coasts they ravage, and the natives kill. The spreading clamor to their city flies. And horse and foot in mingled tumult rise. The reddening dawn reveals the circling fields. Horrid with bristly spears, and glancing shields. Jove thundered on their side. Our guilty head. We turn to flight, the gathering vengeance spread. On all parts round, and heaps on heaps lie dead. I then explored my thought, what course to prove. And sure the thought was dictated by Jove. Oh, had he left me to that happier doom. And saved the life of miseries to come. The radiant helmet from my brows unlaced. And lo on earth my shield and javelin cast. I meet the monarch with a suppliant's face. Approach his chariot, and his knees embrace. He heard, he saved, he placed me at his side. My state he pitted, and my tears he dried. Restrained the rage the vengeful foe expressed. And turned the deadly weapons from my breast. Pious. To guard the hospitable right. And fearing Jove, who mercy's works delight. In Egypt thus with peace and plenty blessed. I lived, and happy still have lived, a guest. On seven bright years successive blessings wait. The next changed all the color of my fate. A false Phoenician, of insidious mind. 
versed in vile arts, and foe to humankind. With semblance fair invites me to his home. I seize the proffer, ever fond to roam. Domestic in his faithless roof I stayed. Till the swift sun his annual circle made. To Libya then he mediates the way. With guileful art a stranger to betray. And sell to bondage in a foreign land. Much doubting, yet compelled I quit the strand. Through the mid seas the nimble pinnace sails. Aloof from Crete. Before the northern gales. But when remote her chalky cliffs we lost. And far from ken of any other coast. When all was wild expanse of sea and air. Then doomed high Jove due vengeance to prepare. He hung a night of horrors o'er their head. The shaded ocean blackened as it spread. He launched the fiery bolt, from pole to pole. Broad burst the lightnings, deep the thunders roll. In giddy rounds the whirling ship is tossed. And all in clouds of smothering sulphur lost. As from a hanging rock's tremendous height. The sable crows with intercepted flight. Drop and long. Scarred, and black with sulfurous hue. So from the deck are hurled the ghastly crew. Such end the wicked found. But Jove's intent. Was yet to save the oppressed and innocent. Placed on the mast, the last resource of life. With winds and waves I held unequal strife. For nine long days the billows tilting o'er. The tenth soft wafts meet at Thesprosia's shore. The monarch's son a shipwrecked wretch relieved. The sire with hospitable rites received. And in his palace like a brother placed. With gifts of price and gorgeous garments graced. While here I sojourned. Oft I heard the fame. How late Ulysses to the country came. How loved, how honored in this court he stayed. And here his whole collected treasure laid. I saw myself the vast unnumbered store. Of steel elaborate and refulgent ore. And brass high heaped amidst the regal dome. Immense supplies for ages yet to come. Meantime he voyaged to explore the will. Of Jove, on high Dodona's holy hill. What means might best his safe return avail? To come in pomp, or bear a secret sail? Full oft has Phidon, whilst he poured the wine. Attesting solemn all the powers divine. That soon Ulysses would return, declared. The sailors waiting, and the ships prepared. But first the king dismissed me from his shores. For fair Delicium crowned with fruitful stores. To good Acastus friendly care consigned. But other counsels pleased the sailors' mind. New frauds were plotted by the faithless train. And misery demands me once again. Soon as remote from shore they plow the wave. With ready hands they rushed to seize their slave. Then with these tattered rags they wrapped me round. Stripped of my own, and to the vessel bound. At eve, at Ithaca's delightful land. The ship arrived, forth issuing on the sand. They sought repast, while to the unhappy kind. The pitying gods themselves my chains unbind. Soft I descended, to the sea applied. My naked breast, and shot along the tide. Soon passed beyond their sight, I left the flood. And took the spreading shelter of the wood. Their prize escaped the faithless pirates mourned. But deemed inquiry vain, and to their ships returned. Screened by protecting gods from hostile eyes. They led me to a good man and a wise. To live beneath thy hospitable care. And wait the woes heaven dooms me yet to bear. Unhappy guest. Whose sorrows touch my mind. Thus good Eumius with a sigh rejoined. For real suffering since I grieve sincere. Check not with fallacies the springing tear. Nor turn the passion into groundless joy. For him whom heaven has destined to destroy. Oh! Had he perished on some well-fought day. Or in his friend's embraces died away. That grateful Greece with streaming eyes might raise. Historic marbles to record his praise. His praise, eternal on the faithful stone. 
had with transmissive honors graced his son. Now, snatched by harpies to the dreary coast. Sunk is the hero, and his glory lost. While pensive in this solitary den. Far from gay cities and the ways of men. I linger life, nor to the court repair. But when my constant queen commands my care. Or when, to taste her hospitable board. Some guest arrives, with rumors of her lord. And these indulge their want, and those their woe. And here the tears and there the goblets flow. By many such have I been warned. But chief. By one Aetolian robbed of all belief. Whose hap it was to this our roof to roam. For murder banished from his native home. He swore, Ulysses on the coast of Crete. Stayed but a season to refit his fleet. A few revolving months should waft him o'er. Fraught with bold warriors, and a boundless store. O thou! Whom age has taught to understand. And heaven has guided with a favoring hand. On God or mortal to obtrude a lie. Forbear, and dread to flatter as to die. Nor for such ends my house and heart are free. But dear respect to Jove, and charity. And why, O swain of unbelieving mind? Thus quick replied the wisest of mankind. Doubt you my oath. Yet more my faith to try. A solemn compact let us ratify. And witness every power that rules the sky. If here Ulysses from his labors rest. Be then my prize a tunic and a vest. And where my hopes invite me, straight transport. In safety to Delicium's friendly court. But if he greets not thy desiring eye. Hurl me from yon dread precipice on high. The due reward of fraud and perjury. Doubtless, O guest. Great laud and praise were mine. Replied the swain, for spotless faith divine. If after social rites and gifts bestowed. I stain my hospitable hearth with blood. How would the gods my righteous toil succeed? And bless the hand that made a stranger bleed? No more, the approaching hours of silent night. First claim refection, then to rest invite. Beneath our humble cottage let us haste. And here, unenvied, rural dainties taste. Thus commune these, while to their lowly dome. The full-fed swine returned with evening home. Compelled, reluctant, to their several styes. With din obstreperous, and ungrateful cries. Then to the slaves, now from the herd the best. Select in honor of our foreign guest. With him let us the genial banquet share. For great and many are the griefs we bear. While those who from our labors heap their board. Blaspheme their feeder, and forget their lord. Thus speaking, with dispatchful hand he took. A weighty axe, and cleft the solid oak. This on the earth he piled. A boar full fed. Of five years age, before the pile was led. The swain, whom acts of piety delight. Observant of the gods, begins the rite. First shears the forehead of the bristly boar. And suppliant stands, invoking every power. To speed Ulysses to his native shore. A knotty stake then aiming at his head. Down dropped he groaning, and the spirit fled. The scorching flames climb round on every side. Then the singed members they with skill divide. On these, in rolls of fat involved with art. The choicest morsels lay from every part. Some in the flames bestrewed with flour they threw. Some cut in fragments from the forks they drew. These while on several tables they dispose. A priest himself the blameless rustic rose. Expert the destined victim to dispart. In seven just portions, pure of hand and heart. One sacred to the nymphs apart they lay. Another to the winged sons of May. The rural tribe in common share the rest. The king the chine, the honor of the feast. Who sate delighted at his servant's board. The faithful servant joyed his unknown lord. O oh, be thou dear, Ulysses cried, to Jove. As well thou claimst a grateful stranger's love. Be then thy thanks, the bounteous swain replied. 
Enjoyment of the good the gods provide. From God's own hand descend our joys and woes. These he decrees, and he but suffers those. All power is his, and whatsoever he wills. The will itself, omnipotent, fulfills. This said, the first fruits to the gods he gave. Then poured of offered wine the sable wave. In great Ulysses' hand he placed the bowl. He sate, and sweet refection cheered his soul. The bread from canisters Mesolius gave. Eumius proper treasure bought this slave. And led from taphos, to attend his board. A servant added to his absent lord. His task it was the wheaten loaves to lay. And from the banquet take the bowls away. And now the rage of hunger was repressed. And each betakes him to his couch to rest. Now came the night, and darkness covered o'er. The face of things, the winds began to roar. The driving storm the watery west wind pours. And Jove descends in deluges of showers. Studious of rest and warmth, Ulysses lies. Foreseeing from the first the storm would rise. In mere necessity of coat and cloak. With artful preface to his host he spoke. Hear me, my friends. Who this good banquet grace. Tis sweet to play the fool in time and place. And wine can of their wits the wise beguile. Make the sage frolic, and the serious smile. The grave and merry measures frisk about. And many a long repented word bring out. Since to be talkative I now commence. Let wit cast off the sullen yoke of sense. Once I was strong, would heaven restore those days. And with my betters claimed a share of praise. Ulysses, Menelaus, led forth a band. And joined me with them, t'was their own command. A deathful ambush for the foe to lay. Beneath Troy walls by night we took our way. There, clad in arms, along the marshes spread. We made the osier fringed bank our bed. Full soon the inclemency of heaven I feel. Nor had these shoulders covering, but of steel. Sharp blew the north, snow whitening all the fields. Froze with the blast, and gathering glazed our shields. There all but I, well fenced with cloak and vest. Lay covered by their ample shields at rest. Fool that I was. I left behind my own. The skill of weather and of winds unknown. And trusted to my coat and shield alone. When now was wasted more than half the night. And the stars faded at approaching light. Sudden I jogged Ulysses, who was laid. Fast by my side, and shivering thus I said. Here longer in this field I cannot lie. The winter pinches, and with cold I die. And die ashamed, O wisest of mankind. The only fool who left his cloak behind. He thought and answered, hardly waking yet. Sprung in his mind a momentary wit. That wit, which or in council or in fight. Still met the emergence, and determined right. Hush thee, he cried, soft whispering in my ear. Speak not a word, lest any Greek may hear. And then, supporting on his arm his head. Hear me, companions. Thus aloud he said. Methinks too distant from the fleet we lie. E'en now a vision stood before my eye. And sure the warning vision was from high. Let from among us some swift courier rise. Haste to the general, and demand supplies. Up started Thoa straight, and Dreamin's son. Nimbly he rose, and cast his garment down. Instant, the racer vanished off the ground. That instant in his cloak I wrapped me round. And safe I slept, till brightly dawning shone. The morn conspicuous on her golden throne. Oh were my strength as then, as then my age. Some friend would fence me from the winter's rage. Yet, tattered as I look, I challenged then. The honors and the offices of men. Some master, or some servant would allow. A cloak and vest, but I am nothing now. Well hast thou spoke, rejoined the attentive swain. Thy lips let fall no idle word or vain. Nor garment shalt thou want, nor aught beside. 
meat for the wandering suppliant to provide. But in the morning take thy clothes again. For here one vest suffices every swain. No change of garments to our hinds is known. But when returned, the good Ulysses' son. With better hand shall grace with fit attires. His guest, and send thee where thy soul desires. The honest herdsman rose, as this he said. And drew before the hearth the stranger's bed. The fleecy spoils of sheep, a goat's rough hide. He spreads, and adds a mantle thick and wide. With store to heap above him, and below. And guard each quarter as the tempests blow. There lay the king, and all the rest supine. All, but the careful master of the swine. Forth hasted he to tend his bristly care. Well armed, and fenced against nocturnal air. His weighty falchion o'er his shoulder tied. His shaggy cloak a mountain goat supplied. With his broad spear the dread of dogs and men. He seeks his lodging in the rocky den. There to the tusky herd he bends his way. Where, screened from Boreas, high o'er arched they lay. Book 15 Argument The Return of Telemachus the goddess Minerva commands Telemachus in a vision to return to Ithaca. Pisistratus and he take leave of Menelaus, and arrive at Pylos, where they part, and Telemachus set sail, after having received on board Theoclymenus the soothsayer. The scene then changes to the cottage of Eumaeus, who entertains Ulysses with a recital of his adventures. In the meantime Telemachus arrives on the coast, and sending the vessel to the town, proceeds by himself to the lodge of Eumaeus. Now had Minerva reached those ample plains. Famed for the dance, where Menelaus reigns. Anxious she flies to great Ulysses' heir. His instant voyage challenged all her care. Beneath the royal portico displayed. With Nestor's son Telemachus was laid. In sleep profound the son of Nestor lies. Not thine, Ulysses. Care unsealed his eyes. Restless he grieved, with various fears oppressed. And all thy fortunes rolled within his breast. When, O Telemachus! The goddess said. Too long in vain, too widely hast thou strayed. Thus leaving careless thy paternal right. The robber's prize, the prey to lawless might. On fond pursuits neglectful while you roam. E'en now the hand of rapine sacks the dome. Hence to Atrides, and his leave implore. To launch thy vessel for thy natal shore. Fly, whilst thy mother virtuous yet withstands. Her kindred's wishes, and her sire's commands. Through both, Eurymachus pursues the dame. And with the noblest gifts asserts his claim. Hence, therefore, while thy stores thy own remain. Thou know'st the practice of the female train. Lost in the children of the present spouse. They slight the pledges of their former vows. Their love is always with the lover past. Still the succeeding flame expels the last. Let o'er thy house some chosen maid preside. Till heaven decrees to bless thee in a bride. But now thy more attentive ears incline. Observe the warnings of a power divine. For thee their snares the suitor lords shall lay. In Samos sands, or straits of Ithaca. To seize thy life shall lurk the murderous band. Ere yet thy footsteps press thy native land. No. Sooner far their riot and their lust. All covering earth shall bury deep in dust. Then distant from the scattered islands steer. Nor let the night retard thy full career. Thy heavenly guardian shall instruct the gales. To smooth thy passage and supply thy sails. And when at Ithaca thy labor ends. Send to the town the vessel with thy friends. But seek thou first the master of the swine. For still to thee his loyal thoughts incline. There pass the night, while he his course pursues. To bring Penelope the wished for news. That thou, safe sailing from the Pylian strand. Art come to bless her in thy native land. Thus spoke the goddess, and resumed her flight. To the pure regions of eternal light. Meanwhile Pisistratus he gently shakes. 
and with these words the slumbering youth awakes. Rise, son of Nestor. For the road prepare. And join the harnessed coursers to the car. What cause, he cried, can justify our flight? To tempt the dangers of forbidding night? Here wait we rather, till approaching day. Shall prompt our speed, and point the ready way. Nor think of flight before the Spartan king. Shall bid farewell, and bounteous presents bring. Gifts, which to distant ages safely stored. The sacred act of friendship shall record. Thus he. But when the dawn bestreaked the east. The king from Helen rose, and sought his guest. As soon as his approach the hero knew. The splendid mantle round him first he threw. Then o'er his ample shoulders whirled the cloak. Respectful met the monarch, and bespoke. Hail, great Atrides, favoured of high Jove. Let not thy friends in vain for license move. Swift let us measure back the watery way. Nor check our speed, impatient of delay. If with desire so strong thy bosom glows. Ill, said the king, should I thy wish oppose. For oft in others freely I reprove. The ill-timed efforts of officious love. Who love too much, hate in the like extreme. And both the golden mean alike condemn. Alike he thwarts the hospitable end. Who drives the free, or stays the hasty friend. True friendship's laws are by this rule expressed. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Yet, stay, my friends, and in your chariot take. The noblest presents that our love can make. Meantime commit we to our women's care. Some choice domestic viands to prepare. The traveller, rising from the banquet gay, eludes the labours of the tedious way. Then if a wider course shall rather please. Through spacious Argos and the realms of Greece. Atrides in his chariot shall attend. Himself thy convoy to each royal friend. No prince will let Ulysses' heir remove. Without some pledge, some monument of love. These will the cauldron, these the tripod give. From those the well-paired mules we shall receive. Or bowl embossed whose golden figures live. To whom the youth, for prudence famed, replied. O monarch, care of heaven. Thy people's pride. No friend in Ithaca my place supplies. No powerful hands are there, no watchful eyes. My stores exposed and fenceless house demand. The speediest succor from my guardian hand. Lest, in a search too anxious and too vain. Of one lost joy, I lose what yet remain. His purpose when the generous warrior heard. He charged the household cates to be prepared. Now with the dawn, from his adjoining home. Was both Oed's Etionius come. Swift at the word he forms the rising blaze. And o'er the coals the smoking fragments lays. Meantime the king, his son, and Helen went. Where the rich wardrobe breathed a costly scent. The king selected from the glittering rose. A bowl, the prince a silver beaker chose. The beauteous queen revolved with careful eyes. Her various textures of unnumbered dyes. And chose the largest, with no vulgar art. Her own fair hands embroidered every part. Beneath the rest it lay divinely bright. Like radiant Hesper o'er the gems of night. Then with each gift they hastened to their guest. And thus the king Ulysses e'er addressed. Since fixed are thy resolves. May thundering Jove. With happiest omens thy desires approve. This silver bowl, whose costly margins shine. And chased with old, this valued gift be thine. To me this present, a Vulcanian frame. From Sidon's hospitable monarch came. To thee we now consign the precious load. The pride of kings, and labor of a god. Then gave the cup, while Megapenth brought. The silver vase with living sculpture wrought. The beauteous queen, advancing next, displayed. The shining veil, and thus endearing said. Accept, dear youth, this monument of love. Long since, in better days, by Helen wove. 
safe in thy mother's care the vesture lay. To deck thy bride and grace thy nuptial day. Meantime mayst thou with happiest speed regain thy stately palace, and thy wide domain. She said, and gave the veil, with grateful look. The prince the variegated present took. And now, when through the royal dome they passed. High on a throne the king each stranger placed. A golden ewer the attendant damsel brings. Replete with water from the crystal springs. With copious streams the shining vase supplies. A silver layer of capacious size. They wash. The tables in fair order spread. The glittering canisters are crowned with bread. Viands of various kinds allure the taste. Of choicest sort and savor. Rich repast. Whilst Aetionius portions out the shares. A tried son the purple draft prepares. And now, each sated with the genial feast. And the short rage of thirst and hunger ceased. Ulysses' son, with his illustrious friend. The horses join. The polished car ascend. Along the court the fiery steeds rebound. And the wide portal echoes to the sound. The king precedes, a bowl with fragrant wine. Libation destined to the powers divine. His right hand held, before the steed he stands. Then, mixed with prayers, he utters these commands. Farewell, and prosper, youths. Let Nestor know. What grateful thoughts still in this bosom glow. For all the proofs of his paternal care. Through the long dangers of the ten years' war. Ah! Doubt not our report, the prince rejoined. Of all the virtues of thy generous mind. And oh! Returned might we Ulysses meet. To him thy presence show, thy words repeat. How will each speech his grateful wonder raise? How will each gift indulge us in thy praise? Scarce ended thus the prince, when on the right. Advanced the bird of Jove, auspicious sight. A milk-white fowl his clinching talons bore. With care domestic pampered at the floor. Peasants in vain with threatening cries pursue. In solemn speed the bird majestic flew. Full dexter to the car. The prosperous sight. Filled every breast with wonder and delight. But Nestor's son the cheerful silence broke. And in these words the Spartan chief bespoke. Say if to us the gods these omens send. Or fates peculiar to thyself portend. Whilst yet the monarch paused, with doubts oppressed. The beauteous queen relieved his laboring breast. Hear me, she cried, to whom the gods have given to read this sign, and mystic sense of heaven. As thus the plumy sovereign of the air, left on the mountain's brow his callow care, and wandered through the wide ethereal way, to pour his wrath on yon luxurious prey. So shall thy godlike father, tossed in vain, through all the dangers of the boundless main, arrive, or if perchance already come, from slaughtered gluttons to release the dome. Oh. If this promised bliss by thundering Jove. The prince replied, Stand fixed in fate above. To thee, as to some god, I'll temples raise. And crown thy altars with the costly blaze. He said. And bending o'er his chariot, flung. Athwart the fiery steeds the smarting thong. The bounding shafts upon the harness play. Till night descending intercepts the way. To diacles that ferry they repair. Whose boasted sire was sacred Alpheus heir. With him all night the youthful stranger stayed. Nor found the hospitable rites unpaid. But soon as morning from her orient bed. Had tinged the mountains with her earliest red. They joined the steeds, and on the chariot sprung. The brazen portals in their passage rung. To Pylos soon they came, when thus begun. To Nestor's heir Ulysses' godlike son. Let not Pisistratus in vain be pressed. Nor unconsenting hear his friend's request. His friend by long hereditary claim. In toils his equal, and in years the same. No farther from our vessel, I implore. The courses drive, 
but lashed them to the shore. Too long thy father would his friend detain. I dread his proffered kindness urged in vain. The hero paused, and pondered this request. While love and duty warred within his breast. At length resolved, he turned his ready hand. And lashed his panting coursers to the strand. There, while within the poop with care he stored. The regal presence of the Spartan lord. With speed begone, said he. Call every mate. Ere yet to Nestor I the tale relate. Tis true, the fervor of his generous heart. Brooks no repulse, nor couldst thou soon depart. Himself will seek thee here, nor wilt thou find. In words alone, the Pylian monarch kind. But when, arrived, he thy return shall know. How will his breast with honest fury glow? This said, the sounding strokes his horses fire. And soon he reached the palace of his sire. Now, cried Telemachus, with speedy care. Hoist every sail, and every oar prepare. Swift as the word his willing mates obey. And seize their seats, impatient for the sea. Meantime the prince with sacrifice adores. Minerva, and her guardian aid implores. When lo! A wretch ran breathless to the shore. New from his crime, and reeking yet with gore. A seer he was, from great Milampus sprung. Milampus, who in Pylus flourished long. Till, urged by wrongs, a foreign realm he chose. Far from the hateful cause of all his woes. Neleus his treasures one long year detains. As long he groaned in Philacus chains. Meantime, what anguish and what rage combined. For lovely Pero racked his laboring mind. Yet, scaped he death. And vengeful of his wrong. To Pylus drove the lowing herds along. Then, Neleus vanquished, and consigned the fair. To Bias arms, he so sought a foreign heir. Argos the rich for his retreat he chose. There formed his empire, there his palace rose. From him Antiphides and Mantius came. The first begot Oikleus great in fame. And he Amphiaros, immortal name. The people's saviour, and divinely wise. Beloved by Jove, and him who gilds the skies. Yet short his date of life. By female pride he dies. From Mantius Clitus, whom Aurora's love. Snatched for his beauty to the thrones above. And Polyphides, on whom Phoebus shone. With fullest rays, Amphiaros now gone. In Hyperesia's groves he made abode. And taught mankind the counsels of the god. From him sprung Theoclymenus, who found. The sacred wine yet foaming on the ground. Telemachus, whom, as to heaven he pressed. His ardent vows, the stranger thus addressed. O thou! That dost thy happy course prepare. With pure libations and with solemn prayer. By that dread power to whom thy vows are paid. By all the lives of these. Thy own dear head. Declare sincerely to no foe's demand. Thy name, thy lineage, and paternal land. Prepare, then, said Telemachus, to know. A tale from falsehood free, not free from woe. From Ithaca, of royal birth I came. And great Ulysses, ever honored name. Once was my sire, though now, forever lost. In Stygian gloom he glides a pensive ghost. Whose fate inquiring through the world we rove. The last, the wretched proof of filial love. The stranger then, nor shall I aught conceal. But the dire secret of my fate reveal. Of my own tribe an argive wretch I slew. Whose powerful friends the luckless deed pursue. With unrelenting rage, and force from home. The blood-stained exile, ever doomed to roam. But bear, oh bear me o'er yon azure flood. Receive the suppliant. Spare my destined blood. Stranger, replied the prince, securely rest. Affianced in our faith, henceforth our guest. Thus affable, Ulysses' godlike heir. Takes from the stranger's hand the glittering spear. He climbs the ship, 
ascends the stern with haste. And by his side the guest accepted placed. The chief his order gives, the obedient band. With due observance wait the chief's command. With speed the mast they rear, with speed unbind. The spacious sheet, and stretch it to the wind. Minerva calls. The ready gales obey. With rapid speed to whirl them o'er the sea. Crinus they passed, next Chalcis rolled away. With thickening darkness closed the doubtful day. The silver Phia's glittering rills they lost. And schemed along by Ellis' sacred coast. Then cautious through the rocky reaches wind. And turning sudden, shun the death designed. Meantime, the king, Eumius, and the rest. Sate in the cottage, at their rural feast. The banquet passed, and satiate every man. To try his host, Ulysses thus began. Yet one night more, my friends, indulge your guest. The last I purpose in your walls to rest. Tomorrow for myself I must provide. And only ask your counsel, and a guide. Patient to roam the street, by hunger led. And bless the friendly hand that gives me bread. There in Ulysses' roof I may relate. Ulysses' wanderings to his royal mate. Or, mingling with the suitor's haughty train. Not undeserving some support obtain. Hermes to me his various gifts imparts. Patron of industry and manual arts. Few can with me in dexterous works contend. The pyre to build, the stubborn oak to rend. To turn the tasteful viand o'er the flame. Or foam the goblet with a purple stream. Such are the tasks of men of mean estate. Whom fortune dooms to serve the rich and great. Alas! Eumius with a sigh rejoined. How sprung a thought so monstrous in thy mind! If on that godless race thou wouldst attend. Fate owes thee sure a miserable end. Their wrongs and blasphemies ascend the sky. And pull descending vengeance from on high. Not such, my friend, the servants of their feast. A blooming train in rich embroidery dressed. With earth's whole tribute the bright table bends. And smiling round celestial youth attends. Stay, then, no eye askance beholds thee here. Sweet is thy converse to each social ear. Well pleased, and pleasing, in our cottage rest. Till good Telemachus accepts his guest. With genial gifts, and change of fair attires. And safe conveys thee where thy soul desires. To him the man of woes. O gracious Jove! Reward this stranger's hospitable love. Who knows the son of sorrow to relieve? Cheers the sad heart, nor lets affliction grieve. Of all the ills unhappy mortals know. A life of wanderings is the greatest woe. On all their weary ways wait care and pain. And pine and penury, a meager train. To such a man since harbour you afford. Relate the farther fortunes of your lord. What cares his mother's tender breast engage. And sire forsaken on the verge of age. Beneath the sun prolong they yet their breath. Or range the house of darkness and of death. To whom the swain, attend what you inquire. Laertes lives, the miserable sire. Lives, but implores of every power to lay. The burden down, and wishes for the day. Torn from his offspring in the eve of life. Torn from the embraces of his tender wife. Soul, and all comfortless, he wastes away. Old age, untimely posting ere his day. She too, sad mother. For Ulysses lost. Pined out her bloom, and vanished to a ghost. So dire a fate, ye righteous gods. Avert. From every friendly, every feeling heart. While yet she was, though clouded o'er with grief. Her pleasing converse ministered relief. With climbing, her youngest daughter, bred. One roof contained us, and one table fed. But when the softly stealing pace of time. Crept on from childhood into youthful prime. To Samos all she sent the wedded fair. Me to the fields, to tend the rural care. Arrayed in garments her own hands had wove. 
nor less the darling object of her love. Her hapless death my brighter days o'ercast. Yet providence deserts me not at last. My present labors food and drink procure. And more, the pleasure to relieve the poor. Small is the comfort from the queen to hear. Unwelcome news, or vex the royal ear. Blank and discountenanced the servants stand. Nor dare to question where the proud command. No profit springs beneath usurping powers. Want feeds not there where luxury devours. Nor harbors charity where riot reigns. Proud are the lords, and wretched are the swains. The suffering chief at this began to melt. And, O Eumius! Thou, he cries, hast felt. The spite of fortune too. Her cruel hand. Snatched thee an infant from thy native land. Snatched from thy parents' arms, thy parents' eyes. To early wants. A man of miseries. The whole sad story, from its first, declare. Sunk the fair city by the rage of war. Where once thy parents dwelt. Or did they keep. In humbler life, the lowing herds and sheep. So left perhaps to tend the fleecy train. Rude pirate seized, and shipped thee o'er the main. Doomed a fair prize to grace some prince's board. The worthy purchase of a foreign lord. If then my fortunes can delight my friend. A story fruitful of events attend. Another's sorrow may thy ears enjoy. And wine the lengthened intervals employ. Long nights the now declining year bestows. A part we consecrate to soft repose. A part in pleasing talk we entertain. For too much rest itself becomes a pain. Let those, whom sleep invites, the call obey. Their cares resuming with the dawning day. Here let us feast, and to the feast be joined. Discourse, the sweeter banquet of the mind. Review the series of our lives, and taste. The melancholy joy of evils past. For he who much has suffered, much will know. And pleased remembrance builds delight on woe. Above Ortigia lies an isle of fame. Far hence remote, and Syria is the name. Their curious eyes inscribed with wonder trace. The sun's diurnal, and his annual race. Not large, but fruitful. Stored with grass to keep. The bellowing oxen and the bleeding sheep. Her sloping hills the mantling vines adorn and her rich valleys wave with golden corn. No want, no famine, the glad natives know. Nor sink by sickness to the shades below. But when a length of years unnerves the strong, Apollo comes, and Cynthia comes along. They bend the silver bow with tender skill. And, void of pain, the silent arrows kill. Two equal tribes this fertile land divide where two fair cities rise with equal pride. But both in constant peace one prince obey. And Theseus there, my father, holds the sway. Freighted, it seems, with toys of every sort. A ship of Sidon anchored in our port. What time it chanced the palace entertained. Skilled in rich works, a woman of their land. This nymph, where anchored the Phoenician train to wash her robes descending to the main. A smooth-tongued sailor won her to his mind. For love deceives the best of womankind. A sudden trust from sudden liking grew. She told her name, her race, and all she knew. I too, she cried, from glorious Sidon came. My father Aribas, of wealthy fame. But, snatched by pirates from my native place. The Taphian sold me to this man's embrace. Haste then, the false designing youth replied. Haste to thy country, love shall be thy guide. Haste to thy father's house, thy father's breast. For still he lives, and lives with riches blessed. Swear first, she cried, ye sailors. To restore. A wretch in safety to her native shore. Swift as she asked, the ready sailors swore. She then proceeds, now let our compact made. Be nor by signal nor by word betrayed. Nor near me any of your crew descried. 
by road frequented, or by fountain side. Be silent still our guard. The monarch spies. For watchful age is ready to surmise. Are still at hand, and this, revealed, must be. Death to yourselves, eternal chains to me. Your vessel loaded, and your traffic passed. Dispatch a wary messenger with haste. Then gold and costly treasures will I bring. And more, the infant offspring of the king. Him, childlike wandering forth, I'll lead away. A noble prize, and to your ship convey. Thus spoke the dame, and homeward took the road. A year they traffic, and their vessel load. Their stores complete, and ready now to weigh. A spy was sent their summons to convey. An artist to my father's palace came. With gold and amber chains, elaborate frame. Each female I the glittering links employ. They turn, review, and cheapen every toy. He took the occasion, as they stood intent. Gave her the sign, and to his vessel went. She straight pursued, and seized my willing arm. I followed, smiling, innocent of harm. Three golden goblets in the porch she found. The guests not entered, but the table crowned. Hid in her fraudful bosom these she bore. Now set the sun, and darkened all the shore. Arriving then, where tilting on the tides. Prepared to launch the freighted vessel rides. Aboard they heave us, mount their decks, and sweep. With level or along the glassy deep. Six calmy days and six smooth nights we sail. And constant Jove supplied the gentle gale. The seventh, the fraudful wretch, no cause descried. Touched by Diana's vengeful arrow, died. Down dropped the caitiff course, a worthless load. Down to the deep, there rolled, the future food. Of fierce sea wolves, and monsters of the flood. An helpless infant I remained behind. Thence born to Ithaca by wave and wind. Sold to Laertes by divine command. And now adopted to a foreign land. To him the king, reciting thus thy cares. My secret soul in all thy sorrow shares. But one choice blessing, such as Jove's high will. Has sweetened all thy bitter draught of ill. Torn from thy country to no hapless end. The gods have, in a master, given a friend. Whatever frugal nature needs is thine. For she needs little, daily bread and wine. While I, so many wanderings past, and woes. Live but on what thy poverty bestows. So passed in pleasing dialogue away. The night. Then down to short repose they lay. Till radiant rose the messenger of day. While in the port of Ithaca, the band. Of young Telemachus approached the land. Their sails they loosed, they lashed the mast aside. And cast their anchors, and the cables tied. Then on the breezy shore, descending, join. In grateful banquet o'er the rosy wine. When thus the prince, now each his course pursue. I to the fields, and to the city you. Long absent hence, I dedicate this day. My swains to visit, and the work survey. Expect me with the morn, to pay the skies. Our debt of safe return in feast and sacrifice. Then Theoclymenus, but who shall lend? Meantime, protection to thy stranger friend? Straight to the queen and palace shall I fly. Or yet more distant, to some lord apply. The prince returned, renowned in days of yore. Has stood our father's hospitable door. No other roof a stranger should receive. No other hands than ours the welcome give. But in my absence riot fills the place. Nor bears the modest queen a stranger's face. From noiseful revel far remote she flies. But rarely seen, or seen with weeping eyes. No, let Eurymachus receive my guest. Of nature courteous, and by far the best. He woos the queen with more respectful flame. And emulates her former husband's fame. With what success, tis Jove's alone to know. And the hoped nuptials turn to joy or woe. Thus speaking, on the right upsoared in air. The hawk, 
Apollo's swift-winged messenger. His dreadful pounces tore a trembling dove. The clotted feathers, scattered from above. Between the hero and the vessel pour. Thick plumage mingled with a sanguine shower. The observing augur took the prince aside. Seized by the hand, and thus prophetic cried. Yon bird, that dexter cuts the aerial road. Rose ominous, nor flies without a god. No race but thine shall Ithaca obey. To thine, for ages. Heaven decrees the sway. Succeed the omens, gods. The youth rejoined. Soon shall my bounties speak a grateful mind. And soon each envied happiness attend. The man who calls Telemachus his friend. Then to Piraeus, thou whom time has proved. A faithful servant, by thy prince beloved. Till we returning shall our guest demand. Accept this charge with honor, at our hand. To this Piraeus, joyful I obey. Well please the hospitable rites to pay. The presence of thy guest shall best reward. If long thy stay, the absence of my lord. With that, their anchors he commands to weigh. Mount the tall bark, and launch into the sea. All with obedient haste forsake the shores. And, placed in order, spread their equal oars. Then from the deck the prince his sandals takes. Poised in his hand the pointed javelin shakes. They part, while, lessening from the hero's view. Swift to the town the well-rowed galley flew. The hero trod the margin of the main. And reached the mansion of his faithful swain. Book 16 Argument The Discovery of Ulysses to Telemachus Telemachus arriving at the lodge of Eumaeus, sends him to carry Penelope the news of his return. Minerva appearing to Ulysses, commands him to discover himself to his son. The princes, who had lain in ambush to intercept Telemachus in his way, their project being defeated, return to Ithaca. Soon as the morning blushed along the plains. Ulysses, and the monarch of the swains. Awake the sleeping fires, their meals prepare. And forth to pasture send the bristly care. The princes near approach the dogs descry. And fawning round his feet confess their joy. Their gentle blandishment the king surveyed. Heard his resounding step, and instant said. Some well-known friend, Eumaeus, bends this way. His steps I hear. The dog's familiar play. While yet he spoke, the prince advancing drew. Nigh to the lodge, and now appeared in view. Transported from his seat Eumaeus sprung. Dropped the full bowl, and round his bosom hung. Kissing his cheek, his hand, while from his eye. The tears rained copious in a shower of joy. As some fond sire who ten long winters grieves. From foreign climes an only son receives. Child of his age, with strong paternal joy. Forward he springs. And clasps the favorite boy. So round the youth his arms Eumaeus spread. As if the grave had given him from the dead. And is it thou? My ever dear delight. Oh, art thou come to bless my longing sight? Never, I never hope to view this day. When o'er the waves you plough the desperate way. Enter, my child. Beyond my hopes restored. Oh give these eyes to feast upon their lord. Enter, O oh seldom seen. For lawless powers. Too much detain thee from these sylvan bowers. The prince replied, Eumaeus, I obey. To seek thee, friend, I hither took my way. But say, if in the court the queen reside. Severely chaste, or if commenced a bride. Thus he, and thus the monarch of the swains. Severely chaste Penelope remains. But, lost to every joy, she wastes the day. In tedious cares, and weeps the night away. He ended, and, receiving as they pass. The javelin pointed with a star of brass. They reached the dome, the dome with marble shined. His seat Ulysses to the prince resigned. Not so, exclaims the prince with decent grace. For me, this house shall find an humbler place. 
to usurp the honors due to silver hairs. And reverend strangers modest youth forebears. Instant the swain the spoils of beasts supplies. And bids the rural throne with osiers rise. There sate the prince, the feast Eumius spread. And heaped the shining canisters with bread. Thick o'er the board the plenteous viands lay. The frugal remnants of the former day. Then in a bowl he tempers generous wines. Around whose verge a mimic ivy twines. And now, the rage of thirst and hunger fled. Thus young Ulysses to Eumius said. Whence, father, from what shore this stranger, say? What vessel bore him o'er the watery way? To human step our land impervious lies. And round the coast circumfluent oceans rise. The swain returns, a tale of sorrows here. In spacious Crete he drew his natal air. Long doomed to wander o'er the land and main. For heaven has wove his thread of life with pain. Half breathless, scaping to the land he flew. From Thesprot mariners, a murderous crew. To thee, my son, the suppliant I resign. I gave him my protection, grant him thine. Hard task, he cries, thy virtue gives thy friend. Willing to aid, unable to defend. Can strangers safely in the court reside? Midst the swelled insolence of lust and pride? E'en I unsafe, the queen in doubt to wed. Or pay due honors to the nuptial bed. Perhaps she weds regardless of her fame. Deaf to the mighty Ulyssian name. However, stranger. From our grace receive. Such honors as befit a prince to give. Sandals, a sword and robes, respect to prove. And safe to sail with ornaments of love. Till then, thy guest amid the rural train. Far from the court, from danger far, detain. Tis mine with food the hungry to supply. And clothe the naked from the inclement sky. Here dwell in safety from the suitor's wrongs. And the rude insults of ungoverned tongues. For shouldst thou suffer, powerless to relieve. I must behold it, and can only grieve. The brave, encompassed by an hostile train. O'erpowered ye by numbers, is but brave in vain. To whom, while anger in his bosom glows. With warmth replies the man of mighty woes. Since audience mild is deigned, permit my tongue. At once to pity and resent thy wrong. My heart weeps blood to see a soul so brave. Live to base insolence or power a slave. But tell me, dost thou, prince, dost thou behold? And hear their midnight revels uncontrolled. Say, do thy subjects in bold faction rise? Or priests in fabled oracles advise? Or are thy brothers, who should aid thy power? Turned mean deserters in the needful hour. Oh that I were from great Ulysses sprung. Or that these withered nerves like thine were strung. Or, heavens. Might he return. And soon appear. He shall, I trust. A hero scorns despair. Might he return, I yield my life a prey. To my worst foe, if that avenging day. Be not their last, but should I lose my life. Oppressed by numbers in the glorious strife. I chose the nobler part, and yield my breath. Rather than bear dishonor, worse than death. Then see the hand of violence invade. The reverend stranger and the spotless maid. Then see the wealth of kings consumed in waste. The drunkards revel, and the gluttons feast. Thus he, with anger flashing from his eye. Sincere the youthful hero made reply. Nor leagued in factious arms my subjects rise. Nor priests in fabled oracles advise. Nor are my brothers, who should aid my power. Turned mean deserters in the needful hour. Ah me! I boast no brother. Heaven's dread king. Gives from our stock an only branch to spring. Alone Laertes reigned our sieges heir. Alone Ulysses drew the vital air. And I alone the bed connubial graced. An unblessed offspring of a sire unblessed. Each neighboring realm, conducive to our woe. 
sends forth her peers, and every peer a foe. The court proud Samos and Dilichium fills. And lofty Zacinth crowned with shady hills. E'en Ithaca and all her lords invade. The imperial scepter, and the regal bed. The queen, averse to love, yet awed by power. Seems half to yield, yet flies the bridal hour. Meantime their license uncontrolled I bear. E'en now they envy me the vital air. But heaven will sure revenge, and gods there are. But go Eumius. To the queen impart. Our safe return, and ease a mother's heart. Yet secret go. For numerous are my foes. And here at least I may in peace repose. To whom the swain, I hear and I obey. But old Laertes weeps his life away. And deems thee lost, shall I speed employ. To bless his age, a messenger of joy. The mournful hour that tore his son away. Sent the sad sire in solitude to stray. Yet busied with his slaves, to ease his woe. He dressed the vine, and bade the garden blow. Nor food nor wine refused. But since the day. That you to Pilus plout the watery way. Nor wine nor food he tastes, but, sunk in woes. Wild springs the vine, no more the garden blows. Shut from the walks of men, to pleasure lost. Pensive and pale he wanders half a ghost. Wretched old man. With tears the prince returns. Yet cease to go, what man so blessed but mourns? Were every wish indulged by favoring skies? This hour should give Ulysses to my eyes. But to the queen with speed dispatchful bear. Our safe return, and back with speed repair. And let some handmaid of her train resort. To good Laertes in his rural court. While yet he spoke, impatient of delay. He braced his sandals on, and strode away. Then from the heavens the martial goddess flies. Through the wild fields of air, and cleaves the skies. In form, a virgin in soft beauty's bloom. Skilled in the illustrious labors of the loom. Alone to Ithaca she stood displayed. But unapparent as a viewless shade. Escaped Telemachus, the powers above. Seen or unseen, o'er earth at pleasure move. The dogs intelligent confessed the tread. Of power divine, and howling, trembling, fled. The goddess, beckoning, waves her deathless hands. Dauntless the king before the goddess stands. Then why, she said, O favored of the skies? Why to thy godlike son this long disguise? Stand forth revealed. With him thy cares employ. Against thy foes, be valiant and destroy. Lo! I descend in that avenging hour. To combat by thy side, thy guardian power. She said, and o'er him waves her wand of gold. Imperial robes his manly limbs enfold. At once with grace divine his frame improves. At once with majesty enlarged he moves. Youth flushed his reddening cheek, and from his brows. A length of hair in sable ringlets flows. His blackening chin receives a deeper shade. Then from his eyes upsprung the warrior maid. The hero reascends, the prince o'errod. Scarce lifts his eyes, and bows as to a god. Then with surprise, surprised chastised by fears. How art thou changed? He cried, a god appears. Far other vests thy limbs majestic grace. Far other glories lighten from thy face. If heaven be thy abode, with pious care. Lo! I the ready sacrifice prepare. Lo! Gifts of labored gold adorn thy shrine. To win thy grace, O oh save us, power divine. Few are my days, Ulysses made reply. Nor I, alas! Descendant of the sky. I am thy father. O oh my son! My son! That father, for whose sake thy days have run. One scene of woe. To endless cares consigned. And outraged by the wrongs of base mankind. Then, rushing to his arms, 
he kissed his boy. With the strong raptures of a parent's joy. Tears bathe his cheek, and tears the ground bedew. He strained him close, as to his breast he grew. Ah me! exclaims the prince with fond desire. Thou art not, no, thou canst not be my sire. Heaven such illusion only can impose. By the false joy to aggravate my woes. Who but a god can change the general doom? And give to withered age a youthful bloom? Late, worn with years, in weeds obscene you trod. Now, clothed in majesty, you move a god. Forbear, he cried, for heaven reserve that name. Give to thy father but a father's claim. Other Ulysses shalt thou never see. I am Ulysses, I, my son, am he. Twice ten sad years o'er earth and ocean tossed. Tis given at length to view my native coast. Pallas, unconquered maid, my frame surrounds. With grace divine, her power admits no bounds. She o'er my limbs old age and wrinkles shed. Now strong as youth, magnificent I tread. The gods with ease frail man depress or raise. Exalt the lowly, or the proud debase. He spoke and sate. The prince with transport flew. Hung round his neck, while tears his cheek bedew. Nor less the father poured a social flood. They wept abundant, and they wept aloud. As the bold eagle with fierce sorrow stung. Or parent vulture, mourns her ravished young. They cry, they scream, their unfledged brood a prey to some rude churl, and borne by stealth away. So they allowed, and tears in tides had run. Their grief unfinished with the setting sun. But checking the full torrent in its flow. The prince thus interrupts the solemn woe. What ship transported thee, O father, say? And what blessed hands have oared thee on the way? All, all, Ulysses instant made reply. I tell thee all, my child, my only joy. Phaeacians bore me to the port assigned. A nation ever to the stranger kind. Wrapped in the embrace of sleep, the faithful train. O'er seas conveyed me to my native reign. Embroidered vestures, gold, and brass, are laid. Concealed in caverns in the sylvan shade. Hither, intent the rival rout to slay. And plan the scene of death, I bend my way. So Pallas wills, but thou, my son, explain. The names and numbers of the audacious train. Tis mine to judge if better to employ. Assistant force, or singly to destroy. O'er earth, returns the prince, resounds thy name. Thy well-tried wisdom, and thy martial fame. Yet at thy words I start, in wonder lost. Can we engage, not decades but an host? Can we alone in furious battle stand? Against that numerous and determined band? Here then their numbers, from Delicium came. Twice twenty-six, all peers of mighty name. Six are their menial train, twice twelve the boast. Of Samos. Twenty from Zacynthus coast. And twelve our country's pride, to these belong. Medan and Phemius, skilled in heavenly song. Two sewers from day to day the revels wait. Exact of taste, and serve the feast in state. With such a foe the unequal fight to try. Were by false courage unrevenged to die. Then what assistant powers you boast relate. Ere yet we mingle in the stern debate. Mark well my voice, Ulysses straight replies. What need of aids, if favored by the skies? If shielded to the dreadful fight we move. By mighty Pallas, and by thundering Jove. Sufficient they, Telemachus rejoined. Against the banded powers of all mankind. They, high enthroned above the rolling clouds. Wither the strength of man, and awe the gods. Such aids expect, he cries, when strong in might. We rise terrific to the task of fight. But thou, when morn salutes the aerial plain. The court revisit and the lawless train. Me thither in disguise Eumius leads. An aged mendicant in tattered weeds. 
There, if base scorn insult my reverend age. Bear it, my son. Repress thy rising rage. If outraged, cease that outrage to repel. Bear it, my son. How are thy heart rebel? Yet strive by prayer and counsel to restrain. Their lawless insults, though thou strive in vain. For wicked ears are deaf to wisdom's call. And vengeance strikes whom heaven has doomed to fall. Once more attend, when she whose power inspires. The thinking mind, my soul to vengeance fires. I give the sign, that instant, from beneath. Aloft convey the instruments of death. Armor and arms. And, if mistrust arise. Thus veil the truth in plausible disguise. These glittering weapons, ere he sailed to Troy. Ulysses viewed with stern heroic joy. Then, beaming o'er the illumined wall they shone. Now dust dishonors, all their luster gone. I bear them hence, so Jove my soul inspires. From the pollution of the fuming fires. Lest when the bowl inflames, in vengeful mood. Ye rush to arms, and stain the feast with blood. Oft ready swords in luckless hour in sight. The hand of wrath, and arm it for the fight. Such be the plea, and by the plea deceive. For Jove infatuates all, and all believe. Yet leave for each of us a sword to wield. A pointed javelin, and a fenceful shield. But by my blood that in thy bosom glows. By that regard a son his father owes. The secret, that thy father lives, retain. Locked in thy bosom from the household train. Hide it from all. E'en from Eumaeus hide. From my dear father, and my dearer bride. One care remains, to note the loyal few. Whose faith yet lasts among the menial crew. And noting, ere we rise in vengeance, prove. Who love his prince, for sure you merit love. To whom the youth, to emulate, I aim. The brave and wise, and my great father's fame. But reconsider, since the wisest heir. Vengeance resolved, tis dangerous to defer. What length of time must we consume in vain? Too curious to explore the menial train. While the proud foes, industrious to destroy. Thy wealth, in riot the delay enjoy. Suffice it in this exigence alone. To mark the damsels that attend the throne. Dispersed the youth reside, their faith to prove. Jove grants henceforth, if thou hast spoke from Jove. While in debate they waste the hours away. The associates of the prince repass the bay. With speed they guide the vessel to the shores. With speed debarking land the naval stores. Then, faithful to their charge, to Clitius bear. And trust the presence to his friendly care. Swift to the queen a herald flies to impart. Her sons return, and ease a parent's heart. Lest a sad prey to ever musing cares. Pale grief destroy what time a while forbears. The incautious herald with impatience burns. And cries aloud, Thy son, O queen, returns. Yumia sage approached the imperial throne. And breathed his mandate to her ear alone. Then measured back the way. The suitor band. Stung to the soul, abashed, confounded, stand. And issuing from the dome, before the gate. With clouded looks, a pale assembly sate. At length Eurymachus, our hopes are vain. Telemachus in triumph sails the main. Haste, rear the mast, the swelling shroud display. Haste, to our ambushed friends the news convey. Scarce had he spake, when, turning to the strand. Amphinomos surveyed the associate band. Full to the bay within the winding shores. With gathered sails they stood, and lifted oars. O oh friends, he cried, elate with rising joy. See to the port secure the vessel fly. Some god has told them, or themselves survey. The bark escaped. And measure back their way. Swift at the word descending to the shores. They moor the vessel and unlaid the stores. Then, moving from the strand, apart they sate. 
and full and frequent formed a dire debate. Lives then the boy. He lives, Antinous cries. The care of gods and favorite of the skies. All night we watched, till with her orient wheels. Aurora flamed above the eastern hills. And from the lofty brow of rocks by day. Took in the ocean with a broad survey. Yet safe he sails. The powers celestial give. To shun the hidden snares of death, and live. But die he shall, and thus condemned to bleed. Be now the scene of instant death decreed. Hope ye success. Undaunted crushed the foe. Is he not wise? Know this, and strike the blow. Wait ye, till he to arms in council draws. The Greeks, averse too justly to our cause. Strike, ere, the states convened, the foe betray. Our murderous ambush on the watery way. Or choose ye vagrant from their rage to fly. Outcasts of earth, to breathe an unknown sky. The brave prevent misfortune, then be brave. And bury future danger in his grave. Returns he. Ambushed will his walk invade. Or where he hides in solitude and shade. And give the palace to the queen a dower. Or him she blesses in the bridal hour. But if submissive you resign the sway. Slaves to a boy, go, flatter and obey. Retire we instant to our native reign. Nor be the wealth of kings consumed in vain. Then wed whom choice approves, the queen be given. To some blessed prince, the prince decreed by heaven. Abashed, the suitor train his voice attends. Till from his throne Amphinomus ascends. Who o'er Delicium stretched his spacious reign. A land of plenty, blessed with every grain. Chief of the numbers who the queen addressed. And though displeasing, yet displeasing least. Soft were his words. His actions wisdom swayed. Graceful a while he paused, then mildly said. O oh friends, forbear. And be the thought withstood. Tis horrible to shed imperial blood. Consult we first the all-seeing powers above. And the sure oracles of righteous Jove. If they assent, e'en by this hand he dies. If they forbid, I war not with the skies. He said, the rival train his voice approved. And rising instant to the palace moved. Arrived, with wild tumultuous noise they sate. Recumbent on the shining thrones of state. The Medan, conscious of their dire debates. The murderous counsel to the queen relates. Touched at the dreadful story, she descends. Her hasty steps a damsel train attends. Full where the dome its shining valves expands. Sudden before the rival powers she stands. And, veiling, decent, with a modest shade. Her cheek, indignant to Antinous said. O void of faith! Of all bad men the worst. Renowned for wisdom, by the abuse accursed. Mistaking fame proclaims thy generous mind. Thy deeds denote thee of the basest kind. Wretch! To destroy a prince that friendship gives. While in his guest his murderer he receives. Nor dread superior Jove, to whom belong. The cause of suppliance, and revenge of wrong. Hast thou forgot, ungrateful as thou art. Who saved thy father with a friendly part. Lawless he ravaged with his martial powers. The Taphian pirates on Thesprotia's shores. Enraged, his life, his treasures they demand. Ulysses saved him from the avenger's hand. And wouldst thou evil for his good repay? His bed dishonor, and his house betray. Afflict his queen, and with a murderous hand. Destroy his heir, but cease, tis I command. Far hence those fears, Eurymachus replied. O prudent princess! Bid thy soul confide. Breathes there a man who dares that hero slay? While I behold the golden light of day. No, by the righteous powers of heaven I swear. His blood in vengeance smokes upon my spear. Ulysses, when my infant days I led. With wine sufficed me, and with dainties fed. 
my generous soul abhors the ungrateful part. And my friend's son lives nearest to my heart. Then fear no mortal arm. If heaven destroy. We must resign, for man is born to die. Thus smooth he ended, yet his death conspired. Then sorrowing, with sad step the queen retired. With streaming eyes, all comfortless deplored. Touched with the dear remembrance of her lord. Nor ceased till Pallas bids her sorrows fly. And in soft slumber sealed her flowing eye. And now Eumaeus, at the evening hour. Came late, returning to his sylvan bower. Ulysses and his son had dressed with art. A yearling bore, and gave the gods their part. Holy repast. That instant from the skies. The martial goddess to Ulysses flies. She waves her golden wand, and reassumes. From every feature every grace that blooms. At once his vestures change. At once she sheds. Age o'er his limbs, that tremble as he treads. Lest to the queen the swain with transport fly. Unable to contain the unruly joy. When near he drew, the prince breaks forth, proclaim. What tidings, friend? What speaks the voice of fame? Say, if the suitors measure back the main. Or still in ambush thirst for blood in vain. Whether, he cries, they measure back the flood. Or still in ambush thirst in vain for blood. Escaped my care, where lawless suitors sway. Thy mandate born my soul disdain to stay. But from the Hermean height I cast a view. Where to the port a bark high-bounding flew. Her freight a shining band, with martial air. Each poised his shield, and each advanced his spear. And, if aright these searching eyes survey. The eluded suitors stem the watery way. The prince, well pleased to disappoint their wiles. Steals on his sire a glance, and secret smiles. And now, a short repast prepared, they fed. Till the keen rage of craving hunger fled. Then to repose withdrawn, apart they lay. And in soft sleep forgot the cares of day. Book 17 Argument Telemachus returning to the city, relates to Penelope the sum of his travels. Ulysses is conducted by Eumaeus to the palace, where his old dog Argus acknowledges his master, after an absence of twenty years, and dies with joy. Eumaeus returns into the country, and Ulysses remains among the suitors, whose behavior is described. Soon as Aurora, daughter of the dawn, sprinkled with roseate light the dewy lawn, in haste the prince arose, prepared to part. His hand impatient grasps the pointed dart. Fair on his feet the polished sandals shine. And thus he greets the master of the swine. My friend, adieu. Let this short stay suffice. I haste to meet my mother's longing eyes. And end her tears, her sorrows and her sighs. But thou, attentive, what we order heed. This hapless stranger to the city lead. By public bounty let him there be fed. And bless the hand that stretches forth the bread. To wipe the tears from all afflicted eyes. My will may covet, but my power denies. If this raise anger in the stranger's thought. The pain of anger punishes the fault. The very truth I undisguised declare. For what so easy as to be sincere. To this Ulysses, what the prince requires. Of swift removal, seconds my desires. To want like mine the people town can yield. More hopes of comfort than the lonely field. Nor fits my age to till the labored lands. Or stoop to tasks a rural lord demands. Adieu. But since this ragged garb can bear. So ill the inclemencies of morning air. A few hours' space permit me here to stay. My steps Eumaeus shall to town convey. With riper beams when Phoebus warms the day. Thus he, nor aught Telemachus replied. But left the mansion with a lofty stride. Schemes of revenge his pondering breast elate. Revolving deep the suitor's sudden fate. Arriving now before the imperial hall. 
he props his spear against the pillared wall. Then like a lion o'er the threshold bounds. The marble pavement with his steps resounds. His eye first glanced where Euryclea spreads. With furry spoils of beasts the splendid beds. She saw, she wept, she ran with eager pace. And reached her master with a long embrace. All crowded round, the family appears. With wild entrancement, and ecstatic tears. Swift from above descends the royal fair. Her beauteous cheeks the blush of Venus wear. Chastened with coy Diana's pensive air. Hangs o'er her son, in his embraces dies. Rains kisses on his neck, his face, his eyes. Few words she spoke, though much she had to say. And scarce those few, for tears, could force their way. Light of my eyes, he comes. Unhoped for joy. Has heaven from Pylos brought my lovely boy? So snatched from all our cares, tell, hast thou known. Thy father's fate, and tell me all thy own. O oh, dearest! Most revered of womankind! Cease with those tears to melt a manly mind. Replied the prince, nor be our fates deplored. From death and treason to thy arms restored. Go bathe, and robed in white ascend the towers. With all thy handmaids thank the immortal powers. To every god vow hecatombs to bleed. And call Jove's vengeance on their guilty deed. While to the assembled council I repair. A stranger sent by heaven attends me there. My new accepted guest I haste to find. Now to Piraeus' honored charge consigned. The matron heard, nor was his word in vain. She bathed. And, robed in white, with all her train. To every god vowed hecatombs to bleed. And called Jove's vengeance on the guilty deed. Armed with his lance, the prince then passed the gate. Two dogs behind, a faithful guard, await. Pallas his form with grace divine improves. The gazing crowd admires him as he moves. Him, gathering round, the haughty suitors greet. With semblance fair, but inward deep deceit. Their false addresses, generous, he denied. Passed on, and sate by faithful mentor's side. With Antiphus, and Halithus's sage. His father's counselors, revered for age. Of his own fortunes, and Ulysses' fame. Much asked the seniors, till Piraeus came. The stranger guest pursued him close behind. Whom when Telemachus beheld, he joined. He, when Piraeus asked for slaves to bring. The gifts and treasures of the Spartan king. Thus thoughtful answered, those we shall not move. Dark and unconscious of the will of Jove. We know not yet the full event of all. Stabbed in his palace if your prince must fall. Us, and our house, if treason must overthrow. Better a friend possess them than a foe. If death to these, and vengeance heaven decree. Riches are welcome then, not else, to me. Till then retain the gifts. The hero said. And in his hand the willing stranger led. Then disarrayed, the shining bath they sought. With unguent smooth, of polished marble wrought. Obedient handmaids with assistant toil. Supply the limpid wave, and fragrant oil. Then o'er their limbs refulgent robes they threw. And fresh from bathing to their seats withdrew. The golden ewer a nymph attendant brings. Replenished from the pure translucent springs. With copious streams that golden ewer supplies. A silver layer of capacious size. They wash, the table, in fair order spread. Is piled with viands and the strength of bread. Full opposite, before the folding gate. The pensive mother sits in humble state. Lowly she sate, and with dejected view. The fleecy threads her ivory fingers drew. The prince and stranger shared the genial feast. Till now the rage of thirst and hunger ceased. When thus the queen, my son. My only friend. Say, to my mournful couch shall I ascend. The couch deserted now a length of years. The couch forever watered with my tears winky face. 
Say, wilt thou not, ere yet the suitor crew? Return, and riot shakes our walls anew. Say, wilt thou not the least account afford? The least glad tidings of my absent lord? To her the youth. We reached the Pillian plains. Where Nestor, shepherd of his people, reigns. All arts of tenderness to him are known. Kind to Ulysses' race as to his own. No father with a fonder grasp of joy. Strains to his bosom his long absent boy. But all unknown, if yet Ulysses breathe. Or glide a spectre in the realms beneath. For farther search, his rapid steeds transport. My lengthened journey to the Spartan court. There Argive Helen I beheld, whose charms. So heaven decreed, engaged the great in arms. My cause of coming told, he thus rejoined. And still his words live perfect in my mind. Heavens! Would a soft, inglorious, dastard train. An absent hero's nuptial joys profane. So with her young, amid the woodland shades. A timorous hind the lion's court invades. Leaves in that fatal lair her tender fawns. And climbs the cliffs. Or feeds along the lawns. Meantime returning, with remorseless sway. The monarch savage rends the panting prey. With equal fury, and with equal fame. Shall great Ulysses reassert his claim? O Jove! Supreme! Whom men and gods revere! And thou whose luster gilds the rolling sphere! With power congenial joined, propitious aid! The chief adopted by the martial maid! Such to our wish the warrior soon restore! As when, contending on the lesbian shore, His prowess Philomelides confessed! And loud acclaiming Greeks the victor blessed! Then soon the invaders of his bed, and throne. Their love presumptuous shall by death atone. Now what you question of my ancient friend? With truth I answer, thou the truth attend. Learn what I heard the seaborn seer relate. Whose eye can pierce the dark recess of fate? Soul in an isle, imprisoned by the main. The sad survivor of his numerous train. Ulysses lies. Detained by magic charms and pressed unwilling in Calypso's arms. No sailors there, no vessels to convey. No oars to cut the immeasurable way. This told Atrides, and he told no more. Then safe I voyaged to my native shore. He ceased. Nor made the pensive queen reply. But drooped her head, and drew a secret sigh. When Theoclymenus the seer began. O suffering consort of the suffering man! What human knowledge could, those kings might tell. But I the secrets of high heaven reveal. Before the first of gods be this declared. Before the board whose blessings we have shared. Witness the genial rites, and witness all. This house holds sacred in her ample wall. E'en now, this instant, great Ulysses, laid. At rest, or wandering in his country's shade. Their guilty deeds, in hearing, and in view. Secret revolves, and plans the vengeance due. Of this sure auguries the gods bestowed. When first our vessel anchored in your road. Succeed those omens, heaven. The queen rejoined. So shall our bounties speak a grateful mind. And every envied happiness attend. The man who calls Penelope his friend. Thus commune they, while in the marble court. Scene of their insolence, the Lord's resort. Athwart the spacious square each tries his art. To whirl the disc, or aim the missile dart. Now did the hour of sweet repast arrive. And from the field the victim flocks they drive. Meden the herald, one who pleased them best. And honored with a portion of their feast. To bid the banquet. Interrupts their play. Swift to the hall they haste. Aside they lay. Their garments, and succinct the victim slay. Then sheep, and goats, and bristly porkers bled. And the proud steer was o'er the marble spread. While thus the copious banquet they provide. Along the road, 
conversing side by side. Proceed Ulysses and the faithful swain. When thus Eumaeus, generous and humane. To town, observant of our lord's behest. Now let us speed. My friend no more my guest. Yet like myself I wish thee here preferred. Guard of the flock, or keeper of the herd. But much to raise my master's wrath I fear. The wrath of princes ever is severe. Then heed his will, and be our journey made. While the broad beams of Phoebus are displayed. Or ere brown evening spreads her chilly shade. Just thy advice, the prudent chief rejoined. And such as suits the dictate of my mind. Lead on, but help me to some staff to stay. My feeble step, since rugged is the way. Across his shoulders then the script he flung. Wide patched, and fastened by a twisted thong. A staff Eumaeus gave. Along the way. Cheerly they fare, behind, the keepers stay. These with their watchful dogs, a constant guard. Supply his absence, and attend the herd. And now his city strikes the monarch's eyes. Alas! How changed! A man of miseries! Propped on a staff, a beggar old and bare. In rags dishonest fluttering with the air. Now past the rugged road, they journey down. The caverned way descending to the town. Where, from the rock, with liquid drops distills. A limpid fount. That spread in parting rills. Its current thence to serve the city brings. An useful work, adorned by ancient kings. Neritus, Ithacus, Polyctor, there. In sculptured stone immortalized their care. In marble urns received it from above. And shaded with a green surrounding grove. Where silver alders, in high arches twined. Drink the cool stream, and tremble to the wind. Beneath, sequestered to the nymphs, is seen. A mossy altar, deep embowered in green. Where constant vows by travellers are paid. And holy horrors solemnize the shade. Here with his goats, not vowed to sacred fame. But pampered luxury, Melanthius came. Two grooms attend him. With an envious look. He eyed the stranger, and imperious spoke. The good old proverb how this pair fulfill. One rogue is usher to another still. Heaven with a secret principle endued. Mankind, to seek their own similitude. Where goes the swineherd with that ill-looked guest? That giant glutton, dreadful at a feast. Full many a post have those broad shoulders worn. From every great man's gate repulsed with scorn. To no brave prize aspired the worthless swain. Twas but for scraps he asked, and asked in vain. To beg, then work, he better understands. Or we perhaps might take him off thy hands. For any office could the slave be good. To cleanse the fold, or help the kids to food. If any labor those big joints could learn. Some way, to wash his bowels, he might earn. To cringe, to whine, his idle hands to spread. Is all, by which that graceless maw is fed. Yet hear me. If thy impudence but dare. Approach yon wall, I prophesy thy fare. Dearly, full dearly, shalt thou buy thy bread. With many a footstool thundering at thy head. He thus, nor insolent of word alone. Spurned with his rustic heel his king unknown. Spurned, but not moved, he like a pillar stood. Nor stirred an inch, contemptuous, from the road. Doubtful, or with his staff to strike him dead. Or greet the pavement with his worthless head. Short was that doubt. To quell his rage inured. The hero stood self-conquered, and endured. But hateful of the wretch, Eumaeus heaved. His hands obdusting, and this prayer conceived. Daughters of Jove. Who from the ethereal bowers. Descend to swell the springs, and feed the flowers. Nymphs of this fountain. To whose sacred names. Our rural victims mount in blazing flames. To whom Ulysses' piety preferred. The yearly firstlings of his flock and herd. 
succeed my wish, your votary restore. Oh, be some god his convoy to our shore. Do pains shall punish then this slave's offence. And humble all his heirs of insolence. Who, proudly stalking, leaves the herds at large. Commences courtier, and neglects his charge. What mutters he? Melanthius sharp rejoins winky face. This crafty miscreant, big with dark designs. The day shall come, nay, tis already near. When, slave. To sell thee at a price too dear. Must be my care, and hence transport thee o'er. A load and scandal to this happy shore. Oh! That is surely great Apollo's dart. Or some brave suitor's sword, might pierce the heart. Of the proud son, as that we stand this hour. In lasting safety from the father's power. So spoke the wretch, but, shunning farther fray. Turned his proud step, and left them on their way. Straight to the feastful palace he repaired. Familiar entered, and the banquet shared. Beneath Eurymachus, his patron lord. He took his place, and plenty heaped the board. Meantime they heard, soft circling in the sky. Sweet airs ascend, and heavenly minstrelsy. For Phemius to the lyre attuned the strain. Ulysses hearkened, then addressed the swain. Well may this palace admiration claim. Great and respondent to the master's fame. Stage above stage the imperial structure stands. Holds the chief honors, and the town commands. High walls and battlements the courts enclose. And the strong gates defy a host of foes. Far other cares its dwellers now employ. The thronged assembly and the feast of joy. I see the smokes of sacrifice aspire. And here, what graces every feast, the lyre. Then thus Eumius, judge we which were best. Amidst yon revellers a sudden guest. Choose you to mingle, while behind I stay. Or I first entering introduce the way. Wait for a space without, but wait not long. This is the house of violence and wrong. Some rude insult thy reverend age may bear. For like their lawless lords the servants are. Just is, O friend. Thy caution, and addressed. Replied the chief, to no unheedful breast. The wrongs and injuries of base mankind. Fresh to my sense, and always in my mind. The bravely patient to no fortune yields. On rolling oceans, and in fighting fields. Storms have I passed, and many a stern debate. And now in humbler scenes submit to fate. What cannot want? The best she will expose. And I am learned in all her train of woes. She fills with navies, hosts, and loud alarms. The sea, the land, and shakes the world with arms. Thus, near the gates conferring as they drew. Argus, the dog, his ancient master knew. He not unconscious of the voice and tread. Lifts to the sound his ear, and rears his head. Bred by Ulysses, nourished at his board. But, ah! Not fated long to please his lord. To him, his swiftness and his strength were vain. The voice of glory called him o'er the main. Till then in every sylvan chase renowned. With Argus, Argus, rung the woods around. With him the youth pursued the goat or fawn. Or traced the mazy leveret o'er the lawn. Now left to man's ingratitude he lay. Unhoused, neglected in the public way. And whereon heaps the rich manure was spread. Obscene with reptiles, took his sordid bed. He knew his lord, he knew, and strove to meet. In vain he strove to crawl and kiss his feet. Yet, all he could, his tail, his tears, his eyes. Salute his master, and confess his joys. Soft pity touched the mighty master's soul. Adown his cheek a tear unbidden stole. Stole unperceived, he turned his head and dried. The drop humane, then thus impassioned cried. What noble beast in this abandoned state! Lies here all helpless at Ulysses' gate. His bulk and beauty speak no vulgar praise. 
if, as he seems, he was in better days. Some care his age deserves, or was he prized. For worthless beauty. Therefore now despised. Such dogs and men there are, mere things of state. And always cherished by their friends, the great. Not Argus so, Eumius thus rejoined. But served a master of a nobler kind. Who, never, never shall behold him more. Long, long since perished on a distant shore. Oh had you seen him, vigorous, bold, and young. Swift as a stag, and as a lion strong. Him no fell savage on the plain withstood. None, scaped him bosomed in the gloomy wood. His eye how piercing, and his scent how true. To win the vapour on the tainted dew. Such, when Ulysses left his natal coast. Now years unnerve him, and his lord is lost. The women keep the generous creature bare. A sleek and idle race is all their care. The master gone, the servants what restrains. Or dwells humanity where riot reigns. Jove fixed it certain, that whatever day. Makes man a slave, takes half his worth away. This said, the honest herdsman strode before. The musing monarch pauses at the door. The dog, whom fate had granted to behold. His lord, when twenty tedious years had rolled. Takes a last look, and having seen him, dies. So closed for ever faithful Argus' eyes. And now Telemachus, the first of all. Observed Eumius entering in the hall. Distant he saw, across the shady dome. Then gave a sign, and beckoned him to come. There stood an empty seat, where late was placed. In order due, the steward of the feast. Who now was busied carving round the board. Eumius took, and placed it near his lord. Before him instant was the banquet spread. And the bright basket piled with loaves of bread. Next came Ulysses lowly at the door. A figure despicable, old, and poor. In squalid vests, with many a gaping rent. Propped or a staff, and trembling as he went. Then, resting on the threshold of the gate. Against a cypress pillar leaned his weight. Smoothed by the workman to a polished plain. The thoughtful son beheld, and called his swain. These viands, and this bread, Eumius. Bear. And let yon mendicant our plenty share. And let him circle round the suitor's board. And try the bounty of each gracious lord. Bold let him ask, encouraged thus by me. How ill, alas! Do want and shame agree. His lord's command the faithful servant bears. The seeming beggar answers with his prayers. Blessed be Telemachus. In every deed. Inspire him. Jove. In every wish succeed. This said, the portion from his son conveyed. With smiles receiving on his scrip he laid. Long has the minstrel swept the sounding wire. He fed, and ceased when silence held the lyre. Soon as the suitors from the banquet rose. Minerva prompts the man of mighty woes. To tempt their bounties with a suppliant's art. And learn the generous from the ignoble heart. Not but his soul, resentful as humane. Dooms to full vengeance all the offending train. With speaking eyes, and voice of plaintive sound. Humble he moves, imploring all around. The proud feel pity, and relief bestow. With such an image touched of human woe. Inquiring all, their wonder they confess. And I the man, majestic in distress. While thus they gaze and question with their eyes. The bold Melanthius to their thought replies. My lords. This stranger of gigantic port. The good Eumius ushered to your court. Full well I marked the features of his face. Though all unknown his clime, or noble race. And is this present, swineherd. Of thy band. Bring'st thou these vagrants to infest the land. Returns Antinous with retorted eye. Objects uncouth, to check the genial joy. Enough of these are court already grace. Of giant stomach, and of famished face. 
such guests Eumius to his country brings. To share our feast, and lead the life of kings. To whom the hospitable swain rejoins. Thy passion, prince, belies thy knowing mind. Who calls, from distant nations to his own. The poor, distinguished by their wants alone. Round the wide world are sought those men divine. Who public structures raise, or who design. Those to whose eyes the gods their ways reveal. Or bless with salutary arts to heal. But chief to poets such respect belongs. By rival nations courted for their songs. These states invite, and mighty kings admire. Wide as the sun displays his vital fire. It is not so with want. How few that feed. A wretch unhappy, merely for his need. Unjust to me, and all that serve the state. To love Ulysses is to raise thy hate. For me, suffice the approbation one. Of my great mistress, and her godlike son. To him Telemachus, no more incense. The man by nature prone to insolence. Injurious minds just answers but provoke. Then turning to Antinous, thus he spoke. Thanks to thy care. Whose absolute command. Thus drives the stranger from our court and land. Heaven bless its owner with a better mind. From envy free, to charity inclined. This both Penelope and I afford. Then, Prince. Be bounteous of Ulysses' board. To give another's is thy hand so slow. So much more sweet to spoil than to bestow. Whence, great Telemachus. This lofty strain. Antinous cries with insolent disdain. Portions like mine if every suitor gave. Our walls this twelve month should not see the slave. He spoke, and lifting high above the board. His ponderous footstool, shook it at his lord. The rest with equal hand conferred the bread. He filled his scrip, and to the threshold sped. But first before Antinous stopped, and said. Bestow, my friend. Thou dost not seem the worst. Of all the Greeks, but prince-like and the first. Then, as in dignity, be first in worth. And I shall praise thee through the boundless earth. Once I enjoyed in luxury of state. Whatever gives man the envied name of great. Wealth, servants, friends, were mine in better days. And hospitality was then my praise. In every sorrowing soul I poured delight. And poverty stood smiling in my sight. But Jove, all governing, whose only will. Determines fate, and mingles good with ill. Sent me, to punish my pursuit of gain. With roving pirates o'er the Egyptian main. By Egypt's silver flood our ships we moor. Our spies commission straight the coast explore. But impotent of mind, the lawless will. The country ravage, and the natives kill. The spreading clamor to their city flies. And horse and foot in mingled tumults rise. The reddening dawn reveals the hostile fields. Horrid with bristly spears. And gleaming shields. Jove thundered on their side, our guilty head. We turned to flight. The gathering vengeance spread. On all parts round, and heaps on heaps lay dead. Some few the foe in servitude detain. Death ill exchanged for bondage and for pain. Unhappy me a Cyprian took aboard. And gave to Demeter, Cyprus' haughty lord. Hither, to escape his chains, my course I steer. Still cursed by fortune, and insulted here. To whom Antinous thus his rage expressed. What god has plagued us with this gourmand guest? Unless at distance, wretch. Thou keep behind. Another isle, than Cyprus more unkind. Another Egypt shalt thou quickly find. From all thou begst, a bold audacious slave. Nor all can give so much as thou canst crave. Nor wonder I, at such profusion shown. Shameless they give, who give what's not their own. The chief, retiring, souls, like that in thee. Ill suits such forms of grace and dignity. Nor will that hand to utmost need afford. 
the smallest portion of a wasteful board, whose luxury whole patrimony sweeps, yet starving want, amidst the riot, weeps. The haughty suitor with resentment burns, and, sourly smiling, this reply returns. Take that, ere yet thou quit this princely throng, and dumb for ever be thy slanderous tongue. He said, and high the whirling tripod flung. His shoulder blade received the ungentle shock. He stood, and moved not, like a marble rock. But shook his thoughtful head, nor more complained. Sedate of soul, his character sustained. And inly formed revenge. Then back withdrew. Before his feet the well-filled scrip he threw. And thus with semblance mild addressed the crew. May what I speak your princely minds approve. Ye peers and rivals in this noble love. Not for the hurt I grieve, but for the cause. If, when the sword our country's quarrel draws. Or if, defending what is justly dear. From Mars impartial some broad wound we bear. The generous motive dignifies the scar. But for mere want, how hard to suffer wrong. Want brings enough of other ills along. Yet, if injustice never be secure. If fiends revenge, and gods assert the poor. Death shall lay low the proud aggressor's head. And make the dust Antinous bridal bed. Peace, wretch. And eat thy bread without offense. The suitor cried, or force shall drag thee hence. Scourge through the public street, and cast thee there. A mangled carcass for the hounds to tear. His furious deed the general anger moved. All, even the worst, condemned, and some reproved. Was ever chief for wars like these renowned? Ill fits the stranger and the poor to wound. Unbless thy hand. If in this low disguise. Wander, perhaps, some inmate of the skies. They, curious oft of mortal actions, deign. In forms like these to round the earth and main. Just and unjust recording in their mind. And with sure eyes inspecting all mankind. Telemachus, absorbed in thought severe. Nourished deep anguish, though he shed no tear. But the dark brow of silent sorrow shook. While thus his mother to her virgin spoke. On him and his may the bright god of day. That base, inhospitable blow repay. The nurse replies, if Jove receives my prayer. Not one survives to breathe tomorrow's air. All, all are foes, and mischief is their end. Antinous most to gloomy death a friend. Replies the queen the stranger begged their grace. And melting pity softened every face. From every other hand redress he found. But fell Antinous answered with a wound. Amidst her maids thus spoke the prudent queen. Then bade Eumaeus call the pilgrim in. Much of the experienced man I long to hear. If o'er his certain eye, or listening ear. Have learned the fortunes of my wandering lord. Thus she, and good Eumaeus took the word. A private audience if thy grace impart. The stranger's words may ease the royal heart. His sacred eloquence in balm distills. And the soothed heart with secret pleasure fills. Three days have spent their beams, three nights have run. Their silent journey, since his tale begun. Unfinished yet, and yet I thirst to hear. As when some heaven-taught poet charms the ear. Suspending sorrow with celestial strain. Breathed from the gods to soften human pain. Time steals away with unregarded wing. And the soul hears him, though he ceased to sing. Ulysses late he saw. On Cretan ground. His father's guest, for Minas' birth renowned. He now but waits the wind to waft him o'er. With boundless treasure, from Thesprotia's shore. To this the queen, the wanderer let me hear. While yon luxurious race indulge their cheer. Devour the grazing ox, and browsing goat. And turn my generous vintage down their throat. For where's an arm, like thine, Ulysses? Strong. To curb wild riot, and to punish wrong. She spoke. Telemachus then sneezed aloud. 
constrained, his nostril echoed through the crowd. The smiling queen the happy omen blessed. So may these impious fall, by fate oppressed. Then to Eumius, bring the stranger, fly. And if my questions meet a true reply. Graced with a decent robe he shall retire. A gift in season which his wants require. Thus spoke Penelope. Eumius flies. In duteous haste, and to Ulysses cries. The queen invites thee, venerable guest. A secret instinct moves her troubled breast. Of her long absent lord from thee to gain. Some light, and soothe her soul's eternal pain. If true, if faithful thou, her grateful mind. Of decent robes a present has designed. So finding favor in the royal eye. Thy other wants her subjects shall supply. Fair truth alone, the patient man replied. My words shall dictate, and my lips shall guide. To him, to me, one common lot was given. In equal woes, alas! Involved by heaven. Much of his fates I know, but checked by fear. I stand. The hand of violence is here. Here boundless wrongs the starry skies invade. And injured suppliants seek in vain for aid. Let for a space the pensive queen attend. Nor claim my story till the sun descend. Then in such robes as suppliants may require. Composed and cheerful by the genial fire. When loud uproar and lawless riot cease. Shall her pleased ear receive my words in peace. Swift to the queen returns the gentle swain. And say, she cries, does fear or shame detain. The cautious stranger. With the begging kind. Shame suits but ill. Eumius thus rejoined. He only asks a more propitious hour. And shuns, who would not. Wicked men in power. At evening mild, meet season to confer. By turns to question, and by turns to hear. Who are this guest, the prudent queen replies. His every step and every thought is wise. For men like these on earth he shall not find. In all the miscreant race of humankind. Thus she. Eumius all her words attends. And, parting, to the suitor powers descends. There seeks Telemachus, and thus apart. In whispers breathes the fondness of his heart. The time, my lord, invites me to repair. Hence to the lodge, my charge demands my care. These sons of murder thirst thy life to take. O oh, guard it, guard it, for thy servant's sake. Thanks to my friend, he cries, but now the hour. Of night draws on, go seek the rural bower. But first refresh, and at the dawn of day. Hither a victim to the gods convey. Our life to heaven's immortal powers we trust. Safe in their care, for heaven protects the just. Observant of his voice, Eumia sate. And fed recumbent on a chair of state. Then instant rose, and as he moved along. Twas riot all amid the suitor throng. They feast, they dance, and raise the mirthful song. Till now, declining towards the close of day. The sun obliquely shot his dewy ray.